Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Tom Wilkins of Amalgamated Life, Johnny. Oh, hi, Tom. What's up? Well, at the moment, 50000 bucks worth of life insurance. Oh? Yeah, we got a policy for that amount in the life of one Edward Russell. Russell? Never heard of him. That's just the trouble, Johnny. Right now, nobody else has either. Three days ago, his wife, Leona, over in Denver, filed a missing persons report. She the beneficiary? Right. So what do you want from me? <laughs> Find out what happened to him. Well, how do you know anything did? Maybe he just walked out on his wife. Now, from what I can gather, Russell was a hothead. Could be he had one argument too many. Uh, it still could be just a guy getting away for a while. Huh? And why would he abandon his car in his storage garage in Colorado Springs? Oh. Yeah. It turned up this morning with part of his luggage in it. Interested? I'm on my way. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an accounting of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Crystal Lake matter. Expense account item one, $120.50, plane fare and incidentals to Denver. Tom Wilkins hadn't given me much to go on, so I figured the logical place to start was with the missing man's wife, Leona Russell. Their house was in a moderately prosperous suburb of Denver, a white ranch house with a shake roof. Everything looked neat and well kept. But somehow, a forlorn feeling came through to me about the place. Then the door opened. And right away, I was sure something pretty bad had happened to Edward Russell. You don't just walk out on a wife who looked like that. Yes. Mrs. Leona Russell? Yes. I'm Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Oh, yes, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Wilkins sent a telegram about you. Won't you come in? Thanks. Hmm, cooler in here. I try to keep the house shut up during the day. It helps. Please sit down. Oh, thank you. I've already told the police what little there was to tell when I filed the... the missing persons report. Oh, sure. This is just a routine investigation, Mrs. Russell. You probably don't feel too much like talking about it, but if you wouldn't mind going over what information there is again... Well, it was just a week ago that Ed, Mr. Russell, left. You were here when he left? Yes, he told me he was driving up to Boulder on business, that he'd only be gone overnight. Oh, what sort of business is he in? He's in real estate. Boulder, huh? But his car was found in Colorado Springs. I know. <laughs> I can't explain that. When he didn't come home on time, I got worried. I'd call the hotel in Boulder. He never checked in there. Yes, I see. Did he know anyone in Colorado Springs? Just business contacts, as far as I know. He might have decided to go there instead of Boulder, but... He would have called me. But he didn't. No. I... I haven't heard a thing from him since he drove away from here a week ago. Mrs. Russell, do you happen to know if your husband had any... well, enemies? No. Ed was pretty impulsive. You might even say hot-headed. But I just can't believe that anyone would hate him enough to... to do anything to him. Well, we don't know that anyone has. I know. <laughs> it's funny that... Things that run through your mind at a time like this? Uh-huh. What sort of things? It sounds funny, but I've almost been wishing it was in an accident or something like that. In a hospital where he might not have a chance to call me, but at least was safe and alive. You've checked the hospitals? All of them. I did that before I filed the missing persons report. Tell me, had your husband been unusually depressed before he left? If you're suggesting that Ed did away with himself. That's just not possible, Mr. Dollar. That's one thing he'd never do. He, he just wasn't built that way. Mm -hmm. Everything was uh, fine between you two. Yes. Oh, of course, we had disagreements, arguments in the six years we've been married. Who hasn't? Uh, but nothing serious. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm not being very helpful to you, Mr. Dollar. Well, I'm sure that's not your fault. You've no idea at all where he could be then or what could have happened. No. None at all. Except... Except what? Well, I don't know if it means anything or not, but I, uh... 
I found this under some of Bill's papers on his desk just this morning. Travel folder. Crystal Lake. Where's that? It's a resort up in the mountains. As I say, I, I don't know whether it means anything or not. Has he ever been there before? Not that I know of. I mention it to you? No, I don't. I'm sure he hasn't. Well, I'll check it out. Thanks, Mrs. Russell. Oh, uh, just one more thing. Yes? You're the beneficiary of his life insurance policy? Yes. I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar. I'm not thinking anything. I'm just asking questions. It's my job. I know. But let me ask you a question, Mr. Dollar. Do you think $50,000 or any amount of money could possibly make up for... for Ed? One thing about my job, you have to ask such nice questions sometimes. After Leona Russell's answer, there didn't seem to be much left to say, so I told her I'd let her know if I found out anything and I left. I looked at the travel folder again. Crystal Lake, pretty slim lead. But when you have nothing to go on, anything at all looks promising. Expense account item two, $45.20. I rented a car and drove to Crystal Lake. It was a beautiful spot. 7,000 feet high, clean, thin air, fragrant pines, and the clearest water this side of the Jackson Hole country. I parked a moment and looked out over the lake. Oh, great place to drop a hook. But I had a strong hunch that the fishing I'd be doing was of a little different variety. One thing was obvious. There was a lot of money up here. Most of the cabins would be in cellar to be called cabins and had their own boat landings. The village was nestled at one end of the lake, a colorful collection of Swiss chalets. I headed for the office of the local law, a deputy sheriff named Ansel Garrett. Tall, thin, raw-boned lad in his early 30s who looked like he'd spent all but the first few hours of his life in the open. Clear, keen eyes that showed he had his wits about him. Have a seat, Dollar. Thanks. Uh, Edward Russell, you said. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Disappeared about a week ago. Left home in Denver. Hasn't been heard from since. So? So he could have come here. His wife found a travel folder about Crystal Lake in his papers. It's supposed to prove something? No, it doesn't prove anything, Ants, but it's my only lead. Here, take a look at this picture. Hmm. You recognize him? Yeah, looks sort of familiar. You've seen him up here at Crystal Lake? Yeah, I think so, four or five days ago. Well, what do you know? Looks like my luck's changing. I hit the jackpot on my first nickel. Well, it depends on what jackpot you're talking about, Johnny. What do you mean? Well, for one thing, I could be wrong about the identification. <laughs> I guess you haven't been wrong about many of them in your time. Uh, suppose he was the guy, so what? Why are you looking for him, anyway? May need to find out if he's still alive. <laughs> what makes you think he's not? Nothing definite, but a hunch that's getting stronger by the minute. Oh? Insurance investigators are operating on hunches these days, huh? Once in a while. Just like deputy sheriff says. Yeah, all right. So hunches sometimes do pan out. But you could be way out in the pasture, Johnny. Maybe the guy just had an argument with his wife and he walked out on Oh, it. sure, yeah, I thought of that. But then I saw his wife. Nobody in his right mind would walk out on her. Mm, like that, huh? Like that. Look, Ants, can you give me any dope on this guy? No, not much. He came to see me about five days ago. Why? Mainly to ask me a silly question. Silly? Yeah. He asked me if there was a guy named Bill around Crystal Lake somewhere. Oh, I take it there's more than one. You know, fistful, Johnny. Bill Cullen, who tends bar at the hotel. Bill Jensen, who runs the boathouse. Bill Pickens, who clerks at the hardware. Yeah, okay, Bill... okay, I get the idea. I take it Russell didn't know which Bill he wanted, huh? Nope. Well, at least I know he was here at Crystal Lake now. You, uh, you haven't seen him since, huh? You know, just once. Oh? Huh? That same night. He was in the bar at the hotel talking to Betty Norton. Who's she? Heiress to the Norton estate. Mining. She's got a big place on the other side of the lake near Lookout Point. Know anything about her? Phew, all I want to. Oh. She travels at a pretty good clip. Oh, I see. Well, thanks for the information, Ace. Yeah, what are you going to do now? Try to find Edward Russell. Alive or otherwise. Is that a hunch of yours still operating? It hasn't gotten any weaker. Oh, uh, just one thing, Johnny. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty high-grade resort here. Things are nice and peaceful. I, uh, I like to keep it that way. Sure. So, so don't go off half-cocked, huh? For instance? For instance, don't start accusing anybody of murder unless or until you find a body. <laughs> and if I do find a body? 
Oh, then looks like we'll have to start doing a little accusing. I left Ansel Garrett's office and walked around the village. All I knew so far was that Edward Russell, or somebody who looked like him, had been in Crystal Lake several days ago inquiring about a man named Bill and that he'd been at the bar with a dough-heavy girl named Betty Norton. There were a flock of Bills in town, but there was only one Betty Norton, so I decided to start with her. I drove around the lake to her home, an elaborate lodge-type place that sprawled along the shore. Betty was down on her boat dock in a bathing suit, and she was a pretty elaborate-looking job herself. I was just going for a swim. Come on, join me. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Norton. I'm not equipped at the moment. Oh, there's some trunks in the dressing room. Yeah, well, look, I'd like to talk to you about something, But so... I don't feel like talking right now. I feel like swimming. But this is important. It's about... So is swimming. If you want to talk to me, you've got to go swimming first. <sighs> okay, we'll play it your way. That's the only way I ever play it, Mr. Dollar. So we went swimming, and I swam hard, but mainly to keep from freezing to death. The water should have been accused by the feel of it, but Betty seemed to think it was normal. After a while, we climbed back onto the land. Wonderful, huh? Ooh. Here's a towel. Oh, it's great, sure. Only about 20 degrees. Too cold. <laughs> Makes the sun feel better. Yeah. Hot and cold, Johnny. Contrast. Mm. That's what puts the charge in life. Is it? I wouldn't know. Hey, look, do you mind now if I ask you a couple of questions? Go ahead. You know a man named Edward Russell? I don't think so. I think you do. You had a drink with him at the hotel several nights ago. So this I do once in a while. Am I supposed to remember all of them? This one might have mentioned he was looking for a guy named Bill. Well, I remember now. He thought the bartender might be the one he was looking for, Bill Collins. So what happened? How should I know? I left. You haven't seen Russell since? Nope. Haven't missed him either. Oh, great. And for this kind of information, I practically freeze to death in the ice trough you laughingly call a lake. <laughs> Maybe your trip wasn't a waste of time after all, Johnny. No. We met. Well, uh... What do you do with your spare time? <laughs> well, A, I don't expect to have much, and B, isn't that sort of a leading question? Mm, I'm pretty good at leading. You must have trouble finding guys to dance with, huh? Why don't you try it sometime? Huh? left on that, feeling like a fly who spotted the web at the last moment. And right now, I was feeling just about as useless as a fly, too. I wasn't getting even close to locating Edward Russell. I went back to my room and the phone was ringing. Johnny Dollar. Yeah, it's Garrett, Johnny. Sheriff's office. Oh, hi. Well, you can quit looking for Russell. We found him. Well, that's good news. Is it? He's dead. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a cabin with a lovely view of a beautiful lake. A nice, comfortable, quiet spot for murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Wyeth, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hey, it's Garrett, Johnny, Sheriff's Office. You can quit looking for Edward Russell. We found him. Well, that's good news. Is it? He's dead. What? Yeah, been dead for three or four days. Where'd you find him? In a cabin on the other side of the lake. 
Your hunch was good. And expensive. What do you mean? It'll cost the company I represent a cool $50,000. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Crystal Lake matter. Expense account continued. Item three, $2.55. Telegram to Tom Wilkins of Amalgamated Life Associates notifying him of Edward Russell's murder. I was reasonably sure the telegram wouldn't make Tom sleep any easier. I headed for the office of Ansel Garrett, deputy sheriff in charge of the Crystal Lake substation. Sit down. Not good, huh, Johnny? No, not good. Not good at all. Who found the body, Ansel? A fellow named Bixby's waiting next door. I figured you'd want to talk to him. Thanks, I do. First, though, I'd, uh, I'd like you to run over what you know about this deal again for me. I want to know just where we stand in it. People at this resort pay a lot of money for peace and quiet. I don't want to disturb it any more than I can help. Good luck. The meaning? Meaning if you know where you stand in this deal, you're a lot better off than I am, and I've got a strong hunch a lot of peace and quiet's going to get disturbed before it's wound up. I don't like your hunches, Johnny. you got a way of proving out. <laughs> like the one about Russell being dead. I suppose you give me the rundown. Okay, okay. And I can make it short because there's not much to tell. The company I represent holds a $50,000 policy on Russell. About a week ago, he disappeared. And his wife filed a missing persons report? Yeah, Leona Russell over in Denver. Mm. She said her husband had told her he was going on an overnight business trip to Boulder. He never came back. His car was found in a garage in Colorado Springs. His wife couldn't account for it? No. She said she was completely in the dark. I take it she's his beneficiary. Oh, yeah, sure. I thought of that, too. I asked her about it. What kind of an answer did you get? Tears, mostly. And a pretty withering look. Either she's completely clean or she's one of the best actresses I've ever seen. The rest of the story you told me... How Russell came into your offices several days ago looking for a guy named Bill, last name and description unknown. You know, like I said, there's a flock of Bills in this neck of the woods. Yeah, no. The bartender, the man who runs the boathouse, a clerk in a hardware store, a few assorted others. Mm. I uh, told you I saw Russell having a drink with Betty Norton the same night he came to see me. You check her out? Yeah, yeah. I had to go swimming with her in that sub-zero lake before she'd answer any questions, though. Then what I got from her was nothing. She said she'd met Russell at the hotel, had a drink with him, and then left. That's all you've got, huh? That's it. Well, that's precious little to go on. I'll let you talk to Mr. Bixby. Oh, Mr. Bixby, would you step in here, please? This is Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Hi. Mr. Clarence Bixby. Hi. How are you? Not too good at the moment. <laughs> you got troubles. It was my cabin the body was in. Oh, a padlock had been changed, Johnny. Here it is. No fingerprints other than Bixby's. I monkeyed with it for a while until I realized my key wouldn't fit, and then I pried it open with a big screwdriver. Mr. Bixby, would you mind showing me your cabin and just what happened? I guess not. Doesn't matter much now, anyway. What do you mean? Well, I was going to show the cabin to a guy when we found the body. He wanted to buy the place. But who'd want to buy it now? Bixby and I drove halfway around the lake. His cabin was a couple of hundred feet from the edge and had a good view of the water. Well, nice spot here, Bixby. It was. You used the cabin much? Eh, I haven't been able to regularly for the last couple of years. I got to figuring why I keep on paying for taxes and upkeep on it. So I decided to sell it. Did you advertise it in the papers? I did. And first crack out of the box, I got a hot prospect. He's the one you brought up here to show the cabin to. Huh? That's right. His name's Putnam. Putnam. I'd like to talk to him. Yeah, he's staying at the hotel. Probably looking for another cabin to buy. Yeah, here we are. Oh. Well, let's see. This is where the padlock was, huh? That was the first thing I noticed, that the padlock had been changed. The one I had on there was better. Whoever did it probably pried the first one off. Yeah, right here is where I, I pried off the lock this morning. Mm -hmm. Then what? And I opened the door. 
body was on the floor, right over here. Bullet hole in the forehead. I see. Putnam turned green, and I... Well, that's not a very pretty sight to find in your own cabin. No. Well, let's go sit outside. The dead man, Edward Russell. Did you happen to know him, Bixby? No. Never set eyes on him before. Why did they have to pick my cabin? Hmm, that's a good question. Hey, that cabin about 100 yards away, who lives there? Oh, that one? Owned by the Butler family. They spend their summers up here. Well, maybe they saw or heard something. No, Deputy Sheriff questioned them. They arrived here three days ago. He figured that was the morning after the killing. Have a cigar? No, no thanks. What does it add up to, Dollar? Not at the moment, Mr. Bixby. Not much. I sat there and watched Bixby tie his cellophane cigar wrapper into a neat little knot. And I realized that was exactly my situation at the moment. The whole deal was a knot, and I didn't know how to untie it. I went back to the hotel. Item four, an expense account, $1.75. Telephone call to the dead man's wife, Leona Russell, over in Denver. It was very considerate of you to telephone, Mr. Dollar. The authorities notified me of what happened... They want me to come up there and confirm the identification. I see. You don't think it could be somebody else? Mm, I'm sorry, Mrs. Russell. I'm afraid not. I guess I'd really given up hoping. All the time I was trying to tell myself he was alive, but... Um, yes, yes. Um, look, Mrs. Russell, have you ever heard of a man named Clarence Bixby? Bixby? No. Your husband was found in Bixby's cabin... Did you ever hear him mention the name? No. Okay. Thanks anyway. I'll keep in touch. I hung up and sat there a moment, thinking her over. She stood to benefit to the tune of $50,000 by her husband's death. She seemed on the up and up, and yet... Expense account item five, another call to Denver, to the police department. I wanted them to check, check on her, but I found out that they and Ansel Garrett working together were a couple of jumps ahead of me. They'd already checked on Leona and established the fact that at the time of her husband's murder here at Crystal Lake, she'd been in Denver. I decided to look up Putnam, the man who'd wanted to buy Russell's cabin. I found him in the bar at the hotel. Yes, I tell you, it was quite a shock, Mr. Dollar. When Bixby opened his cabin door, a body sprawled there in front of us. It... <sighs> yes, sir, quite a shock. Yeah. How come you decided to buy Bixby's cabin, Mr. Putnam? Well, my wife and I had been on the lookout for a cabin for some time. When I saw Bixby's ad in the paper, it sounded like just the sort of place I was looking for. I see. So I answered the ad, made the arrangements with Bixby to come up here and have him show me the place. Mm Mm-hmm. Are you still interested in buying a cabin up here? Possibly. I've always wanted a place where I can come for rest now and then, but after what's happened, I don't think I'd be too happy in Bixby's place. Mr. Putnam, the dead man's name was Edward Russell. Did, uh, did you have to know him? Of course not. Why? Ever hear of him before? See here, Mr. Dollar, what is your reason for asking questions like that? Surely you don't think I'm involved in any of this? No, routine, Mr. Putnam. Well, I don't care for the routine, Mr. Dollar. Well, look, I would... Skip it. See you later, Putnam. What pulled me into action was a glimpse I caught of the bartender. I started remembering a few things. Number one, Edward Russell had been looking for a guy named Bill. Number two, the bartender was one of several guys by that name here at Crystal Lake. Number three, something I saw on the bartender's face made me think he could be the bill that Russell had been looking for. I left Putnam's table and slid onto a stool at the bar. Hi. Hi. What'll it be? Is uh, is that I.W. Harper there? Yeah. And soda. Coming up. Sort of quiet this evening, huh? Yeah, yeah. Been a little slack this season so far. I made a little pickup later on this summer. Here. There you are. Thanks. Must have been quite a fight. Come again? You're wearing what looks like the tail end of a black eye. Oh, yeah, that. No, I've, I've been down to pick up a bottle of mix the other day, and I bumped my face on the corner of the bar. You're uh, sure that's the way it happened, huh? Where are you getting at, pal? Better take a look at my car now. Insurance investigator? Yeah. A guy named Edward Russell was in here a few nights ago with Betty Norton. He was looking for someone named Bill. By some strange coincidence, your name is Bill. And by an even stranger coincidence, you've got a black eye. Okay, Dollar. So Russell did give me the black eye. I traded him a split lip for it. What happened? 
I still haven't figured it out. He was in here drinking. He started talking to Miss Norton. She called me by my first name, and suddenly this Russell heats up. He comes up to me and starts asking me a bunch of questions. What kind of questions? Well, mainly had I ever lived in Denver. I told him no, but he didn't seem to believe me. Got pretty insulting, and we ended up outside. He pasted me first, and I let him have one. Then I spotted the hotel manager and broke it off. They left right after that. Why the cover-up about hitting your face on the bar? Are you kidding? Look, how long do you think a bartender would last in a hotel like this if the management knew he got in a fight with a customer? Particularly if the customer winds up dead, huh? Yeah, I heard about the killing this afternoon. Tough, but I must say that guy was asking for trouble. I don't know what was eating him, but something sure was. You didn't see him after that night? No. Check on me if you want. Oh, don't worry, I will. I... Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? You said something a minute ago that just rang a bell. You said they left together after the fight. Who's they? Russell and Miss Norton. You sure about that? You sure she was with him when he left? Sure, I'm sure. You don't miss any tricks about a guy like that. Hey, look. If he told you different, I don't want to get nobody in trouble. That's where you and I differ, Bill. There's one person I want to get in trouble real bad. Who? The person who killed Russell. And right now, Betty Norton looked like an interesting possibility. I went outside and started walking along the lakeshore in the moonlight, thinking about it. She told me she'd left alone after one drink with Russell. But according to the bartender, she'd lied. She and Russell had left together. The motive stumped me, though. As far as I could figure, Leona Russell was the only one who could profit by her husband's death. Yet she didn't kill him. But Betty Norton, the girl who always had to play everything her way... I decided to have another talk with her and turned to go back to the hotel, and I stopped. Out of the corner of my eye, I'd seen a movement near a tree on the slope above me. A shadow where there shouldn't have been a shadow. I scrambled up the slope. There was nobody in sight. So somebody was keeping an eye on me. Somebody who knew this area pretty well. A nasty thought started pecking away at me. To wit, in getting closer to Russell's killer, I might be getting closer to something else, too. A bullet. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a girl who lied and a padlock that didn't. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif... It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. This is Betty Norton. I've been trying to call you. I know. I was out. I'm sorry. You keep pretty late hours. It's after midnight. Did I wake you up? No. Good. Why don't you come over? The moon's real nice tonight. The lake is luscious. I'll come over, Betty. But not to talk about the moon or the water. Oh. Got something else on your mind, maybe? Yeah. A little thing called murder. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Crystal Lake matter. Expense account continued. Item six, two dollars. Tip to the Crystal Lake Hotel garage attendant for rousting him out of bed to get my car. I wanted very much to have another talk with Betty Norton, the wealthy, glamorous girl on the other side of the lake. She had told me she hadn't been with Edward Russell when he left the hotel bar the night he was murdered. But the bartender at the hotel swore that she and Russell had left together. If she'd lied about that, maybe she'd lied about a few other things. When I got to her lakeshore mansion, she had a few well-spaced dim lights burning, a dreamy-type record playing, and some drinks mixed. The whole bit. Here you are, Johnny. Bourbon, isn't it? Yeah. Ah, you've got a good memory, Betty. Sure. I always remember what's important. Or what you want to remember. Same thing. Is it? How about the things you don't want to remember? Meaning? How about the questions I want to ask you? Oh, now don't start making with those dull questions again. Look, let's just have a drink. <laughs> Last time I had to go swimming with you before you'd answer. This time it's got to be a drink, huh? Well, I thought we might dance, too. With you leading, I suppose. Sorry, Betty. I know you probably own quite a few things in this world, but the list stopped short of me. I want some answers from you, and I want them now. Okay, so be a party pooper. So ask questions. You told me you met Edward Russell in the hotel bar the night he was murdered. You had one drink with him and left. That's right. You lied, Betty. Who says so? The bartender at the hotel. My, I've always tipped him so well, too. Look, baby, suppose we cut the comic routines, huh? All right, so I left the bar with Russell. Why did you lie about it to me this afternoon? It's very simple, Johnny. Part of the Norton training, I guess. What does that mean? My father told me long ago I could do whatever I liked, but to keep it out of the newspapers. That's the way I've played it ever since. Well, go on. On that night you're talking about, Russell and the bartender got into a fight. I know. And that's why I lied to you. Believe me. I just didn't want to be mixed up in anything that could land in the papers. I see. What happened then? He and I went to a coffee shop to sober him up a little. You can check that. I will. Then what? He kept mumbling about somebody named Billy was looking for. He say much about him? No, he wasn't making very much sense. And then Hiram came into the coffee shop. Who? Hiram, the old fellow who drives what passes for a taxi here at the lake. He told Russell somebody wanted to see him. Russell left with Hiram. And you didn't see Russell after that? No, I didn't. You don't look convinced, Johnny. I'm not. You lied once before, you could be lying again. Sorry. I told you I lied before, but this time it's the truth. Mm -hmm. We're going to get in touch with Hiram. His number's on the cover of the local directory. Local directory. This one over here? Yes. Okay. Johnny, at this time of night? Yes, at this time of night. He doesn't usually take calls after midnight. Sleep around somewhere, I guess. Well, I'll check him in the morning. What is it? Shh, quiet. Johnny, what is it? What's the matter? I thought I heard something outside here. Could it have been one of your servants? Well, I only have a housekeeper with me here, and she went to bed hours ago. Hmm. There are a lot of deer around here. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah, maybe. Johnny, you call Hiram in the morning. He'll back my story up. It's crazy thinking I had anything to do with Russell's murder. What possible reason could I have? A pretty weird one, maybe, but it might fit. You told me this afternoon you had to play everything your way. You've probably been doing it most of your life and getting away with it. Maybe Russell wouldn't cooperate. Are you kidding? Look, men like Russell are a dime a dozen. So I had a drink with him and got mixed up in a barroom brawl. I should have known better. But as far as getting interested in him, I wasn't. Believe me, I can always find others who like to play it my way, as you put it. Hmm. What's the matter? Oh, you kill me. That gold-plated front you put on. I wonder if behind it you aren't just a hollow, lonely kid. Thanks a lot for reminding me, Mr. Freud. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I guess that was a little out of line. I guess I was asking for it. But you're wrong about me not being able to stand anyone who doesn't play it my way. You see, I found someone who won't. 
And I kind of like it. Kind of like you, that is. Um, <clears throat> yeah, look, uh, oh, I guess don't I better... worry. I'm not going to try to appropriate you or, or to buy you. But about the loneliness? Don't leave just yet, Johnny. Stay just a f- few minutes more. Okay. Just a few minutes. I guess I felt a little sorry for her and her loneliness. Or maybe it was... Well, anyway, I stayed a few minutes more. I think it was just a few minutes. My watch had stopped. First thing in the morning, I tried to get Hiram the cab driver on the phone again, but still no answer. I headed for Deputy Sheriff Ansel Garrett's office. Clarence Bixby, who owned the cabin where Russell's body was found, was with him. Good morning, Johnny. Ants, Mr. Bixby. Good morning, Dolly. Anything new? Not much. Well, I won't take up any more of your time, Sheriff. Uh, However, I would like to ask a favor of you, though. What is it? So far, the Denver papers haven't mentioned which cabin up here the body was found in. I'd appreciate it if it could be kept that way. Otherwise, if it got out, I'm afraid my chances of selling the place would be pretty dim. Yeah, and anybody who'd want to buy it for that reason would probably be the kind of person not very welcome here at the lake. Okay, Bixby, sounds reasonable enough. I'll see what I can do. <clears throat> Much obliged, Sheriff. Cigar? No, thanks. Dollar? No, no thanks. Well, I'll see you later, fellas. I'll be around a day or two more if you want me for Okay. Well, how do things look this morning, Johnny? Just like Bixby's cigar wrapper. Hmm? I wish he'd quit tying those things in knots. Every time he does it, it reminds me that we're right in the middle of a knot we can't untie. Mm. It's a bear, all right. Oh, brother, it's worse than that. A guy named Edward Russell takes off from his home in Denver and disappears. He turns up here looking for a guy named Bill, of which there are too many in this town. Then Bixby brings a prospect up here to show his cabin, too. He finds the padlock's been switched. Russell's body inside. Yeah. Ants, the only person who stood to profit financially on Russell's death is his wife, Leona, beneficiary on his $50,000 insurance policy. Mm-hmm. But she couldn't have killed him. The Denver police established her in Denver at the time. Oh, incidentally, she's up here at the lake now, Johnny. Oh, yeah, she told me over the phone you wanted her to confirm the identification. How'd she bear up? Uh, not too well. It's kind of rough. You got any information out of Betty Norton? Well, her story is she had coffee with Russell after his fracas with a bartender... Hiram, the cab driver, came in and told Russell somebody was looking for him. Russell went away with Hiram. You checked with Hiram? I've been trying to get in touch with him on the phone. No answer. Yeah, he's on the go a lot. He keeps his cab behind the hotel garage. We can check there and leave a message for him. Yeah, okay. Yes. What about Bixby as a possibility? I thought of that too, Johnny. It had taken an awful lot of nerve to kill a guy and then arrange to discover the body in your own cabin, but... It sure would be quite a cover. Yeah. yeah. but like you say, it'd take more nerve than most men have got. Besides, we run a check on Bixby, and we've turned up absolutely nothing to tie him into the deal at all. Now, there's no evidence he'd ever known Russell. I know. Leona Russell can't remember her husband ever mentioning Bixby's name. I, uh... Hey, wait a minute. How about Putnam? Well, the guy who wanted to buy Bixby's cabin? Yeah. The same thing could apply to him. He knew the cabin was empty... He could have planted Russell's body there and then arranged for Bixby to open the cabin. It could be, except how does he tie in? I don't know. He said he and his wife wanted to buy the cabin. Might be interesting to check with his wife and see what she says. Not a bad idea, Johnny. I'll put in a long-distance call to her. Don't count on much, though. At this point, Ansel, I'm counting on nothing. And I wasn't. I was getting nowhere trying to match a logical motive with any of the suspects. I decided I might as well continue checking guys named Bill around town and see if I could find the one Russell had been looking for. I went down to Bill's boathouse at the landing. Bill Jensen ran. It was a stocky, heavyset man in his late 20s. His face looked friendly enough. That is, if you weren't paying much attention to his eyes. They were about the coldest shade of blue I'd ever seen. What can I do for you, Mr. Dollar? Boat, maybe? A little information, maybe. <laughs> what about? A man named Edward Russell. The guy who was murdered? What about him? Did he come around here to your boathouse? Not that I know of. Well, he was looking for a man named Bill, and I thought you might be the one. No. 
No, Ants Garrett was telling me about him, but I'm not the one he was looking for. Sorry. Did you have to see him around town anywhere? Russell? Nope. First time I saw him was his picture in the paper after the killing. I see. Hey, you got quite a lot of boats here, Jensen. Yeah, pretty big investment in them. You keep the ones here in the boathouse padlocked, I see. No, I have to. Used to get one stolen now and then. Say, you want to take one out in the lake now, Mr. Dollar? Uh, not right now, Jensen. Maybe later. See you around. All of a sudden, I was real interested in Bill Jensen and his boathouse because some of the padlocks on the boats looked very much like the one that had been placed on Bixby's cabin door, the one he pried off when he discovered Russell's body. I wanted a closer look at those padlocks, but now wasn't the time. I went on back to the hotel to look for Hiram, but his taxi still wasn't there. So I left him a message to contact me as soon as possible. Then, after dark, I went back to the boathouse. There was nobody around. I slipped in the back and took a close look at the boat padlocks. Yeah, no doubt about it. They were the same kind as the one on Bixby's door. And one of them was missing. Yeah, Bill Jensen could be my boy. I hit the deck fast behind one of the boats and looked around me. It was a bad spot to be in. I was pinned against a wall. I edged toward the rear, then dove for the door of the tiny office. Then I realized my mistake. I'd figured that the office would have an outside door, but it didn't. I was trapped. Yeah, it looked like I'd just solved the murder. The hard way. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a shot in the dark that missed, and another that hit the bullseye. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ansel Garrett, Johnny. I was out when you phoned a minute ago. Ants, get over here fast. What's the matter? I'm trapped in the office of Jensen's Boathouse. Trapped? Look, I've got no time to explain. There's a man outside with a gun, and I can't hold him off much longer. Who is it? I don't know, but I've got a strong hunch it's the one who murdered Russell. And he's trying to do likewise to me. Tonight... And every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the Crystal Lake matter. Expense account continued. Item seven, two cents. Just about what I figured my life was worth at the moment. The tiny office I was in had no windows and no outside door. A real trap. And outside in the darkened boathouse, somebody with a gun was stalking me. Probably the killer I've been looking for. But now he was looking for me. 
I stacked what furniture there was against the door. He started throwing his weight against it, and it couldn't last very long. There was nothing I could do but wait. Right then, the sound of Ants Garrett's voice outside was just about the sweetest music this side of heaven. Drop the gun! Drop it! You okay, Johnny? Yeah, yeah, just a minute. I'll get this stuff away from the door. Okay. Light switch here somewhere. There. Well, Bill Jensen. So you're my boy, Jensen. What are you talking about? What are you doing here anyway, Dollar? Getting shot at by you, mostly. Look, this is my boathouse, remember? You got no business to come prowling around here. Now simmer down, Bill. Simmer down. I thought he was a prowler, Ants. Oh, yeah, sure. You knew I was getting close to you, Jensen. You decided to put me out of the ball game, and you came pretty close, believe me. I tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. I figured it was somebody after my boat again. expect me to buy a story like that? Just hold it a second, both of you. If I can get a word in edgewise around here, maybe we can straighten things out. They're pretty straight right now, as far as I can see. Maybe. Bill, you claim you figured Johnny was a prowler trying to steal something, huh? How would you figure it, Ants? I see somebody sneaking into the boathouse and catch a glimpse of somebody else hanging around outside. Wait a outside. minute, wait a minute. Somebody else who? Man or woman? I couldn't tell. Whoever it was got out of sight mighty fast. Oh, sure. Pretty convenient story, Jensen. Somebody around here has been keeping an eye on me right from the start. But right now, it figures to be you. Look, Dollar, I'm... Hold it, Bill! A couple of Jensen's boats have turned up missing lately, Johnny. It's natural he might think that Yeah, you... and something else has turned up missing here, too, Ants. What do you mean? That's why I came here to the boathouse tonight in the first place. When I was here this afternoon, I noticed that the padlocks on his boats were missing. One of them was missing. They looked an awful lot like the one that Russell's killer put on the cabin door when he planted the body there. A lock's a lock, Johnny. Yeah, but one of Jensen's is missing. Don't forget that. Oh? Here, come here. Take a look. Right there. Yeah. Yeah, So it is. How about it, Jensen? I didn't even know it was gone. How do I know what happened to it? Somebody stole it. Probably the same guy who stole those boats last month. Look, look, if you're trying to involve me in Russell's murder, you're wasting your time. I didn't even know the guy, and you got nothing to tie me into it. No? Then you better listen to a few facts, Jensen. Edward Russell took off from his home in Denver and came up here to Crystal Lake looking for a guy named Bill, which just happens to be your name. Half a dozen other bills in town, too, Dollar. Now, what does that prove? Russell's body was found in Bixby's vacant cabin when Bixby brought a prospect up to show him the place. Bixby's lock had been taken off the door and a new one put on. Your padlock, Jensen. I already told you somebody must have stolen it from Then I come around to your boathouse here to check on the locks and you start throwing shots at me. You figure it out. You haven't got a case against me and you know it, Dollar. Just the same, Jensen. You better come down to my office with us. I got a few more questions I want to ask you. And I'd like to check your gun against the slug that killed Russell. Go ahead. Check it. Sure, I'll come down with you, Ants. I want to get this straightened out, too. But let me tell you something, Dollar. Next time you come around my boathouse without a search warrant, I won't miss. We questioned Jensen for an hour, but he didn't change his story. He kept denying any connection with the murdered man, Edward Russell, or his wife, Leona. Afterward, Ants and I went into his office. Uh, I don't think we got enough to hold him on, Johnny. Uh, uh, for one thing, his gun's a different caliber than the one that killed Russell. Oh, sure, he could have used a different gun, but we'd have to find it to prove anything. Well, what about the padlock? Uh, that's a point, all right, but it's our only point. Somebody could have stolen it, like Jensen said. A frame? Could be. Jensen sure sticks to his story. Yeah. I threw everything I could think of at him, but he didn't crack an inch. Well, after all, Johnny, you were out of line going into his boathouse like that. So I should have had a search warrant. There wasn't time. You know, you got quite a knack for stirring up trouble. If you're wrong about Jensen and the other suspects, you're going to owe a few apologies. Apologies I don't mind handing out. But Russell's killer I want. You think I don't? Deputy Sheriff Garrett speaking. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, put it through. It's Mrs. Putnam in Denver, Johnny, wife of the man who wanted to buy Bixby's cabin. Yeah. I put a call into her earlier, hope... Hello? Oh, yeah, Mrs. Putnam. This is Deputy Sheriff Garrett up at Crystal Lake. The reason I'm calling... 
Your husband tells us you and he had been interested in buying a cabin up here for some time. I thought I'd check with you. What's that? You sure about that? I see. Well, thanks very much, Mrs. Putnam. Well, I guess your hunches are still clicking, Johnny. She didn't know anything about it, huh? Not a thing. Didn't even know her husband was up here. Look, gentlemen, I've already told you all about it. I saw Bixby's ad in the paper about his cabin here being for sale. It, it sounded like just a thing that, that... That you and your wife had in mind, Mr. Putnam? Yes, yes, exactly. So you I... can hold it right there, Putnam. You lied to us. I most certainly did not. Your wife doesn't seem to know anything about it. Oh, my wife? Good Lord, is she up here? No. No, I talked to her on the phone. You, you, you didn't tell her about my wanting to buy the cabin. Yeah, Putnam, I did. You lied, Putnam. And there could be a pretty good reason for it. Look, I... You knew Bixby's cabin was empty. You could have planted Russell's body there and then pretended to want to buy the place so Bixby would open it up and the body would be discovered. It'd make a pretty good cover for you. Oh, gentlemen, please. I'm in enough trouble as it is right now without you piling more on. I had nothing to do with Russell's murder. I didn't even know the man. What do you mean about being in trouble, then? Oh, with my wife. Look, it's probably hard for the two of you to understand... You don't know my wife. Don't know your wife? What about? I did lie about her wanting the cabin. She didn't know anything about it. We know that. I just wanted a place to, well, to get away from her once in a while. Ants looked at me, and I looked at Ants. And I guess we both had the same idea. The idea that we'd run another in a long series of blanks. We heard Putnam out, a long and familiar tale of woe. We could establish no connection between him and the dead man, so we finally left. We left him in the middle of a long sentence about what his wife said to him every time he got home from the office late. Anson and I went outside. The lake was silver in the moonlight, and a million stars were crowding the sky. A good night to be young, but at the moment I was feeling 90 years old. Getting you down, Johnny? Yeah. Yeah, right now I feel like an old beat-up merry-go-round. I've been going round and round, and my bearings are getting creaky. Yeah, the trouble is we've checked out just about everybody who could possibly be involved. It's motive that beats me, Ants. The only one we know of to gain by Russell's death is his wife, Leona, beneficiary of his $50,000 insurance policy. Yeah, but the Denver police established her in Denver at the time Russell was killed up here. Yeah, she couldn't have done it. We've got only one more lead as far as I can figure the guy who drives the local taxi here at the lake. Huh? Yeah. He keeps his car right over there in that shed. I know. That's why I was heading this way. Shed's empty, though. Benny Norton told me when she was with Russell the night he got killed, his Hiram came up and told Russell somebody was looking for him. Drove him away. Well, Hiram could have a line on the killer. But I can't seem to get a line on Hiram. I've tried to call him half a dozen times. I've left a message for him to contact me, but I haven't had a word from him. I don't like it. Our boys are looking for him. No sign yet. <sighs> well, we're not getting anywhere right now. Hey, look, if you're off duty, Ants, I'll buy you a drink in the hotel. Room. I am, and you got a deal. Of course, there's one possibility been in the back of my mind all along, Johnny. Yeah, probably in yours, too. You mean the killer could be somebody we don't even know about, a stranger? Yeah. Yeah, those are the toughest ones to crack. I know. Hmm. Lobby's kind of crowded tonight. We're getting into the busy season. Mr. Dollar. Hey, it's Leona Russell. Excuse me a minute, Ants. Meet you in the bar. You're right. Good evening, Mrs. Russell. I didn't know you were still here. I'm leaving in the morning. The sheriff asked me to come up here and make an identification of the body. I know. Afterward, I just couldn't seem to get myself organized. I took one of the hotel cottages for a day or two. Such a peaceful spot up here. It's hard to believe... Yes, that... I understand. Uh, Mrs. Russell, your husband came up here apparently looking for a man named Bill. I've questioned two Bills so far, Cullen the bartender and Jensen the boatkeeper. Those names mean anything to you? Not that I recall. <laughs> That's what's so terrible about this whole thing, Mr. Dollar. There just doesn't seem to have been any connection between anybody up here and my husband. Why would anyone have done it? That's a good question, Mrs. Russell. And right now, we don't seem to have an answer for it. I went into the bar, but Anne Garrett was nowhere in sight. The bartender told me he'd been called away. 
Expense account item eight, 75 cents, one drink. I waited. Still no Garrett. After a while, I went on in back of the hotel to check on Hiram's taxi cab. Nothing. The message I'd left him was still there. I went back into the bar, but Ants didn't show up. Finally, I went up to my room. Johnny Dollar. Hey, it's Garrett, Johnny. Oh, hi. I tried to call you in the bar just now. They told me you'd gone to your room. I got tired waiting for you. Sorry, I got hauled away on official business. I'm calling from a gas station up near the three-mile grade. Trouble? Plenty. Johnny, seems like when you go looking for people, it always turns out to be bad luck for them. What do you mean? You came up here looking for Russell. He turned up dead. Now you've been looking for Hiram, the taxi driver. Don't tell me. Afraid so. We just fished his body out of a ravine. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up, the payoff. A payoff with illegal tender. Hot lead. Join us, won't you? Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ansel Garrett, Johnny. I'm calling from a gas station up near the three-mile grade, ten miles north of the lake. Trouble? Plenty. Johnny, seems like when you go looking for people, it always turns out to be bad luck for them. What do you mean? You came up here to Crystal Lake looking for Edward Russell. He turned up dead. Now you've been looking for Hiram, the taxi driver. Don't tell me. Afraid so. We just fished his body out of a ravine. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Amalgamated Life Associates Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is a final accounting of expenses and report of my investigation of the Crystal Lake matter. <laughs> Item 9, one dollar. Tip to the garage man to get my car out in a hurry. I drove up to the three-mile grade. Deputy Sheriff Ansel Garrett was waiting for me beside the highway and led the way down the ravine. It watch the foot, Johnny. It's pretty tricky. Yeah. Who discovered Hiram's body? One of my boys patrolling the highway. He spotted a glint of metal down here in the moonlight. 
here we are. Yeah. Oh, brother. Taxi cab and all, huh? What a wreck. Yeah. He crashed the guardrail and came down the slope. I doubt if it was an accident, Ants. When a guy's got a bullet hole in his forehead, it's no accident, Johnny. Looks like the same person who killed Russell killed Hiram to shut his mouth. Uh, I guess that's about the size of it. Hiram's murder opens up another keg of nails, Ants. How so? Well, Betty's story is that the last she saw of Russell the night he was murdered was when he drove away in Hiram's taxi. But that story depended on Hiram for confirmation. You'll never be able to confirm it now. Well, earlier tonight you were beat because you were fresh out of suspects, Johnny. Now you got a real live one again. Maybe. But trying to find a motive to fit Betty Norton as a blind alley. The only one who could benefit financially from Russell's death is his wife, Leona. And she was in Denver at the time. I still think Russell's murder ties in with the fact that he came up here looking for somebody named Bill and apparently had it in for him. It could be. Trouble is, Johnny, we got too many guys by that name at Crystal Lake. Bill Cullen, the hotel bartender, Bill Jensen at the boathouse. Both of them are still possibilities, Ants. The bartender had a fight with Russell on the night of the murder. And it was one of Bill Jensen's padlocks on the cabin where the body was found. Yeah, that's true enough. Whoever killed Russell and hid his body in Bixby's vacant cabin didn't know that Bixby was planning on selling the place and would bring somebody up to show it and discover the body. Sounds real convincing, Johnny. Now, all you have to do is figure out somebody's name for the whoever and a good motive, and you're all set. Oh, yeah, sure. Real simple. You know, one thing that's been bothering me from the start, though. Why did the killer plant Russell's body in a cabin? With all the wide open spaces around here, why a cabin? Yeah, you could have figured dogs or animals would uncover the body if it was outside somewhere. How about the lake? The bodies have a way of coming to the surface. Yeah, I guess you're right. If we could only have gotten to hire him before this... You happen to know where he lived? No, a little rooming house not far from the hotel. You through here? No, not yet, Johnny. I got a couple of my boys beating the bush around here. Okay, I'll head back to town and see if I can turn up anything of interest at Hiram's rooming house. On the way back to the village, I stopped at Betty Norton's Lakeshore Mansion, but she wasn't at home. Her housekeeper told me she'd gone to Denver for a couple of days. On hearing that, my interest in her as a suspect shot up again. Expense account item 10, $1.45, long-distance call to the Denver police, requesting them to try to locate Betty Norton for further questioning. Then I went to the rooming house where Hiram had lived. I couldn't find anything in his room that would give me a lead on his killer. But as I was coming out, I found someone in the hall who might. Huh? Well, Bill the bartender. Oh, hello, darling. What are you doing here? It's real simple. I live here. Oh, same rooming house as Hiram, huh? That's right. Now, look, don't go trying to tie me into his murder. We was friends. I didn't know the news of his killing was out. How did you know he was dead, Bill? Well, I I just talked to one of Vance Garrett's boys at the hotel. He told me. Oh, I see. No, you don't see, Dolly. You still fight. Look, whoever killed Hiram is the same one who killed Russell. You had a fight with Russell on the night of his death. Yeah, I explained that to you before. He was looking for somebody named Bill. He thought I was the one, got tough about it. But that's all there was to it. I didn't kill him. I didn't kill Hiram. You'll never prove it I did. Yeah, going round and round on the merry-go-round. Somewhere along the line, I must have missed something. But I didn't know what. I decided to go back and start from the beginning. In this case, Bixby's cabin, where Russell's body was discovered. I found Bixby in the hotel bar. Hi, Dollar. Care for a drink? No, no thanks, Bixby. Well, I got a little good news earlier this evening. Sheriff Garrett told me he was through checking over my cabin so I can get it cleaned up and repainted now. You gonna advertise it again? Yeah, yeah, I'm not too optimistic about my chances of selling it, though. Even though the location of it's been kept out of the papers, everybody at Crystal Lake here knows about it. Uh, <clears throat> you never found out who put that new padlock on the door, huh? All the lock came from Jensen's boathouse. But we haven't been able to tie in Bill Jensen with any of the rest of it. Look, Bixby, you mind if I take another look around your cabin? Not at all, Dolly. You want me to go with you? No, that won't be necessary. Okay. Here's the key. Help yourself. It was my last chance. Maybe there was something in the cabin that neither Ansel Garrett nor I had noticed before. Something, anything that would give me a lead. I spent an hour going through it inch by inch, and I drew a great big blank. Everything was in place. Nothing had been touched. Even my cigarette butt on the front porch and Bixby's cigar wrapper twisted in a knot 
where we'd sat and talked after he'd reenacted the discovery of Russell's body. Inside, only marks on the floor where Ansel Garrett's boys had measured the distance of the body from the door, stuff like that. But as far as anything that would give me a fresh lead, there was nothing. Nothing at all. I was licked and I knew it. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Good evening, Mrs. Russell. I just dropped in to say goodbye. Well, that that was very thoughtful of you. Please come in. Thanks. When are you leaving? I'm checking out in the morning. What are your plans? I'm not sure, Mr. Dollar. I'll probably get rid of the house in Denver and take an apartment for a while. After that, I, I don't know. Have you filed your claim yet on your husband's insurance policy? No, not yet. My lawyer will take care of it for me. I'd rather not have any more to do with things like that personally than I can help. Mr. Dollar, have you gotten anywhere with your investigation? Have you found anyone at all who could have had a reason to kill my husband? To tell you the truth, Mrs. Russell, up to now I've got no... Then I saw it. Something in Leona Russell's room. Just a little thing. But all of a sudden the whole deal slid neatly into place. But I had to be sure... Somehow I had to start the ball rolling and see what happened. You were saying, Mr. Dollar? Oh, yeah. I I was saying that up to now I haven't been able to get any... Uh, What time is it? Well, um, well, a quarter to ten. Oh, i got to make a phone call. Mind if I use your phone? uh, No, not at all. I was supposed to call Deputy Sheriff Garrett to check on a new lead. And uh, if it's panned out, looks like we're in. Deputy Sheriff Garrett. Johnny Dollar, Ants. Uh, how's that new lead look? Huh? What new lead? Yeah, good. Hey, what are you... Oh, maybe putting on an act for somebody, Johnny? That's right. Well, looks like we're on the right track at last. Uh, you can't beat a lab test. Thanks, Ants. Something new has developed, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Looks like we're finally closing in on the right man, Mrs. Russell. I gotta run now. Got a date with the sheriff. But I'll keep you posted. I went outside her hotel cottage and waited. I could hear her on the phone. In a moment, she came out, started along the trail near the lakeshore. I followed. I was sure I was finally getting close to Russell's killer. But then a gun barrel on my back told me I'd gotten a little too close. Hold it, Dollar. Well, Mr. Bixby. Surprised? As a matter of fact, no. Bill? Is that you, Bill? Dollar. Hello, Leona. Leona, you stupid little... Falling for a gag like Dollar just pulled on you. But I had to talk to you, to warn you. Looks like you're a little stupid, too, Bixby. Huh? I just spotted one of them in Leona's cottage. I told you I should never have come to your cottage, Leona. You insisted. I had to see... That's what threw me about you, Bixby. Clarence Bixby, but a middle name of William, huh? Wilfred, if it'll do you any good now. It was you and Leona right from the start. Her husband found out about it, but all he had to go on was the name Bill. Somehow he got a lead that brought him up here to Crystal Lake. Of course I arranged for him to get the lead. Yeah. You wanted to be easy to find. You had Hiram, the taxi driver, decoy Russell to you, then killed Hiram to shut his mouth. Bill, get rid of him. Then you killed Russell in your own cabin and left his body. I had to. The people in the next cabin moved in that night. I was afraid they'd see me if I moved the body. So you played it smart. You stole a padlock from Bill Jensen to throw suspicion on him. Then you advertised your cabin and discovered the body when a prospect wanted to see the place. A pretty neat cover, Bixby. You had a lot of I still have, Dolly. Enough to do what has to be done now. And sweet little Leona Russell, the poor grieving wife. In it with you, right from the start. Hurry up and do it, Bill. Then you and I can... Oh, no, that's where you're wrong, Leona. It's not going to be you and I anymore. Bill, you can't say that. You engineered the whole deal right from the start, and I'm sick of it. I'm getting out. You can't get out, Bill. You hear me? You can't. You're in this as deep as I am, and you... Oh, yes. I can get out all right, Leona. I know one good way. Oh, yes, I've used it before, and it works. Here's for you, baby. Bill, no! Bill! He swung the gun toward her. I drove at him, but too late. Oh, no! I hit him twice in the face and I went down. I bent over Leona, but she was gone. She must have been dead when she hit the ground. Mm-hmm. 
seventh and final item on expense account, $145.20. Transportation and incidentals from Crystal Lake home. Total expenses, $423 even. Remarks about Bixby. In jail, awaiting trial on three counts of murder. Edward Russell, Hiram, Leona Russell. About Leona, who'd engineered the whole deal for a payoff. Well, she got paid off, all right. End of remarks, end of report. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, beginning on Friday night, because I'm sure you'll want to listen to the Republican convention Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week, a simple string of beads, and each bead on it, a motive for murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Dick Crenna, Charlotte Lawrence, Gene Tatum, Howard McNear, Forrest Lewis, and Herb Ellis. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Remember, next week's story will start on Friday night because of the Republican convention on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So join us Friday, a week from tonight, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. The makers of Grove's Bromo Quinine Tablets bring you another adventure of Sherlock Holmes with Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. A cold is a miserable thing. A cold may become a dangerous thing. Even a so-called light cold can take a serious turn. Be prompt, be decisive in your treatment of a cold. At the very first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets quickly check the symptoms of a cold, quickly relieve the distress of a cold. They give you speedy results which are very important. Don't monkey around when you can get such a dependable preparation as Grove's bromoquinine tablets. And now, here we are again on our usual visit to Dr. Watson. He's waiting for us in his study, a cheerful blaze crackling on the hearth. Very relieved to see you, Mr. Manning. Hasn't the weather been atrocious today? I was beginning to wonder if you'd be able to get here tonight through all this fog. Yes, it certainly is what you Londoners call a regular pea super. <laughs> yes, indeed. It reminds me of the adventure of the missing submarine plans. A case that was solved in the underground. Underground? What you Americans call a, a subway. Yes, but what has a solution in a subway got to do with a foggy night? Well, you see, the affair started in weather exactly like this. It was the third week in November, the year 1895, to be exact. On Monday, a dense yellow fog had settled down upon London. On Thursday, it was still there, thickier and, and murkier than ever. At first, Holmes had turned his nervous energy to cross-indexing his huge reference books. But when, after pushing our breakfast chairs back for the 
for the fourth morning, we saw the greasy brown swirl still drifting past the windows. Holmes's patience snapped. <laughs> Holmes, if you must pace around in circles, I wish you'd change directions now and then. You're, you're making me dizzy. Bah! It's inexcusable, Watson. Inexcusable. No initiative. No imagination. Nothing ever gets done. If you're alluding to the inactivity in this last session of Parliament, my dear Holmes... I'm not speaking of our lawmakers, Watson, but of our lawbreakers. The London criminal is certainly a dull fellow. What makes you say that? Well, look out of the window. Ideal weather for committing a crime. The criminal advances on his intended victim practically unseen. He pounces! And disappears into thin air. <laughs> there have been numerous petty thefts, ah, I believe. Petty, petty thefts, pickpockets, ragamuffins. What's the country coming to? Now, if I were a criminal, Watson. Well, I, for one, would move to America. <laughs> oh, hello, hello. Mrs. Hudson's knocking. Excited. What's up, I wonder? Yes, Mrs. Hudson, what is it? Oh, a telegram for me. Uh, yes, sir. Very well, thank you. Oh, well, what's it say? Well, oh, wait until I open it, can't you? Ah, dear me, what next? Most unusual, Watson, most unusual. What's most unusual, Watson? What's it, sir? Well, it's from my brother, Mycroft. You remember him. He helped us solve the case of the Greek interpreter. He's coming here. Why not? What's so phenomenal about Why that? not? Why not, indeed? It's as startling as it would be to meet a tram car coming down a country lane. Yes, yes, now I come to think of it, uh, Mycroft is rather like a tram car. His rails lead from his Pall Mall lodgings to the Diogenes Club in Whitehall. That's his circle. I wonder what upheaval could have derailed him. Doesn't the telegram explain? It says, uh, must see you about Cadogan West coming at once. Cadogan West? Cadogan West? Why, that's the young chap who's found dead in the underground on Tuesday morning. I remember reading about it in the papers. Oh? The young man had apparently fallen out of a train and, and killed himself. He hadn't been robbed and there was no reason to suspect violence. Quite an uninteresting case, if I remember correctly. And yet... It's serious enough to cause Mycroft to alter his habits. No, Watson. This must be an extraordinary event. Uh, do you recall any other facts about the affair? Yes, now I come to think of it, there was one unusual bit about... Who came out of the inquest. They were unable to ascertain at what point he entered the train, because his ticket was missing. Strange. But articles were found on the body. Oh, two pounds fifteen, I believe it was, a checkbook and... Oh, yes, 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 two dress circle tickets for the Woolwich Theatre... Dated for that evening. Theater tickets, eh? Then it wasn't suicide. A man doesn't procure theater tickets for the evening on which he intends to end his life. Anything else? A small packet of technical papers. Technical papers? What kind of technical papers? The, new, the newspapers didn't say. Ah, as serious as that. What did the young man do? Where was he employed? He was a clerk at Woolwich Arsenal. Ah, government employee. There we have it, Watson. British government. Woolwich Arsenal. Technical papers. That's why Mycroft is involved in this affair. I don't understand. No, I suppose not. Watson, have I ever told you what Mycroft is? Your brother, of course. Oh, no, 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 Watson. Do you have to be so dense? I mean, do you know what he does? Hmm? I seem to have some vague recollection that you once told me that he'd held some small office under the British government. It would be more accurate to say, in a way, that he is the British government. What? His position is unique. He made it for himself. Is the tidiest and most orderly brain of any man alive, with a great capacity for storing facts and giving them the proper interpretation. The conclusions of every government department are passed on to him. He's the central exchange, the clearinghouse. Again and again, his word has decided the national policy. He thinks of nothing else. Nothing else can lure him from his contemplations. And yet he's coming here. Yes, Jupiter is descending on us today. What on earth can happen? Uh, uh, Watson, that sounds suspiciously like a bad pun. Ah, here he is. If I'm not mistaken, to speak for himself. Come in, come in. Hello, Mycroft. What's up? What's up? You look flustered. Most annoying business, Sherlock. Most annoying. You know how I dislike altering my habits. Extremely awkward for me to come away from the office, particularly with Siam, this present state. Oh, dear me. Yeah, sit down, Mycroft. Sit down. Uh, you know Watson, of course. Yes, yes, of course. I'm trying to find a chair that I can trust to hold me. Yeah, I'd better take the sofa. You certainly haven't got any thinner. I've never seen the Prime Minister so upset. As for the Admiralty, it's buzzing like an upset beehive. You know anything about the case? No, uh, Watson's just been telling me what was in the newspapers. Uh, just what were the technical papers found on the body? Sherlock, for the love of heaven, not so loud. 
Those papers which so wretched youth had in his pocket were none other than the plans of the Bruce Partington submarine. Oh? A submarine which would completely revolutionize naval warfare. The most important papers in our government archives. Under no circumstances could they be removed from the office. Even the chief constructor of the Navy was forced to go to Woolwich if he desired to consult them. And yet we find them in the pockets of a dead junior clerk in the heart of London. Yeah, from an official point of view, it's deplorable, my dear Mycroft. Simply deplorable. You may laugh, Sherlock, but this country won't be safe until they are recovered. But I thought you said that they were found in the pocket of this chap, Cadogan West. Ten papers taken from Woolwich. Seven were found in the pockets of Cadogan West. Three are still missing, the three essential ones... To recover those three papers is imperative. The peace of Europe depends on... Mm, nice little problem, eh, Watson? Why did Cadogan West take the papers? How did he die? How did his body reach the place where it was found? And where are the missing papers? Find the answer to those questions, Sherlock, and you'll have done your country an invaluable service. Oh, why don't you solve it yourself, Mycroft? I believe you could. Mm, possibly. But it's a question of digging out details. Give me the details and I can give you the solution from an armchair. No, when it comes to running about and cross-questioning railway guards and lying on one's face with a lens to one's eye... <laughs> no, no, that's not my major. <laughs> Besides, your, uh, your figure prevents your taking such an undignified position, eh? <laughs> Very well. Leave that part of it to us, eh, Watson? <laughs> right, you are. <laughs> Good. I've got a cab waiting outside to take the place where the body was found. I can give you the details on the way. <laughs> Who was the official guardian of these famous papers? No less a personage than Sir James Walter, a gentleman who's grown grey in the service. His patriotism is beyond suspicion. A uh, bachelor, if I'm not mistaken, lives with his brother. Yes. He was at the house of Admiral Sinclair at Barclay Square during the whole of the evening when this accident occurred. The Admiral vouches for him. He's one of the two who have the only keys to save. And his key was with him all evening? Right. His key, the key to the building, the key to the room. Hmm. Who was the man with the other key? The senior clerk, Mr. Sidney Johnson. Man of 40, married, silent, morose, with an excellent service record. Any alibi? He too had his key with him and seems to have spent the evening playing a game of drafts with a green grocer around the corner from his lodgings. Of course, he has only the word of this green grocer to back him oh, up. Oh, come, come, my dear Mycroft. No class discriminations, please. The word of a green grocer is often just as good as that of an admiral. What about Cadogan West? He had a good reputation. A bit hot headed, but straight and honest. At least everyone thought so. He was next to Sidney Johnson at the office. His duties brought him into daily personal contact with the plans. No one else ever had the handling of them. Oh, it's perfectly clear. He must have taken... Ah, not so fast, Watson. Not so fast. Who locked them up that night? Mr. Sidney Johnson. Ah. They were of value, commercially, I mean. Oh, yes. There's no doubt that West could have got several thousands for them very easily. And yet, only a small amount of money was found on the body. Perhaps the buyer took it back after he'd murdered West. Ah, what puzzles me is... How did West obtain possession of those papers? To do so, he must have had a false key. Several false keys, Sherlock. He had to open the building and the room as well. Oh, well, well, well. Several false keys then. Let me see, let me see. Suppose West did take the papers and went into town. And on the way back to Woolwich, where he is hoping to replace the papers, he is killed and thrown from the train. But the spot where the body was found is considerably past the station for London Bridge, which is the route to Woolwich. Ah, that's interesting. Also, if young West did make an appointment with some foreign agent to sell the papers that night, why didn't he keep the evening clear? Why buy two theater tickets? Exactly. Furthermore, he actually escorted his fiancée halfway there before he disappeared. A blind. That's what it looks like to me. Why did he take the papers at all? Why not copy them out in the office and sell the copies? He certainly had plenty of opportunity to do so. And why the absence of his underground ticket? Perhaps a ticket would have shown us which station was near the agent's house. So the murderer destroyed it. Good, Watson. Very good. <laughs> and yet, I wonder. Huh? Well, here's the underground station. The railway authorities have sent a man round to show you the exact place where the body was found. You won't change your mind and come with us? Go well, crawling round that black hole on my hands and knees. <laughs> not very likely. Well, I shall expect a report on your efforts this evening. Uh, never expect too much, Mycroft. Never expect too much. <laughs> Before we follow Holmes and Watson into the mazes of the London subway system, I have a word of advice. Every year, colds cause a lot of sickness. Every year, they cause a lot of expense and time lost from work. 
Always regard a cold seriously. Always treat it earnestly. At the first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets are famous relief for the distress of a cold. Their efficacy has been fully established. Bromoquinine tablets go right to work on a cold symptom. They don't waste any time. They don't pull any punches. They quickly relieve the misery of a cold. They help reduce the fever of a cold. Thousands of people keep bromoquinine tablets handy all winter. Thousands of people depend on them as their relief for colds. No other preparation enjoys greater confidence than bromoquinine tablets. Follow the example of millions, and at the first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Get them at any drugstore, a few cents a box. Ask specifically for Grove's, G-R-O-V-E-S, Bromo, B-R-O-M-O, quinine, Q-U-I-N-I-N-E, Grove's bromoquinine tablets. This way, sir. Step right along the tracks. But it isn't safe. Supposing a train should come shooting round that curve. Oh, that's all right, sir. There won't be another for five minutes anyway. Here we are, sir. This is where they found the body. Right here alongside the rails. Lying on its face, it was. Mm, spooky old place, eh, Holmes? Like the catacombs, only without the skeletons. Yeah. Anything in his hands when they found him? No, sir. Were they clenched? Or spread out as if he were protecting himself? No, sir, they was what you might call relaxed. Ah. What time did all this happen? Well, sir, the train he was hoisted out of, as near as we can figure, passed along here about midnight on Monday. All the carriages have been examined for signs of violence, I suppose. They didn't find nothing, not even the missing ticket. There was a passenger to Allgate on the ordinary train, about 11.40 it was. He said he'd heard a heavy thud, like something striking the line, just before the train reached this station. But it was so foggy, he said he was blessed if he could see what it was. Holmes, what's the matter? What are you staring at? The curb, Watson. The what other? The rails. What other? What do, you, what do you mean? I suppose there aren't many curves as abrupt as this. No, sir, I can't say as there is. What have curves got to do with it? Oh, an indication, Watson, merely an indication. Hmm, unique. Perfectly unique. And yet, why not? I don't see any indications of bleeding on the line. No, sir, there wasn't any to speak of. But I understand there was a considerable wound. The bone was crashed right enough. Holmes, do you hear that? It's a train. It's, it's coming this way. Run, sir. Run for your life. Yes, yes, but where? Uh, up ahead. There's a place where the train switches off. Run, what's a run? It's just around the curve. Well, we'll never make it. We, yes, we will. Faster, faster. Uh, there's the switch up ahead. Come on. Here comes the train now. We'll make it. We'll make it. Ah, Justin, Watson, for the love of heaven, you're on the wrong track. That was a narrow escape, Holmes. I, I must say my knees are still shaking. Look at the shoulder of my coat where you pulled it there. Lucky thing for you that I did. Where are we off to now in, in this fog? Yes, it's a nice afternoon. Suppose we pay a few calls. I think Sir James Walter claims our first attention. After that, we might drop in on Miss Westbury. Miss Westbury? Who's she? She is Cadogan West's fiancée and the last person to see him alive. Holmes, we seem to be going around in circles. We've accomplished absolutely nothing so far except to get, to, to get ourselves nearly annihilated in the underground. After all, it's perfectly obvious that the young man had a quarrel with someone, in all probability the agent, to whom he sold the papers, and got himself thrown out of the railway carriage for his pay. I disagree with you, my dear Watson. His body fell from the roof of the carriage where it had been placed. Cadogan West met his death elsewhere. The roof of the train? Consider the facts, Watson. A. The curve in the tracks. The body is found at a spot where the train pitches and sways as it comes around the points. B. There was no ticket. C. There were no signs of bleeding on the line because the body had bled elsewhere. Of course. Everything fits together, but... But where was the body placed on the train? I think I can make a fair guess at that, my dear Watson. Ah, oh, here we are. This is the famous official villa of Sir James Walter. And that, if I'm not mistaken, is his brother, Colonel Valentine, just coming out of the house. What's the matter with the man? He, he looks positively haunted. Oh, uh, pardon me, Colonel Valentine, but can you tell me if, uh, if Sir James is at home? Uh, Sir James, sir? Sir James is dead. Good heavens, dead. He died this morning. It's terrible. Terrible. How did he die? Oh, it's this horrible scandal. My brother, sir, was very sensitive of his honor. He couldn't survive the disgrace to his department. It broke his heart. 
Pardon me, gentlemen. I must go. It, it broke his heart. Most appalling development. Eh, Holmes? Uh, I wonder if his death was natural or if the poor fellow killed himself. <laughs> Tell Miss Westbury that Mr. Sherlock Holmes would like to see her. Oh, please come in, gentlemen. I'm Violet Westbury, Mr. Holmes. I've been expecting you ever since I heard you had taken the case. Please be seated. Well, thank you. Oh, Mr. Holmes, we, we must save his good name. He couldn't have done it. Cadogan was the most chivalrous patriotic gentleman on earth. He, he couldn't have done it. He would have cut his right hand off rather than sell a state secret. But the facts, my dear Miss Westbury. I admit I can't explain them. Uh, was he in need of money? No, Mr. Holmes. His need was simple and his salary very good. He'd saved several hundred pounds. We were to be married at the new year. I see. Had you noticed any signs of mental excitement? Why, I... Well, that is... Uh, come, Miss Westbury, be frank with us. Yes, Mr. Holmes. That night, I... I had a feeling that there was something on his mind. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it, will you? We were on the way to the theater. It was a foggy night, you remember? We were walking slowly. Our way took us close to his office. Cadogan seemed thoughtful and worried. Darling, what's the matter? You haven't said a word for the last five minutes. Have I said or done something? Of course not, silly. It's just that I've got something on my mind. Well, why not tell me about it? Perhaps I can help. It's no use, Vi. It's too serious for me to talk about, even to you. You know, sometimes, Carrie, I feel just the least little bit jealous of that old job of yours when you're cooped up in that building all day. Oh, now you're not going to be jealous of the building. <laughs> well, not really. But it is funny to think of a husband having secrets he can't tell his wife. Mighty important secrets, I can promise you. There's one in particular that any foreign spy would pay good money to get hold of. How thrilling. Well, I don't know. They're awfully slack about some things over there in that building, Violet. What's too slack? It would be too confounded easy for a traitor to get his hands on those plans. What plan? Oh, never mind, darling. I guess I'm getting a bit melodramatic. But there's something been worrying me. Hello, what's that? What's what? Over there, that shadow moving along the side of the building. It's a man. So that's it. I always suspected... Oh, what's the matter? You're so excited. What's wrong? Stay here, Violet. There's something I have to find out. Stay here. <laughs> waited and waited, but he never returned. Oh, Mr. Holmes, if you could only save his honor, it, it meant so much to him. We shall do our best, Miss Westbury. This, uh, this shadow, this man moving along the building, did you see it too? I think I did, Mr. Holmes. But the night was so foggy, I can't be sure. But there must have been a man. Another man, it, it couldn't have been Cadogan. Surely character goes for something. Let us hope so. Come along, Watson, we must return home. I'm expecting an answer to some telegrams I sent Mycroft earlier this afternoon. We've done enough for one day. Holmes, where have you been all day? You left this morning before I was up. Now you've come home with your towel awry, your suit torn, and as ravenous as a wolf. <laughs> yes, I've had a bit of exercise, my dear Watson. Uh, pass me the tongue, will you? It would have done you good to go along. Yes, what were you doing? Investigating the premises inhabited by foreign spies known to have been in London on last Monday. Mycroft sent me a list of them. Took a bit of doing, too. Climbing walls, breaking into cellars, prowling around rooftops. Well? I discovered there was only one residence which had the uh, proper facilities for disposing of West's body after the murder. Well, whose residence was that? It belongs to a Hugo Oberstein. The address is 13 Caulfield Gardens, Kensington. The gentleman himself has departed for Europe. Gone, has he? And he took the plans with him. It's, it's too late. Not necessarily, Watson. What can we do now? We're going to keep a rendezvous with the gentleman who stole and sold those plans. The assignation will take place at Mr. Oberstein's house this evening at nine. What the deuce are you talking about? Uh, these newspaper clippings. I found them in the drawer of Hugo Oberstein's desk. Read them. Hmm. The Daily Telegraph agony column. The first one says, Too complex for description. Must have full report. Terms agreed. Too payable when goods delivered. Signed, Piero. Piero, indeed. Sounds like a Mardi Gras. Now, read on, Watson. Read on. Second goes, matter presses must withdraw for unless contract completed. Piero again. And the last, dated Monday, the day the crime is committed. Monday night after nine, two taps, payment in hard cash. I say, 
Do you think it was a submarine that, that the plans that, that he was buying? I'm almost positive. And Puro was Oberstein himself. But we'll find out for certain this evening. I've invited the gentleman who sold the papers to meet us. But how? I don't understand. I inserted this advertisement in today's Daily Telegraph. Tonight, same hour, same place, two taps, vitally important. Your own safety at stake. Signed, Piero, as usual. By George, if he answers that, we've, we've got him. Unless we're too late. Come along, Watson. There's no time to lose. You can take this pass- uh, pa- package for a change. I'll, uh, I've been carrying it around all day. What's in it? Oh, just a jemmy, a dark lantern, a chisel, and a revolver. Nice equipment for a respectable citizen to be carrying about the streets of London. I must... Yeah, you know, Watson, there are times when I suspect we aren't quite respectable. <laughs> Here we are. This is Caulfield Gardens. Thank heavens, it's still foggy. I shouldn't like to be caught in the act of housebreaking. Yeah. Over this wall, Watson. There's a window we can easily pry open in the back. Scale that wall? Oh, come on, hurry up, hurry up. There's no time to lose. Here, here. I'll give you a boost. Mm. Come on, up here. Oh, uh, that's it. Look out, here I come. I must say, Holmes, you're as agile as a cat. <laughs> it's uncanny. This is the window. Light the lantern and give me the jemmy. One. Two. Mr. Holmes, the underground runs right past here, almost on the level of these windows. I could have reached out and touched it. Yes, quite convenient, wasn't it? It was here the body was placed on the roof of a train. Look out of this, uh, look on this windowsill. Hmm? You can see the soot is blurred where they rested the body. And here, look here, look, look. This brown stain is blood. Mm, nasty, eh, Holmes? Let's, let's get on to the house. Very well, then. Come along, come along. The window's open. Easy, easy, don't break the glass. Supposing Oberstein should happen to return home. Well, we must take our chances in this business. Come along, Watson, come along. Our visitor will expect to be let in by the front door. I wish these stairs didn't, didn't, didn't squeak so. Nine o'clock. We can expect him at any moment now. You take your position on one side of the door. I'll be on the other. We can punch on him when he enters. I'll throw my greatcoat over his head. Oh, well, I, I wish he'd hurry. Shh, Watson. I wonder what if he doesn't come. There he is. Ready now. I'll open the door. You wanted me? No, you don't. Take that. What the hell Easy, Watson, easy. All right, Holmes, I've got him. Well, let's take a look at our catch. Take the overcoat away, Watson. All right. Hi. It's, it's Colonel Valentine Walk, Walter. Sir James's brother. Quite. Well, sir, what have you to say for yourself? Why did you steal the Bruce Partington plans? Who are you? What do you know about this? I am Sherlock Holmes, and I know everything. Oh, this is terrible. I'm lost. I didn't realize their importance until my brother killed himself. But I needed the money. I had to have it. Oberstein offered to give it to me if I'd let him see the plans. So you took an impression of your brother's key, opened the safe, and procured the papers. Cadogan West saw you leaving the building, followed you here, and you killed him. No, I didn't do that. I swear I didn't do it. No? Then perhaps you'd better tell us who did murder Cadogan West and placed him on the roof of the railway carriage. I'll tell you. I promise you I will. I did the rest. I confess it, but, but not that. Very well, then. How did it happen? I got the papers, as you've discovered. Made my way through the fog until I reached the door. Once or twice, I fancied I was being followed. I could hear footsteps on the pavement behind me. Colonel Walder? Yes? You have the papers? Yes. Let me in, quick. I think someone's been following me. Yes, it's me. You can't do this, Valentine. It's treason. All right, do you hear? No, you can't sell the papers. Papa Oberstein, he knows how to use a blackjack, eh? You, you, you've killed him. So? It's murder. I'm going to get out of this. Oh, no. I think different. You will come in here if you do not wish to taste a blackjack, too. But I... I... But... That is better. Oh, what can we do? They'll find the body. I have an idea. First, I look at those papers. I take the ones I want and the rest. We put in the pocket of this foolish young man. And then we give him a nice ride on top of the underground train, no? He will be the guilty one. Who will ever know? What a thoroughly unpleasant gentleman. What a pity that he got away with the papers, Dr. Watson. Oh, but he didn't. Oberstein had left a Paris forwarding address with Colonel Walters. That gentleman sent him a letter dictated by Holmes saying that he had discovered that one essential detail in the plans was missing and that he had procured a tracing which would make it complete 
for a price. And did Oberstein swallow the bait? <laughs> did he swallow it? He was arrested as he got off the boat at Folkestone. Some weeks later, I learned incidentally that Holmes had spent a day at Windsor Castle and returned with a remarkably fine emerald type-in. When I asked him where he got it, he answered it was just a small present from a certain gracious little old lady for whom he'd been able to do a, a small th- favor. Yes, and I think I can guess the lady's august name. Elementary, my dear Mr. Manning, elementary. I see. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. In the meantime, let us repeat. Watch out for colds. At the first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets are made especially for the relief of colds. In other words, they're specialized medication, and that's what you want. Yes, at the very first sneeze or sniffle, go right to your druggist and get a package of Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Now, Dr. Watson, next week? Next week, I think I'll tell you the story of the lion's mane. The lion's mane? What was that, Dr. Watson? Well, the answer to that question, Mr. Manning, almost stumped Sherlock Holmes himself. Suffice it to say that they were the last words gasped out by a dying man as he lay writhing in agony on the sands of the Sussex coast. <laughs> You have been listening to a Sherlock Holmes adventure adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Bruce Partington Plans, with Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. The dramatization was by Edith Miser. This program is presented from Hollywood every week at this same time by the makers of Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Quick relief for colds. This is Knox Manning speaking. <laughs> This is the National Broadcasting Company. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... Invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his good friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I'd like to tell you about my favorite time of day. It's just before dinner. You know, when the family's all sitting around in the living room and wonderful things are cooking in the kitchen? Ah, that's for me. And boy, that's the time for a glass of sherry. Because Petri California sherry really makes waiting for dinner a pleasure. That Petri Sherry is the perfect before-dinner wine. Just look at its beautiful amber color. And then taste that wonderful Petri Sherry. What a flavor. Petri Sherry has a rich, nutty flavor that's right from the heart of sun-ripened grapes. And if you like your sherry dry, you know, not sweet, you'll want to get Petri Pale Dry Sherry. Or better yet, taste them both. Don't buy one, buy two. Those letters P-E-T-R-I on the label are the personal assurance of the Petri family that Petri Sherry is truly good wine. And now it's time to keep the weekly appointment with our good friend, Dr. Watson. How are you this evening, Doctor? I never felt better, thank you, Mr. Bartell. Draw up your usual chair and... Make yourself comfortable. Thanks. That's it. Oh, I see you've had the old tin dispatch box out again. I suppose you've been going through your notes on tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Yes, Mr. Bartell, and I think you'll find it as pretty a little problem as we ever encountered. The story began in 1887, a very busy year for us, my boy. It was the same year that Holmes solved the case of the Amateur Mendicant Society, who held their meetings in a luxuriously furnished vault below a furniture warehouse. Oh, I remember that story, Doctor. And uh, wasn't 87 the year you both escaped from death in the Paradol Chamber? It was indeed. You've got a very good memory, Mr. Bartell. The story I'm going to tell you tonight topped off this unusually exciting year. It was late in October, and the equinoctial gales had set in with exceptional violence. All day the wind had howled, and the rain had beaten against the windows of our Baker Street lodgings. Finally, it was uh, nearly midnight, as far as I remember... The storm grew higher and louder, and the wind in the chimney sobbed like a child. Suddenly, 
Much to our surprise, the doorbell jangled, and a few moments later, our midnight visitor stood before us. He was a man of about 45. And as he looked about him anxiously in the glare of the lamp, I could see that his face was pale and that his eyes heavy, like those of a man who was weighed down with some great anxiety. And yet when he spoke, his tone was businesslike and almost aggressive. I've come to you for advice, Mr. Holmes. That's easily obtained. And help. That is not always so easy. Now help the gentleman off with his coat, will you, Watson? Yes, indeed. Here you are, sir. Let me, let me hang it up for you. Thank you, sir. I heard of you, Mr. Holmes, from Major Prendergast. Oh, yes. He said that you could solve anything. Oh, I'm afraid he said too much. But you've never been beaten. I've been beaten four times, sir. Three times by men and once by a woman. But supposing you sit down and introduce yourself. Uh, my friend's name is Watson, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How do you do, Doctor? My name is Lovelace, Edmund Lovelace. And what brings you to me at this hour of the night, Mr. Lovelace? I'm in terrible trouble, Mr. Holmes. You don't know anything about me, but if you'll accept my case, you can save four lives. I wouldn't say that I know nothing about you, sir. No, it's true that I know little beyond the somewhat obvious fact that, uh, well, you're single, <clears throat> that you keep a dog, but not a manservant. And that you are much preoccupied with your business, which I take to be some form of insurance. Oh, come, come, come. Oh, steady. Now, what is this? Well, like I, magic? I'll wager that my friend's right, though. Isn't he, Mr. Lovelace? Perfectly. But I'll be hanged if I can see how he knows it. It's a practical application of logic, sir. The briefcase that you carry might at first indicate a barrister or some other professional man. But your brusque, business, business-like manner counteracts that suggestion. An insurance broker who must visit clients at odd hours is the likeliest man to combine that manner with a briefcase at midnight. But uh, <laughs> the wife and the manservant, uh, and the fact that I'm preoccupied with my business. Uh, your cufflinks don't match, sir. They each is from a different pair. That would suggest preoccupation, and it's a mistake that neither a wife nor a manservant would have allowed to pass. <laughs> yes, but how about the dog? Um... Oh, surely that's obvious, Watson. Well, I can't see it. I shall let you ponder on that matter while Mr. Lovelace uh, tells us his problem. Mr. Holmes... Are you as interested in preventing a murder as in solving one? Well, naturally, I am, Mr. Lovelace. Even more so. But, uh, uh, please tell me your story. I live with four cousins of mine in an old house in Camberwell. My grandfather left the house and a sizable fortune to the five of us on condition that we lived together and maintained the family unity. It probably won't surprise you to know that we've grown to get pretty much on each other's nerves. Well, what happens if one of you dies, Mr. Lovelace? His share is divided among the others, Doctor. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, the wonder to me is, sir, that, uh... Not that a murder may take place, but uh, that it has not happened long ago. Who's responsible for the administration of the estate? My cousin Gerald. He's much older than the rest of us, and he's a thoroughly unpleasant, cantankerous man. Yeah. He gets an extra share in the estate as administrator, and in consequence he doesn't work. We feel, of course, that he lives off us, and we're continually quarreling with him about it. Well, sounds mm. like a jolly household, I must say. There's going to be trouble, Mr. Holmes, I know it. Gerald hates us, and he's jealous of our share in the estate. You spoke of preventing murder just now. Uh, yet I can see that you've selected your cousin Gerald as the potential murderer. Am I right? Yes, you are. Mm -hmm. But don't think it's personal prejudice that makes me suspect him. I have good reason for doing so. Uh, what reason? This evening, just before dinner, I helped Gerald off with his top coat and went to hang it up for him. As I did so, I heard a strange metallic clink in one of his pockets. I slipped my hand inside it and found a hypodermic syringe and a small pile of liquid. I opened the pile and smelled it. Gentlemen... It reeked of bitter almonds. Mr. Cyanide, eh? Now, what did you do? I thought of destroying it, but I realized that that would put him on his guard, so I replaced it in his pocket. Of course, I warned the others. And we decided that I'd come to you. I had to see a most important client tonight, or I'd have been here earlier. Yes, it seems odd that you didn't come directly to Mr. Holmes as soon as you'd made the discovery, Mr. Lovelace. After all, if a potential murderer is walking about with a pocket full of cyanide, <clears throat> I should have thought that that itself was a, a more important than business. Well, I, uh... Yes, I, I suppose it might seem so to you, Doctor. Now, that's the most interesting stick you carry, sir. May I examine it? Of course. Here. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now I see how you deduced that Mr. Lovelace had a dog, Holmes. There are the marks of the dog's teeth on the stick. Yes, my dear Watson, but these marks under scrutiny give us even more specific information. He's a large dog. You've had him for some years, Mr. Lovelace, and he's now old and feeble. Well, you're perfectly right, but... I'll be hanged if I can see how you can tell that from looking at a walking stick. <laughs> this stick is covered with teeth marks, therefore it has been carried many times by the dog. Now it's um, a heavy stick, so only a large dog could have carried it. And the teeth marks also indicate a large jaw. The older marks are deep sunk. Look here. The fresh ones, where the wood has not yet darkened, are shallow. 
Yes. It's obvious that the jaws are losing their strength. That's very clever of you, Mr. Holmes, but I don't see what it has to do with the case in hand. Well, neither do I, Holmes, I must confess. No, surely it tells us that your story, Mr. Lovelace, may bear a less terrifying implication than you think. On the other hand, its implication may be even more terrifying. Oh, it's late at night. I feel that any further delay in this matter would be extremely dangerous. I suggest that we get a cab and come to your house in Camberwell at once. Alice, Randolph, I'm glad you're still up. I was able to persuade Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson to come back with me. Gentlemen, this is my cousin, Alice Harley. How do you do? How do you do, Miss Harley? How do you do? And my cousin, Randolph Lovelace. How do you do? How do you do, sir? How do you do, Mr. Lovelace? I've told him about the whole business, Randolph, so we can all speak perfectly freely. Let's begin by sitting down, shall we? Randolph and I had just finished a little cold supper. We've been to the theatre tonight. Well, Mr. Holmes, I... I suppose Edmund told you about finding the hypodermic syringe. And the cyanide in Gerald's coat pocket. Yes, indeed. May I ask where your cousin, uh, Gerald Lovelace, is now? We left the house at seven, but... I imagine Gerald went upstairs at eight, as usual, didn't he, Edmund? On the stroke of eight, Alice. He's very fixed in his habits, Mr. Holmes. He goes up to his room every night at eight. There he reads or works on his accounts and eventually goes to bed any time between ten and one. Well, he might still be up. I should like to speak to him a little later. In the meanwhile, may I ask you two young people, tell me quite honestly your feelings about your cousin, Gerald? And you might as well be frank. I've kept nothing back. All right. Randolph and I hate him. First of all, we're sure he's jealous of our shares in the estate, and and then we... Alice and I want to get married, Mr. Holmes, and Gerald won't hear of it. But you're your cousins, aren't you? Only second cousins, Dr. Watson. Gerald is dreadfully conventional. He's threatened us that if we do get married, he'll go to court and try to have our shares in the estate annulled. And from the way the will is worded, I wouldn't be surprised if he could do it. So you can see why we have no great love for him, and why we're afraid of him. Well, he sounds an extremely unpleasant person to me. You mentioned there were five cousins in the house. The three of you are here. Mr. Gerald Lovelace is upstairs. Who and uh, where is the fifth cousin? The fifth cousin is my brother, Gilly. He's something of a tragedy, I'm afraid. You see, Gilly's 20, but he he never developed mentally beyond the, the age of eight. He had a bad fall in the hunting field when he was a kid. He's been like this ever since. I'm sorry to hear that, sir. But he's the dearest, most gentle boy you've ever met. And, incidentally, the one person in this house who doesn't hate Gerald. The poor fellow doesn't understand the conditions of the will, I suppose. No. But if he did, I don't think it'd make any difference. I swear that Gilly loves every living thing, especially Gladstone. Gladstone is the name of his dog. His dog? Yes. A dog may be the key to this whole matter. A dog? What makes you say that, Holmes? When a man brings a quick and painless poison home to a household containing an old and feeble dog, it's more than possible that he has obtained that poison quite legitimately to give the dog a merciful death. To kill Gladstone? Oh, no! After all, Alice, dear, he is old and almost blind But, now. Mr. Holmes, if you think Gerald brought home the poison to put Gladstone out of the way, and I admit it sounds perfectly logical, what made you decide to come here tonight? Because I dare not even guess what you may have done by intruding the thought of murder in this situation. Uh, where is your brother, Gilly? In his room upstairs, asleep. I wonder if we might go up to him. I should like to talk to him, if you don't mind. And after that, I... I want a few words with your cousin, Gerald Lovelace. <laughs> Sleep, Mr. Holmes. Yes, with with a dog in his arm. Hmm. I'm afraid we'll have to waken him. Gilly? Gilly? That's all right, Gladstone. We're not going to hurt him. Gilly? Hmm? Who, who, who is it? Oh, hello, Alice. Who, who are these men? They've come to take Gladstone away. No, no, Gilly, we, we haven't. Well, of course not, Gilly. We've just come to admire him. Your brother's been telling us what a fine dog he is. Oh, that's different. He... isn't he beautiful? I... I just had such a wonderful dream about him. Oh, such a wonderful dream. What was it, Gilly? Hmm? Well, he, he, he was all young again. Just a puppy. He, he was chasing a rabbit across a cliff top. And, and... and I was running with him. 
Oh, Glaston looked so beautiful. Didn't you, old boy? <laughs> of course you did. And, and you know, the rabbit went down a hole and, and Gladstone went down after him. And I went down after Gladstone. And, and we all had tea with the rabbits. Huh? It was so funny. They all had little green hats on. Hats with, with feathers. I wanted Gladstone to try one on, but well, he wouldn't. <laughs> so sleepy. Come on, Gladstone. Let's go back to the tea party. Poor kid. Hmm. His world may be a great deal more pleasant than ours, Watson. That's what I'd like to think, Mr. Holmes. Now I'd like to have a few words with your cousin, Gerald. His room's at the end of this corridor. I'm afraid Gilly wasn't much help to you, Mr. Holmes. On the contrary, young lady. He told me exactly what I wanted to know. Here we are. This is Gerald's room. There's no light under the door. He must have gone to sleep. And I'm afraid we must waken him, too. Hmm. Must be a heavy sleeper. But he isn't. He's a remarkably light one. Come on, let's go in. Strike a match, will you, old fellow? Not sure. The gas mantle's at the head of his bed, Dr. Watson. Yeah. Well, he's lying on the outside of his bed. He must be... There's blood on the pillow. Great Scott Holmes, the back of his skull smashed in. He's been murdered. <gasps> oh, no! Horrible! Yes, Watson, but not by the blows on his head. Look here on the table by his bed. A hypodermic syringe and a broken file. Yes, a broken file. Reeking of bitter almonds. Poor devil. Well, I won't pretend I liked him. But what a ghastly way to die. All they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. So the scriptures say, Mr. Lovelace. The very suspicion of the killing has brought murder to pass. Well, it's too late to prevent it. Our job now is to find the killer and see that he's brought to justice. Dr. Watson will tell you the rest of his story in just a few seconds. Just time enough for me to tell you that if there's one wine that's perfect for any occasion, it's Petri California Sherry. With a bottle of that rich, amber-colored Petri Sherry on hand, you can make that time before dinner a, a main event. And Petri Sherry is the perfect answer to the question of what to serve when company comes. Serve Petri Sherry alone and let its full, wonderful flavor speak for itself, or serve Petri Sherry with hors d'oeuvres or party sandwiches. And remember, you can serve Petri Sherry proudly because Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wine. Well, Dr. Watson, so you found Gerald Lovelace dead in one of the bedrooms of the house in Camberwell. Uh, what did you do? Send for the police? Not at once, Mr. Bartell. Sherlock Holmes persuaded the remainder of the household to give him the opportunity of examining the scene of the crime carefully before the police were sent for. And so a few minutes before one o'clock that October night... Holmes and I stood alone in the room of death. And the gas a little higher, will you, old chap? Sure. You know, Holmes, I think you should have sent for the police right away. In a case like this, Watson, I prefer to be my own police. And I have spun the web. They may take the flies, but not before. What are the results of your medical examination, old chap? Well, it's exactly as you reconstructed it, Holmes. He was first beaten on the head with that poker lying on the floor. Then he had the full file of cyanide injected... Into his left wrist. Can you estimate the time of death at all accurately? No, this room's confoundedly hot. He might have died any time from one to, to five hours ago. Yes. It's now one o'clock, and we know that he was alive at eight. Mr. Edmund Lovelace saw him leave for his room at that hour. Yes, if he was telling the truth. One thing we do know for a fact is that this man was murdered at the exact moment he was going to bed. He's wearing his nightgown and nightcap, but his... Bed has not been slept in. Well, isn't it possible that the murderer might have killed him shortly after eight and then dressed him in his night clothes to confuse us? No, my dear chap. You will notice that the hypodermic needle passed through the sleeve of his nightshirt here. Also, the nightcap is crushed and bloodstained from the blows of the poker. No, Gerald Lovelace had prepared for bed. Yes, look at the glass of water on the night table and the, and the prayer book and the watch. Yes, signs of a prosperous and meticulous man. Mm-hmm. Very fine gold watch and in excellent condition. Aha. Uh -huh. There's the answer, Watson. What do you mean, there's the answer, Watson? I just wound this watch one turn and then it was fully wound. That provides us with the time schedule for our murder. Come on. 
We'll send a servant for the police, and while they're on the way, if you'll call everyone together, I should like to put a few more questions to this family. Before the police arrive, I should like to hear your statements again very carefully, if you don't mind. Mr. Edmund Lovelace, what were your exact movements tonight? I... Left here shortly before ten. From ten o'clock until the time I came to Baker Street, I was with my client. His name and address, please. Derek Waterlow, 39, Onslow Square, South Kensington. Thank you. Make a note of these, will you, Watson? All right, you're home. You, Miss Harley, and you, Mr. Randolph Lovelace, went to the theatre together. Can any independent witness testify as to your movements? Well, yes, Mr. Holmes. We went with friends, the Grant Moresby's. They live at the Clarendon Hotel off Charing Cross. What time did you leave this house? Well, it... It was about a quarter to eight, wasn't it, Alice? Yes. And after the play, we went to the Café Royale for a little refreshment with our friends and then came back here. I see. And what time did you arrive back at this house? Just a few minutes before midnight. I remember the grandfather clock in the hall striking just as we went into the drawing room. And your brother, Gilly, sir. I hate to waken him again. Have you any idea of his movements tonight? Well, he never goes out after dark, Mr. Mm -hmm. Holmes. But I spoke to the cook as we came in tonight. She says that he played cards with her until just after ten o'clock. He was fast asleep when I looked in on him shortly after midnight. Thank you. You've made a note of all these facts, Watson? Yes, Holmes. I got them all down. Good. Then let's be on our way to Baker Street. But the police, Mr. Holmes, they're on their way. I know. Uh, uh, please give them my regards, will you? Apologize for my informality and tell them that I shall have the answer to this matter probably in a little over 24 hours. <laughs> Here it is, well after midnight. You haven't done a thing on the Camberwell case. No, but you have, old chap. You've checked on all the time alibis and found them valid. I'm much obliged to you. Well, Inspector Lestard was here tonight, you know, and he made some pretty caustic remarks, I can tell you. Oh, didn't you inform him that I'll uh, have the answer to the problem before many hours have passed? Uh, I did, but you know, Lestard, he, he wanted action. <laughs> he shall have it. Is the watch... Still running. Yes, there's another thing. What will Lestard say when he finds that you took the dead man's watch? I've no idea. Oh, why didn't you take it anywhere? You sound sleepy, old chap. Yes, I am confoundedly sleepy. Well, why don't you go to bed? Well, what are you going to do? Continue my vigil with my pipe and the watch of a dead man. <laughs> Watson, wake up. Uh, what time is it? Five o'clock in the morning. We're already dig up at this hour. The watch has just stopped. I'm about to rewind it. What are you rewinding it for, Holmes? You waited over 24 hours for it to unwind. When I know how many turns it takes to wind it fully, I shall have the answer to the whole business. Ten. Eleven. You're being confoundedly mysterious, as usual. Fourteen. Fourteen. Fourteen turns, and the watch is fully wound. Get your clothes on, old chap. Well, where are we going on this hour? To the house in Camberwell. Now I know who murdered Gerald Lovelace. Mr. Edmund Lovelace, I'm glad you let us in. Please take us up to your young cousin's room at once. Really? What do you want with him? I'll explain in a moment. Please take us up to him. Oh, of course, but... What brings you here at this hour of the morning? Mr. Holmes knows who murdered your cousin. Well, I'm glad to hear it. It's more than the police seem to know. They were here half the night cross-examining us. Here we are. I don't think we'll bother to knock. Gilly. Gilly? I'm awake. We heard you coming up the stairs, didn't we, Gladstone? <laughs> it's the same man again. You're not going to take Gladstone away, are you? Please don't take him oh, away. Don't worry, Gilly. We're not going to touch him. Oh, that's all right, then. Oh, Gilly. Yes? You really love that dog, don't you? Of course I do. More than anything or, or anybody. I believe you'd even kill a man who tried to hurt Gladstone. Wouldn't you? Oh, yes, sir. I would. Gilly! Really? No. Great shot, I... Gilly... I don't think you'd really kill a man. I don't think you could. <laughs> Couldn't I, though? How would you kill him? 
I'd hit him first. I'd take a poker and hit him on the head so he couldn't fight back. And then I'd take the nasty needle he told me he was going to stick in Gladstone and, and, and I'd fill it full of that water he showed me and I'd stick it in him. That's what I'd do. Then he'd be dead. And, and he couldn't hurt my Gladstone anymore. Not ever. <laughs> Let's leave him, shall we? Goodbye, Gilly. Pleasant dreams. Goodbye, sir. Good old Gladstone. You satisfied, sir? Yes. Poor Gilly. There's no doubt about it, of course. No, can there be no one who described the murder to him, and yet he's just given an exact description of its method? Well, well, uh, what'll happen to him? They, they won't try him. No, 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 no. A little pressure in the right places, and he'll be released to a private nursing home. I'll do everything I can, Mr. Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now that we're back in Baker Street and the whole depressing case is finished with, perhaps you'll tell me how you knew that, that Gilly had committed the murder. Well, consider the uh, time schedules, old fellow. You checked the alibis of the other cousins and found them satisfactory. That meant that um, Alice Harley and uh, Randolph Lovelace could have committed the crime only at midnight. Edmund, only before ten. Gilly, only around eleven. You said that the... Uh, time of death could have been at any of those hours. Yes, I did. So how did you pin it down to, uh, to 11? The watch gave me the specific answer. When I picked it up, I unthink unthinkingly wound it. Made one turn and was then fully wound. Now, when does a methodical, precise man like Gerald Lovelace wind his watch? Just he's going to bed. Exactly, old fellow. So that it was obvious that he was killed precisely one watch stem turn before I wound his watch. Now I'm beginning to see daylight, Holmes. So you let the watch run down. That's what I did. It took uh, 28 hours from 1 o'clock the night before last until 5 this morning. Now, how many turns did it take to rewind it? 14, wasn't it? That's right. Therefore, one turn of the watch stem equaled two hours, proving that Gerald Lovelace had been murdered two hours before 1 o'clock at 11 p.m. When Gilly was the only one who could have done it. You know, Holmes, I still find it hard to believe that boy was... Capable of such a ghastly crime. He seems so gentle. Oh, he is, he is. Except when his beloved dog's life was at stake, probably out of some mistaken notion of kindness, Gerald Lovelace warned the boy of his intentions regarding the dog. Oh, it's a sad business, Watson, a sad business. I hate to think of that boy spending the rest of his life in a mental home. I have one prayer for his future. What's that, Holm? <clears throat> the dog Gladstone can't live very long. I pray that Gilly does not long outlive him. Doctor, that was a remarkable bit of deduction on the part of Mr. Holmes. Yes, extremely clever, wasn't it? Of course, if I may say so, I was of some small help myself. Small help? Why, Doctor, you practically solved the case by yourself. Oh, I wouldn't go as far as saying that. But, Doctor, you did check all the alibis, didn't you? Yes, I checked where each suspect was at various times. Yes, you checked time. And what's more important than time? Well, Why, I... Doctor, time is even vitally important when it comes to wine. I was wondering how you were going to bring that in. And one thing we do know, Petri took time to bring you good wine. So nobody can miss with Petri wine. It's just got to be good. You know, you can't be in the wine business as long as the Petri family without really learning all about the fine art of making wine. And don't forget, the Petri family has been making fine wine since way back in the 1800s. So, naturally, they've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, the result of generations of experience at turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. No matter what type of wine you prefer, you'll like it more if it's a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story do you plan to tell us next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a most unusual adventure that Holmes and I had when we were attending a performance at the Opera House in Rome. It concerns a famous singer who lost her voice, an understudy who was nearly lynched, and a murder that baffled the police. I call it the adventure of the terrifying cat. <laughs>
Well, that's a story we've got to hear. Thank you, Mr. Bartell. And before you go, I want to talk to our friends about their war bonds. You know, during the war, the best investment we could find was a United States war bond. And for my money, they're still a great investment. They're called United States savings bonds now, and only the name is changed. Savings bonds are sold in the same denominations and give you all the same advantages. And you can buy savings bonds at the same places at your bank or your post office or through the payroll savings plan. So invest all you can in United States savings bonds because you cannot find a better or a safer investment. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Five Orange Pips. Music is by Dean Fostler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock... Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... Invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. You know, the lives of Holmes and Watson were not always filled with action. They spent many a quiet evening at home in Baker Street, discussing the problems of the world over a glass of port. You know, it seems that no wine is more expressive of friendship and hospitality than port. And I'm sure there's no port wine more enjoyable than Petri California port. Try a good glass of Petri poured after dinner some evening, or any time you get together with your friends. You'll love the rich, ruby-red color of that Petri port. You'll love its smoothness and full body, its remarkable and wonderful flavor, a flavor that comes straight from the heart of luscious, hand-picked grapes. Serve that Petri port alone, or serve it together with cake or cookies or with fruit. Yes, and serve it proudly. You can, because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now I'm sure our old friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's tap on his study door. Come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Come over here by the fire. I was just having a cup of coffee. Would you care to join me? Thanks, that'd be nice. Uh, it'll prevent you falling asleep during my story tonight. <laughs> There's no chance of that, Doctor. From the hints you gave us last week, it sounded like quite a story. It began in a circus in Paris, you told us? Yes, my boy, the circus. A colorful world of sawdust and spangles. A world, Mr. Bartell, that I may tell you confidentially, always held an irresistible fascination for me when I was a youngster. Me too, Doctor. In fact, when I was eight years old, I fell desperately in love with... a. With a lady bareback rider. A stunning creature who wore pink silk tights with gold sequins on them. Unfortunately, my mother caught me writing her proposal of marriage, and I'm afraid that, uh, well, it's another story, and one that you probably wouldn't find very interesting. <laughs> I'm sure I would, Doctor, but I think it would be safer to stick to your Sherlock Holmes yes, story. Yes, you're probably right, my boy. Well, it was a winter in the 1890s, and Holmes and I were in Paris. On our second day there... Holmes suggested we attend that night's performance of the Cirque Royale. Needless to remark, I was delighted, Mr. Bartell. And shortly after nine o'clock that night, I found myself seated beside Holmes in a box near the ringside. It was an incredibly vivid scene, even for that city of color and light. The gay costumes of the women, 
and the gaudy trappings of the ringmasters and clowns looked like a giant kaleidoscope under the blazing glare of the arc lamps. As we sat there, a brass band nearby blared forth some popular music of the day, and yet he didn't appear to be enjoying himself. And so I leaned across and touched his arm. Hmm. What is it, Watson? Well, you're very quiet, Holmes. Aren't you having a good time? A good time, oh, I suppose. Well, chap, I was just wondering where Mr. Edwards is. Mr. Edwards? Who, who's he? An extremely distinguished client who was to meet us in this box at nine ah, o'clock. Ah, client. So this little excursion was on business after all. Yes, I might have known it. No worry, old fellow. In your case, I think you'll be able to combine quite a little pleasure with the business. Well, can't you be a little more explicit, Holmes? Shh, shh. Here comes the ringmaster. La grande vedette du cirque, Mademoiselle Giselle Girondet, équestrienne incomparable. Giselle Girondet, yes, I've heard of her. She's a bareback rider, isn't she? Honest in France, old fellow. She also has quite a reputation as a femme fatale. Three duels have been fought over her. A young English officer in the Grenadier Guards committed suicide last year because of her. And a famous French banker is at present languishing in prison because her extravagances drove him to appropriate funds that did not belong to him. Yes, Watson, she's an extremely colorful personality. You know, Holmes, it's a funny thing. When I was eight years old, I fell violently in love with a lady bareback rider. She wore pink suit tights with golden sequins on them, but uh, unfortunately... Here she is, old fellow. Here she is. She's exquisite. Look at the way she's jumping from the back of one horse to the other. Sheer poetry of motion. The lady appeals to Watson. By George, yes, indeed she does. In fact, Holmes, I don't mind telling you that if I weren't a married man and a yeah, poor you'd like man... you'd like to the lady, eh? Uh, yes, I, I should Excellent, indeed. Oh, excellent. That's the very reason for our attendance at the well, What in heaven's name are you talking about, Holmes? Ah, there you are. Good evening, Mr. Edwards. Holmes, my dear fellow, how are you? I haven't seen you since, uh... Since that little affair at Windsor Castle, when Mother... Uh, excuse me, sir. I am Mr. Mycroft, and this is my friend, Sir William Nigel. Sir William Nigel? Oh, of course, of course. And I am Mr. Edwards. We must uh, respect each other's incognitos, eh? How do you do, Sir William? Uh, well, I'm extremely honored to meet you, Your, your Royal... Uh, 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 Mr. Edwards. How do you like Giselle? Isn't she a stunning creature? Yes, indeed she is, sir. The four of us to have supper together after the performance tonight, I understand, Mr. Edwards. Well, unfortunately, I can't be there, Mycroft. There's some stupid affair at the embassy which I have to attend. We must postpone the dinner until tomorrow night. Oh, very well, sir. Uh, come over to my hotel a little early and we can discuss the whole business. Personally, I think a lot of fuss is being made about nothing. Now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I must go back and see Giselle for a moment and tell her that I can't keep our appointment for tonight. I'll see you tomorrow, Mycroft. Good night, sir, will you? Good night. Good night, uh, good night sir. And now, for your pleasure, les frères Salini, les jongleurs internationales. Holmes, what's all this mystery? That wasn't Mr. Edwards, it was the prince of... Shh, Watson, please. Discretion, old fellow. Mr. Edwards, as you know, is extremely democratic. Too much so, possibly, when one considers his position and responsibilities. He's become quite seriously involved with Mademoiselle Giselle, the lady bareback rider who has just left the ring. Oh, so that's it. The Foreign Office, quite naturally, I suppose, is deeply concerned over the matter. And I've been entrusted with the delicate mission of protecting Mr. Edwards. Oh, does Giselle Gironde know that his true identity, do you suppose? That's the first thing that we have to find out. It's possible that she is simply captivated by having a rich Englishman at her feet. If on other hand, uh, she knows who Mr. Edwards is, then we may be in for a great deal of trouble. Yes, but how are you going to find that out? By tempting her with a richer Englishman. And one with a title. That, my dear fellow, is why you are Sir William Nigel. You mean that... Uh, your I... job, old what? fellow, is to do your utmost to steal Giselle Gironde from Mr. Edwards. But, uh, well, I, I don't even know the girl. We shall remedy that defect in a few minutes. As soon as the performance is over, my dear chap, I shall take you to her dressing room and arrange an introduction.
I must say, Holmes, the backstage life of the circus is even more colorful than in the ring. What makes you say that, old fellow? Well, I just saw Pinhead having tea with a, a bearded lady while a sword swallower was standing behind him practicing his act. Oh, hello. See that man standing talking to the girl in tights? Yeah, attractive, isn't he? Uh, the gentleman is Inspector Bernay of the French police, an old friend and a distant relative of mine. Bernay! How are you? Ah, well, <laughs> mon cher ami, comment ça no, no, va? No, 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 Bernay, please. On this occasion, my name is Mycroft, if you don't mind, and this is my friend, Sir William Nigel. How do you do, Inspector? Enchanté, Sir William. Uh, permit me to introduce Mademoiselle Yvette Marat. How do you do? How do you do, Mademoiselle? How do you do? Uh, uh, what brings you behind the scenes at the circus, may I ask, Monsieur Mycroft? Uh, my friend, Sir William, is most anxious to make the acquaintance of Mademoiselle Gironde. But, of course, every man wishes to meet Giselle Gironde. Why not ask Bernay? He will present you to her. Ha! In those oh, now, Yvette, chérie, do not begin that all over again. You are in love with her. You have always been in love with her. I, I, I wish you were dead. Sometimes I... Sometimes I think I could kill her myself. Oh, my soul, Inspector, she's a fiery little thing, isn't she? Ah, ça c'est vrai, ça, Sir William. <laughs> Many times I've told her that Giselle Gironde would never waste her time with a simple police inspector. Uh, uh, she prefers a wealthy foreigner. But Yvette ne comprend pas. She does not understand and she does not believe. Mademoiselle Nara was dressed in tights, Bernay. And what does she do in the circus? Uh, she walks the tightrope. Oh, She's yes, a queen of the high wire. Mm -hmm. A charming and a talented girl, but a most, most, most jealous one. Uh, Bernay, my distinguished friend, Sir William Nigel, is most anxious to meet Giselle Gironde. Uh, will you introduce him? I should prefer not to appear on the matter of this stage. Oh, mais certainement. I, I will take you to her dressing room. Uh, please come with me, Sir William. Uh, right. I I'll see you later, Holmes. I'll be waiting for you, old chap. Good luck. Hey, you're a lucky man, Sir William. Giselle has quite a penchant for the Englishmen. And when they are rich and have a title, I am sure she finds them irresistible. You really think so? Poor, but of course. Ah, tell the marriage that I'm only a poor policeman. Ah, hey, here we are. Entrez. Giselle Monchou, permit me to present to you Sir William Nigel. He's a great admirer of yours. Yes, indeed, madam. Ah, Sir William Nigel. Come and sit here beside me, Sir William. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, shall leave you. Au revoir. Uh, sit closer. There. That is much more cozy, no? Oh, it's very nice of you to see me, Mademoiselle Gironde. Oh, don't <laughs> be so formal, my Englishman. You may call me Giselle, and I shall call you... Let me see, I shall call you... Sir William, not... Willie! I shall call you Willie! You do not mind? <laughs> mind? I think it's very delightful. Quite delightful, my dear. I was hoping perhaps that you'd care to have a little, little supper with me tonight, Giselle. <laughs> uh, so what about some, some oysters, a cold pheasant, and a bottle or two of Pomery and Green 072? Do you get to taste rather well, don't you think? <laughs> oh, Willie, I can see you are a perfect host. Oh, toast. I don't know about One that. One moment, I get my clock. Uh, well, you, you know, Giselle, it, it, it's a funny thing. What is a funny thing, Willie? When I was eight years old, I fell violently in love with a, a lady bareback rider of a circus. History seems to be repeating itself. Pierre. Pierre, Pierre. Do you no longer knock when you come to my door? Who is this man? My name is Nigel, Sir William Nigel, my good man. And who may you be? I am Alfio Alfieri. I am Alfio Alfieri. And what is he? Huh. A trainer of wild animals. An imbecile. Raton! You must not speak to Alfio in that way. You belong to me. Send this stupid Englishman away. You found it impudent. Grossier. Belong to you. She said belong to no one. Do I have to take my whip uh, to put you? Put down that way. Put it down, you scoundrel. <coughs> That's the time it will be your face, Carl. You Amiga. infernal blackguard. Raising your hand against a woman. Shocking. Oh, oh. Monsieur Willie has knocked him down. Uh, he certainly deserved it. Oui. And... You, in turn, deserve something, Willie. Oh, what was that? Come close, Willie. I give it to you. A little kiss. Oh, kiss? <laughs> Thanks awfully. <laughs> So strong, so resolute, so brave. Oh, it was nothing, my dear Giselle. Nothing at all here. More champagne, Gus. More champagne. Oh, Willie! Giselle? Oui, Monsieur Edwards? I have a box for the opera tomorrow night. 
I was hoping that perhaps... Oh, I'm sorry, monsieur, but my time is occupied. I am showing the delights of moment to mon cher Willy. Mademoiselle est mieux le collier de perles à cinq rangs ou celui à trois rangs? He says, which do I prefer? The five-string color of pearls or the three-string color of pearls? What does my Willy think? So that you can't hang too many pearls on a pretty neck like yours. I'll take the five-string collar, my good fellow. You're doing splendidly, Watson, splendidly. Yes, but Holmes, I felt such a blasted fool handing that jeweler fellow a check signed by Sir William Nigel. Are you quite sure that it'll oh, be honored? Oh, don't worry, old fellow. Remember who our client is. Money is the least important concern in this matter. On with the masquerade, old fellow. On with the masquerade. <laughs> More champagne, Gasson. Willie, you are such a headstrong boy. <laughs> More champagne. <laughs> Sit it all, you dear little thing. Oh, Willie. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Bernay. Has Mademoiselle Gironde come in for the evening performance yet? Yes, Monsieur Holmes. I escorted her to her dressing room an half an hour ago. Uh, Monsieur Edwards is in there with her now. At last, it seems, she has use for a poor policeman. Last night, she found a threatening letter on her makeup table. Since then, she has been most grateful for my company. A threatening letter, eh? Any idea who might have sent it? Oh, yes, of course. I'm afraid I have, Mr. Holmes. Uh, I told her to pay no attention. Uh, by the perfume of the notepaper, I recognized the sender. A jealous tightrope walker called Yvette Marat. Oh. <laughs> Poor Yvette. She would make a very inferior criminal, I'm afraid. Still, Giselle asked me to stay outside her dressing room till the performance starts. Uh, uh, you wish to see her? Uh, yes. Oh, good evening, Mr. Redwood. Evening, Mycroft. Evening, Inspector Werner. Uh, come on, step up, Mr. Redwood. Look here, Mycroft. I think this little game's gone far enough. Giselle has just refused another invitation of mine. Now, I know who Sir William Nigel is, and I swear I'll tell her. Uh, don't you think, sir, that the lady is hardly worth bothering about? Surely this whole incident with Sir William proves that she's a scheming little adventuress. A fictitious title and an apparently bottomless purse have shown her up in her true colors. <laughs> I could have told you the same thing without such an experiment, my friend. Well, I suppose you're right, Mycroft. I've been a fool. An idiot who lets a pretty ankle turn his head. A conceited dope. <laughs> Let us just say, monsieur, that you have been a man. Uh, good evening, sir. Oh, good, evening. Watson, good evening. Good evening. I uh, just came back to see Giselle for a moment. I brought us these flowers for her. Oh, I'll be back in a jiffy. Uh, just a minute, Watson. I, uh, I hate to dampen your ardor, old chap, but uh, the masquerade is ended. Ended? What, what do you mean it's It is no ended. longer necessary for you to impersonate Sir William Nigel or to pay court to Giselle. Oh, uh -huh. Oh, 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 really? Really? Well, that's, that's a great relief, sir. Great relief. I've hated the whole business. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure you have. Uh, we um, appreciate the sacrifices that you've made, don't we, Sir Edward? Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I must go back and see her once more, though. We had a rendezvous for tonight, and I must cancel it. A gentleman's thing to do, you know. Um, I, I won't be a minute. <laughs> Never have I seen a man more downcast. Obviously, with him, my dear Holmes, business was a pleasure. I'll fear it. Where are you going? That Englishman. I just saw him go into Giselle's room. To whom are you referring? That man that called himself Sir William Nigel. Uh, Two days ago, he strike me. I have to settle with him. No man may strike Alfieri. Do not cause any more trouble, Alfieri. From what I've been told, you thoroughly deserved what happened uh, to you. Here he come now. You English, you... Alfieri challenge you to a duel. Holmes! Holmes! What's old chap? What is it? You're as fright as a ghost. It's... It's Giselle. What's wrong with her? She's dead. She's lying there in her dressing room. Strangled. Strangled. And only half an hour ago I spoke with her myself. Since then I've been standing in this corridor, guarding her door at her own request. Only two men have entered Giselle's dressing room since then. You, Monsieur Edwards, and you, Sir William Nigel. What are you suggesting, Bernay? I am suggesting nothing. I am stating that these two gentlemen... I want to arrest for suspicion of murder. Dr. Watson's unusual story will continue in just a few seconds. 
time I'd like to take to remind you that one wine that seems to be the outstanding favorite among the ladies is Petri California Muscatel. That's probably because, like a beautiful woman, Petri Muscatel is subtle and intriguing. Petri Muscatel is the color of burnished gold. And its flavor, well, it's the flavor of big, plump Muscat grapes, picked by hand, carefully and tenderly, and they're just full of wonderful, delicious juice. If you want to show that you really know the wine that women prefer, serve Petri Muscatel. Serve it after dinner or later in the evening. It's wonderful. And why shouldn't it be? It's a Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, so you and the mysterious uh, Mr. Edwards got yourselves arrested on suspicion of murder. Huh? Yes, Mr. Bartell. Holmes did everything in his power to persuade Inspector Vernet to release us, but it was useless. And so, while Mr. Edwards and myself were languishing in detention cells, the local Sûreté, Holmes, and the French inspector were examining the dressing room of the dead woman. I'm, in sh I'm sure, Inspector Vernet, that... Uh... Being as keen a detective as you are, you must suspect the true identity of Mr. Edwards. Of course, Monsieur Holmes. But that is the danger of incognitos. If he chooses to assume the identity of plain Monsieur Edwards, then he must run the risks of plain Monsieur And you are convinced that either he or my friend strangled Mademoiselle Girondet? It is obvious. Then I'll have to prove to you that they didn't. Let me examine the body again, will you? If she had been strangled by either of my friends, why would her body be lying here under the window? as far away from the door by which they left this room as possible. That proves nothing. No, but it's odd. Giselle was a strong girl. Uh, there might easily have been a struggle. Uh, perhaps she tried to get away through the window. And yet there are no marks of violence on her throat. Just this piece of very fine cord that did its deadly work so cleanly. <laughs> Cut with a knife. Uh, uh, please do not remove the cord, Monsieur Holmes. The body has not yet been photographed. Jeremy Vernet, you're making it very hard for me, aren't you? Uh, you notice, of course, that the window is open. Yes, but we have examined the snow outside. There were no footprints within three yards of the window. The murderer must have entered by the door that I was watching. Yes, it would be hard, even for a professional acrobat to jump in. An acrobat? There your young friend, Mademoiselle Yvette Marat, is a tightrope walker. Yvette, but... No. Yes, she certainly had a motive. She'd even sent a threatening letter... I heard her express hatred and jealousy for this dead woman. It's conceivable that she could enter a room by a window without leaving footprints in the snow. Where was she at the time of the murder? I do not know. I was waiting for her in the corridor. And I suggest that we investigate her alibi at once. And after that, Inspector, I must pay a visit to the Sûreté. I don't want my friends to think that I've deserted them. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Holmes. I'm afraid it looks rather black. As I was telling you, Yvette Marat, the tightrope walker, was able to establish a completely satisfactory alibi. Vernet still suspects you or Dr. Watson. Well, that's ridiculous. May I ask you a very straightforward question, sir? Of course. I can well understand that if you had gone into the dressing room and found the woman already murdered, you might easily be tempted to conceal the fact, to avoid a scandal involving your person. Will you swear to me, sir, on your true identity? That Giselle was alive when you left her. She was, Holmes. I swear it. Thank you, sir. That's all I wanted to know. Holmes, I'm glad to see you. You know, I've been thinking. All this depends on Vernet's evidence. But supposing he was the murderer. He told us that Giselle had turned him down, you know. I'd thought of that, but Mr. Edwards swears that Giselle was alive when he left the room. And yet that means that Mr. Edwards... Oh, no, 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 it's unthinkable. Holmes, you're not suggesting... Holmes, if I thought that that were possible, I'd confess to the murder myself. My life wouldn't matter if, if it would save a scandal like that great Scott. It would shatter the empire. Dear old Watson, you will not sacrifice yourself. You're as valuable a British institution as the lion himself. No, my dear fellow. It will never sacrifice you, not while my mind is still capable of... My mind? That's it. Thank you, Watson. You've given me the answer. Holmes, what are you burbing be about Be patient, now? old fellow. In half an hour, you'll be out of this cell and the real murderer will be in it. Questions, questions. 
Why must Alfieri answer so many questions? Because he will not yet tell the truth. You murdered Giselle Gironde. How many times I have to tell you I did not kill her. Why should I want to arm her? Because you were jealous. Because she humiliated and tormented you. But I was not in her dressing room. I've already proved that fact. Am I a magician that I can kill somebody without entering a room? Alfieri, I know how you killed Giselle Gironde without its necessitating your entering this room. Uh, and you're a very smart man. Please to tell me. I don't need to tell you. With the aid of Bernay, I'll show you. Open the window, Alfieri. Uh, what game is this? Very well, then I'll open the window myself. Put your head out. Come on. So. Uh, who do you see? Inspector Vernet, standing three yards away, where you stood, and he's got your long training whip. No, no! Don't move! Stand there, the inspector hasn't your skill with a whip, but he wants to try a little experiment. No, leave him alone! All right, Vernet, I'm holding him! Well, Mr. Edwards, I, I mean, I mean, well, sir, this is a pleasant change from a prison cell, isn't it? <laughs> it certainly is. Holmes, I can't tell you how grateful I am. I still don't quite understand how you did it. Watson, in uh, rather a roundabout way, was responsible for giving me the clue. Oh, how was that, Holmes? Well, on more than one occasion, old chap, I've had cause to deploy a rather florid style of writing. Tonight, I was very thankful for it. Uh, when I began to speak of the capabilities of my mind... Uh, suddenly I remembered a phrase of yours in which you referred to uh, its whip-like rapidity and accuracy. That, of course, made me think of Alfieri, the animal trainer. Exactly how did he kill the poor girl? Uh, well, sir, he stood outside the window, uh, far enough away to leave no incriminating footprints. Called to Giselle, probably persuaded her to lean out, then snapped the whip around her neck, pulling it tight and strangling her. And then I suppose he cut the cord and let the body fall back into the room. Precisely, old fellow. We found a whip stock among his tackle, a whip stock from which the lash had been cut. The stub of lash left matched the cord around the dead girl's throat. Amazing business. And I don't mind telling you, fellas, I'm very thankful to be through with it. Yes, so am I, sir. In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if this whole incident cures me of my love of circuses. Oh, I didn't know you had a predilection in that direction, Watson. Oh, oh, oh yes, sir. Yes, if you don't mind my saying so. Uh, uh, when he was eight years old, he fell in love with a lady bareback rider. <laughs> didn't you, Watson? <laughs> Indeed. What happened? Well, sir, I, I don't remember her name, but she wore pink silk tights with golden sequins on them. And I wrote her a rather hot-headed letter... Unfortunately, my mother... Well, Doctor, that was one of the most unusual stories you've ever told. And, and I might say you played a very prominent part in that case yourself. Oh, I suppose I did it. That, Mr. Bartell. Giselle was a beautiful girl. Beautiful. Boy, I sure love that nickname she gave you. Wheelie. Yes, I thought it was rather nice myself. Well, that is, uh, I, I, I mean... I thought... <laughs> Don't get embarrassed over a nickname, Doctor. You should hear the nickname I had. But when I went to school, all the girls called me Bottles. Bottles? Oh, <laughs> I see from Bartell. Bartell? Bartell. Hmm. <laughs> Some nickname, like a prophecy. What do you mean? Well, they called me Bottles, and now that's what I like to talk about most. Bottles. Bottles of Petri wine. Oh, I should have known. <laughs> and I'd like to talk about Petri wine because, as far as I'm concerned, it's the swellest wine that ever poured from a bottle. That's because the Petri family really knows how to make good wine. Well, they ought to. They've been making good wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And since the Petri family has always personally owned and operated their business, they've been able to keep that fine art of winemaking right in the family, handing it on down from father to son, from father to son, from generation to generation. So it's no wonder, whenever you want a good wine, you want a Petri wine, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you going to tell us about next Well, week? now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you of a strange adventure that Holmes and I had in the swampy Fenlands of Norfolk. Concerns a gypsy encampment, a child that vanished, and a horrible death in the murky depths of a fearsome quagmire. <laughs>
Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Three Students. Music is by Dean Fostler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petrie family. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about an exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective Sherlock Holmes. While you're getting comfortable, I'd like to tell you about an old, old American custom. The custom of serving a glass of sherry wine before dinner. Petri California Sherry. You know, Petri Sherry is to a good meal what the overture is to a good musical comedy or an opera. Before you sit down at the dinner table, just pour yourself a little glass of Petri Sherry and sip it slowly. Look at that beautiful amber color. Smell the fragrance of those sun-ripened grapes. And taste that fine sherry flavor. You'll agree with me, I'm sure, that Petri Sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. And say, if you happen to like your sherry dry, as I do, you'll really like Petri Pale Dry Sherry. Believe me, you can't go wrong with any wine that bears the name Petri, the proudest name in the history of American wines. <laughs> Now let's drop in on the good Dr. Watson, who's waiting for us in his California ranch house. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Foreman. Come in and make yourself a towel. Thank you, Doctor. Sitting here with the lights off, I see. Have you been getting yourself in the mood for tonight's Sherlock Holmes story? No, my boy, I was watching the sunset. It's quite a beautiful tonight. I, Doctor, the sun set over an hour ago. Yes, I know that, young fellow, my lad, I know that. But at my age, a fellow's entitled to take a little snooze after dinner, isn't he? Of course he is, Doctor. And now that we've settled that, how about tonight's story? Well, a very beautiful girl figured prominently in this adventure, Mr. Foreman. Her name was Jasmine Lafleur. Huh? Can you say that again, Doctor, please? <laughs> I know, my boy, but that was her stage name. When she was a magician's assistant, unfortunately, I never had the opportunity of seeing Jasmine Lafleur in the theater. But I'm told that she was a, a fascinating figure in tights and... and and spangled. <laughs> when Holmes and I first met her, however, she was uh, dressed a little more conventionally. And a new Diana Venering. Lady Venering. Lady Venering? Say, those tights and spangles really paid off, didn't they? Well, how did you and Sherlock Holmes come to meet up with her, Doctor? In rather spectacular style, Mr. Foreman. Something of a femme fatale in the early 1900s. First of all, she married Signor Rossoni, the magician for whom she was working. On the wedding night, he was mysteriously stabbed to death. A few months later, Madame Rossoni, very fetching in her widow's weeds, I'm sure, met Sir Wilfred Venering. And, after a whirlwind courtship, she married him. Don't tell me he got murdered, too. He did, Mr. Foreman. Also on the night of the wedding. But this time, the police found a suspect. It was a certain Major Beckworth, cousin of the dead man, and an ardent suitor of the fair Diana. The trial at the Old Bailey was one of the most sensational I ever remember. Sherlock Holmes and I, in, in court on the closing day as a jury, were still considering their verdict. The jury's been out over eight hours. I bet you they can't agree on a verdict and there'll be a new trial. I think not, old chap. Look, here they come now. You know, there's a strong moral probability of guilt, but I'm sure they'll agree that there's insufficient evidence to convict. Oh, perhaps you're right. Just look at Lady Venering down there ahead of us. What a, what a stunning woman. Yes, and a woman of great poise and courage. Here it comes. Gentlemen of the jury, have you arrived at a verdict? We have, my lord. How say you? 
you find the defendant guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Exactly. Come on, Watson. Let's get a breath of fresh air. Well, I was wondering, perhaps, if we shouldn't go over and congratulate Lady Venery. On what? The fact that her husband's murdered? I suppose you're right. You ever read the book of Tobit, Watson? Tobit? I don't think so. When was it published? Well, a little before our time, old chap. It's an Old Testament story. <laughs> Whatever made you think of it at <laughs> this moment? Well, it's so remarkably apposite with the case of Lady Venery. Deals with the highly peculiar of murders, seven of them, if I remember correctly. Who was the murderer? A jealous demon by the name of Asmodeus, who strangled husbands on their wedding nights. Well, judging by the verdict just now, Mr. Beckworth isn't the Asmodeus, or whatever you call him in this case. Here are, boy, here. Give me a paper. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Paper! Paper! Well, Holmes, what does it say? Here we are. Listen to this. <laughs> Lady Venring, widow of the murdered man, says that she will marry the suspect. Lady Venring told newspaper reporters this afternoon that if Major Beckwith is acquitted, she will marry him before the year is out. Oh, from my soul, Holmes, there's a positive sparkle in your eyes. You read about her. I must admit the lady fascinates me, old chap. I hope before she becomes involved in any further tragedies that we may have the opportunity of meeting her. And something tells me that we will. <laughs> case, Holmes. <laughs> Did you read them? No, I didn't, Watson. There's a complete life history of Lady Venering in one of them with photographs. It's uh, rather interesting. Really? What are you doing over there, Holmes? Looking out of the window. Ah, yes, yes. You expecting anybody, Holmes? No, come over here, old fellow. Oh, it's, a, it's a clergyman. Yes, a very agitated one. Look at the way he's pacing up and down. And looking up at our window, too. Uh, Joe, what eyes? Yes, there's a fanatical look about him, which suggests either the martyr at the stake or the inquisitor lighting the faggots. Mrs. Hudson's letting him in now. Well, I'll be interested to know what he's come to us about. I can hear footsteps on the stairs here. I'll, I'll go and have a look. How do you do, sir? Uh, come along in, won't you? It's all right, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. You're Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am, sir, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. My name is Whalen, the Reverend Arthur Whalen. How do you do, How sir? How do you do, sir? Sit down, would you, and uh, tell me what I can do for you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Holmes, this, uh, this is a very difficult subject to broach. In fact, it's only after intense personal conflict that I've been able to force myself to come to you. May I ask you, are you familiar with the Book of Tobit? Book of Tobit? You, you were talking about that yesterday, Holmes. I see that you've come to consult me about the Venering case. But that's amazing. How did you know? Has Lady Venering been in touch with you? Uh, no, sir, but uh, I'm familiar with the book of Tobit. And Lady Venering's case closely resembles that of the woman Sarah in the Old Testament story. More closely than you realize, Mr. Holmes. Did you know that before each one of Lady Venering's husbands was killed, they received a threatening note? Yes, I recall that from the trial. Signed in some sort of gibberish, weren't they? No, Doctor. Yesterday I was permitted for the first time to examine one of these notes. The apparent gibberish was, in reality, ancient Hebrew writing. Indeed. Were you able to translate it? Yes, Mr. Holmes. In effect, it said, If you go through with this marriage, your hours are numbered. And it was signed Asmodeus. Oh. The name of the jealous demon who strangled husbands in the book of Tobit. Exactly. Just why have you come to me, sir? I want you to talk to Diana, uh, <laughs> to Lady Vannering, to tell her she must not... Murder is stalking her, Mr. Holmes. I have argued with her, prayed with her, implored her to realize her danger. But she is adamant. Ah, I'm afraid I should feel extremely presumptuous in giving her my advice. No, Mr. Holmes. I have prepared the way for you. You could, I'm sure, make her realize her danger. And she's willing to see me, you say? Willing and anxious. Oh, very well. But I'd like to ask you a few questions first. Anything, Mr. Holmes. What is your interest in her? She is, she's a member of my flock. She needs my guidance. Nothing further? No, no, Mr. Holmes. Well, I, I believe that you uh, performed the marriage ceremony at both of her previous weddings. Yes. Are you proposing to officiate the uh, ceremony if she marries Major Beckwith? Well, I... Uh, I don't know. That marriage will never take place. And so I want you to help me, Mr. Holmes. Hmm. Where does the lady live? 
37, Barclays. Very well. Uh, Dr. Watson and I will call on her this afternoon. Mm, delighted to, delighted to. I doubt if I can be there myself. In fact, Diana might speak more freely if I'm not. Yes. But uh, here's my, my card. Oh, thank You'll you. You'll know where to get in touch with me if you want to. Very well, sir. Good day to you, gentlemen. And I, I'm greatly in your debt. Well, good day, sir. Good day. Hmm. Strange business, Holmes. I, I can't believe that Mr. Whalen's motives are entirely impersonal. Nor can I, old chap. <laughs> Hmm? <laughs> what are you laughing about? I was thinking of the book of Tobit, Watson. Hmm? In that, the role of protector, the role I have just been asked to take, uh, was can't help feeling, Watson, that I'm making distinct strides in my profession. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I'm so glad to meet you. How do you do, Lady Venering? May I introduce my old friend, Dr. Watson? How are you, Dr. Watson? Oh, we're glad to meet you, Lady Venering. <laughs> uh, let's sit down, shall we? You're just in time for oh, tea. Thank you. Um, you know why we're here, of course. Oh, naturally. Mr. Whalen came round here as soon as he'd left you. Uh, you were to persuade me to look after my mortal affairs uh, while he takes care of my immortal ones. <laughs> Isn't that it? He takes care of my charmingly foot, Lady Venering. <laughs> uh, may I say, Mr. Holmes, that I'm flattered that a man of your eminence should be sufficiently interested to bother about You me. underestimate your own importance, Lady Venering. Though I may mention that if your problem had been as simple as Mr. Whaler made it out to be, I might have been otherwise engaged. For being very frank and a little mysterious. Are you suggesting that Mr. Whalen didn't tell you everything? I am. And I hope you will be more candid with me. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, I like you. <laughs> You're most refreshing. Uh, milk and sugar in your tea? Uh, just milk, thank you. Here you are. How about you, Dr. Watson? Oh, just the same way, please. Hey, thank you, my dear. And now, Mr. Holmes, perhaps you'll tell me why you think that you haven't been told everything. Before I answer that, uh, Lady Venering, I wonder if I might ask you some questions. But of course. Anything. When your first husband... Uh, Signor Rossoni was killed. Did the police find any suspects? Uh, yes, one. Ferdinand Gautier, a young man who had been an assistant in our magician's act. A stupid, good-looking boy who thought he was in love with me. But, of course, Inspector Lestrade had to release him. There was no evidence. Inspector Lestrade? Well, you can bet that if he arrested him, <laughs> the boy was innocent. A warning there. Oh. With the name Asmodeus. Uh, but perhaps you're not familiar with the Book of Tobit. Oh, yes, yes, sir, I am. I'm familiar with it, Lady Venering. Uh, how did you know then that the Hebrew letter signified that name? Mr. Whelan translated them for me. Oh, I see. And also read me the book of Tobit. Uh, he's always been particularly fond of that book. Perhaps because it illustrates his own ideas on the dangers of marriage. But Holmes told us that he hadn't seen one of the warning notes until yesterday. Precisely. Lady Venering, I read in the papers that you intend to marry Major Beckwith, the man who has just been tried for your late husband's murder. Yes, Mr. Holmes. When are you going to marry him, may I ask? When it pleases me. Doesn't it occur to you that uh, a great deal of comment will be caused? Also, that Major Beckwith's life is in obvious danger? Of course it occurs to me, my dear man. But because of two tragic marriages, am I to spend the rest of my life alone? As Mr. Whelan would have me do. I'm young, alive. Peter, what are you doing here? I just arrived back in England today, Diana. What's this I read about you marrying Beckwith? Peter, I... Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, this is Peter McComas, one of our most promising young painters. Oh, Diana, oh, tell me it oh. isn't true. When I left England, you loved me, and I you. I come back, and what do I find? You're planning to marry Beckwith. Well, I won't stand for it. If you think you can throw me over like some silly boy, you're very much mistaken. I can tell things, you know. I can tell lots of things. Get out of here, Peter. Get out. Diana. And don't come back until you've learned manners. And discretion. But, but, Diana... Get out! I'm sorry, gentlemen. Were there any more questions you wanted to ask me, Mr. Holmes? Uh, one, Lady Venering. Uh, where is your fiancé, Major Beckwith? He's upstairs. 
Uh, I'm letting him stay here until the scandal of the trial has died down. I must see him at once. At once? Why, Holmes? He's in no danger until the marriage takes place? The marriage has taken place, Watson, unless what? I'm very much mistaken. It makes you think so, Mr. Holmes. You're much too discreet and intelligent, Lady Venering, to let him stay here in your house unless you were already married. <laughs> we were married this morning. But we planned to keep the fact a secret for a few months until the scandal had died down. May I talk to him, please? Of course. I'll ring for the butler and ask him to come down. May I ask, uh, madam, who married you? The Reverend Arthur Whelan, of course. Oh, and all the time he talked to us today, he knew perfectly well this marriage had taken place. He must have just come from it. I don't trust that man, Holmes. Oh, there you are, Hudson. I just rang for you. Uh, will you ask Major Beckley Excuse to... me, lady. I, I was just on my way to telephone the police. The police? What do you mean? It's Major Beckwith, my lady. He's been stabbed to death in his bath. Major Beckwith murdered, too. Hodgson, I'll telephone the police. By now, I'm rather well acquainted with Inspector Lestrade. Excuse me, gentlemen. A dreadful business, Holmes. A third husband murdered on his wedding day. But what a woman, Watson. She's superb, magnificent. What on earth do you mean, Holmes? What courage. What unconquerable spirit in the face of a fresh tragedy. Watson, she fascinates me. I haven't seen such a splendid female since we solved that case for the King of Bohemia. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds. Time enough to remind you that the easiest way to make good food taste better is to serve that good food with a swell Petri wine. And there are two Petri wines in particular just made to go with food. Petri California Sautern, a delicate white wine with a subtle flavor that's perfect with chicken and fish. And Petri California Burgundy, a hearty, rich red wine that's out of this world with any meat or meat dish. So if you want to know just how good a cook you are, serve your good food with Petri wine made to go with it. A Petri Burgundy or a Petri Sauterne. Two swell Petri mealtime wines. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The famous detective and his old friend Dr. Watson have become involved in the affairs of thrice-married Diana, one-time magician's assistant. Each of her husbands has been mysteriously murdered on his wedding day. The latest murder occurring on the same day that Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are brought into the case. As we rejoin our story, it's a month later, and for some obscure reason, Sherlock Holmes seems to have lost interest in the case, though not in the beautiful Diana. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mr. Stard? It's over a month now since Major Beckwith was murdered, and we haven't found a single clue to work. Do you expect me to supply the deficiencies of Scotland Yard? Well, it's unlikely not to help us, Mr. Holmes. And after all, you and Dr. Watson were in the house when it happened. If you ask me, the murderer's either McComas, that Irish painter, or the clergyman Wayland. Now, what do you think, sir? As far as I'm concerned, the case is closed, Mr. Arden. I wish you'd stop bothering me. What do you think I am? Nothing but a detecting machine? Mr. Holmes, whatever's come over you... You're not going out again this evening, are you? I'm afraid so, old chap. Well, this will be the fourth night in a row. I was hoping that we might have a nice, quiet evening in front of the fire. Oh, I'm sorry, Watson, but I promised to take Diana to the horse show at Olympia. I should be home by midnight. Holmes. Yes, Mr. Whelan? You're seeing altogether too much of Diana. She seems to be completely under your spell. But you introduced me to her in the first place with a request that I keep an eye on her. I made a great mistake. As her spiritual protector, I'm afraid I must ask you to stop seeing her. I'm afraid I must ask you, sir, to mind your own business. I say, Holmes, have you seen the paper that that violinist, the Zywe, is playing at the Albert Hall tonight? Uh, no, I haven't looked at the paper today. Oh, I thought perhaps we might go along and see Oh, I'm afraid I can't hold you up. No, I'm taking Diana to the French maid at Delius Theatre. I hear it's a, a charming musical comedy. <laughs> Here, Holmes. We've been friends for a good many years now. Very true, old fellow. And I think I'm entitled to speak to you straight from the shoulder. Of course you are, Watson. Very well, then. This Diana Beckworth. Oh. Well, yes, it's your own business, I suppose, but I can't bear to see her making such a fool of you. You've neglected your work entirely since you met her. You get about as though you're a young fellow of 20. What's come over you, Holmes? Stop, stop pacing about, old chap, will you, and sit down. In fact, uh, it might be a good idea if you fortified yourself with a little brandy from the tantalus there. Uh, what I'm about to tell you uh, 
may be something of a shock. Um, Watson, uh, uh, Diana and I are getting married tomorrow. What did you say, Alan? Um, I'm getting married tomorrow. But, uh, you're insane. Oh, that's not very flattering, Watson. Anyway, I don't see why you should be so surprised. You, you... You yourself married and left Baker Street once, didn't you? For you, Holmes, a confirmed woman. Oh, no, 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 my dear Watson, no, indeed no. You will remember in our adventure that you titled A Scandal in Bohemia, I met a lady that I have often referred to as a, oh, the woman. You mean Irene Adler, but she was a criminal. Exactly, and yet Diana has the same magnificent characteristics. Keen intelligence, courage, and unconquerable spirit. But Holmes, three of her husbands murdered on their wedding nights. You're proposing to be the fall. Oh, rubbish, my dear fellow, because tragedy has attended her previous marriages. Is she to go through life alone? Holmes, you... Uh, you really mean it, don't you? Of course I do. I think I will have a nip of brandy. Oh, don't take it so bad, old fellow. We'll continue to see a lot of each other. Diana's very fond of you, you know. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad. Who's going to perform the ceremony? Not the... The Reverend Mr. Whaler. Oh, no, 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 no. We decided, in view of Diana's previous marriages, that he might prove to be a trifle, uh, well, unlucky. A clergyman named Bernay will officiate. Whalen, of course, insists on being present just the same. Uh, what time is the wedding tomorrow? Two o'clock, old fellow. Oh, um, I should have mentioned this before. I hope your cutaway coat and top hat are in a good state of preservation. You'll be a pretty prominent figure at the ceremony, you know. You mean that, uh, that... Well, I mean that uh, if Sherlock Holmes gets married, who else can be his best man but his old friend, Dr. Watson? It's elementary, my dear fellow, elementary. And why? And those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. claim the privilege of the best man and <laughs> give you a kiss. Of course you shall, Doctor. It's you, Holmes. You, you, you're lucky fuller. Of course I am, old chap. Uh, Sherlock, I'm going upstairs to change my dress now. Very well, Diana. I'll be up shortly. I'll see you later, Dr. Watson. Very well, Mrs. Holmes. <laughs> you know, Holmes, I, I never thought I'd live to say that. Uh, what's no fellow? I'm worried. Worried today? Oh, my dear fellow, what, what's the matter? Well, just before the ceremony, I received one of those warning notes signed by Asmodeus. Oh, you better be careful, Holmes. I think I'll slip out and have a pipe or two on the matter. Yes. Look after my guests for me, will you? And keep your eyes open and your ears. Yes, I will indeed. Ah, uh, there you are, Mr. Wellen. Would you care for a glass of champagne or a punch or something or other? Thank you, no, Doctor. I'm in no mood for celebration. I'm certain that Diana has made a shocking mistake. Well, really, sir, I don't think... I only came here in a last-minute attempt to dissuade her. Now that I've failed, I shall leave. Good day, sir. Dr. Watson? Oh, hello, McCormick. Where's Mr. Holmes? We'll be back in a few minutes. Would you care for a glass of champagne, sir? Thank you. I should like to drink a toast to the pair. I've been in love with Diana for years, you know, but she wouldn't marry me, and well, I suppose I might as well make the best of it. I must say, your friend Sherlock Holmes seems like a splendid fellow. He is indeed, McComas. In fact, I may say... Excuse me, sir. All right, Holmes, I'm coming. Up here. What else the matter, Holmes? Follow me. Lock the door behind you. Allow me to introduce you to the demon Asmodeus, Watson. Unfortunately, at the moment, she's in a faint. Good Lord. It's Diana. Exactly. Always an impetuous woman, she made the mistake of trying to stab me with that knife. So I bent over to strap up a suitcase. She didn't allow for the wall mirror in which I was watching her. You mean you suspected her all along? Of course I did, old fellow. The problem was to find the proof. I first suspected her when I knew that she had been a magician's assistant. The key to the profession of magic is misdirection, and these murders have been a perfect example of thanks to the well-meaning stories of uh, the Reverend Mr. Whalen, whose theological libraries... She must have copied the Hebrew signature. She focused the murders on jealousy, concealing the fact that the one person with a perfect motive was herself, the widow who was to inherit. Oh, why hasn't she been caught before? Because she was clever, devilishly clever. She left no clues except an indirect one that I had once spotted, that the likeliest person to be able to approach a bridegroom unsuspected and stab him is his bride. 
And now I wish you'd see if you can revive her, old fellow. When the police get here, I should like Mrs. Holmes to be in full possession of all her faculties. <laughs> Well, Holmes, I must say I never expected to be driving back with you to Baker Street on your wedding day. <laughs> I thought that I deserted you, didn't you? Oh, well, naturally, I wish you'd told me the truth. Well, I couldn't tell anyone, not even you. If the faintest shadow of suspicion had entered our mind, I'd never have caught her. Well, it seems to me you paid a pretty high price, Holmes. You told me you made a will in her favor. Supposing something happens to you before her trial, she'd get the money, you know. Oh, the will? Oh, no, that was worthless. I told Diana... But it was a holographic will and perfectly valid. Well, what on earth is a holographic will? Uh, a will drawn up in uh, one's own handwriting on a piece of perfectly plain paper. Such a document is quite legal, but I drew mine up on a paper with, uh, well, with a left head. That made it um, invalid. Well, I see, but the fact remains that you are married, Holmes. <laughs> I, I really fooled you completely, didn't I, Watson? Uh, didn't the name of the clergyman who married us suggest anything to you? The Reverend Vernet? No, and why not should it? Well, Vernet was a French painter of some note. He also happens to have been a great uncle of mine and, um, you, Mycroft's. You mean that, that your brother Mycroft was a clergyman? I mean he's just a clergyman. And a very convincing job he did, too. A more satisfactory clergyman than the Reverend Mr. Whalen, no doubt, whose possible complicity may compel him to answer some very awkward questions. Then you're not married. <laughs> Upon my soul, Holmes, I, I, I don't know what to say. Then I suggest that you say nothing, my dear chap. Let's just sit back quietly, as two good friends can, about the uh, mutability of human affairs. Well, Doctor, tonight's adventure was really a little extraordinary, to say the least. Holmes sure had a narrow escape. Uh, doubly narrow, Mr. Foreman, doubly narrow. He not only escaped the, the jaws of death, but he also escaped the, the clutches of matrimony. Actually, the story had a happy ending for everybody but Lady Venering. Uh, uh, Jasmine Lafleur. What about that artist fellow, McComas? How did he take it? Oh, very well, very well indeed. In fact, in gratitude, he even painted Holmes's portrait. Not exactly a good likeness, though. One of those... Modern artist who pictures impressions of a person rather than a portrait. What do you mean? Well, now, let me see. If he were to paint his impression of you, you'd probably end up by looking like a bottle of Petri wine in a sports jacket. Oh, I have about Petri wine. And why not? The facts bear me out that Petri wine most certainly is good wine. After all, the Petri family knows all there is to know about the art of turning plump, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. That's because they've been making wine for generations. Ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, the family done from father to son all their skill and knowledge and experience. And believe me, that adds up to plenty. So no matter what type of wine you prefer, one to serve with meals or a wine for any special occasion, choose one of the fine Petri wines. You can't miss because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watton, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, let me see, Mr. Foreman. I'm going to tell you about, uh, about a strange adventure that began by my taking a wild cab ride through the moon and me being trapped in a luxuriola below a furniture warehouse down by the waterfront. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Shoscombe Old Place. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri. Better remember Pet, Pet, Petri. Wine. This is Bill Foreman saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. There's a time on Broadway when the fury dies. The revelers give up and the street is an empty corner of a faraway world. It's four o'clock in the morning. The time of yesterday's newspaper drifting with the night wind. The time of the tired shadow and furtive sounds dimly heard. And you walk it because you're a policeman and your day's just over. You turn a corner because it's the way home. And some of the shadows melt into a man and you're glad because it's a man you know. Hi, Danny. John. How are you? Fine, you. Good. You got your transfer, huh? Yeah, and I like it. I guess I'll always be pounding a beat and shaking doors. But I like doing it better here. What's new, Danny? I don't know, John. The same, I guess. Hey. From down the street, probably help just... Help me! Help me! Come on. Some... Right over there. Someone's in a hurry to leave. That car, no light. Here's what they left. This man's been badly beaten up. Call box down the street. I'll get an ambulance. Wait. No need. Dead? Yeah. Go for him, John. See who he is. Okay. Did you notice that truck in the alley, Danny? Yeah, I'll take a look. Did I find anything? Uh-uh. No wallet. Looks like he was beaten for it. You? The truck's a bakery truck, the Felder Bakery. It's not far from here, on First Avenue near 39th. It's on the beat. Yeah, this man in white shirt and white pants could be a delivery uniform. Sure, they're open 24 hours a day. Call it in, John, then stick with it. I'll get over to the bakery. Maybe those people can tell me something. told me a man wanted to see me. You the man? Yes. Mr. Felder? Uh-huh. Louis Felder. Uh, look, friend, I'm sorry I can't help you. I got all the men I need to handle what I got. I suggest you try the Baker's Union. Uh, they... Uh, try the union. I'm from the police, Mr. Felder. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. No disrespect intended. It, it just that so many men come in asking me for work. If there's been a complaint, our product, one of my employees... Truck 12. Who drives it? 12? You mean tonight? Tonight. Yeah, I'll find out. Hey! Who was on 12th tonight? Huh? What do you want? Who drove 12th tonight? 12? Just a minute. Morris had it tonight. Oh, of course. Mar- Morris Bernstein. Good man. Certainly Morris has... He's dead. He was killed. Morris? In-, in an accident? His truck was torn apart. He was beaten to death. Oh, I've been afraid, afraid. Of what, Mr. Felder? Something like this would happen. One night they would beat a man until he died. Who? Hoodlums, rat pack. We don't know. Happened to another one of my boys last week. They turned over his truck, threw the bread into the gutter, attacked him. I'd like to talk to him. Uh, naturally. Sid! Sid Norman! Still here? Yeah, yes, okay, okay. Want me, Mr. Fowler? Yeah. A little bit later, I should be out in the route. This man is from the police, Sid. Morris was killed tonight. Beaten up? Why did you say that, Sid? Well, because it follows. It happened to me last week, but yeah, I was lucky. I ran away from him. Morris probably stopped to reason with him. He was that kind of a man. Could you recognize any of them, Sid? No, they jumped me when my back was turned. I was gathering up loaves of bread, sweet rolls, things like that, and something hit me in the back of the head. I didn't stop to say hello. I just ran. How many were there? Could you tell me that? Oh, four or five, maybe. Punks, just kids. I could tell by their voices. Gee, the kids nowadays. They gather in rat packs and, and kill... Mr. Felder, any reason this should happen to your trucks, your men? I, I don't know. Maybe it's because my men are out alone at four o'clock in the morning. I don't remember ever doing anything wrong. Hey, excuse me, please. Stop the machines! Stop the ovens! You don't work anymore today. Go home. <laughs> Dan, men didn't look happy. They looked worried. It was as if suddenly the scene were taking place in slow motion. 
The tentative movements, the glances, one man detaching himself from the rest, walking over to Louis Felder, then the rest forming a questioning circle around him. But Mr. Felder just shook his head and walked through the door. It was 4.30, and I went home. At 10 o'clock, I was back at headquarters. There was a man waiting for me in my office, just as I knew he would be. The fates had fashioned it that way. They'd grinned and put their heads together and conspired that Sergeant Tataglia should always be waiting in my office when I closed the door behind me. Here we are, Danny. We are indeed. I understand you had a pretty rough night of it. <laughs> You're going to brighten up what otherwise might be a drab day, is that it? My utter best, Danny. Thanks. What do you got? This baseball cap found some 50 feet from the scene of the beating up in the gutter. It might or might not have something to do with what happened. The last is my own comment upon matters. Let's see it. Yeah, Danny, here. If you will notice, on the inside, there's a sweatband, and on the sweatband is printed in ink a name and address. Uh-huh. My middle boy, Rufio Tataglia, did the same to his three propini. Gabe Kirby, it says. 1412 West 18th. Uh, that's pretty far from where Morris Bernstein was killed, Danny. So, like I said, this cap might or might not have something uh, to do... Let me find out, huh, Tataglia? <laughs> The address printed neatly in the baseball cap was a cold water tenement, a scar, an open wound fashioned of peeling brownstone, of litter, of something that scurried under your feet, then darted into a hole. It watched you with bloodshot eyes as you walked up the stairs. Then at the landing, you heard it come out again. You knocked at a door, and a woman, haggard, resigned, told you her son Gabe was at school, the 16th Street Vocational School. And at the school, a man sighed, shrugged, Walked away from you. Came back with Gabe Kirby. He said you could use his office. He was used to it. Then he left you alone with Gabe. The principal pulled me away from something very interesting. The secret life of a drain pipe. Plumbing two-way. Why did he do that? Sit down, Gabe. Oh, the courteous approach. I've been making a catalog how you guys approach us guys. Yours is a courtesy type. Glad to add it to my collection. You've been in trouble before, Gabe. Uh, lots of times, huh? I wouldn't say lots. I'm only 18 years old. My share, though. Yeah, I had my share. Yeah. This baseball cap belong to you? Hey, you're a blue ribbon retriever. I've been missing that cap for a month now. How about that? I never dreamed I'd see that cap again. Gabe. I'm sorry, pal. I can't offer you a reward, but I'll even it up for you. Someday when conditions are better. Gabe. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for bringing back my cap. It's a good luck charm. My bat and average... Sit down, Gabe. I said sit down. Okay, okay. The approach changes. Huh, Mr. Policeman? Where were you last night, Gabe? Somebody broke into a grocery store last night? Where were you? I slept on an iron cot. All night. Not at home, Gabe. Your mother told me you went home last night. Oh, the old lady told you that. Thank her for me. Where were you? In a room over a garage. We call it a club room. I belong to a club. The Titans. Last night I slept there. We take time sleeping here, we boys. To watch over a lot of things we wish we had. You were there all night? All night. From 8 o'clock on. You can check with Richie. Richie? Who's he? You don't know Richie. Mr. Richard Peel? An important man. He's the athletic director of the Titans. Volunteered for the job. He sets us boys a good example. The other Titans, where were they? Who knows? I was sleepy, so I went to sleep. Check with Mr. Peel. Gabe, your cap was found 50 feet from where a man was killed. Beaten up and killed by a gang. A man named Morris Bernstein. Morris Bernstein. And my cap was there, huh? Well, how about that? Check with Mr. Peel, Mr. Policeman. Over to Conway Garage on 20th. And now I hear Plumbing Two-Way calling me. Uh, you'll excuse me? Hey, you, you looking for someone? Yeah, I am. Who are you looking for, mister? Uh, Richard Peel. You found him. You from the employment agency? No. Oh, I thought you were from the agency. Police. I thought you were from the agency. There's no phone here. They said they'd send a man over if anything turned up for me. What do you do here, Mr. Peel? What do you mean? Well, this place, uh, over a garage, empty. Not empty, Mr. Uh... Clover. Not empty, Mr. Clover. Look around. We've got some equipment. Barbells, wall exercises... Enough for now. This is where the Titans meet, huh? That's right. We'll get it fixed up. I still don't understand. What do you do here? 
I thought you'd know by now. The boys need a direction. I try to give them that. Get them off the street. Organize teams, you know. You like doing that. A man has an obligation to kids. Haven't you ever told yourself that, Mr. Clover? Especially about kids who come up here without roots, broken homes, drunken fathers and working mothers, or worse. It's my obligation. Yeah, I suppose more people should feel the way you do. Somebody has to. <laughs> what am I telling you for? You'd know. Ever read any statistics on juvenile delinquency? Uh-huh. Then you'd be the one to know. These kids need something. To let them know their heritage, rights, things like that. Give them direction. They don't find that on the street. There's a reason I came up here, Mr. Peel. I know. Not many adults come up here. They're just not interested. It's about Gabe Kirby. Well, something's bothering you, I can tell. Just what about Gabe? He said he was here last night, all night. I know why he said that. Because he was. Well, seems to me... I know just what you're going to say. And it seems to you a boy 18 years shouldn't stay out all night. All right, suppose Gabe went home. What'd it be there for him? The drunken father I told you about. You'd swear he was here all night. On that cot over there. And I slept on the other one. I assure you, Mr. Clover, if some young man got into trouble last night, it wasn't Gabe Kirby. You have my 100% word on that. Mr. Peel found my hand, shook it, looked me straight in the eye 100% and invited me to address a meeting of the Titans. The boys would appreciate friendly advice from a friendly policeman, he assured me. I mumbled something and got out. At headquarters, the routine of tracing down the murderers of Morris Bernstein gnawed at the day until there was nothing left but the nighttime. I gave it up and went home to sleep. That didn't work either, so I went back to headquarters. The files on rat packs, from a social point of view, from a criminal point of view, from a statistical point of view, educational, but no help in the murder of Morris Bernstein. So I thought I'd try to sleep again. At two in the morning, it should come. It didn't. On the street, back to it, a friend stopped me. Officer Rucker. How you, Danny? Long day, huh? Yeah. How's it been for you? Quiet, Danny. Not a peep. Nothing? Nobody? I've been keeping a close eye on every person, every car. If they don't look right, I question them. So far, nothing. You'll keep on it, huh, John? You told me to do that. It won't change. Hey, good night, John. Get some sleep, Danny. It'll do you good. Danny, Danny, you all right? Yeah. Just knocked me down. License? No light. No license, Danny. I was blind. Didn't they see me? They saw you all right. You're lucky, Danny, because whoever it was, they tried to kill you. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat. Written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Every Saturday evening, two top music makers bring CBS listeners an hour of great entertainment. Vaughn Monroe is on hand with his famous band playing the five top tunes of the week as chosen by Variety. Gene Autry then comes along with a half hour of ranch ballads and roundup comedy. The Vaughn Monroe Caravan and the Gene Autry Show are regular Saturday evening features on most of these same CBS stations. Hear them both this Saturday. Night slips out of Broadway's fingers. Broadway is left alone, empty-handed and bewildered. The long, long day, 100% pure, 100% unadulterated, now walks the street and invites. So what's to do, kid? Well, there's the guy at the newsstand to the comic books and the hot tips. No. Well, there's the pinball machines and the flea circus. Uh-uh. Well, there's the trash baskets with the morning papers. Try that. Hmm. Day-old murder of a bakery driver warmed over for this morning's commuters. Nothing. A policeman run down by an unidentified car. Better. And at police headquarters, you try to readjust the adhesive on your ribs when the door bursts open. Danny, what do you think you're doing? Leave the bandage alone. Oh, don't get upset, Dr. Sinsky. I was just trying to ease it a little. Take your hands away from it. Here, here let me look. It's uh, all right, isn't it? Who did this job on you? The boys in the police emergency hospital. Oh, medical students, amateurs, college boys. 
that bad. As a matter of fact, it excites a certain envy in me, Danny. This is a very progressive way to apply a bandage to a cracked rib. Mm. Mm. <laughs> What are you doing? Hurts, huh? That's good. Serves you right. You couldn't call your old friend Dr. Sinsky no matter what time of night. You don't approve of Sinsky's oh, methods. It's not that. I, uh, the next time someone tries to kill you, Danny, please call on me. Do that for an old friend, please. <laughs> you made a deal. Hmm. Contusions, hmm, abrasions. Oh, this will leave a small scar to make you interesting. Otherwise, you'll live. Thank you, Doctor. I can button up my shirt now. What's the matter? I uh, called on you for another reason, too, Danny. Yeah? Uh, here, let me help you with the buttoning. Uh, yeah, Danny, we uh, we completed the examination of the body of Morris Bernstein. And? I won't bore you with medical terminology, but the man was beaten in such a way. A new way for hoodlums, methodically, systematically, beaten after, even after he sank into unconsciousness. Whoever attacked him, Danny, made sure Morris Bernstein would die. Doctor, that uh, slip of paper on my desk that I tell you just brought in. Oh, of course. There's an address. Uh-huh. Uh, 2650 Riverside Drive. Who's Danny? Morris Bernstein's. I'm going to find out why somebody wanted him dead. I beg your pardon, are you... The... Whatever you want me to be, that's what I am. In this place... Oh, pardon me. Russell speaking. Again. Look, Mrs. Braverman, just tell Mr. Braverman to pull down the blinds. That's my only advice to you. How do you like that? Somebody wanted to look at Mr. Braverman. Now, what is your complaint? My name's Clover from the police. Here are my wrists. Slip the handcuffs on them. Take me far away. A rain solitaire. <laughs> you don't look like a criminal, Mr. Russell. You've been working here long? Uh, I'm a new boy. I'm just breaking in one month. Did you know Morris Bernstein? I read about him in the papers, about hoodlums beating him up. I'm trying to find out something about it. Well, I can tell you this. He lived in apartment six, a four-room apartment shared by four other gentlemen who had exclusive rights to use kitchen number 2A. Otherwise, it was just it's a nice day. Yes, isn't it? Between Mr. Bernstein and me. Anyone up there in his apartment now? Any of the four gentlemen? I curtsied them all out on their way to work this morning. I'll uh, want to talk to them later. About seven o'clock, I think. That's when they'll all be home from the world. Another pardon, please? Russell speaking. Yes, Mr. Scar on the mail is in. And how do I know whether you've got anything? I haven't put it up yet. Well, all right, then. We'll wait for me, Austin. It's a rebel, Mr. Clover. He wants me to see if he has any mail before I put it in his box. I'll wait. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me see. Jordana, Westfall, Valentine. Uh, look, Mr. Clover. What? A letter for Morris Bernstein. Uh, let me have it. Oh, sure. I can tell you who it's from. The girl whose name and address is on the upper left-hand corner. I can see that. Yes, but this girl, she's Morris's girlfriend. They write letters to each other, even though they could phone... This has been going on since the girl moved away from here. Oh? When did that happen? Oh, just before I came to work here. Someone told me. Let me see. Maybe Morris. Uh, Mr. Scarn? Were you clicking? No mail, Mr. Scarn. There was no more mail for Mr. Scarn, and sorry. No more information about Morris Bernstein. Very sorry. Try the girl, Leah Golden, on the return address. Maybe she could help. Maybe Leah could. I tried it. At a rooming house on West 76, a woman shook him off out a window and told me Leah Golden had moved to another rooming house on West 90th, 2346 West 90th. It took 10 minutes. No Leah Golden moved to a furnished room in a flat on 116th Street. A kid told me Miss Golden was a nice lady. Gave him bubble gum, but was gone now. Moved. Don't ask nobody where, mister, because nobody knows. At headquarters, I put out an all-points bulletin on Leah Golden. Find her, I said. What does she look like, they asked me. I added it up for them. All the scraps of description I'd salvaged in darkened hallways on the screaming street. Find her, I said. And at one in the morning... Danny? Danny, you're asleep? No, Dr. Sinsky. Well, there's no time, Danny. They found Leah Golden. What? The call came to my office routine. Then she's... No, Danny. Just hurt. How bad? I don't know. Where? In a vacant lot on Amsterdam Avenue. Uh, the man who found her said she was beaten up. The ambulance is waiting. I thought... Well, let's go. From 
from somewhere out of the alleys, detaching themselves from the shadowed streets, from the unlit doorways, breaking away from the night whispering, they'd come. The seekers after someone else's pain. They stood in a circle, silent, hungry for the spectacle. Stood on tiptoe, strained for a look at the girl lying broken in a patch of weeds. The policemen held them back and they murmured their seething protest. And in the building standing at the edge of the lot, windows had been flung open, heads poked out of them, and the gallery seats were filled. Dr. Sinsky pushed a way open for us, and they retreated from his fury. Then he kneeled at the girl's side. Uh, uh, my case, Danny, a, a bottle. Give it to me. This one? Hey, yeah, yeah, quickly. Oh, so much blood. Miss Golden. Not now, Danny, not now. I'm sorry. Thought... In the morning you can question her. In the morning, maybe. What's all the excitement? A garbage man will move her. Who was that? You up there in that building. Who was that? Danny, I need help with the girl. Now, gently... Very gently. I nodded another officer into the building to look out for who had yelled down to us. To bring him to me, I'd be at headquarters. And I helped Dr. Sinsky. Back at headquarters, I waited. The officer came in, reported no one in the building knew who it was that yelled. Then later, a couple of hours later, word came down from Dr. Sinsky that I could talk to the girl. Miss Golden? You are Mr. Clover. The nurse told me. Before you sit down... Yeah? Will you crank up this bed so I can sit up so we can talk better? Oh, sure. All right. Oh. oh. Pull it down. Oh, my back. I, I didn't realize. That's better. I can come back later, Miss Golden. No. All right. But if it's too much to talk now... Please. Lying, who beat you up? I don't know. Boys, young men. I'd never seen them before. No faces you'd recognize? No faces, but... But the names they call me. I've heard them before. In Europe. Uh -huh. There's something else. You want to know why I was running away? We need to know it. I was running away from a man. Morris Bernstein? No. Oh. Oh. Then who? I don't understand it. Wait. I lived at the same apartment house that Morris did. I know. That's why we were... I met him there, Morris. We, I don't know, we went to the movies together and did things like walking and looking at each other's face. Something was happening between us. Something... Morris hated the word love. He said it, it wasn't enough. Then... Why were you running? A man worked there at the apartment house. What man? He wanted me to. He, he said that a nice girl like me shouldn't be spending all that money for rent. He said that. What man? Listen to me. One night he walked into my room. I tried to reason with him, but he wasn't hearing me, so I screamed. He ran away out of the room. Didn't you tell someone about him? Morris. Morris had him discharged. He went to the owner of the building and had him discharged. The man's name, Miss Golden? I don't know. What, you? The, the name he, they called him by, that's all. Richie. They called him that, and after that I ran, but, but he followed me. Wherever I ran, he followed. You, you'll be all right, Miss Golden. I'll, I'll try to make it that way. <laughs> Clover, come back to the clubhouse to look for me? Yeah, I am. How are you feeling, Mr. Peel? I'll feel better after this. <sighs> Nothing like a workout on the barbells to make a man feel good. Uh-huh. You caught me in the middle of some repetition presses, Mr. Clover. Press away. I'll wait. Thanks. Well, I relax between exercises, Mr. Clover. <laughs> What's on your mind? You are, Mr. Peel. That's why I'm here. Oh, you want to hand me that sweatshirt? We got a girl down at the doctor's hospital. She says you were bothering her. Oh? What's her name? Leah Golden. She only knew you as Richie. The Titans, your, your club, calls you that, too. Yeah, I know Leah Golden. She got hurt, huh? On account of you, Richie. Oh, come I'll now. I'll tell you about it. You were after her while you were superintendent in her apartment. She got you fired, didn't she? 
I quit that job. The people there... Well, you know. Leah told Morris Bernstein about you walking in on her one day, so Morris saw to it you got fired. People like that think they run the world, don't they? People like you, Richie. No, not me. Look at me. An out-of-work guy. Somebody waves a finger and I'm out of a job. But you figured a way to get back at them, didn't you? Volunteering your services to these kids. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm cooling off. Time for my bicep belt and exercises. You want to watch out for a minute? Uh-uh, leave them alone. I said leave them alone. Hey. Clover, don't push me around. Stand there and listen. The kids, Richie. You heated them up, fed them your poison, pointed out Morris Bernstein and Leah Golden and said sick them. I did that, huh? Good for me. With Bernstein, you were there, huh? You finished it up when the kids were through. Your boys, Peel, the juvenile authorities will want them. You got a long way to go, Clover. Just uptown. Get your shirt on. <laughs> that easy, huh? Oh, you're so... You're soft, Clover. You look big, but you're soft. <laughs> I said, Peel. Uptown. In the time of June, Broadway shimmers like an enchanted island. Night falls, and the wave of neon floods the streets, showers it with its light and color, the million sounds, and it ebbs. The pavements strike glints where dreams were caught in the mud. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Harry Bartell, Maria Palmer, Barney Phillips, Jack Crucian, Billy Hallop, and Howard McNear. Jack Benny, Amos and Andy, Charlie and Edgar. They're off on summer vacation, but Sunday night on CBS still offers one of radio's top bargains in entertainment. Red Skelton, Lucille Ball, and Corliss Archer are still here with their unbeatable brands of comedy, plus the bright new comedy star, Steve Allen. There's superb music with Dick Hames and Joe Stafford on the Contented Hour, with Guy Lombardo and his sweetest music, This Side of Heaven, with Percy Faith, his orchestra, and his guest stars. Horace Hyde is on hand with the original Youth Opportunity Program, and Hit the Jackpot can hit home to you with fine prizes if you get a call and can solve the secret saying. They're all here this Sunday on most of these same CBS stations, so be listening, won't you? Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where the Goldbergs are every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. There's a thing about Broadway, it mixes well with the sunlight. On a noonday of summertime, the concrete strikes silver glints. And the mob is nicely proportioned with silken ankles and ducks hunts and wind-blown hairdos. And an organ grinder plays background music for the big grin and the clown's funny nose. At headquarters, I stood watching it, pushing away the time for the filling out of my routine reports. 
The diversions were down there in the streets, the girl and the yellow silk dress she wore, both knowing about summer and loving the feel of it. Then I heard two things. The sigh that came from me, the phone ringing that came from the phone. Danny Clover speaking. Did you do what I told you? Who is this? Did you do it, Mr. Clover? I don't understand. Who am I talking to? I wrote you a letter about Stephen Courtney. But Stephen Courtney's dead. Yes, I know he's dead. What's the matter with you? Everybody knows he's dead. What's your interest in Courtney? Who are you? Can't you see? It doesn't matter who I am. Can't you understand? Stephen Courtney... Hello. 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 It started that way. The anonymous call, impossible to trace. The sifting through the dust of a man's death. Stephen Courtney's dying had for a moment upset the delicate balance of many worlds. Of finance, of corporate bodies, of dynasties in oil and steel, and the breeding of racing horses. The decay that for months had wasted his body had forced him finally down to the level of all old men who must die. The headlines wept, the commentators lamented. The memos came down from chairman of boards. There'd be a minute of silence for the death of Stephen Courtney. But now it was spoiled. Now a voice cried, murder. And the policeman must listen. In the records bureau, I found Stephen Courtney's death certificate. Cause of death, heart failure. Date of death, June 16th. Attending physician, Dr. Arthur Fulbright. In his office, Dr. Fulbright was poised, curious, and annoyed. Uh, Permit me to understand. You're questioning my diagnosis of the cause of Steve Courtney's death. We can put it that way if you want. And what do you base this sudden presumption? You have a right to know on a phone call. From whom? Another doctor? Some quack who wants to destroy my reputation? Chooses to degrade me by having me questioned by the police? It came from a woman. Who? She didn't say. All she said was Stephen Courtney was murdered. That's preposterous. Steve Courtney died last week as I had expected him to die, of a coronary disorder. He knew he would die of it, as I knew it, his family, his servants, his enterprises. But you'll fill me in, huh, Doctor, because I wasn't that privileged. Now the newspapers had it for months. How old Steve was bedridden. How he had chosen me as intimate friend to be his attending physician. How I kept him by sheer know-how from death's door. Still, he died. There are things in heaven and earth Yeah. That... Tell me about his dying. Normal. I had a call from his estate on Long Island. I canceled all other calls, went out there. Found old Steve lying sprawled on the floor, dead. Peacefully dead. You said he was bedridden. Why was he... Why was he on the floor? I confess the question occurred to me at the time, but then I rejected it. Like everything else, old Steve chose his own way of dying. Describe it to me exactly how you found it. I have. He was sprawled in the middle of the room. He had knocked over a radio on a... Hmm. That's strange. What is? The radio. Quite left explicit instructions. Nothing of the sort was to be in the room with him. Too exciting. Now, what do you know? Old Steve defied me. Yeah, I guess he did at that. Sometimes it slips out of our hands, doesn't it, Doctor? It took about an hour to drive to Long Island in the estate of Stephen Courtney... And enough time driving through the estate to make an observation. The grass is always greener in a rich man's backyard. And plants that are only supposed to grow in the tropics will blossom on Long Island as long as they're nurtured by thumbs turned green by association with money. The plenipotentiary of the hibiscus beds told me he didn't know whether there was anyone in the house or not. But try at the track, he said. Yeah, the racetrack, way down there. Miss Lilla would probably be there. She always was. Then some more of the tour to the private track of the late Stephen Courtney. When I got there, the decor was still intact. A golden girl riding a black racing stallion. And a man leaning over the rails, holding a stopwatch. Uh, he did fine, Miss Lilla, just fine. Whoa, son, Prince. Steady, boy. Steady, that's the boy. Uh, how did he do, Joseph? Uh, 101 and two fists for the fire furlongs. Uh, I'll help you down, Miss Lilla. All right. Who's your friend? Huh? Your friend. I didn't notice any... Hey, what are you doing here, mister? My name's Danny Clover. I didn't ask you that. Hi, Danny. Cool off, Sun Prince, Freddy. What can we do for you, Danny? I'm from the police. Fine. 
I'm Lilla Courtney. This is Joseph O'Donoghue, our trainer. How, How do, do you Mr. do, Mr. O'Donoghue? Uh, what's the police want with Miss Lilla? Joseph takes care of me. I see he does. The old man said I should. The old man said that, Miss Lilla. Joseph? That day he died. The next morning from that, his voice said to me, Joseph, you see that Miss Lilla is all right. When did my father tell you that? The morning after he died. Your daddy still talks to me. The way he always did. I'm glad. Things like that happened to Joseph, Mr. Clover. Once, well... No, tell me about it. I once chartered a plane to take some people down to Baltimore last year's Preakness. Joseph said, don't go. A voice came to him while he was sleeping and said, tell Miss Lilla not to go. But I went. The plane crashed. I was the only one who came out of it alive. Even at that... Well, here, feel my knee, Danny. Well, uh... Go ahead, you'll see. The doctor said I'd be a cripple for life. Dr. Fulbright? Oh, you know him. We just met. Don't go back to him, Danny. I think he's incompetent. But he diagnosed your father's sickness as heart disease. I know. Oh, I... I suppose I'm being malicious. Of course, Daddy had trouble with his heart. Of course, Dr. Fulbright is competent. What about the radio in your father's room? What did you say, Danny? The radio. Your father wasn't supposed to have a radio in his room. He did on the day he died. He did? Now, I don't understand either. Why are you here? Why is a policeman asking me questions about Daddy? Call it routine. Don't talk to him, Miss Lilla. Joseph. I got a feeling about it. I say don't talk to him. Danny. Danny, I'm sorry. I've got to go now. There's some questions, Miss You'd Cole. better talk to my brother. He's around someplace. Try the house. I just can't talk to you, Danny. Graveyard of dead animals? Oh. oh, yeah, quite a trophy room. <laughs> yes, that stuffed specimen you're looking at, Bengal tiger. Huh? Many brave souls lie asleep in the deep Hindu jungle, all because old Steve wanted to bring home a pussycat. Old Steve, your father? My father. Brandy? No. Then you're Burl. Yep. Mother and I got along fine. But old Steve said the boy is hard to handle, so he called me Burl. <laughs> he thought that would make Mother angry, but Mother fooled him. She died a long time ago. <sighs> First of the day, it says here. You know who I am, why I'm here? No, oh, the domestic staff is agog with it. A woman called me. Said your father was murdered. It's a free country. They have the vote. They can say people were murdered, even my father. <sighs> Maybe it proves something. Like what? That the old man was human enough to die when someone killed him. I didn't know that about him. I thought he always picked his own time and place for everything. Then you think he died because he was ready to die. Hmm. What does it matter? He's dead and I'm rich. We're all rich. It'll be easier if you try to stay sober. <laughs> sober. When was that? All right, all right, I'll stay sober. You said you're all rich. Who? Lilla. I watched you from a window. An exciting thing, Lilla, wouldn't you say? Lilla. Who else? Yeah, you wouldn't say. Well, well, there's O'Donoghue. He got a big hunk. And the cook and the maids and the nurse. And a man in Iowa who shined my father's shoes once. The nurse. A who was she? Alice Barnett. Nursed the old man for years. It paid off. Where is she? Who knows? Old Steve dies, Nursey goes somewhere to cry. Leaves this nice, big, cozy mausoleum. No Nursey, anywhere. She lived here. Mm hmm. Bed and board and street dresses. Who cares? We do. I'll phone headquarters to find her. Good hunting. O'Donoghue, the trainer, he told me your father talks to him even now. <laughs> My father. Joseph hears voices all the time. About a month ago, he had a three way conversation with Orville and Wilbur Wright. There was a radio in your father's room when he died. How did it get there? You know, I wouldn't know. But he was dying. Surely you... I was a most unfilial son. Uh, look, why don't you ask Nursey when you find her? See, she knew about things like that. Yeah, you, you just ask Nursey. I uh, earned this. No? <laughs> Well, 
welcome back to the doldrums, Danny. Huh? I was just leaving headquarters for the day. I thought it would be nice of me to welcome you back to them, the doldrums. What are you talking about, Tataglia? Well, Danny, since you have been cavorting with society and munching scones with the blue bloods, I wondered if you would be the same old Danny. And am I? Did you bring me a scone, Danny? Uh Uh-uh, no scones. Tell me one thing. What about the nurse, Alice Barnett? Did you find her? She is being as scarce as a... as a... You didn't find her, huh? As a... as a... Danny Clover speaking. You'd better get up here, Mr. Clover. Who is this? Burl! What's the trouble? It's your business to find out. Get up here. Somebody just got beaten to death. It was a design in horror, done in grotesques. The horse, rearing, screaming, clawing its hoofs against the stall. The girl, disheveled, twisted with terror, pleading with it. Tia! Tia, leave him alone no more! Leave him alone, Tia! Pearl dazed, helpless, sodden with fright, with drunkenness. The blazing moon setting fire to the web of blood that reached out from under the stall gate. Tia, no more! Tia! Pearl, help me! Help me get that horse out of there! I can't hide the giant. I can't. Tia's a good girl. Help me! Help me! <laughs> I'll open the gate. You grab her mane. Come on. Now. Come on, dear. There's a good girl. Come on, dear. I, I can't hold her. I can't. Let her go. <laughs> Joseph. Oh, poor Joseph. Poor dead Joseph. Dead Joseph. What happened? <laughs> Lilla, what happened? I, I don't know. I was coming back from a moonlight ride. I heard Joseph scream. Tia was standing over him when I found him, trampling him with her hooves. I tried to pull her away. I called Burl. We, Tia, we tried. Tia must have kicked him. He, he fell, and then she... till he died. <laughs> Tia. No, not like that, Burl. Joseph died because he was murdered. <laughs> You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Don't let a rainy day find you unprepared. Start saving for that rainy day right now by buying United States savings bonds. If you hold on to your bonds until they mature, you'll get back $4 for every $3 you invested. Buy United States savings bonds regularly. In June, Broadway bursts out all over. It lulls in the breezes of the air-conditioned movie. It compares postcards from the family in the Catskills. It drinks deep of the neon-scented summer air. Sighs and wishes Mom and the kids would stay there. Because Broadway's having a wonderful time. Sixty girls, sixty, will pass a given point at any given hour. The music drifting out of the Diamond Dance pavilions is like partaking of an open-air band concert. And the drama on the front pages. A movie. A sheer, unadulterated drive-in movie. Consider, a tycoon dies, someone calls up, says it's murder. A horse trainer is kicked to death by a horse gone crazy with the moonlight. The police say it's murder. Where else but on Broadway can you spend a summer in such a way? And in the technical lab, a man in shirt sleeves wipes the sweat off his lips, breathes on a magnifying glass, wipes it on his pants, invites you to hold it to a photograph. Have a look, Mr. Clover. I, I suppose congratulations are in order. All because you made a lucky guess. Huh? <laughs> come, come. It was only a guess, was it not? You're saying this Joseph O'Donoghue was murdered? Well, anyway, the photographs, my analysis, quite bear you out. They do? Oh, yes. This one in particular. See the back of the skull. It's quite plain on this one that O'Donoghue was beaten to death. But not by a horse, by a weapon to make it look like a horse. A uh, horseshoe, I'll bet. But not of the type affected by thoroughbreds, by racehorses. More like one off a truck horse or one that pulls a milk wagon. Ergo, 
Considering the circumstances, my view is the man was murdered by a human wielding a heavy horseshoe. He... <sighs> Technical. Conrad speaking. Yes. Yes, he is here. Yes. Yes, I will tell him. Tell him. There is a woman waiting for you in your office, a Miss Alice Barnett. Lucky guess, huh, Mr. Clover? Yeah, I didn't even have a magnifying glass. Miss Barnett? Yes. We've been looking for you. Yes, I thought perhaps you were. I've come to give myself up. You're the one who called me, who told me Stephen Courtney had been murdered. Yes, I wrote you a letter, too. But there must be many things you want to ask me. There are. Why'd you hide? Because I was foolish. Because I was frightened. Because I, I, I don't really know. It's all mixed up. You see, Stephen and I were going to be married. Oh? As soon as he got well, it was all planned. It would have been exciting to be married to Stephen. Not for the money, just for Stephen. He was much older. Was he? I loved him. I didn't notice. I see. Why do you think he was murdered? Because it happened on my day off. Because I don't think he would have died if I'd been there. Where were you? In town, shopping, walking in the park, feeding the pigeons. In St. Patrick's for a while. It was quiet there. Restful. But no place we can check. No, I don't think so. On your days off, who took your place? We had an arrangement with the nurse's registry. I don't know who it was that day. It was usually a different nurse each week. I'll check. Where? On Madison at 49th. It's in the book. You think Stephen was murdered. In your opinion, who would have a reason? Whoever wanted all the money. The money Stephen would have settled on me as his wife. Nilla, Burl, O'Donoghue. But O'Donoghue has been murdered. That makes the jackpot bigger for the rest of you, doesn't it? It does. It means another 50000 for me. I don't know about the others. Where were you the night O'Donoghue was murdered? I had a movie. It's a feeble alibi, isn't it? I'm holding you, Miss Barnett, on suspicion of murder. Miss Barnett accepted it. She folded her hands in her lap and waited patiently until a man in uniform... Nudged his head through the door, got the signal from me, and gave the signal to her. Somehow I got the idea that as long as she would stay in jail, people would spend their time apologizing to her. It was a time for thinking about things. Too many people had been unconcerned about the death of Stephen Courtney. And in the murder of Joseph O'Donoghue, a man who heard voices there, that was the thing to think about. Somehow the first death necessitated the second. And in the matter of the nurse sent by the registry, that also needed looking into. I did. The receptionist said you were a policeman. That's right. You wish to hire a nurse? Maternity? Your wife? No, it's not that at all. We're conducting an investigation. And you want to see me? That's right. It's about one of your nurses. Hmm. One of the newer ones, I suppose. If you would have seen the crop that just graduated, that just registered with us... Some of them are pretty. I wouldn't know. I want some information about the nurse assigned to the case of Stephen Courtney. There were several of them. I'm afraid you'll have to help me if you want me to help you. The relief nurse assigned to Mr. Courtney on June 16th, the day he died. Facts. That's what I like. Now we shall see. Courtney. Courtney. You see, we have them cross-filed. Patient's name, nurse's name, doctor's name, name of the illness... Courtney, Courtney, J. Courtney, S. Samuel, Courtney S. Stephen. Here we are. I said, here we are. Tell me about it. I was never much good with charts. Each little line has a meeting all its own. As you see here, there is no line at all opposite the date of June 16. So we turn the chart over. Naturally. And we see the reason why, written in longhand. Uh... On June 16, there was a phone call from the Courtney household telling us not to send a replacement on that day. Oh? Who called and said that? Why? I wouldn't know. For information like that, you'd have to go straight to the source. Naturally. Perhaps if I'm more explicit, Mr. Clover, you'll understand. No one is to go into Miss Lilla's room. 
Not even the police. Those are your orders, Doctor? Precisely mine. Then you won't mind justifying them to the mere police. Justify? What presumption you people have. However, Miss Lilla is quite ill. Psychotic shock. Two people she loved very much are dead. She tried to stave off the inevitable by riding, gaiety, etc., etc., but it's, it's caught up with her. Natural in a woman of Miss Lilla's sensitive fiber. Yeah, I guess it is. Doctor, who gave the order that no replacement nurse was needed the day Stephen died? You? I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about. No nurse? Well, that's preposterous. Get out of here! Get out of here! Why, whatever could Psychotic that... Psychotic shock, huh? Sensitive fiber, huh, Doctor? You're a vicious girl. You're ugly and vicious and drunk. Oh, no, little sister. Don't throw anything else. It'll only bring on a relapse. Come on now, poor, sick little sister. Out of bed! <laughs> Leave her alone, Pearl. Are you all right, Lilla? Oh, are you all right, Lilla? <laughs> sure you're all right. Everybody thinks you're so sick, little sister. Shut up, Pearl. You can't say that to me. I am the master here now. You, Lilla, O'Donohue, old Steve, I crack the whip. And, and I... Uh, uh... Pearl. Pearl, are you hurt? He'll be all right. Just let him sleep it off. I'm sorry. Sorry you had to see us like this, Danny. It's all so ugly. So like they want us to be in the papers, isn't it? You're not really sick, are you? No, Danny, just tired. I fixed it up with Dr. Fulbright so they'd leave me alone. I I don't know doing it this way. (laughs) Maybe it proves I really am sick, you think? Lilla, listen to me. The day your father died, there should have been a nurse here. Why wasn't there? I don't know. We thought maybe things got all mixed up down at the nurse's registry. No one showed up. Because they were called and told not to. Who did that, Lilla? Someone called. I don't know. I don't know who it could have been, Danny. I told you I don't know. Quite a thing, I Willa. told you. Get out, get out. I can't take any more. <laughs> Look at it, Danny. The boys found it, huh? It's not pretty. A horseshoe nailed to a club. They dug it up back in the far turn of the Courtney track. Murder up in Danny? The thing that beat her down who to death? I'd say so, Totoglin. You know, it's not enough. I'm up to my elbows in the solution of this case with horses. But I had to go to the movies last night. For you. Comes the newsreel and more horses. The running of the Westfall Handicap. Nip and tuck, nip and tuck all the way home. Oh, Danny, that's Sun Prince. What a horse. Who? Sun Prince, the horse that almost won the Westfall Handicap. I'm telling you, I almost had heart failure. Why? Well, look, here was this horse, six lengths out in front. He stumbles, throws his jockey. This Westfall handicap, when was it run? Oh, Danny, I can see you are a man who is not smitten by the bobtails. This handicap was run last Saturday. Let's see, uh, June 16th. Gino, you went and did it. You put two and two together. And I got four, huh? Not only that, Gino, you got a murder. There was no hurry after that. I took my time driving out to the Courtney estate. I didn't even have to go to the house. I saw what I was looking for on a small knoll that overlooked the grounds. Lilla. Lilla holding the reins of a black stallion, standing against the early evening. A precise composition, sculpted to catch the eye. There was a flaw to it. Lilla had seen me coming, and the pose she'd struck was too steady, too pat. But it held until I walked to her, touched her arm. Oh. You've recovered, Lilla. Not really. Look at me. How do I look? The same. You've got some more clothes on than the last time I saw you. Outside of that, the same. I'm glad. But I need this. The quiet, the evening, riding. Do you want to ride with me, Danny? No. I expected you to come. I thought sometime soon you'd come back and use the gamut of let's ride together, Lilla, and I made it easy for you. Now I don't understand you at all. I'm trying to make up my mind about you. Oh, how can you? You're not really trying. Whether your murder becomes you or not. It made me ill for a while. You saw that. You're faking, Lilla. It's how you reacted to committing murder. Me? Your father's murder, O'Donohue's. Oh, you're a fool, Danny. Your father's murder, by attending him yourself instead of a nurse, by turning on the radio when his prize horse raced. The excitement when the horse stumbled stopped your father's heart and brought you a lot of money. Is that murder? Because a horse stumbled, because my father's heart stopped, eventually it'll happen to all of us. O'Donohue, because you were afraid of him. Because you really believed he heard voices. Because you thought one day your father's voice might tell Joseph who killed him. 
Ride with me, Danny? No. Come on, Lola. You're a fool. Sun Prince! Get off that horse. Up, Prince! Up! Kill him! Kill him, Prince! Kill him! The stallion reared high, pawed at the gathering darkness. His jowls flecked with foam. Then a hoof caught me, spun me. And again, I looked up from the ground. He was a monster, poised on his haunches. Prince! Suddenly he lost balance, fell to his back, recovered. And in an instant, he was a fleeting shadow. And I got to the girl, and I got to Lilla. She was small, huddled. She didn't move. Only in her eyes was there life. And it held briefly. And it stopped. <laughs> night turns into Broadway, the streets burst into fragments of electric flame, fling reflections hard into the shadows. It's a piece torn out of a jagged dream, the twisted concrete, the blare that ebbs, then screams again, the faces that dart and waver, and are lost forever. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Joan Banks, Mary Lansing, Florence Lake, Francis X. Bushman, Elliot Reed, and Junius Matthews. For more adventures with Danny Clover and Broadway is My Beat, CBS invites you to make a date with them for Monday evening, July 3rd. Yes, after tonight's broadcast, Broadway's My Beat moves to Mondays for the summer, starting July 3rd. Next week at this time, you'll hear the premiere broadcast of a new CBS show called Songs for Sale, featuring Jan Murray, Tony Bennett, and Ray Block's orchestra. Celebrities from the music world will meet songwriters with unpublished music on Songs for Sale, and you'll find it's full of fun and tunes of all kinds. Be sure to join us Monday, July 3rd, for the next broadcast of Broadway's My Beat. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where the Goldbergs are every Saturday night. The Columbia Broadcasting System. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Lyon. Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan investigator, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The House by the Sea. This is the way it started. I walked in the office about 11 o'clock that morning. It was a nice warm day, and I didn't have much on my mind. That's the trouble with nice days. You take a couple of easy breaths, open somebody's door, and it's just like peeling a wrapper off an atomic bomb. The lion was in his den, sitting behind his desk. He couldn't tell where he left off, and the desk began. He was talking to a girl with a flock of black hair. She was the kind you see driving a Cadillac convertible down Sunset Boulevard on hot Sunday afternoons. No wonder the lion's cigar was out. It was wet on both ends. Well, well, come in, Regan, come in. I was just about to call you, but now that you're here, it makes things simpler. Miss Carmen, this is Mr. Regan. How do you do, Mr. Regan? Mr. Lyon tells me you're just the man I want. You said the same thing to a mortician last week. 
He is the man I want, Mr. Lyons. Well, well, that's fine, Miss Carbon. I knew you'd be pleased. I'm very proud of Jeffrey. As long as I'm in the cast, how about a look at the script, huh? Miss Carmen is associated with the famous psychic consultant, Prince Keiru. I help the prince look into people's minds. Well, that ought to be real fun if all your customers are under six. <laughs> you don't believe in thought transference, Mr. Regan. Do you? I said I help the prince. <clears throat> prince Keiru sent Miss Carmen to retain an operator, Jeffrey. It's a very delicate matter, and I'm placing the entire case in your hands. Why didn't he come himself? Do you disapprove of me? I just want to know what's what. Well, Prince Cairo never appears in public. He prefers to spend his time in meditation and thought. Yeah. I handle all of his outside contacts. So, Jeffrey, you just drive on out to Prince Cairo's home in Ocean Town with Miss Carmen and speak to the prince. What kind of a retainer did he send? Uh, How much did you get? Now, see here, Regan, we don't discuss finances in front of clients. Oh, stop it, will you? This is another blind spot. You don't know what it's all about. All you know is she waltzed in here with a check, and you'd sell your grandmother to a glue factory for two bucks. How do I know I won't wind up being a patsy again? Is there any way I can reassure you? Buy me a battleship. Jeffrey, have I ever involved you in anything that I wouldn't undertake myself? Have I ever knowingly imperiled your life? Yeah. Jeffrey. Come on, lady. What's it all about? You work for the guy. Well, I really don't know. He was excited this morning, called me in, gave me this address, and told me to make arrangements. He must have told you something. He never tells me anything. As you say, I... I just work for him. Well? All right, I'm hired. Good, good. Now call me, Jeffrey. Call me if you run into any trouble. Well, I asked her how about lunch... She said no. I asked her about dinner. She said something that meant no, so I gave up. You know, it's like that sometimes. The flag's up, the meter's ticking, and you're not getting anywhere. But from a couple of things she told me, I got the idea she was doing more than just helping the prince read minds. Well, his place turned out to be a good hour from downtown Los Angeles, up 101. It was a couple of stories of glass and concrete leaning out over the ocean. It was high and dry and quiet up there. And you got a feeling you should be hearing things and feeling things when you looked down and saw that water banging around the bottom of the cliff. She unlocked the door, and a guy in a white turban and some pants that looked like oversized diapers and a pair of tennis shoes was standing there. He had a big curved knife hanging around his waist, and he put his hand on it when he saw me. Right this way, Mr. Regan. Who's he, the butcher? Oh, that's Telly. He works for the prince. Manservant. He's from India. Yeah, I'll bet the Indians were glad to get rid of him. <laughs> Tell he's harmless, tongueless, and he doesn't hear. I like you, Mr. Reed. Come in, come in. Ah, uh, Pelma, my dear. You've returned with spoils. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Mr. Regan, this is Prince Carew. Regan, ah, the lion's eye. I've heard of you, Mr. Regan. I'm honored. Sit down. That'll be all, Velma. Charming girl. Hmm? She handle all your outside contacts? Most efficiently. Except, of course, for matters that I must handle personally. What kind of matters? I'm in trouble, Mr. Regan, and I beg your assistance. That's well, all paid for. Correct. But there's a personal bonus in this for you. Why? Because, sir, uh, I want you to save my life. You look healthy to me. I am healthy, let me assure you. But my life has been threatened. Well, that would come under police business, wouldn't it? Normally. Uh, didn't Miss Carmen explain that this was a delicate matter? Yeah, she did. Why didn't she call the police? <laughs> I'm hardly in a position to ask the police for assistance, Mr. Regan. It is a delicate matter. Outside it says you're a mind reader, all right? What am I thinking now? That I'm a charlatan, a faker, and that I'm trying to hide something from him. That gets you the cigar. <laughs> It's been a very lucrative arrangement for the most part and very satisfactory. Except, of course, for the annoyance of having my life threatened. Who's the guy? It would be of no consequence if it were a man. It's a lady, Mr. Regan. A very beautiful and lovely creature. And she'd like nothing better than to see my carcass go out with the tide. Why does she want to kill you? A matter of confidence. Uh, suffice it to say that she is thoroughly capable of doing just that. How do you know? One, she is erratic, ill-tempered, ruthless. Two, she called me this morning and told me what she intended to do. She giving you a chance to reach for your gun? To reach for you, Mr. Egan. What do you want me to do? I feel the entire matter could be settled amicably if you were to call on her. 
inform her that you are my personal bodyguard and that you are here to protect my life. You think she'd go for that? I'm positive. How long have you been blackmailing her? What? Well, your racket might last six months or a year, but not long enough to pay for a place like this. The answer is blackmailing, huh? Okay, okay, okay. I should have told you. How do you do it? I can slip him into a trance. They spell a family secret or two. I push a buck that way. That's nice. If you want the mines red, I read them. Twenty-five bucks a parade. And shake down. The guy's got to eat. You put the squeeze on her. She's an actress. She was in on a deal at the studios. She wouldn't shake? At first, I just told her I had to have a larger fee. Then they come out with it, cold turkey. And she said she'd blow your head off. Yeah, she's the kind. I went wrong on this one. I'm in a spot. Who is she? Grace Nichols, movie actress. Ever heard of her? Redhead. Makes you want to go home and kick your wife downstairs if you got one. That good? Better. But she means this business about bumping me. And I won't look good dead. All right, where she live? Over in the Palisades. Here's her address. Uh, you going over there now? Yeah. Be careful. She isn't gunning for me. That isn't what I mean. There's a skinny boy there. He's nasty. No callers. Name of Tim Rogers. I remember that. I hope you can talk her out of it. I've been sweating. I don't want to shake her down. I just want to get a little sleep at night. I left him sitting there, scratching his bald head under his turban. He looked about as happy as a guy who just ate a Vaseline sandwich. Well... Grace's place was too big for a marble game and too small for football. I think I remember reading something about how she got it from her third husband. There was a big wire fence all around it and a sign every 15 or 20 feet telling you not to trespass. So I parked my car outside the driveway and walked up to the front door. A guy in a chauffeur's uniform was standing there. He looked like a razor blade with arms. He gave me the fish eye and blew smoke in my face and kind of nudged me with his shoulder. Move on, Pilgrim. No handouts here. I came to see Grace Nichols. Yeah. I got business with her. Yeah. So tell her I'm here. Blow. You always like this, or did you miss lunch today? I don't know who you are, Pilgrim, but I don't like you. Beat it. I know you. There's something about a guy in a lineup. Yeah? He memorizes real easy. Copper. Investigator. Private or city, I don't care. You all smell the same. This isn't hunting season. You always carry a thirty-eight. Does it show? Maybe you got a broken rib. A real funny guy. I met all kinds of funny guys. Drift. I said I wanted to see her. And I said she wasn't in. All right, I'll tell you once more. I got business with it. So do a couple of hundred other guys. Watchdog? Ah, you're getting smart. You weren't. What kind of a crack is that? I want to see her, I'm going to see her. Trick I learned a long time ago. Shoot a guy in the knee and he'll never walk straight again. You ever done it? Oh, yeah. That's how I learned. Ow. That's one I learned, baby. Well, I might have to get a new chauffeur. You looking for a job? I already got one, lady. Timmy's going to be awfully upset when he finds out what happened to him. When someone works for me, they have to be perfect. Want his job? They wouldn't let me in. I'll let you in. You, uh, do that kind of thing often? When I have to. I suppose you have a name. It's Regan. I'm a private investigator. All right, Mr. Regan, you've ruined a perfectly good chauffeur and bodyguard, and you're in my house. What have we got to talk about? A guy named Cairo. The prince? Must we talk about him? He thinks you're dangerous stuff. So do a lot of people. Tell me, Mr. Regan, what do you think? About what? Me. Right now or when I'm a couple of feet away? Right now. Look, remember, I just got here. I know. You must have a first name. What is it? Jeff. Oh, Jeff, we'll get along. It's in the card. Pretty fast deal. I like it this way. Fast. Might be a bum deck. Never mind. Deal. That's the bell. How much time between rounds? Uh, well, you know me better. Hello? Yes? Yes, right here. You know a man named Lion, Jeff? Uh-huh. He seems to be roaring. Give it to me. Yeah. Regan, is that you? Well, now, how do you figure it? Now, don't be smart. Who's the name who answered the phone? Our client's friend. I think she's a friend of yours now, or maybe you have been doing some road work. Did you have something to say, or is this the day you turned scoutmaster? I'm busy. Well, you can stop being busy, lover. It's all off. 
Don't tell me you're passing up a fee. I'm passing up nothing. Prince Carol called me ten minutes ago and told me to forget the whole thing, and that's what I'm telling you. How'd you know I was here? The prince told me, so it's all over. Finished. Forget it. I've already started something. I don't care what you started. I just remember. You finish it on your own time and expense sheet. <laughs> you look worried, Jeff. Anything I can do? I'm called off. You mean you're out of a job? I got one. Remember, you put my bodyguard out of commission. You owe me something. Well, Tim, boy, he'll come around. I don't want Tim anymore. I want you. Uh. <laughs> I'll get you a drink. We can talk about it. Carew told me that Tim was a pretty good boy. You can fill his shoes. Come here and get your drink. Now, tell me about 9 o'clock tonight. we get dark. I got a new dress. I think you'll like it. I probably would. The place above Malibu, we could have dinner and listen to some music. I want to be with you, Jeff. That deal's fast again. I don't care. I don't care. I just decided something, Jeff. I'm going to like being with you. I'm going to like it a lot. Well, she didn't want me to go. But I was thinking about the prints and the way everything looked. I told her I'd see her that night. I was just climbing into my car when Tim Rogers, her ex-number one boy, stepped out from the gate. I waited for him to walk over. You're pretty good with your women, Regan. You look lonely, Timmy. Somebody stole your popsicle? Bum joke, Regan. I've been waiting to talk to you. You were so quiet in the house, I didn't want to make any noise. Any better here? You came out champ this afternoon. But you won't even make the prelims next time. You got something to say? Stay away from her. You're shaking. You need a drink. Stay away from her, Regan. I've been with her too long. Known her too long to take the bounce from a two-bit gum heel. Mm, goodbye. I'm not finished yet. That's your version. Now get your foot off that running board, punk, or I'll take it with me. I left him standing in the middle of the driveway. If I'd have waited another minute, he'd have been crying. I stopped off and had some barbecued ribs at a drive-in out on Sunset. It was just getting dark when I got to my place. I had company. It was Velma Carmen, Prince Carew's right-hand man. She was sitting on the edge of my sofa. Her back was as stiff as a filing cabinet, and there was a little ring of white around her lip. She looked like she'd just been measured for a coffin. There was a twenty-five automatic sitting in her lap. I've been waiting for you, Mr. Wick. I asked the janitor to let me in. Yeah? He was very nice about it. I told him I was associated with one of your clients. Yes, I told him I was associated with Ryan O'Connor. Did you know that Prince Carol was my husband? Since when? Oh, a long time now, a long time. Not many people know that. Is that what you came here to tell me? No. I... I came to tell you that you don't have to worry anymore. That none of us have to worry anymore. You mean you're calling me off the case? That's it. That's exactly it. I'm calling you off the case. Well, well I've already been called off. My office phoned me when I was over at her house. First, Nichols? Yeah. Then it was about her? Yeah. <laughs> well, then, we don't have to worry anymore, do we? No. She's very pretty, isn't she? I've seen her many times. I think she's quite pretty. I, I could hardly blame the prince. I could hardly blame him at all. What are you getting at? Of course, all the others were pretty, too. Where'd you get that gun? Bought it for thirty dollars. Let me see it, huh? Oh yes, I brought it here so I could show it to you. I, 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 I paid thirty dollars for it. I paid thirty dollars. I'd imagine the air would be cleaner in there, don't you? What are you talking about? I mean, it's really very humane they come. It's just like sitting down and never waking up. I've read all about it. You just walk in and sit down, and if you don't try to hold your breath, you, you go to sleep, don't you? You've met murderers before, Mr. Regan. Do I make a good murderer? Do I make a good murderer? <laughs> stop it. Stop it, will you? You trying to tell me you killed him? Oh, Mr. Regan, that's why I came here. I shot him. I walked up behind him and I put the gun close to his back and pulled the trigger. It don't make such a great deal of noise, do you think? I left him sitting there in his house by the sea and he looks very much alive. Only... Honey, he's not alive at all. Now answer me. Now answer me. Do I make a good murderer? Do I make a good murderer? <laughs> you 
We're listening to the story of the house by the sea. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. They're still available for qualified nurses. Yes, the Army Nurse Corps Reserve still has commissions available. If you are a graduate registered nurse between the ages of 21 and 45 you may be eligible for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps section of the regular officer's reserve. To find out if you do qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to the story of the House by the Sea and Jeff Regan, investigator. After she got through, she settled down to a slow, even kind of a giggle that started somewhere around her shoelaces and didn't get past her knee. It was one of those things that gives you a feeling like somebody's standing in back of you with a red-hot iron ready to press your pants before you get them off. Now, she wasn't going to do any more talking, so I went downstairs and brought back a doctor friend of mine named Sammy Wing. He brought his little black bag with him and gave her a shot of something. And she wilted like last night's orchid and went to sleep on my couch. Sammy began talking. Some playmate. Wish I'd have been here for the party. I had four appendectomies and one broken leg today. So they alive. Well, how is she? You know her better than me. No, is she going to be all right? Well, she'll wake up in five or six hours and I want some water. And then what? She might ask you what happened or it might start all over again, whatever it was. By the way, what was it? Well, I found her here when I got home. I should find something like this. She said she killed an ex-client of mine. Oh, maybe I'm lucky at that. What does all the past tense mean? I was called off the case. Oh, nice. It's all clean. No clients to protect. Is there a corpse someplace? I don't know, Sammy. Call the police. They'll find out. And then you and me can go out and get a drink. She said she used this gun. Smell it, Sammy. It hasn't been fired. The safety catch is still on. She's pretty and she's nice. And I'll bet she looks like a million bucks in a bathing suit. But if I'd have met her within the last three hours, I'd have run for help. Call the police. Is that professional? This is acute hysteria. The kind that pops off guns and pops off people, and there's a lot of things they can't remember later on. Call the police. What about the gun? Other guns. Call the coroner while you're at it. Tell him to go out there with some DOA forms. He'll use them. Or will you stay here with her and like it back? Corpse hunt? Just an idea. Hitler had an idea. The odds were against him. You got about as much chance as a three-legged horse in the Kentucky Derby. She's bit somebody, and she's told you about it. I want to make sure. What do they do when a private eye walks in and messes up a nice, clean murder? Sammy, will you stay? Had any bourbon around here? Yeah. Okay, take your time. Maybe both of us will get our pictures in the paper. I left him with a kind of a soft smile on his face like he had some inside information on Tuesday's winter at Del Mar. Well, it was 9.30 by the time I got there, and it was dark enough to give a ghost that creeps. It was different, too. Maybe it was the fog. I used that ring of keys I'd taken from her purse. It smelled dry and funny inside. It was real quiet, like somebody was waiting for the world to fall apart. I clicked on my flashlight, and I walked down the long hall to his office. He was there, just like she said. There were three holes in the front of his shirt, but it wasn't the laundry's fault. I spotted a 38 on the floor by his hand. I broke it and three cartridges came out. It was the right gun for the job. It was pretty messed up. While I was standing there trying to figure Velma Carmen's story, the lights came on. A fat man wearing a sheriff's star was standing by the switch. There was a taller man in a brown overcoat next to him. They both looked like they'd just finished dinner. Scavenger hot, son. You don't talk, Charlie. Ain't much for him to say, is there, Cap? Guess not. Well, son? Well, it looks like you're going to be calling me names. What do you like best? Killer, murderer, or slayer? The papers use slayer a lot. I don't like any of them. Kind of breezy for a hot boy, ain't you? Mind giving me a name? It's Regan. I'm a private detective. Hmm. It's Regan. He's a private detective, Cap. Yeah. Got a card or something with you, son? Yeah. Yeah, he's right. For the international. Lion still there? Yeah. Who's that? An old bum I used to know. Regan, why do you go around killing people? The lion will be mad. Look, this is a fix. Now, why do you want to say a thing like that? Somebody tip you. 
Phone call a little while ago. Huh? Funny kind of a voice, a whisper. Said we'd find a stiff up here, but didn't say we'd find you. You're extra. Look, I just came here to see what it was all about. Same thing we did. Only we come up with a suspect and a corpse. No cop could ask for anything better. Charlie, better call a coroner. Ocean Town, just a small place where you can only me and Charlie around. We borrow from the county when we get something like this. I can find you a real answer in an hour. You let me and Charlie worry about that. You look good enough for the time being. All right, son. Let's go. I had as much chance as an elephant in a tea room, and if those two locked me up and booked me. So I leaned back into his gun and spun around and knocked his wrist down. He pulled the trigger, and by that time I flicked the light switch and was out the door. I didn't run for my car. I cut across the driveway and doubled back up the hill. I could hear him yelling and shooting out in the dark. I hailed a cab about five blocks away, and he took me to the place above Malibu. I found her in a booth with a piano player. She was wearing one of those black strapless things, and it was worrying a couple of ball-headed guys sitting at the bar. You're late, Jeff. We said nine o'clock. I had three drinks all alone. You want me to get mad, or are you going to catch up? How long have you been here? You sound like you're out of the mood. I thought we were going to look at the stars together. How long have you been here? It's nine o'clock. What's the matter? I've been working tonight. Well, it's after hours now. Tell me how you like my new dress. It's the right color, but the wrong cut for a funeral. I haven't read the obituaries today. It'll be in tomorrow's paper, only it'll make the front page. Have a drink. Let's wait for tomorrow. Your friend was killed tonight. What friend? Kru. He was no friend of mine. I told you that. So did he. Car smash up, or did he fall off his house? 38. We didn't talk about him this afternoon. Let's not start now. Look, two cops in Ocean Town are kind of crowding me. They think I'm going to take a good picture. Is that why you're late? It's a murder rap, lady. We should have had dinner together. They'll be knocking down your door in the morning. Why, darling? Because you threatened to kill him, because he hired me to call you off. Oh, wait a moment, Jeff. We've been having fun up there now. Who told you that? Why did you think he sent me over today to sell magazines? I never found out you were called off. I suppose he hired you to scare me. Jeff, we're old friends now. I can tell you a family secret. I know about him blackmailing you. And that puts you ahead of me for the cops. Did you do it? I don't know. Did you? What he told you don't sound right. What does sound right? I went to him one day and put him in a trance. Only I used scotch. Found out what he was doing and how I was doing it, so I turned the tables. It was good, clean fun, but expensive for him. You've been draining him? I thought that's why you came today. That's why I had Timmy around. Well, some of this is beginning to make change. If he was your meal ticket, then you got an alibi. I don't feel like stars anymore, Jeff. Let's go over to my place and talk. On the way over, she didn't have much to say, and I couldn't think of anything. I was all too mixed up. If she'd really been shaking him down, then she figured out. And the girl back in my apartment figured in. Only she had the wrong gun. Then there was a little business that I'd have to explain with the Ocean Town cops. Well, when we turned in the driveway, I stopped figuring. Tim Rogers, the man with the guns, was there standing on the porch. Hello, gorgeous. I've been waiting to see you. You're home late. I thought I fired you. Still tramping with this tramp, huh? I thought you'd be sick of him by now. For once, I'm glad to see you, Tim boy. That sounds cozy, but I don't want to see you. I know where your 38 is. You're wrong. It's her 38. And it's got her prints on it. Jeff, he's making it look bad for me. Ask me. Ask him what he's doing here, will you? Just in for a showdown, Angel. You're tagged for his murder. They'll want you. I fixed it good. I can fix it so you can get away. How? A friend of mine shutting off at Pedro. Four o'clock. To go all over the world. Jeff, if all of this is straight, I'm in a spot. Relax. This guy never did anything right. Tell me how I'm wrong. All right, that tip to the Ocean Town cops was wrong. Trying to pile up a scare on me was wrong. Killing Cairo was wrong. And this clinches it. Yeah. Well, that's where you're twisted, Pilgrim. I got a warrant out for you right now. Plugging a murder suspect is something they'll thank me for. You said her prints were on that gun. They'll find that out in the morning. And how was I to know? Just happened to hear on the radio they were looking for you tonight. I see you, I plug you. Everybody will be sorry, but it'll be manslaughter and suspended. I worked it once in Toledo. What do you say, Angel? Do I plug him and meet you somewhere in two weeks? Let me have a smoke. Let me think it over. Sure. Sure, go ahead. Angel. Well, the gun's empty now. I carried this for three years. I never used it. He deserved to die, didn't he? Didn't he, Regan, didn't he? I don't know, lady. You knew him better. Well, 
It unwound like red thread in the Levi factory. Grace Nichols had been putting the shake on the prints. He got tired of it and called me in and told me his phony story so he'd have a good self-defense angle when he finally got around to shooting her some afternoon. He had Tim planted there to keep me from really seeing her. Oh, it was a nice idea, only I bounced Tim and got inside. And then Tim made a phone call and the lion jerked me before I had a chance to compare notes with her. I guess Tim went kind of crazy seeing how well we got along together and he figured Grace would do anything if she was wanted for murder. So he killed the prince and made her the patsy with those fingerprints. She'd handled the gun before, see. But then I had my caller, Velma Carmen, the prince's wife. She went kind of crazy, too, when she walked in and found him dead. It took three doctors a couple of weeks to tell her what really happened. When I told it all to the lion, he was mad at first, but then he saw Grace Nichols' picture in the paper. He asked just one question. What was I doing at Grace's place all afternoon? I didn't even bother to answer him. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS same time next week for hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by E. Jack Newman, produced by Sterling Tracy. The role of Grace Nichols was played by Betty Lou Gerson, David Ellis was Tim Rogers, Lorene Tuttle was Velma Carmen, and Marvin Miller was Prince Carew. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. 4,000 of them, if they wish, may choose active duty. All nurses who receive reserve commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. The educational opportunities offered the nurse by the Army Medical Department will be of great advantage to her in her work. Don't wait. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card now for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Original music for this program is by Dick Aron. Jeff Regan, investigator, is heard every Saturday at 9.30 over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan, investigators stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Lady with No Name. The next time you're out for a drive, pick up Olive Street along about the 700 block. You can't miss it. It's a big building made out of white granite. The Cosmopolitan Building. The man who built it is doing a long run up at San Quentin for draft. Anthony J. Lyon, the guy I work for, rents an office in that building. International Detective Bureau, Suite 308. A couple of rooms with a connecting wastebasket. The Lion has the only desk in the office and a typewriter that Remington dropped from their catalog back in 1915. Well, I walked in last Tuesday at 10 a.m. The office was full of taboo. She was a tall girl, very pretty, wearing slacks and a coat that must have set the mink population back 20 years. But she still looked cold, like she'd never get warm again. The Lion had one arm around her shoulders... He knew by this time that coat was the real article. There wasn't any music, but he didn't seem to mind. Come in. Not much room to dance. We got trouble. She's your date. This is one of my operators, Mr. Regan. How do you do, Mr. Regan? Now, tell him exactly what you just told me. Yes. It's all right. May I sit down? I feel strange. Of course. Come here. Thank you. Get this, Regan. 
I don't know where I live. I don't know my name. Yeah? I want you to find out who I am. You heard that, Regan? Heard what? It's a verbal contract. She just hired us. Oh, you're out of your mind. And you're a witness in case anything comes up. Please. Please, I, I don't feel well. I, I'm perfectly willing to pay you. You'll just find out who I am. Well, look, lady, there's a cop on every corner. I couldn't go to the police. You got here. Quit pushing her. This is our case. I was afraid. I found this in my purse. Mm -hmm. 32 caliber, Smith and Wesson. It's been fired. There's three gone. What are you doing with that, miss? I don't know. It's just been used by you. I don't know. Well, where'd you get it? I just found it in my purse. Remind you of anything? No. You take it. Now, look, miss, I know you don't feel well, but there are certain questions you'll have to answer. I just want you to find out who I am. It's terrible this way. It's... Oh. Ain't it? Yeah, you always had a way with women. Help me bring her around so she can sign that contract. She hasn't got a name, remember? We'll give her a name. Jane Doe's good enough. I guess so. What do you mean? She's dead. <laughs> The lion just stood there. He looked sad, like a water buffalo caught in a drought. Well, when she rolled onto the floor, her purse went with her. It cracked open, and the stuff inside spilled out on the rug. There wasn't anything to tell us who she was. No comb, no makeup. Nothing but a house key and a receipt for a cab ride dated that day. There wasn't even a label in that mink coat. Nothing to go on. I might as well have tried to walk to Catalina. I told the lion to phone the coroner's office and... I hopped over to the cab company. They told me that the receipt came from meter 212, driven by a man named Servi. He worked the call box at Hollywood and Western. He was a little guy. I figured he got the job because they ran out of big uniforms. They double-crossed him on that cap. If it wasn't for his ears, he'd have been wearing a snood. Uh, uh, sorry, bud. I got a fare. Where is he? Under the floorboards? I got a fare. Yeah, you said that. Where? Uh, in there, eating. Your flag's up. I'll pull it down. Happy? You, Johnny Serby. Whose nose are you? They told me I'd find Serby in this hack. Who told you that? Cab company. They don't know any more than you do. Now, look, if you... I... never mind the Nick, jokes. Just give me the straight out. lines. Nix, will you? Cut out this company uniform. Well, they're going to get it back if you don't open up. Get it out. All right. Louise pulled out three weeks ago. She took all the furniture with her. You can collect from her. I'm not the finance company. No? Here. Oh, private people, huh? Well, who's getting caught? Did you carry a brunette in a mink coat sometime this morning? Maybe. Where'd you drop her? Downtown, six and grand. Where'd she live? Ask her. I'm cruising in from the fair. Where'd you pick her up? In Burbank, Hollywood Way, and Kensington. The fair's in Pomona. You took the long way. I like to drive. It's company gas. Yeah. She was nice, real nice. You know what I mean? Real class. Okay. Ah, oh, wait a minute, will you? Yeah. We didn't go anywhere, but time's up. That's five even. Fast meter. Hey, you want me to tell you about the guy? What guy? Tall, dark haired, uh, brown sport coat, movie type. Go on. He was chasing her when she caught my cab. He looked like a match. Was it? Ask him. Is that all? She got in, we drove away. Right here. Thanks. No tip? Like you said, we didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Ever have somebody drop a key in your lap and say, go find a door? Well, I drove out to Burbank and I began looking around for a good lock near Hollywood Way in Kensington. I figured that key I'd found in Jane Doe's purse would have to fix something. I made my letter on the 10th house. There was a for sale sign on it. I didn't see anybody around, so I unlocked the door and it went in. Outside of something that smelled like tar and kerosene, the place was empty. I was just about to turn around and leave when a brown sport coat slid into the room. Movie type. When he walked over to me, I knew he drank the right kind of scotch. Gonna use your GI loan? Just looking. You gotta buy it. It's a steal. No, the lady won't like it. Your wife? Girl in a mink coat. You make that kind of dough? She got it from somebody else. Uh, you Hollywood guys. Where'd you get the key? I borrowed it. She won't need it. What's your name? I didn't have a chance to ask her. Oh, you're kind of slow, aren't you? 
sometimes. You'll see how fast you can hit the door. No, I just got here. Yeah, now you're leaving. Cab driver says he knows you. I'm friendly. I talk to everybody. Said you were doing a chase scene. Could be. She was pretty. They all look good in mink. It's not the house. What do you want? Well, we could start with a name. It's Dameron. Not enough. That's all you get, wise punk. Now beat it. You'll give more at homicide. I don't see any bad. Now look, we can play games some other time. A cab driver put the finger on you as the last man to see that girl in mink. You talk like she's dead. You called it. Too bad. There's a lot of fur coats in L.A. and a lot of guys chasing them. You got nothing. That's what they always say downtown, but you'll talk. I don't figure on leaving, but you're going on your way right now. Better open a window, Dameron. You're sweating. Keep talking, sunshine, or we'll make one in that far wall. You got help in the back room? Quit scratching around. It doesn't mean anything to you. It didn't before she pulled a fade in my office, but it does now. Out by a new carpet. I don't know who let you out, but it's bedtime. You've been talking about a dead girl who doesn't even know her name. Now go back and finish your dream. You got all the questions. Now let's fill in the answers. I'm fresh out of box taps. There's a door used. No, not yet. I'm going to get what I came for. Little man, that's it. Promise. You're out of condition, Dameron. You're in a great position to throw that line. Oh, you got talent, mister, but it's still raw. Come here. Now, come on, get up. I'm not through. That's where you're wrong. It's a big luger. Makes the same size hole. All right, punk, you got a name? A lot of them for you. Oh. School isn't out yet. Just answer. It's Regan. Okay, Regan, let this sink in. Forget you ever saw any dame in a mink coat. Forget you ever saw me. That won't be hard. Look, Junior, you just lost the round. Now remember what I told you. Have a memory lapse. Is that clear? You made your point. Now blow. You always use a Luger? For close work. Well, then that 32 doesn't fit. What 32? The one that the girl was carrying. You got it? No, I gave it a homicide. Good, good. It saves me a trip downtown. You're not worried? No, I'm very happy. Huh? Today's my birthday. That's the reason you're walking out of here. The whole thing looked as phony as an undertaker in a white derby. Well, I went back to the office and the lion was sitting there with a bottle of beer and a sandwich that looked like a couple of end tables. He stopped chewing when I came in. What's her name? It's still Jane Doe. You've been gone four hours. Movie? They don't open till noon. All right, where you been? A vacant house in Burbank. I trailed it up from that cab receipt. What'd you find? A guy named Dameron. What'd he say? Nothing. Shy? Tough. That way you got the egg on your chin? He was nervous. When you gonna learn to be nice to people? He had a gun, too. Tell me more. That's all. Yeah. I like this. It's got possibilities. All right, take off your saddle. The race is over. When the coroner's boy showed up, they told me why she dropped. That's easy. She died. It's poison. Was that an autopsy? Something about her color. It isn't official, but we can work on it. Suicide? Murder. Why murder? They feed themselves iodine and sleeping pills, but they don't take aliseed. What's that? A hot drug with a petrol base. It burns. Homicidal handler. Sure, homicidal handler. Only we got things to do. We got a stake in this. You made her the client. We're going to give her service, dead or alive. What does Wendetti say? I don't pay Wendetti. We find out who she is. All right, you try. Her picture shows up in the paper. She drops dead in our office. How's it make us look? They sent in the first string when she died. You'll clear this up before homicide does. They'll lift your license. We won't need it. What do you mean? I still got Exhibit A. What? Smith and Wesson, 32 caliber. You're withholding evidence? I forgot to give it to them. All right, now give them a call and tell them. That was five hours ago. You make the call. All right, I'll tell homicide. They'll give me a break. That's what Dillinger thought. Give me the gun. They've got Jane Doe's prints on the wire. They'll have the answer in ten hours. Cut that in half, Regan, and we've won the championship. You'll have to give the cup back. You cheated. When I left the lion, he looked happy, like a guy who just figured the mystery melody. I had the gun with three bullets gone that Jane Doe had been carrying in her purse, the lion in back of me, the police department in front. That left me about as much chance as a blue peanut on a wedding cake. I knew that if I walked into homicide with that 32, they'd hold on to me like a season pass. I had to find out who it was registered to, so I gambled and I went down to the city hall. I went in the Temple Street entrance, room 11, personnel division. If I pegged it right, I could get the dope on that gun without getting involved. I figured wrong. Can I help you? You in charge here? Lunchtime, yeah. All right, whose name matches these numbers? Small arms? Yeah. What authority? I just bought it. Want to know if it's clean? Yeah. Caliber and make? 
It's uh, 32, Smith and Wesson. Okay. Smith and Wesson, huh? 32, 32, 32. Yeah, right here. Got the weapon with you? No, why? No rule. No gun, no vital. I got it. Here. Okay. Purchased August 1929, factory re-blue job 1931, owned by American Trust and Loan, permitted to Dale W. Curtis. Thanks. I'll have to ask you to wait. Why? No rule. Got to run them all through ballistics. Anything special? Maybe. Found a guy floating around Silver Lake this morning, full of 32s. Who? Working on it. Have to ask you to wait. No, I can't. I haven't had lunch yet. Stick around. We may invite you. I don't like your food. Oh, don't worry. You can have anything you want the last day. You're listening to the story of the lady with no name. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. If you are a graduate registered nurse, please listen carefully to this important message. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to the story of the lady with no name and Jeff Regan, investigator. There it was. The clerk took Jane Doe's gun and closed the door marked ballistic. I figured he couldn't be too sure about whether that thirty-two would match up, but I didn't want to wait around to find out. He left the vitals card on the counter. I spun it around and I got the address of Dale W. Curtis. It turned out to be a one-story frame that stood in the way of the new freeway they're building. The movers were just jacking it up and I caught the last carload of people leaving. They told me that Curtis hadn't lived there for seven years. They did give a number over on Manzanita off Fountain, where I might be able to find him. It was an apartment on the second floor. From the looks of the place, it figured that the OPA had a fight on their hands. I rang the bell and waited. I don't know whether it was a lighting effect in that dim hallway, but when she opened that door, I expected to see those thousand ships slide down the ways again. She was uh, wearing some kind of a filmy thing that made a spider's web look like burlap. She had a voice that stole over you like a pint of Irish ale. I didn't expect you until tonight. I broke my watch. Come on in. I'll see if I can fix it. I'm great for the swift movement. Yeah, it shows. My name's Marlo Curtis. I want to see your husband. He's not here. Do you expect him? No. Where is he? Up north. Business trip? Yeah. He sold out. Oh, what kind of business? Ask the warden. Huh? The El Curtis is in the prison cemetery. Been there five years. Sorry. Don't say You deserved it. You're going to drown in those tears. I'm still burning. The right color, wrong occasion. Soda? What? Just think. How do you want? Well, you're mixing. Now, isn't that better? I don't know. It's my first drink. You'll get another. The weather's changed. No, not in here. You're quick. Must have a good straight man. Yeah, you. You get top billing. What's your name? Regan. Detective. Maybe. Arrest me. Hmm. Sergeant? I'm due for a promotion. You'd make a better lieutenant. Come here. If I had anything to do with you, the captain. Yeah, sure, until you snag your colonel. You're nasty, too. Did I pay for my drink? Get out. Tell me about this nail file. You got that out of my purse. I had one hand free. You two-bit shadow artist. Now get out. Hello? Yes, he's here. Yeah? Uh, this you, Regan? Uh, you don't know me. I've been lucky so far. They should never have taken that gun down to the city hall. You get around. You shouldn't be up there in Marlowe's apartment. You gonna run my life? Now, I told you what you shouldn't do. 
Here's what you're gonna do. Look, Buster, don't crowd me. You're gonna forget all about today. The girl forgot a lot of things today and she dropped dead. Got the idea. Suppose I don't buy it. You want a partner for that gun. Dameron give you the nickel? He gave me a dime. I got one more call to make to the city hall. All right. Suppose I lay off. I got something for my piggy bag. You're no petty girl. Hang it up and get out. You know, Regan, I could have really liked you. Yeah, well, that's why I'm scared. Well, you can see how things were. I felt like a short girl with a new look. No matter how I tried to break it down, I figured to cop the leading role. A Jane Doe walks in her office and drops dead. She has a gun that probably talked to a couple of people. A cab ride receipt takes me to Bill Dameron, a guy with a talkative gun. I end up in Marlowe Curtis' apartment for a lot of punctuation marks. Everybody talks but the people. Well, I knew I'd have to begin to move before homicide tagged me, so I hopped down to the Times and I checked the morgue file. I pulled the clips on Dale W. Curtis. Marlowe didn't lie. He was dead. The old papers didn't mean anything, but the banner headline on the night final put one piece of the jigsaw in position. I told about a treasury department agent named Shields. I found him in Silver Lake. He'd been shot three times with a thirty-two. Now I knew where Marlowe's nail file fit. I started to leave when I caught the last paragraph. It said, Unidentified man turns in the murder weapon. Police are seeking his whereabouts. Yeah. This is Lyon. I've been calling your place for two hours. I just got home. Gonna give yourself up? It was your idea. Who's Jane Doe? I don't know. Why? You got a badge, you try. Look, Regan. You're hot. Every prowl car in town's looking for you. Yeah. Better start filling this in or they're gonna get you. Now listen, big shot, you're in this too. <laughs> Not from where I sit. I gave you the gun. Now send me some dough over here. I don't have enough for your pay. I need some money for cab fare. No petty cash in the office. Don't lie to me. What about that money you got out of Jane Doe's purse? What do you mean? She could have never got up there without cab money. Well, she must have lost it in the elevator. Look, I haven't got time to play games. Now send it over. How much do you need? Ten bucks won't break you. Where you going, to Yuma? I'll expect it in an hour. Goodbye. Hello? Hello, Dameron. Always like your door. I wouldn't stop you. You'd crawl under. Come on in, fellas. It's drafty out there in the hall. You got a parade permit? Rodney, say hello to Regan. I already did on the phone. What about Slim? Hi, you broken. His name's Regan, isn't it, Big Mouth? Oh. Sitting right next to Rodney when he made that call to you was perfectly clear to me. Wasn't it clear to you, Big Mouth? Oh. Rodney told you to lay out, but you just had to get out of that newspaper, didn't you, Big Mouth? Yeah. Rodney, Slim. Slim on the bed. All right, my go. Now, Regan, once more, they got a gun downtown. They got a dame and her prints are going to fit it. They got a stiff and that gun's going to fit him, okay? And I'll lay you off. Uh, you said that before. Rodney Slim, hold his hands. <laughs> now, Regan... I know you understand me. I said all the right words. Maybe my punctuation's bad. Lay off. <coughs> Period. Lay off. <coughs> Period. All right, leave him in the bed. He's on the floor. That's fine. Now he won't have to change his bedding. <coughs> Dameron was good. When I got up, my face looked like a relief map of Death Valley. He was wearing a signet ring. He left out all the water holes, but the mountain ranges were rising fast. I figured I was safe now. That guy in the personnel office had never recognized me. Well, I was standing in the kitchen giving myself the cold water treatment when somebody knocked. I figured that was a switch, so I opened the door. It was that hacky, Johnny Servey. He had an envelope in his hand. Yeah? Hi. Remember me? You give up cab work? Oh, I found this under your door here. Yeah. Thanks. Football? What do you want? Well, you asked me about a dame in a mink coat today. Now, I'm asking you. I don't run a meter. Well, I figure all this might help. All of what? Well, I get to thinking about it, see? And then I think some more. All right, come on. Get to the point, will you? Uh, you played a hand. Now I'm playing a hand. Go on. Well, dames mean trouble. And mink coats, they mean double trouble. Yeah. Is it worth five if I remember another guy? Maybe. Well, he's all over the papers now. i seen him. Who? Shields, the guy they fished out of Silver Lake. Where? He was out in Burbank this morning, early. Thought you were at Pomona. I was, I was, but... Well, I guess I wasn't exactly cruising. I, I got a friend who's out that way. Know what I mean? When was this? An hour before I pick her up. 
This guy they find in Silver Lake is walking around that house. I'm looking for a store for oh, breakfast. I'll let you eat. Well, that's it. After breakfast, I hop in my cab, and that's when I pick up the name of Mink. Why'd you bring me all this? Oh, I figure we got somewhere this time. Now do I get my tip? I gave him his five bucks, and he left. Then I opened the envelope he'd handed me. It was the money that I'd asked the lion to send over. Two five-dollar bills. Well, I looked at it, put it back in the envelope, stuck it in my pocket. So far, all I could see that I got out of this thing was a good beating from Dameron. The question still stood, who was Jane Doe? Well, I knew my next move. I wanted to hop over to the Treasury Department and see if my two matched their two, and maybe between us we could come up with four. I didn't have much to go on. It was just a hunch. I took Marlowe's nail file with me, and I walked in the front door of the federal building. I showed my license to the chief agent. That's right, one of our agents, Shields. They have the murder weapon down at Homicide. I know. All we want is the man that pulled the trigger. Well, I got an idea. I'll listen. What's wrong with these five-dollar bills? You can't spend them. I figured that. Where'd you get them? How bad are they? Lousy paper, rotten ink, terrible engraving job. You could do better with a rubber stamp outfit. Where'd you get them? Any of these been floated? We picked up a few. Were Shields working on it? That's as much as I can give you. Now, where'd you get them? Well, the girl faded out in our office this morning. She was carrying them? Yeah. What's her name? That's what I gotta find out. Uh, Jane Doe, huh? Well, that's what we called her. So there's a paper. Hmm? Same girl? Yeah, that's her. Any identification? Not yet. They've been running a picture for hours. Well, I'm short on time. You're the guy. Wait a minute before you hit that button. Yeah? Your addition's good, but you haven't got all the figures. Don't make book on that. You're the number one boy with me. You think I'd solo in here? You might. No, no. I got an ace. All right, so you keep your nails clean. Now look at it. It's a nail file. They cut dum-dums out of shields. Who told you? A second story apartment with a deep voice. How did you know? You're holding the file that cut the grooves. You use it? I can give you the guy who did. Dum Dum makes a big hole. Half shields. Move the tip of a 32 slug, it'll spread from here to Kansas when it hits. You can do it with a nail file. Maybe. Where's that apartment? No, I'm too close to quit now. I can't let you go alone. I got a big car. Well, before we go, mister, if no one belongs to that file, you belong to the gun. In that case, I'll have a lot of time to do my nails. Well, it was a long shot, but that's all I had. The agent just sat there on the way over. He didn't say a word. Well, I figured he didn't believe me, but it was a short drive to find out. We hit Manzanita Street just after the dinner time rush. It was quiet, and everybody was eating, or they'd gone out for the evening. We climbed the stairs to Marlo Curtis' apartment. I told the agent I wanted to go in alone. He didn't like the idea, but... I explained to him that I expected friends and somebody should cover me from the outside. Oh, she looked even prettier than I remembered her. One tear was just about ready to take that last plunge across her cheek. What do you want? I brought you a paper. I've seen it. You know the girl? Yes. What's her name? Too late. For you, maybe. I gotta know. You wouldn't understand. Try me. You're still looking for things. No, not this trip. You didn't think I could cry, did you? No. I learned. Weeping over a nail file? I said you wouldn't understand. It split a slug in a treasury agent. I don't know. Well, I do, sis. You filed the grooves. Shows you how many times you can be wrong in one day, Regan. Kind of cramped behind that screen, Dameron? Small apartment. Yeah. Always wanted to get the girls a bigger one, but Marlowe's getting tried. You're wrong, Dameron. Not anymore. You've been around Regan too long, Marlowe. Now you got a mouth just like his. Big. I just figured out what he's been trying to do. You putting brains on the market, too? The Jane Doe he's been looking for was Evelyn. Your sister could have been a rich woman. Not with the kind of money you printed. What are you playing this scene for? I didn't count on murder. Evelyn forgot things. You killed her. It was no good. She couldn't tell the fives from the tens. I'm going to identify her. You know where that leaves me? Sure I do. And I'm going now. You'll have to walk through this Luger. Is that the same gun he used on the Treasury agent? You and Regan hardly got acquainted, didn't he tell you? Your sister did that for me. You're lying. Ask Regan. The nail file. That's right. Dumb dumbs. Evelyn wanted to be sure. You're rotten. Now get out of my way. Marlo, don't try it. I'm going out that door. Not standing up. It was a real photo finish. Just as Dameron pulled the trigger, the agent kicked the door open and threw a couple of fast ones into him. I'd call it a dead heat, but you'd have to give the agent the edge. His first slug cut Dameron down like a blade of grass. I figured the second was for Shields. Marlowe wasn't in a hurry anymore. 
mistaken. I'll call the doctor. No, Father. My phone's too big now. It hurt, baby. Yeah. It got bigger. I almost made it. Was a good try. No, Dameron. It's all used up. Good. Regan. You could think I'm as bad as him. No, baby. You just played on the wrong team. He was... Let's go. Yeah. From here on, it's a monologue. Well, it was hard to figure. It was like trying to throw a saddle on a porpoise. I gave what I had to homicide, and it unbuttoned something like this. The girl who pulled a quick exit in the office, Jane Doe, was Marlowe's sister, Evelyn. She was front man for Dameron's bad money. She helped him pass it. The treasury agent, Shields, got a little too close, so Evelyn pumped a couple of dum-dums into him. She did it for Dameron, and then he slipped her the poison. He figured this stuff would work best, but she lived long enough to take that taxi ride to the office. Well, it didn't begin to make sense until I got down to personnel. I didn't think to check it before, but when I handed the clerk that gun, I noticed the tip of the slugs were grooved. Then over at Marlowe's, I picked up that nail file. It was full of lead filings. From there on, it was a fast reel. Dameron filled in the rest in the fight with Marlowe. Yeah, well, it's too bad about Marlowe. We might have had something. That's what I don't like about this business. We can't build friendships. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by E. Jack Newman, produced by Sterling Tracy. The role of Bill Dameron was played by Charles McGraw. Yvonne Patey was Marlo Curtis. Marvin Miller was the Treasury agent. David Ellis, Stacey Harris, Lou Krugman, and Bernice Barrett supported. Original music for this program is by Dick Arant. Bob Stevenson speaking. Jeff Regan Investigator is heard every Saturday over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Most private detectives, when they're called into a case by a wealthy patron, are ushered into the library or the gun room or the master's private den. Not so private detective Michael Shane and his attractive assistant Phyllis Knight. Oh, no. They find themselves at San Francisco's Cliff House to keep a date with, well, let Phyllis tell it, which she is doing without any of the poetry she knows so well. Now, there's no use arguing, Mike Shane. If she oh. weren't a blonde and good-looking, you'd have turned the case down. For the thousandth. Time, honey, I tell you, I haven't seen the girl. Oh, really? She isn't blonde, and I don't know whether or not she's good-looking. I'll bet, I'll I bet. I only know, honey, that she's frightened. Mm -hmm. She said she was a brunette, five foot two, and wearing a Kelly green raincoat. Well, then, there she is, hmm? staring out the window. Right, Angel. Well, leave us ankle over. You know, she does look scared. Oh, she saw us. Hey, does she know you? No, but I told her I was bringing you along, and there aren't any other couples around. Mr. Shane and Miss Knight? Correct. You, Miss Jones? Well, no. Well, that is, I used that name over the phone, but my real name is Wright. Not Patricia Wright? Yes. Hmm? Oh, then it was your brother. I mean, I read the article in the papers. Say, what is all this? My brother was killed Monday. The police said it was an accident. He fell over the cliff, they said, but... But you think he was killed <clears throat> deliberately? Yes. Uh, murdered, in fact? Yes. Why? Well, I just know he was pushed over that cliff. And now, whom do you suspect? Oh, I don't know... My father's manager, Mr. Haberman, for one, and, mm -hmm. and a Mr. Armstrong, a businessman dealing with my father, and... And... And your father? Well, yes. Well, not that I think my father killed my brother, no, but... 
Well, I am suspicious of some of my father's business dealings and very suspicious of some of his associates. Uh, Miss Wright, your brother was in the business with your father? Yes, and, well, he didn't approve of some of their deals. Did he complain to you or to your father, or both? Both. Oh, they've had bitter quarrels over some of their transactions. And how about you, Miss Wright? Are you afraid for your own life? Yes, terribly oh. afraid. Okay. Okay, that settles it so far as I'm concerned. We'll take the case. Now, uh... How about going out to your place and looking over the ground? Hmm? But we can't. That's why I use the assumed name, and that's why I met you here instead of at the house. Listen, Patricia, your best safeguard is to let the murderer know that you have a detective on the job. The very fact that you've engaged me will make them wonder how much you know. We'll watch out for you, Miss Wright. Nothing's going to happen to you while Mike's on the job. Well, all right, I'll do it. Fine. Good. Now get in your car, then, and we'll follow you out, and even if he turns out to be your father, we'll get the killer. <laughs> It's over here, just by that white post. That's where he... he fell. Uh-huh. Oh, boy. Did they, uh... Did they take your brother's body away from the bottom of the cliff or, uh, bring it up here on ropes? Well, they took it away from the bottom, in a boat. I see. Was there much of a crowd here at the top? No. Why? Well, there are a lot of footprints here. I'll the ground see. is pretty well tramped down. But there weren't any people here at all. Why, this is private property. The murderer tramped the ground to confuse... Hey, wait a minute. What? What is it, Mike? Honey, you see those marks? Yeah. Those marks were made by a dead man's heels as his body was dragged to the edge of the cliff and thrown over. And the killer hid behind the tree. Yes, and probably hit his victim with a rock. Yeah. Uh, Patricia, did your brother have a date with anyone the night he was killed? Yes, with Mr. Haberman, Daddy's partner. Mr. Haberman came out to the house at 8 o'clock hmm? and said that he'd made an appointment to meet my brother. But about 10 o'clock, he decided to go home. Just as he was leaving, the chauffeur came to the door and said that they'd found the body down on the rocks below the cliff. Was the chauffeur looking for your brother? No, we didn't know anything was wrong then. The chauffeur was out fishing and was just coming into the little cove when he saw a hat on the water. He turned the boat along the rocks and found my brother's body. The chauffeur is up at the house now? No, he left. He left? He left? What do you mean? Well, he's been doing a lot of drinking, and my brother fired him about a week ago. Oh, fine. We seem to be turning up suspects wherever we move. Uh, right, Angel. Well, Miss Patricia, will you get your father's manager and Mr. Armstrong up to the house right away? Use any excuse at all. I'll get Inspector Faraday to find the chauffeur, and we'll have a little quiz contest with Mike Shane as quiz master. <laughs> I don't know what on earth you could be thinking of, Patricia, to do such a thing. But, Daddy... Not another word. You tell this Shane fellow to get about his business. When any private detectives are hired to come to this house, I'll do the hiring. Daddy, I'm more convinced than ever that my brother was murdered. Murdered? Stuff and nonsense. My dear, you're upset. I don't blame you for that. You were very fond of your brother. But thinking for one moment that any of my business associates could be guilty of such a thing... The idea of dragging Mr. Haberman and Mr. Armstrong out here to be cross-questioned by a, a private detective. Why, it isn't as if there was any suspicion about your brother's death. The police were satisfied it was an accident. I'm not satisfied, however, Mr. Wright. Who are you, sir? Michael Shane, private detective, and this is my assistant, Miss Knight. Hello, I'm very happy to meet you, Mr. Wright. I'm sorry I can't say the same. Hmm? I hate to appear impolite, but I must ask you to leave my house immediately. Well, let's go, Mike. We don't have to take this sort of thing from anybody. Uh, just a minute, Angel. Oh, really? Mr. Wright, I suppose you realize that by your attitude, you're casting a lot of unnecessary suspicion on yourself. Why, you impudent young whelp. If I were a younger man, I'd thrash you within an inch of your life, you... you... Will you leave quietly, or will I have to have you thrown out? Evidently, there's company at the door, and I'd much prefer not to have to introduce you. Pardon me, sir, but to Mr. Faraday. Faraday? Detective Inspector Faraday, sir. With the chauffeur, sir. Hello, mm. Mike. Fellas. Hello, Inspector. Mr. Wright here was just about to order us thrown out. <laughs> he won't have a private detective around the place. I see. Well, maybe he'll let you stay as my assistant. What on earth are you talking about? I'm talking about the fact that we're here to investigate the death of your son. I'd just as soon get on with the questioning if you haven't any objections. 
Will you have everybody come in here? Uh, Inspector, they're all out in the front hall. I don't know what this is all about. I'm only the chauffeur. I haven't done anything. I'll sue you for arresting me. That's That's right. Be sure and do that. All right, into the front hall. Well, which one of you is Haberman? I'm Mr. Haberman. Why? And Armstrong, that's you, I suppose. Mm Mm-hmm, correct. Now, I don't know much about this except what Mike told me over the phone, but I understand that you, Mr. Haberman... Had an appointment with Mr. Wright, Jr., the deceased, the evening he was killed. Yes, that is true. Uh, what was that meeting about? Well, I don't see that it's any of your business. You mm-hmm. can answer that question here and now or at headquarters later. Take your choice. Well, uh, it was a business matter. Don't answer him. But, right, if I don't, he'll take me in and... And you know. he'll have to answer in the long run. It was uh, business, and young Mr. Wright was going to tell you that he wouldn't play along with the kind of deal you and his father were cooking up, correct? Well, that's putting it rather strongly. Hmm. He was a young fellow, too many idealistic ideas for the business world. I was quite certain I could straighten him out when we sat down and talked it over. And when he wouldn't listen, you threatened his life? Of course not. You didn't see him that night at all? No, I didn't. And you weren't anywhere near the top of the cliff between 8 and 10.30? I most certainly was not. Can you prove that? I can. I sat and talked with Mr. Haberman all evening. And Mr. Armstrong, I suppose you have an alibi, too? Well, I don't know. I think I was at a picture show that night, but I wasn't keeping track of my movements. Uh, I wasn't anywhere near this house, though. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, Inspector. Yes, Mike. Come in. I think we ought to do some checking on the murdered man's papers. We might find something that would give us a lead. You're probably right, Mike. Okay. You can all go now. But don't leave the place. We may want to do a few more answers before we leave. Uh, Miss Patricia. Yes, Inspector. Will you take us to your brother's room? We'll see what that leads us to. Find anything, honey? Uh Uh-uh. Nothing important, Mark. How about you, Inspector? Nothing. I hope we're not on a wild goose chase. Oh, I know we're not. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here's something. What What is it, Mark? It's a memo pad. And here's an entry. It says, must talk to father about Haberman's inability to do things honestly. If he can be so dishonest with the people we are doing business with, there will come a day when he will be as dishonest with us. Mm. Hey, hey, look at that later entry, Mike. The one made the day he was killed. Here. Oh, yes. We'll have showdown with Haberman tonight. Either he goes or I get out of the business. Have called him and made appointment for 7 o'clock. Wait a minute. 7 o'clock? Haberman said he made the appointment for 8 o'clock. Yeah, that's he right. Did. Come on. Come on, we'd better hurry up looking through this stuff and then a little more questioning for Mr. Haberman. What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? Mr. Shane, Inspector, yeah. it's it's unbelievable. It's horrible. What is it? What is it? Haberman. I I went to the stables a few minutes ago. Go on, go on. Haberman was lying there, dead. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane and his assistant Phyllis in their adventures. All of us know that some restaurants always seem to serve better food than others, even though their menus may read the same. The reason, of course, is simple. Better ingredients plus extra attention on the part of skilled help. The same principles apply to car lubrication. For example, Union Oil Stopware lubrication is more than just a grease job. Stopware lubrication is a highly specialized servicing process. Only trained attendants using the latest and most modern equipment are allowed to service your car. Each fitting and bearing is thoroughly lubricated with the finest high-quality greases in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications. While your car is on the hoist, the Minutemen inspect out-of-sight points and check them for danger signs. As final evidence of the care and exactness with which stopware lubrication is performed, you receive a thousand-mile written guarantee with each job. Definite proof of reliable service. So, ladies and gentlemen, since careful, thorough lubrication is so vital to the life of your car, why not buy Stopware? Stopware guaranteed lubrication is available only at Union Oil Minuteman stations, and it costs no more than ordinary lubrication. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. It is a few minutes later. Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday have reached the stables and stand looking down at Haberman's body. Now, how did it happen? Well, he just got too close to Prince, and Prince lashed out and kicked him. I found him lying here when I came by. Was anybody else around the stables? Yes. uh, Armstrong was here, and the groom and the gardener. 
Isn't it a bit odd that everyone should gather at the stables? No, I don't think so. Everybody's interested in the horses, especially Prince. Why Prince? Well, I've warned them all to keep away from him. He's a killer. Why have you kept him, then? Because I can handle him. So can the stable hands, and he's a very valuable horse. He just lashes out at strangers or people who don't talk to him as they approach him. <laughs> Surely you don't think this is murder, too? Hmm? Why, it's ridiculous. Nobody in their right mind can have any doubt as to how Haberman was killed. The mark of the horseshoe is as plain, too plain. Well, you can see the curve of the shoe across his forehead. Perhaps I'm not in my right mind, Mr. Wright, but when two men engaged in the same business die within a few days of each other, I'm suspicious. You and me both, Mike. Mr. Wright, you just walked out from the house and found Haberman lying dead. Well, uh, more or less, I came out from the back of the house, hmm? saw that the upper half of the door to Prince's stall was unlatched. I came over to latch it and found Haberman. I couldn't see him lying on the ground from where I was because, as you can see, he was hidden by the water trough. Yes. Yes, I see. So, Inspector, depending on how you look at it, everybody has alibis or nobody has an alibi. You're right, Mike. They all have alibis if they're telling the truth. Well, I most certainly have. I was talking on the telephone from the time I left you until I came out here. The servant saw me in the hall when I was on the phone. Oh, yes, and the chauffeur and the stable boy, Joe, saw me at the back of the stables. I didn't even come around front until Wright called out. That's true. I'm his alibi and he's mine. <laughs> so I'm afraid, Mr. Shane, you'll have to pin the guilt on the horse after all. Yeah, it looks that way, doesn't it? Oh, Mike. Yes, Inspector? How about running down to headquarters with me? Okay, but you're going to leave someone here. Well, I hardly think we need... Inspector. Inspector, for 24 hours, I'd like someone posted at the stables and at the west side of the house looking out toward the cliff. Yeah, but Mike... If only to guarantee the safety of Miss Wright. Okay, Mike. I'll leave the sergeant and one man. Will that satisfy you? Excellent, Inspector. Excellent. And now I'm quite ready to accompany you to headquarters. Okay, here you are, Inspector. Report on a threatening telegram. A threatening wire addressed to Haberman was handed in at San Francisco's main office. No one remembers what the man looked like. They paid no attention. Okay. Follow through on the chauffeur, will you? Yes, sir. Well, it's not much help. Oh, why don't you give up, Mike? After all, we're just following nothing but a hunch from that girl, Patricia. Now, that's right, Mike. I admit it's a bit gruesome having two deaths in the same household, but it's happened before. Oh, there's something wrong about the whole thing. What do you mean, Mike? Well... As I see it, the father, Mr. Wright, isn't above entering into shady deals. No, that seems apparent. So one can legitimately assume that his manager, Haberman, wasn't uh, averse to entering into the same sort of deal. We don't have to assume that. We know it from the son's memo pad. Yeah, that's right. The son actually accused him of being crooked. And we have Armstrong, a business associate. We can assume in his case, too, that he's not above turning a sort of twisted penny. To all of which the son is opposed. To such an extent that he actually puts in writing that he's going to talk to his father and that either the crooked manager goes or he does. Right. And if we assume, too, that the father would rather have his son in the business than the crooked manager, we have motive for murder. For some men, at least. And we have Haberman making a date to see the son. Which Haberman says was for 8 o'clock, but which we know for a fact was at 7 o'clock. You will inquire the case, Mike, but it all hinges on supposition. Suppose, Mike, that you're right. Yeah? And if you are right, and Haberman did kill the son, justice already overtaken him. Yeah, but there's something wrong with the whole thing, Inspector. You say I'm building the whole case uh, uh, of a supposition. Well, plus a hunch of the girls, Mike. And a funny little quirk that keeps running through my own mind. What? Well, when I was a kid, I used to hold horses at the old Fairfax Hunt Club. Yes? Sometimes for a whole day's work, I made two bits. One day, well, I hadn't made my two bits. I guess I was a little on the anxious side... I stepped up too quickly to a horse. He lashed out at me, and I, I jumped back. But that hoof, with its iron shoe, seemed to be following me. It was a huge, as huge as a, as a barn door. A great big black iron shoe that would mash my face in from chin to forehead. A great big letter U coming at... Go on, go on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. A big U. That's it. That's what's wrong with the picture. Oh, what a blockhead I've been. Say, what goes? What is it, Mike? Oh, come on. Can't you picture Haberman lying there on the ground by the stable? Well, sure I can, Don't but... you remember what Wright said? The mark of the horseshoe is as plain, too plain. You can see the curve of the shoe across his forehead. I remember him saying that, but what an... Mike, 
You're right. Well, I don't get it. I uh, Yes, I do. Haberman would have had to be standing on his head for the horseshoe to have left a mark like that. Atta girl, honey. The mark was upside down. Come on, come on. Back to the right stables as fast as that squad car of yours will take us, Faraday. <laughs> Go right back to the stables, Inspector. We can park there. Right, Mike. I'm going to follow my hunch as long as I'm in the mood. What do you mean, hunch? If I were a killer and had killed a man at the stables... Yes? And I was so certain that everybody would think it was an accident, and so nobody would even think of looking for a weapon... Yeah, yeah. Where would I go to hide the weapon? The The hayloft. Right. So, come on, up these steps. Here, honey, I'll help you there. Well, I'm not very good at this. I know that, but come on. There we are. Now you take the car in, honey. And I'll climb up onto the raft. Okay, and I'll take the scent. Oh. It's not behind the speed box. It's not here either. Where's it? Where's Phyllis? Here. Here, under this load of hay. Okay. Anything up there, Inspector? No, everything up here is covered with dust, so I think this is all in the clear. Okay, come down then before you break your neck. Ooh. What? What is it, honey? Oh, it's something heavy. And wet. Huh? And sort of sticky. It, it's blood, Mike. Let me have it. I'll use my handkerchief. There may be fingerprints. What is it? Just a second. Oh, ye gods. Look, Inspector. A heavy piece of timber. Oh, but with a horseshoe nailed to the flat side. Upside down. Okay. Okay, let's keep our find a secret and continue our quizzing. We'll rejoin Mike Shane, Phyllis Knight, and Inspector Faraday in their search for the killer in just a moment. We'd like you to listen for a moment to one of the most sickening sounds of modern life. Lately, you've been hearing that sound more frequently. Traffic accidents in the United States are increasing to an alarming extent as our automobiles grow older. To reduce human casualties and conserve transportation, the International Association of Chiefs of Police has developed a program to emphasize the need for good brakes for all cars. For the next six weeks, law enforcement officers throughout the nation will conduct a brake-checking campaign. They are seeking to protect your life and property. This program on brake emphasis for traffic safety is supported by over 100 automobile clubs and traffic organizations, including the Office of Defense Transportation. Your cooperation is earnestly requested. You can help by checking your own brakes. If you can depress your brake pedal within an inch of the floorboard before the brakes take hold, they are inadequate and demand immediate attention. Remember... Serious accidents can occur at speeds as low as 20 miles per hour if your brakes are in poor condition. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you have the slightest doubt about the condition of your automobile brakes, don't take chances. Have them inspected without delay. Mike, Phyllis, Inspector Faraday, and Patricia Wright are in the library waiting for the members of the household to put in an appearance. Are you sure you don't want me to get Daddy and the others in here? No, no, not yet. We let them wander in one at a time and take them by surprise. I I have a reason. Hey, what about the chauffeur, Mike? For my money, he's out. Mm. Why, Mike? Well, as a suspect for the killing of the son who fired him, he was a possibility, but I see no connection between him and Haberman's death. No, perhaps not. But don't forget one thing. He's the alibi for Armstrong, just as Armstrong is his alibi. The way I'm thinking right now, honey, no one has an alibi. What do you mean? When all the suspects have alibis for their actions, and yet you have two bodies to account for, there's only one extra. One and answer. that is? Someone or all of them are lying. And the alibis mean nothing, so just ignore them. Mike, somebody's coming. Hmm? That's right. Oh, there you are, Pat. What? Oh, I, I thought you'd all gone back to the city. We did, sir, but we have a few more questions we'd like answered. <laughs> if you don't mind my saying so, I... I think you're not quite bright. Hmm? Meaning what, Mr. Wright? Meaning that you're all following a completely senseless theory, trying to find clues to a murder when no murder has been committed. 
To everyone but you, it's obvious that Mr. Haberman had been kicked by Prince. Suppose we just skip that for a moment, huh? Uh, Mr. Wright, just exactly what is the relationship between your firm and Mr. Armstrong? I don't see that it's any of your business. Oh, now let's not go through that routine again. If you'd let me finish, I still think it's none of your business, but I'm perfectly willing to tell you. Mr. Armstrong is an agent for some eastern industrial properties which we're considering purchasing. I see. And was Mr. Haberman in complete agreement with you about this purchase? He was up until a few nights ago. Uh, what or who changed his mind? Well, uh, my son wasn't too happy about the deal, and I think he changed Haberman's mind. When did your son tell you that you either fired Haberman or he would leave the company? What? Why? No, you... no, no, no. Don't I... get all ins- insulted and abusive. We know your son did tell you that. Patricia, if you... Your did... daughter had nothing to do with our knowing that, Mr. Wright. Ah, uh, let's not argue about it. It is true, isn't it? Yes. And what did you decide? Well, go on. Answer. Well, I... I hadn't made up my mind. I... I sort of hoped that things would work themselves out. And they have, sir. First, by the death of your son, and next, Haberman. Both troublesome elements removed within a... Surely you don't... You can't think that I'd connive in the death of my own son. Patricia, you... Yes, Father. You don't believe that I had anything to do with... No, Dad. And I don't either. Nor do Miss Knight and Inspector Faraday. Well, I... I'm glad of that. I... I'm glad, too, that you're coming to your senses and realizing that my boy's death was an accident. No, Mr. Wright, your son's death was not an accident, any more than Haberman's was. Well, who could you possibly suspect? Who stands to gain by both deaths? Why, no one. What about Armstrong? Armstrong? But Armstrong... You mean that Armstrong was afraid that my son's objection to our deal and later Haberman's objection might cause the deal to fall through? Exactly, Mr. Wright, and it's very easy to prove, that is. It Mm. will be easy. If you will cooperate. Oh, oh, certainly. I'll cooperate in any way I can. But... <laughs> you haven't been very cooperative so far, Mr. Wright. I... Yes, well, I'll, I'll do whatever you ask me to. Now we're getting somewhere. Now here's what we'll do. Phyllis, the inspector, and I will hide. Phyllis behind the curtains leading to the terrace. The inspector in that closet. Got it. And I'll get behind the door. Yes. Patricia will go to her own room. You, you, Mr. Wright, will call Armstrong in and tell him you're not going through with the deal. Mm. I'm quite certain his reaction will be enough to convince you. Well, I, I don't think I'll find that difficult. I, I'd practically made up my mind to that anyway. All this I think is Armstrong to... is coming in the front door hall. Oh. Oh, all right, all right, now, quick, everybody, quick, get set. You run upstairs, Patricia, go on. Okay, right, call him in. Uh, oh, uh, <clears throat> that you, Armstrong? Yes. Did you want me? Uh, yes, yes. I I think in spite of all the tragedy around here that we ought to arrive at some definite conclusion about this transaction. Well, I suppose you're right. I didn't want to hurry you or seem aggressive with all the things that have happened. Yes, yes, I understand. But it is an excellent opportunity, and I know you'll make a mint out of it. I'm not going through with it, however. I... What? I'm not going through with it, Armstrong. Oh, you're not, huh? Well, that's what you think. What was that you said? I said that if you think you've got to back out now, you've got another thing coming. Oh, wait a minute. You're not leaving me holding the sack. I've obligated myself for those properties, and you're going to buy them. I'm most certainly not going to buy them if I don't want to. And maybe this will persuade you. Put that gun down, you fool. Drop it, Armstrong. The next time, be faster. What is this? Is this a trap? In a way, it is, yes. And apparently quite a justifiable one. I must apologize for the gunplay... And I must apologize for being quite slow and somewhat blind. Blind, Mike? Yes. Yes, I should have noticed long before this that Mr. Armstrong was left-handed. I didn't, however, until he whipped out that gun of his with his left hand. Left-handed? Yes, I... Phil, left-handed. What What does that matter? I, I've been left-handed all my life. Yes, Armstrong, left-handed. I think you can produce the evidence now, Inspector. Right, Mike. Did you ever see that weapon before, Armstrong? Where did you find it? In the hayloft. That's where you hit it, isn't it, Armstrong? Okay, Inspector, I don't think we'll get any more argument out of him. You ready, Armstrong? (laughs) Yes. want some more coffee, Inspector? No, thanks, Phyllis. Mmm, that was an excellent dinner. Oh, say that again. Angel's a good cook. Flatterer. As well as being good at, uh, 
poetry review. Oh. <laughs> Say, that left-handed business, I've been turning it over and over in my mind. I don't see what on earth Armstrong's being left-handed had to do with the case at all. Hmm? Well, I thought perhaps his being left-handed was, well, responsible for him nailing the horseshoe on the club the wrong way. Oh, no, Angel. No. That was just the inevitable slip that a murderer makes. Well, then what was the left-handed clue? When I remarked on Armstrong's being left-handed, you repeated it after me, remember? Yeah, sure. I... I caught the look in Mike's eye and repeated it after you. Well, yes, I remember that, too. It impressed me, but I didn't catch on. Ah, then it impressed Armstrong, too, and he didn't catch on. He didn't know why or what we had in mind, and the inspector and I didn't give him time to find out. We played cat and mouse with him. Armstrong thought that his being left-handed was a clue. He couldn't figure out what it was. But our tone of voice convinced him that we had him dead to rights. And, well, he broke down. Smarty. Hmm? <laughs> it was nothing but playing up a guilty conscience. <laughs> right, Angel. One of the best weapons a private detective has. So let it be a lesson to you there, darling. And don't try holding out anything on your old man, Mike Shane. Or your good old conscience will get you. again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, and Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written and produced by David Taylor, and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Excitement and danger are the salt and pepper in Mike Shane's recipe for life. But at this particular moment, Mike seems fresh out of spice and seasoning. Life is very dull for our detective friend. So dull, in fact, he almost yawns right in the very pretty face of his secretary, Phyllis Knight. <gasps> Ten minutes to four. You've had that poetry book propped under your nose since lunch. Well, certainly. If I'm going to write poetry reviews, I've got to read them. Exactly. Three people have walked through that door today. One bill collector and two guys asking where they could... Mike... Where they could comb their hair. Three plus one equals four. You, sir, are Monsieur Michael Shane, the private detective? If it's all right with you, ma'am. I am Madame Jolene Toulot. Uh, once again? Madame Jolene Toulot. But, of course, I shouldn't expect a detective to know and the... Pre- Jolene Toulot, the opera star, of course. Won't you have a chair, please? Uh, the other one, Phil, it's strong, uh, more comfortable. Young man, I weigh 230 pounds. If this chair won't hold me, I'll let you know. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. A big voice means a big body. Did you ever hear a voice from one of those little musical comedy with it? Uh, no? No more voice than a sick grasshopper. Madame Tello, you wish to see Mr. Shane about some problem, a case? Of course. What did I come here for? It's in my purse. Here, read this letter. Thank you. Madam. this is your last morning. If the book is published, you will not be here to enjoy the pain it causes. 
Hmm, that's all. It's unsigned. This is the second one I've received in the past two weeks. Oh, what on earth does it mean, uh, the, the book? My memoirs. Oh. Everybody knows I am writing them. A lot of famous people will lose sleep when they read what I, Madame Jolene Torlo, has told about them. But I want to live to uh, enjoy it. You you wish me to investigate who's sending you these notes? I do. I'm sorry, madam. I'm not a press agent. Writers have tried this publicity stunt before. Why, you young cochon. Very well. I'll go to a good detective. I wish you luck, madam. I like you, young man. You talk back to me and don't apologize. Only in months spelt with an R. <laughs> I admit I like publicity, Mr. Shane. I love to see my name in print, but not in the obituary. If you will take the case, I'll give you the names of the people that might have written these notes. Go ahead, Mike. We wouldn't want anything to really happen to Madame Tillot. Thank you, my dear. What is your name? Phyllis. Phyllis Knight. I remember hearing you sing Carmen when I was a little girl. Mm, you're older than I thought. <laughs> uh, you like <laughs> opera? Oh, I love it, yes. I've got record albums at home of Aida and Carmen, Rigoletto, Cavaliero Rusticana. Wait a minute. Didn't I see in the papers that you were singing that tonight? The, uh, the, uh, benefit series. Yes. My fifth farewell appearance. Uh, coming back to business, madam, you were going to give me some names. Yes. The first one is Roderick Mackenzie of the Newport Mackenzies, an old suitor of mine. Would, uh, he threaten to kill you? He's come clear out to the coast just to keep his name out of my memoirs. He wants to buy his letters back from me. Oh? My dear Julien, he says, I was wild, a wild and foolish boy, but that was long ago. So is my family, you, my uh, circle. You're writing this down, honey. Uh-huh, yes, yes. Uh, then there's my ex-husband, Edwin Buck. He's got political ambitions which my book might sour. And uh, Leonora Baril, Madame Baril. Do you think I have to sing tonight with that Hungarian foot owl? Uh, oh, and one other, Savadal, our maestro. They're all in your memoirs? Uh, any others? Uh, yes. Savadal, our maestro, he hates the air I breathe because I won't let Helen marry him. Helen? My secretary, Helen Smith. Oh. The girl thinks she's in love with him. She's too young, too good for him. Uh, you might add the secretary to the list, honey. Mm-hmm. Helen? Impossible. She couldn't. She's... No, never. Well, we've got four names here. Now, where do I find these people? Come to the opera tonight, the Figaro Theater. I will have them all there for you. Figaro Theater, Okay. Uh, it's a double bill, Pagliacci, then Cavalleria. I sing in the second half. Oh, oh let, uh, let us meet in my dressing room during the intermission. Uh, one thing more, madam. Do we have to listen to the opera itself? Of course. Someday you can tell your children you heard Madame Jeline Torlo. You will never forget tonight. Uh-huh. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> I wanted to hear the end of Pagliacci. Yeah, so do I. It can't end quick enough. Oh, you're just being childish. You like music and singing. Yes, yeah, sure, darling, but when guys get up on the stage and insult each other, I want to enjoy it in English. Oh, my. Yes? Oh, oh, we thought this was Madame Turlow's dressing room. I'm sorry. It is. Madame has no come here yet. Oh, well, we were to meet her here in her dressing room. Can we come in and wait? I am awaiting to see her. Okay, we'll make it a threesome. Uh, the names are Miss Knight and Mike Shane. So? I am Savadel. The maestro? But I thought you were conducting the... Cavalleria only, madame. Oh. Diavolo, she is late, late. Uh, uh, excuse me. Hello? Hello? Madame, the time I wait and wait and wait. So? See, they are here. You, Mr. Shane. She wants to talk. Oh, thank you. Hello? Mrs. Shane, I am going to be late. A certain person has been here at the house trying to tear up my memoirs. What? Who? I'll tell you when I get to the theater. Come back to the dressing room after the performance. Au revoir. Goodbye. I want to talk to her. I'm sorry, Maestro. She hung up. Oh, that woman, that big girl, will not stand to this. I warn her. No, we're doing it. I'll do what? Hey, hey, just a second there. That, my dear, is what we artists call temperament. Fortissimo. Yeah, well, I've got a plainer name for it. 
Come on, darling, let's go back to our seats and join the other sufferers. That man conducting the orchestra, he doesn't look like Sabadell. Yeah, you're right. It's the same bald head who umpired the first opera. Yeah, but Sabadell said he would. I wonder what it means. Don't ask me, darling. The only thing I know about grand opera is the price of our tickets. Hey, that's... That's awfully funny. Yeah. Well, this is the last part of the prelude, and right now the tenor is supposed to be singing off stage. The curtain's huh? going up. There's nobody on the stage. Somebody's coming out, of the, out from the wings now. It's Sabadell. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please. I am regret to announce there will be tonight no Cavalleria Rustican. I have to announce there is a tragedy. Our soprano, Madame Turlow, is a dead. We'll return to Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. Many motorists blame poor mileage, sluggish pickup, and inferior engine performance on wartime gasoline. Now, it's true that all civilian gasoline must be restricted in quantity and quality due to government regulations. But if you've been having trouble with a rough motor, or your gas coupons don't seem to go quite as far as they used to... Ask yourself this question. How long has it been since my spark plugs were checked? You see, spark plugs have a lot to do with engine performance. If they're old or burned or dirty, they won't fire properly and they waste gasoline. In fact, engineering tests show that defective plugs can waste one tank full of gasoline out of ten. Now, there's no reason why anyone should put up with this condition when it's so easy to have your Union Oil Minuteman check your spark plugs. Union Oil Spark Plug Inspection is scientifically performed. The condition of each plug is carefully measured on a special machine, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minuteman will clean and adjust them. The cost of this service is only a few cents per plug, and you'll soon save that in extra mileage. You'll find Union Oil Minuteman ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. The sudden death of Madame Turlot has been announced from the opera stage. It's a few minutes later. Mike and Phyllis are at the home of the dead singer. As they hurry through the entrance hall, Inspector Faraday is explaining. Well, for once, Mike, I beat you to the scene. The old lady started to phone the police, but never completed the call. One of our operators heard gunshots over the phone. So you hightailed it right over. Yeah, when somebody at the opera phoned for her, I gave him the news. Well, this is the living room. The bodies, well... You can see for yourself. But, but, Inspector, there are two of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As bloody as Grand Opera itself. Oh. And when she came to our office, I thought it was a publicity stunt. Mike Shane, you're a hero. Oh, Mike, you couldn't possibly know. I haven't had time to identify the other body. It's a woman of, I'd say, 25 or 26. That's probably Helen Smith, the mm-hmm. secretary. Only we knew who was here with Madame Turlot when she telephoned you at the theater. Yeah. The somebody who had just tried to destroy her manuscript. So that's what it was, a manuscript. One of my boys found a pile of paper over there in the fireplace. A lot of it was burned up. Uh Uh-huh. Looks like some old photographs and letters, too. Oh, maybe that's the coroner. Be right back, kids. Okay. Look at these, Mike. Here, these pages didn't burn. Chapter 5, My Husband. There never was a more dashing, gallant figure of a man than Edwin Buck. Hmm, there's something screwy here. She's giving him a gold-plated Oscar, unless it's supposed to be sarcasm. Her desk looks as if she'd been working on a manuscript, Mike. A lot of typewriter paper and carbon sheets. Only used a couple of times. Oh, good, good. You know what to do with them. Mike, what are you staring at? Blood stains on the carpet. They trail from the phone over here to the piano where she died. Oh. Well, she must have clutched at the music rack as she fell. There's music all over the floor. Uh-huh. She's got a couple of sheets crumpled in her hand. Looks like they were torn out of something. Let me see. That's part of an opera score. An aria from Rigoletto. 
Could I G on I Valrazi? Mike. Corsiani Vilrazzi. It's a baritone aria. I thought she was a soprano. Oh. Helen, Mamma Mia, Helen. No, Sabadell, no, don't touch her. I don't know who these men are, but they all insist they're special friends of Madame Turwell. What's your name, sir? Edwin Buck. I was once her husband. And you? Roderick McKenzie. I've known Jelaine for, uh, well, a long time. I was supposed to meet all three of you gentlemen this evening about certain threatening letters sent to Madame Turner. Mm-hmm. So no, I understand. Have that. you got those letters, Mike? Uh, I have one, Inspector, here in my purse. Maestro Savadell, uh, when we were in the dressing room with you, you blew your top about Madame. You said you uh, had warned her, and now you would do it. Uh, do what, Maestro? I was, I was a meaning for Helen. Madame, she said, we cannot marry. I am say... Madame Turlow have no right to stop us. Tonight I'm going to decide. No more talk. We do it. And uh, where did you go when you slammed out? First I go for a walk. Get over my temper. Then I phone Madame. She's a very late. They say she's a dead. Mr. Buck, you came here for some reason, but you're very quiet. Yes, I... Oh, it's so horrible and... How long ago were you divorced from Madame Turlow? About 18 years. I understand you have political ambitions. Is that right? I hope to run for Congress. And what your ex-wife wrote about you might do your opponents more good than you. Hmm? Why, no. From all Jelaine told me, she wrote rather well of me. From all she told us, that wasn't her idea. Can you tell us, Mr. Buck, where you were during the past hour? Why, certainly. At the opera to hear Jelaine. Mm-hmm. Mr. McKenzie, I believe you made a special trip here from New York to keep your name out of these memoirs. There's no crime in that. You tried to buy your letters back from Madame. I did. I have my family to think of, my social standing... Some of my letters were, well, full of youthful enthusiasm. I was afraid Jelaine would distort them. Mr. McKenzie, where were you during the past hour? I was at the opera. No, no, that is one a lie. He was here. I'm see him. All right, McKenzie. Drop the innocent act. What were you doing here? Well, if you must know, I, I came to talk to Jelaine's secretary. And? I was going to bribe her to steal my letters for me. But nobody answered the door. I never got in. You can't prove anything on me. Except that you're a poor liar, sir. That goes for all of you. Any one of you three could have sneaked up here from the opera and killed these women. Inspector? Yes, Mike. Madam has some uh, some of the musical score in her right hand. I want to borrow it for an hour or so. But, Mike, that's evidence. Nothing's going to happen to it, Inspector. And, honey, if you'll give me the keys to your apartment, please. Uh, what? I- I'll go with you. No, no, no. I want you here to sort of observe the uh, proceedings. Mr. Shannon, please. I want to talk with you. It must be private. Inspector Faraday will be glad to hear anything you have to say, Maestro. Uh, I'll be seeing you, children. Oh, Angel. Uh, you dropped your handkerchief. Hmm? Oh, thanks. All right, Mr. Sabadell. What was it you wanted to tell Mike? No, it's a, like I say. It's a private. Okay, I suppose it's private while you came here earlier and saw Mackenzie. I'm already to tell. I come to see Helen. And say to Madame that we get married. But nobody's opened the front door. They're already dead. Inspector. Now what? This isn't my handkerchief. It's got the initials L.B. Mm-hmm. Of course. Leonor Beryl, the singer. Her name was on our list, too. Then she must have been here. We're knee-deep in suspects. Well, maybe this one is the fish we're really after. See you later, Inspector. Hey, Phil, where are you going? Where do you suppose? Right, Inspector? <laughs> I, I hope you will excuse my appearance, but I'm, well, I, I am so unstrung from this shock. Yes, yes, I understand, Miss Barilla. Shalene and I, were, we were such good friends. She was like a mother to me. Yes, you know. yes. Did you see her today? Today? Oh, no. No, I... Oh, my eyes. Mascaro. Oh, here, here, use this, Frankie. Oh, oh, thank you. You buy very expensive handkerchiefs, Miss Barilla. What? That handkerchief. It's yours. You dropped it in the living room. Jelaine Turlow's living room. Oh, you did see her today, didn't you? In fact, this evening. How did you know? <laughs> I didn't. There's a shot in the dark. I see you use a typewriter. What, what are you doing? Just checking something. Will not be... Yep, it's the same. It is the same what? The letter E on your typewriter, exactly like the E in the note threatening the life of Jelaine Tullow. All right. I was trying to scare her. She had me in her memoirs. I am trying to get my husband back. But if Savadell reads the malicious way she twisted things... Savadell? I... He's your husband? And our divorce became final last month. 
But I am going to get him back. Ah. He was going to elope with Helen. So you got rid of the girl. Then you had to kill the other woman. I killed... Get out of here. Get out of here. Gladly, gladly. I think you've told me all we need to know. with women. They tell it too much. Oh, Zephardel, how did you get here? The inspector, he's a turn to lose everybody but Mr. McKenzie. Now, I talk to you. No, you don't. You stay. Zephardel, they want to talk. You let go of me. Get home alone, she bite Stop it. Stop it. She's getting away. Sister, I am away. time because Wait everything that please, she said... Please, Angel, please give it to me slow. I oh. can't get it all at once. Well, listen, all right. Faraday has turned everybody loose except Mackenzie. He's holding the wrong man. Well, it could be, but Inspector Faraday must have his reasons. But the handkerchief. Leonore Beryl admitted she was with Madame Tullo tonight, and she was married to Savadell. Uh, so you said. But doesn't all this mean anything to you? Savadell tried to keep me in that apartment. Mm-hmm. Men try that occasionally. Oh. By the way, did you check Madam's uh, carbon paper? I did not. I found more important things to do. Phyllis, I told you Mike, that... stop fiddling with that phonograph and listen to me. Leonore Barrill sent those threatening letters. She wanted Savadell back, but he was going to elope with Helen. Don't you think Leonore would be mad enough to kill her and Jelaine Tello? If you think that, why were you so scared of Savadell? Because... Because they're in it together. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh by the way, honey, have you got some extra phonograph needles? This one's getting scratchy. Oh, Mike... What's my something wrong? Yes, you. Huh? I beat my brains out trying to help you on this case. You just stand there gawking at sheet music and phonograph records. Excuse, please, but the doorbell. That's the apartment phone, stupid. Down by the mailboxes. Oh, I'll get it. It's probably Inspector Faraday. Hello? Please. Miss Phyllis and I. Well, who is it and what do you want? Senor Sabadell. I must see her at once. Look, mister, look, this is Mike Shane. And if you come around here to pester Phyllis, I'll put no, you... No, no, please. I want to talk to both of you. It's a secret. I have an idea. Oh. Uh, hello? Oh. Hello? Hello? Oh. Hello? Mr. Shane. Yeah? The aria. The aria. Oh. Sabadell. Sabadell, what's wrong? Sabadell! <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures. A few minutes ago, we mentioned some of the reasons why clean spark plugs are important to the efficient performance of an automobile engine. Now, while you're having your spark plugs checked, it's a good idea to ask the Minuteman to look at your ignition cables, too. These cables are the small, fine wires which deliver electricity to the spark plugs. If any of them are broken or frayed or the insulation damaged, even brand new plugs won't help your driving. You see, old or damaged ignition cables leak electricity so that by the time the charge gets to the spark plug, there isn't enough juice left for the rich spark needed for instant firing. So to get full power out of old engines, ask the Union Oil Minute Man to check both spark plugs and ignition cables then you'll be sure of more power and better mileage. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Ignition Service. Thank you. For the second time tonight, a phone call has been ended suddenly by a revolver shot. It is minutes later. Mike and Phyllis are standing on the sidewalk outside Phil's apartment house. Two men in white are lifting a limp body onto an ambulance stretcher. Mike, do you think he'll live? Well, the doctor says he will if they get him to the hospital quick enough. Even so, we won't be able to question him for days, and that may be too late. Not a soul in this crowd saw who did it. Somebody decided Savadell shouldn't talk to us. Yeah. Oh, if I had only listened to him when he tried to tell me something at Madame Turlow's. Or you at Leonor Barrill's. Well, if we just knew, what he wanted to tell I us? I think I have a sneaking hunch on me. You have? Yep. Yeah. Well, come on, bright eyes. We're going to phone Inspector Faraday and send out the invitations. Invitations? Mm Mm-hmm. To a midnight reunion at Madame Turlow's. The guest list will be very select and slightly dangerous. Uh, Good 
Good evening, Inspector. Hello, Inspector. Did you round up everybody? I did. They're in the living room. Come on in. Okay. That package under your arm, Mike, what is it? Ah, ha, ha. Patience, me lad. Patience. Everything in due time. Mm, Mike, you tell me on the phone that Mackenzie was innocent and to release him. Well, I haven't. You mean you've got proof on him? Mackenzie came clear across the continent just to stop Madame Tolo from publishing that book. He admits he was going to bribe her secretary to steal the stuff for him. And Savadel placed him here at the house at or about the time of the killing. That's enough for me. Now, uh, there's just one hitch, Inspector. What? Uh, how about the killer trying to remove Savadel, too, at the very time you had uh, Mackenzie at headquarters? Say, that's right. Yeah. Uh, unless Savadel's ex-wife did it in a fit of anger. Mm. Oh, uh, Miss oh, Burrell, yeah. this is Mr. Shane. So, I understand I have you to thank for dragging me out at this unearthly hour. Yes, Miss Burrell. Oh. Uh, Mr. Buck, how are you? As well as could be expected. Phyllis, uh, will you look up those carbon papers now? Yeah, yeah, right away. I believe Inspector Faraday has told you of the shooting of uh, Maestro Savadel, so the first thing we want to know from both of you is, uh, where were you during the past hour? Well, I was at home, reading the newspaper story about tonight. Oh, an incomplete story, I'm afraid. And you, Miss Perrin? Also at home. When uh, Miss Knight left you and Savadel, or should I say, escaped from you, what happened? Nothing. You and Savadel had a fight. He accused you of killing Helen so he couldn't marry her. I told him I didn't, and it's the truth. All right, all right, all right. Now, honey, how about the carbons? All checked. Madame Tillot was still working on the chapter, My Husband. And? We were right the first time. She's anything but flattering to Mr. Buck. Rubbish. She was very kind to me. Well, here's the carbon sheets. We found them on Madame's desk, and they were used only twice. I just held them up in front of my vanity mirror and read what she'd typed, and it was not flattering. Well, how was I to know that? I thought it was all favorable to me. Well, that's a minor issue now, anyway. The real key is Helen Smith, the secretary. How do you mean, Mike? Madame Turlow was against a marriage between Helen and Savadell. She told us it would never happen. Mm -hmm. Now, doesn't that strike any of, any of you as a little strange? Employers usually don't have such control over the lives of their secretaries. Okay, Mike, but get to the point. Ah, that is the point, Inspector. And now you wanted to know what I have in this package. Yeah, yeah. First... The music score we found in Madame Turlow's hand. A baritone aria from Rigoletto. The Cortigiane Virazzi. Pronunciation by courtesy of Miss Phyllis Knight. Thank, Thank you, you, darling. And uh, next we have Phil's record album of the same opera. Angel, will you warm up the Madame's phonograph for me? If you ask me, this is all very cheap and, and dramatic. Operatic is the word, Miss Borel. You see, when Madame Turlow was shot, she made a dying effort to tell us who killed her and Helen, especially Helen. She tore a very special aria from the score of Rigoletto... In a desperate gamble, somebody would understand it. Mr. Shane, I don't believe you are the man to give us a course on opera appreciation. Well, we shall see, Miss Buddy. Photographs ready, Mike. Okay, darling. Now, uh, do you people know the plot of Rigoletto and what this aria means? Well, of course. I have sung Rigoletto. I'm afraid I have only a hazy idea. All right. This is the setup. A gang of the Duke's courtiers have just kidnapped a girl. Now this guy, Rigoletto, is cursing them. Now he's begging them to give her up, and they won't. Now he tells them the secret. The girl is his own daughter. Well, does that mean anything to you, Mr. Rill? Not a thing. You, Mr. Buck? I can't say that it does. Okay, then I'll put on the other record. Now, this is the end of the opera, the payoff. Miss Burrell, as an opera star, tell us what's happening on the stage right now. Why, Rigoletto had planned to kill his enemy, the Duke. Right. He has the body in a sack, and then he makes a discovery. Now, listen carefully, Mr. Buck. Rigoletto opens the sack and sees a girl's body. He cries, speak, oh, speak to me, my darling daughter. Oh, awful fate. By my hand, she hath fallen. Oh, what? What's that? My, 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 my child. Helen was my child. Helen was Jelaine's daughter. Then... Then Buck is her father? I... I didn't know. I didn't know. Yes. Her father. And her murderer. Are you feeling better? Ah, uh, Mr. Shan, to you, bigger congratulations. <laughs> Your work, bravo. She's the most brilliant. Well, thank you, Maestro. I thought I was pretty good myself. Good? Well, Buck could hardly add anything to his confession. He hadn't seen his daughter Helen since she was six years old. Buck says he just wanted to scare her, man, out of publishing her book. 
Helen tried to grab the gun. It went off. Then he had to shoot again. Mr. Savadell, you uh, had something you wanted to tell me privately. Now, can you talk now? Yes. Yes, I can. Tonight, I see Aria from Rigoletto in a madam's hand. Mm -hmm. The ideas have come to me. Maybe Helen is not often the way she should think. Maybe she is the daughter of Madame and Mr. Buck. The same idea Mr. Shane have. But I must tell in a private. Well, why under the sun would Jelaine Tello keep such a secret from her husband and her own daughter? We in the opera are stranger people. Mm. Madame Tello live and breathe opera. She's a very dramatic. She's in a joy secret, just like a storybook. Uh, speaking of operas, Angel, I noticed you got another record album up at your apartment. Maybe if I studied it, I might get the answer to another problem. Mike, not another crime. Well, a different sort. It's uh, The Marriage of Figaro. Catch on, Miss Knight? Then, uh, Mr. <laughs> Shane, you must uh, translate better than your rigoletto. Huh? But just a minute ago, you were complimenting me about... See, honor your thinking. But, the honor, you no. I have never heard such a bad translation. Oh, my. <laughs> Dear, I was so proud of your learning and your culture. Well, what about you? You didn't correct me. You're supposed to be the highbrow in this partnership. Oh, I am. Opera, music, books, poetry, reviews. Climb down off that pedestal, you fake. Why, Michael <laughs> Shane... <laughs> Phil, I... there's only one book a man wants a woman to review. I know, I know. A cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> right. Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf. If the chimes shudder a little on Sunday afternoon, well, they know there's mystery in store Sunday with men of action like Mike Waring, better known as the Falcon who brings his fearless and romantic touch to the solution of another mystery. After the Falcon, it's high adventure. Then the big guy steps in. The new private eye, Charlie Wilde, concludes with a few casual homicides. The chimes mean mystery and action this Sunday afternoon on NBC. Transcribed. My boss is the smartest and the stubbornest, the fattest and the laziest, the cleverest and the craziest, the most extravagant detective in the world, Nero Wolf. It's the adventure of Stamped for Murder with that brilliant, eccentric, private detective, orchid fancier and gargantuan gourmet, Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Instructions for this morning, Archie. Your notebook, please. First, Mr. Salensback. Inform him that the Long Island peafowl he sent were most unsatisfactory. Peafowl's breast flesh is not sweet and tender unless it is well protected from all alarms, especially from the air, to prevent nervousness. Long Island is full of airplanes. Look, Mr. Wolf, I... I shall uh... want a dozen chickens that have been raised on blueberries. And a fresh-killed lamb for tomorrow. Uh, Mr. Wolf, please listen, there's... Uh... Mr. Good, and be quiet, and then dinner on the following day becomes a problem. Mr. Wolf, dinner any day is going to be a problem if we don't pay Sausenbach's bill. Then pay it. With what? The bank account's empty. Ridiculous. They were $4,000 yesterday. But you bought that shipment of orchid bobs from wine old Gluckner. Mr. Wolf, we need money. You've got to stop eating and drinking beer long enough to earn some... <laughs> You're an alarmist. Will you, for the love of heaven, stop turning down clients and turn an honest dollar? 
I've got a couple of prospects right outside the door. Send them away. No, sir. Send them away. Tell them I've gone to Egypt. Nothing doing, sir. Confound you, Archie. Obey orders. Send them away. Miss Kent, Mr. Rodman, come in, please. Yes, thank you. Confound you, Archie. You're mutinous. Yes, sir, and you're stuck with it. This is Miss Gloria Kent and Mr. Rodman. They arrived as advertised with a pressing problem. Good morning. You people are here by sufferance only. I shall speak to Mr. Goodwin about it later. Yes, indeed. I don't like pressing problems, Miss Kent. What are yours? My father. Indeed, I'm not a court of domestic relations, Miss Kent. What did your father do? Beat you? Withhold your earnings? Discourage your suitors? Mr. Goodwin should have informed you this office does not undertake cases involving marital or family problems. But that's not... If Mr. Goodwin had not been beguiled by your pretty face, he might have warned you and avoided this embarrassment to you and annoyance to me. Now, 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 take it easy, take it easy. How many times have I told you you don't know how to handle women? Then suppose you let Miss Kent handle me. Well, it's simply this, Mr. Wolf. I had some money my mother left me. My father's just spent it without my permission. I want it back without a scandal. Thanks, Miss Kent. How much? How spent? Ten thousand dollars. Father bought a treasure map. Indeed, from whom? A pair of swindlers named Cross and Halleck. They've driven him crazy, talking about fortune salvaged from the SS this and the SS that. He, he's got a map and old letters he studies. He, he's childish. Many fortunes have been recovered. Many more are weight on the sea bottom. How do you know your father has been duped? Well, I know... You do, Mr. Rodman. Yes. Cross and Halleck bought some old letters for me, written by my grandfather from Hawaii. They used them to manufacture the map and evidence. And that's what they sold to Kent. Father thought he was being so clever. He had the paper analyzed. Of course, the document research laboratory said the letters were genuine. They were. But something new had been added. I'd have never known if Mr. Rodman hadn't told me. You are a party to the swindle, Mr. Rodman? I was not. I never knew what they were up to. Mr. Wolf, you've got to help me. I can't do anything with Father. I can't convince him. Even Mr. Rodman can't... No, Miss Kent, I'm sorry. This is not for me. But you must. You must. Not in my office, madam. No tears. Please, please, Archie, stop her. Okay, okay, okay. Archie, when Miss Kent has finished her disgraceful exhibition, show them out. How dare you walk out on us Easy, like easy, were... easy. I know him. I know him. You don't. He gets into a panic when women cry, or else he's curious about what Fritz is cooking for lunch. Now, just uh, wait a minute, please. Oh, aren't you ashamed of yourself walking out like that on that poor kid? That hysterical gamma. <laughs> She's lost all of her money. She needs help. I charge high fees, Archie. So charge a small fee. Do you want her to starve? Good heavens. Starve? How monstrous. I'm not kidding. While you'll be in here smelling your dinner, she and her father will be starving. I thought you were bringing me a paying claim. Well, this is different. She's, uh... Beautiful. Archie, you're impossible. Oh, very well. Go back into them. Get names, addresses, facts. I am not committed to Miss Kent's case, but we'll see. Be a tribute I pay for your weakness for a pretty face. Rodman and Gloria Kent were gone, however. So all I had were the few facts they'd given me before they met Wolf. I felt guilty about that when he came back into the office and sat down in his specially built chair. He closed his eyes and I glared at him. Well, how much of you is awake? Mr. Wolf. Uh. Well, they disappeared. Did you tell me you were going to help this girl just to get her out of the office, or did you mean it? You're a gadfly. No, sir. No, sir. You made a promise, and you're stuck with it. What did you get from Rodman? Name, address, occupation. He's a librarian. That's all. Very careless, Archie. You missed a significant point. Such as, uh... How did Rodman discover the letters he sold were being altered by forgery and used for swindle? How did he locate the dupe, Mr. Kent? Uh, I guess you're right. I'll ask him next time. But uh, what about now? Are you going to get Gloria's money back? I assume you call Miss Kent Gloria solely in order to annoy me. It does. Stop it. Get Cross and Halleck. On my way. You'll find them at the Hotel Bogart. <laughs> Wrong, sir. According to my notes, their address is... Never mind their address. The Hotel Bogart is the headquarters for successful confidence tricksters. They celebrate their victories there while the money lasts. You will possibly find Cross and Halleck drinking whiskey or lunching, probably booth.
I located Cross and Halleck in the hotel bar and lured them back to our place on 35th Street. Wolf was sitting behind his desk with his hands crossed on his impressive middle, at peace with his lunch and the world when I ushered them in. He sat bolt upright and scorched me with a look. Good afternoon, Mr. Wolf. The tall one's name is Cross, the short one is Halleck. They uh, want to help me invest my money. Gentlemen, Mr. Nero Wolf. Huh? Who? Nero Wolf. Hey, what is this? Confound you, Archie. How drunk are they? Not too drunk for business. Let's get out of here. Come on. Wait a minute. Chill, duck, decoy. You want me to keep him here, Mr. Wolf? Not by violence, Archie. Come back here, gentlemen. Unless you want seven years in the state penitentiary. Unless what? You got nothing on us, Wolf. Nothing. I have the Kent case. The Kent? That's a laugh. We're sitting pretty, sitting pretty. You are not, sir. You imagine you possess legal immunity. Mr. Kent believes you are grotesque balderdash and will not sue for fraud. Miss Kent cannot sue because she is reluctant to accuse her father of wrongfully obtaining her money. Ergo, you think you are invulnerable. Now, listen. But you forget me. I'm a detective with a fee to earn. A big fee. Quiet, Archie. I am determined to get that fee. Therefore, as Miss Kent's agent, I can and will bring action against you. I'm indifferent to her tears or her father's disgrace. I'm indifferent to anything outside of money. You will return the $10,000 to me at once, sir, or you'll be in jail by morning. You mean that? I do, Mr. Cross. Alec, come here. Come on, honey. Uh, okay. Here, Mr. Wolf. Alec and I have decided we don't want to get in any trouble with you. Here's your ten grand. Uh, let's have it. Give the dough to Kent, Mr. Wolf, and get the letters and map back for us. You've got a reputation for being tricky, but honest. We trust you. Come on, Alec, let's go. <laughs> well, how about that? Preposterous. No, sir. Take a look. $10,000, genuine coin of the realm. That man crosses a fool. Does he imagine I am to be fooled so easily? What do you mean he left the money? He surrendered too quickly, Archie. Too easily. And that money in the envelope he was carrying all ready to refund. Why? Well, maybe he's got a better sucker. I heard him mention a Ben Sanford. Nonsense. Does he need Kent's forged letters and map to cheat this Ben Sanford? Couldn't he prepare another set? Uh, I guess you're right. Something's fishy. In any event, it's no concern of mine, thank heaven. Uh, why not? I'm not committed to Miss Kent in any way. As a favor to you, I undertook to regain her money. I have done that. You may take it back to her and obtain the forged papers in return. But, uh... Silence, Mr. Goodwin. Go to your redhead charmer. Leave me in peace. I intend to spend this afternoon with my new world atlas. <laughs> I left him 3,000 miles up the Amazon with his magnifying glass and drove up to East 69th Street. The Kent house was a broken-down little brownstone, and as I went up the stoop, the door opened and Gloria Kent burst out like a skyrocket. Hey, Miss Kent, easy, easy. Let go of me. Let go. What's wrong? What's wrong? Wrong. Wrong. Nothing is wrong. Nothing at all. Well, how about seeing your father? You want to see my father? Come inside. Oh, for the love of heaven. Come inside, what... Mr. Gooden. I'll introduce you. He's in a back room. Come right through the living room. What else came through this living room? A hurricane? No, Mr. Goodwin. Something else. There's my father, Mr. Goodwin. What in the devil? He's dead. His throat's cut. Father. This is Archie Goodwin from Nero Wolf's office. He and his boss refused to help while they could. Maybe he can help you now. Stop it. All I'm good for now is revenge. That's all. Stop Archie. it. Stop it and look at me. When did it happen? I don't know. When did you find him? Just now. Keep looking at me. Who went through this house like a hurricane? You? No. Where did you go after you left the office? To the laboratory. What lab? Document research. The place that checked the map. How long were you there? Until an hour ago, I was with Mr. Rodman. Keep looking at me. And then? I had lunch. With Rodman? Alone. And then I came home. All right. All right, now listen to me. I want you to go to Mr. Wolf's house right now. Have you got cab there? Yes. All right, take a cab. I've got to stay here, but I'll call Mr. Wolf and tell him you're on the way. Now, get. I called Wolf, 
told him everything, and he instructed me to advise Inspector Kramer, who arrived with the homicide squad. I gave the inspector everything while the squad photographed and measured, print dusted and detected. At 3.30, Kramer took me back to the house on 35th Street for a fight with Wolf. It's a great story, Wolf. Great. Kent buys a phony treasure map. Everybody knows it's phony except Kent. But Cross and Halleck try to buy it back, and Kent gets himself murdered. Did you find the map and letters in the house, Inspector? No, no, I didn't. The killer was after the map. The phony map? Certainly. Why? Well, if we knew that, we would know why Cross and Halleck so willingly paid back the money and why Kent was murdered. Maybe it's not phony. I'd better see the girl now. Oh, you fancy her for the murder? Well, I'll know after I ask a few questions. Tonight. She's had a shock, Mr. Kramer. She needs rest. Look, Wolf, I want her. Why bother with her when there's so much to be done? Yes, such as? Cross and Halleck, find them. And the mystery man they spoke of, Ben Sanford. These are the men you want now, not this poor, overwrought girl. Yeah. All right. The girl will be here for questioning tonight, though, huh? Tonight, Mr. Kramer. Okay. You'll hear from me later on. <laughs> well, you buffaloed him out of that, okay. Say, uh, why don't you want her questioned? Is she guilty? I don't know. Well, what did she say when she got here? She said nothing. She never arrived. She never what? She never arrived. Well, then why did you tell Kramer she was resting? Would he have believed the truth? <laughs> she must be found. More important, we must learn why Ford's letters... And forge map of producer's turmoil. Find the killer and you find the map. You said so. I said the reverse, which is an altogether different statement. Archie, I want a photograph of that map. Get it. Oh, sure, sure. Any particular camera you want me to use? You'll find a photograph of 200 Vanderbilt Street. Are you kidding? The lab cannot check the authenticity of old papers without photographing them in ultraviolet light, infrared light, and so on. If this document research lab has examined those papers, they will have photographs. Get them. He got out of his chair and waddled back to the house elevator. It was four o'clock and time for his regular afternoon session with the orchids. I drove down to the document research laboratory on Vanderbilt and got such a shock that I grabbed the office phone and dialed Wolf at once. Mr. Wolf, Archie here. What's the matter? Are you lost? No, sir. No, sir, but I found something. Photographs? No, Mr. Wolf. I don't think you'll ever see any photographs of the Kent map. I don't think any were taken. Indeed. But uh, guess who runs the document research laboratory? No, 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 no. Don't guess. You probably know. A man named Ben Sanford, and he's sitting right here looking at me. Bring him home with you. Home? But it's four in the afternoon. This is the sacred hour when you pray over your orchids. And Mr. Sanford can join the ceremony. Hey, how about this place? How about it? There must be a million flowers up here. <laughs> no, not flowers. Orchids only. Mr. Wolf has 10,000 plants. <whistles> never saw anything like it. And you never will again, brother. Hey, uh, what, uh, what kind is that on the bench? Oh, that... That's our pride and joy. Odontoglossum harianum. Above them, the Van Petersirana, and the pink ones are the Silogiani uh, Pandoratas. Now, the large object, mulching flower pots, is Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf, Ben Sanford. Good afternoon, sir. Hi. I came along to be obliging. I've got nothing to say about anything. How much have you offered Cross and Halleck for their treasure map? No comment. Mr. Sanford, I'm going to make some assumptions. I assume that you are not, in fact, a document expert, but an accessory to the fraud of Halleck and Cross. No comment. And you actually prepare fraudulent maps for those swindlers, and then, in the guise of an expert, guarantee their authenticity. No comment. Now, this you must answer. You did guarantee the authenticity of the map and letters can't bought. It's on record. All right, I did. Then will you admit they were forged? What, are you, a comic? No. You guarantee the value of the Kent map? Yes. As an expert? Yes. Then you've convicted yourself of murder. Murder? What is this? Mr. Kent was murdered, sir. 
evidently for the map and letters he bought. But of all persons involved, you alone believe in the value of the map. No one else does. Therefore, you alone would have murdered Ken for the map. Well, for the love of... Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Chew it over, brother. Chew it over. Either way, he's got you. Okay. Okay, you... You want me to level? Here it is. Level, Hutchie? Okay, boss. Thief-type talk. It means tell the truth. It's like you say. The letters were bought from Rodman. I forged the map and evidence onto them. I guarantee them to Kent. The swindle. The letters are without value? Oh, sure. They're old, that's all. From 1851. Just tired family gossip and stuff. Indeed. There we have the problem again, Archie. Mr. Kent is swindled with a map and letters that are known to be worthless. He alone believes the fantasy of the treasure. There isn't any treasure. Never was. Yet Cross and Halleck refunded the swindle money so eagerly. It is obvious they want those worthless documents back badly. Someone else wants them so bad he murders Mr. Kent. Why? I don't know. Ah, uh, gee, we must find the girl. There's a chance she turned to Mr. Rodman for refuge. I'm sorry, you'll have to go there at once. If the girl isn't there, bring Rodman. Yes? Hello, Rodman. Remember me? I'm Archie Goodwin from Nero Wolf's office. Oh. Oh, yes, of course. I came to get Gloria Kent. There's been a change in plans. Tell her to come out, please. Gloria? Well, she's not here. Why should she be? Haven't you heard? Heard what? Well, I guess you'd better come down and see Wolf. Uh, Mr. Goodwin, I'm afraid I can't. I'm rather busy. Look, Rodman, maybe you ought to know. Old man Kent was murdered. What? Yes, yes, just after you and Gloria left us. Kent murdered? Well, well, this is awful, Mr. Goodwin. You want to see Mr. Wolf now? Get your hat. Murdered? Well, believe me, I never wanted this. I'm going to tell Nero Wolf the whole mess. Every word of it. Okay, then. Come on, let's go. Yes, of course. Just a minute. I'll get my hat in the bedroom. Murdered? Kent, I never dreamed. Oh. Come on, Rodman. Come on, Rodman. Come on. What? I didn't hear you. Oh, Rodman. What the... Oh, Rodman. Oh, Rodman. Good Lord. What next... Come on. This is Nero Wolf. Archie here. We've had a tough break. Yes? While I was waiting for Rodman at the front door, he went into the bedroom for his hat. The killer was there. How do you know? He cut Rodman's throat. Kill. The back window was open. It's a ground floor apartment. He was out and gone before I had a chance. Archie, where were your wits? Let me alone. I've had a man murdered 20 feet from me. You think I'm cheering? Mr. Kramer is here, and he has news for us, Archie. Could not locate Cross and Halleck in their apartment. They had not been home all day. The maid informed him that she was waiting for her weekly salary. Well, so what? She was most angry and peppery, Mr. Kramer informs me. Red pepper? Exactly. Okay. Okay, maybe I know what you mean. I'll try to deliver the goods this time. Goodbye. I drove down to the apartment house on Gramercy Square where Cross and Halleck lived, took the elevator up to the 10th floor, found the right door, and slipped in with a pass key. Come on out. Come out wherever you are. I know you're in here. You fooled Kramer pretending to be the maid, but you didn't fool Wolf. You'd better... Gloria! Cut it out! Cut it out, you idiot! Lay off! No. Archie, Archie, you don't. Archie Goodwin from Nero Wolf's office. Remember me? Give me the gun, Gloria. Give it to me. Oh, that's right. Who, uh, who did you think I was? Halleck. Oh, brilliant. So Wolf figured you out, huh? Well, you are a brave girl. They killed your father. You came up here and waited for them. You were going to kill them right back, huh? Oh, that red-headed temper. And you bluffed Kramer into thinking you were the maid. I had to do something. It was the only thing I could think of. To come here and kill him. Well, you're coming home with Archie. And just remember one thing. When Wolf's working for you, don't try to do any thinking. It only gets in Wolf's way. (laughs) 
I got Gloria Kent back to the house at 7 o'clock. I parked the car, brought her into the office, and got the shock of my life. There was a convention on. Wolf was there with Inspector Kramer representing the cops. Cross, Halleck, and Sanford were there representing the crooks. When Kramer saw Gloria, he scowled first at her and then at Wolf. So it was a slick one after all, Wolf. You didn't have the girl. You had no intention of producing her. Please, Mr. Kramer, that can wait. But other matters more important. I dine at eight. That leaves me one hour to solve your murders. Murders? More than one? Yes, two. Elmer Rodman. But I haven't good one if you... Please, Mr. Kramer, not now. First, Miss Kent. Good evening, Miss Kent. I presume you have met these gentlemen, Cross, Halleck, and Sanford? I... I... Yeah, I'll take your purse, please. What? Why, I... No, don't think me as naive as Mr. Goodwin, miss. When you left your home after the murder of your father, you took the map and letters with you. They are in your purse well, now. that's true. Archie, the purse. Thank you. We have here an interesting situation. There exists some old letters and map, forged and fraudulent. They're worth $10,000 and more to Cross and Halleck and worth two murders to a killer. Why? There must be something of great value in the letters. Yes, such as? Something which Mr. Sanford could not see, although he worked on the document closely. Yet something which could be made manifest. What is the answer, Miss Kent? You know it? I swear I don't. Secret writing, Archie. Bring the chafing dish from the dining room. Right. Secret writing? I saw nothing when I worked on those letters. Naturally, Mr. Sanford, the writing is invisible. The heat is an agent. Makes most forms of secret writing visible. The chafing dish, boss. Thank you, Archie. Place it before me and light it. Right. Now I open Miss Kent's purse. From it, you see, I withdraw these ancient letters which he took from her house after her father's murder. That's not true. Archie. That's enough, Gloria. That's enough. From now on, you just listen. We remove the letters from the envelope and toast them gently. Secret Ink Vintage 1851 will easily succumb to the agency of heat. Careful. Those envelopes will catch fire. Uh, hey, 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 they're caught. Don't be upset, Mr. Cross, Mr. Halleck. The envelopes! Uh. They'll burn safely in the dish. We can concentrate on the writing. Watch closely. I don't want to be accused of trickery. You fat fool. The envelopes are everything. Put them out, Sanford. Don't sit there. Put them out. Why, Mr. Halleck? Well, the stamps, the missionaries, are worth a fortune. The missionaries? Of course. You know that. Mr. Cross knows. So does Mr. Sanford, right? Yeah, yeah. Of course, Sanford knows, you old fool. Let me... Uh, Mr. Sanford is not alarmed. Why not, sir? I don't know what you're talking about. Fifty or a hundred thousand dollars is burning before your eyes, Mr. Sanford. Cross and Halleck are burning their fingers, putting out the flaming envelopes. And you sit there quite indifferently. Why? Well, I... Uh, I, you know the value of the missionary stamps on the letters you bought from Rodman. But you know these aren't the real letters. Isn't that it? Not the real letters? I told you I'm tough to crack, Wolf. You didn't fool me with those dummies. Dummies? How do you know? Mr. Cross didn't know. Mr. Haddock didn't know. How did you? Well, I... Uh... I'll tell you, sir. Only one man could know I was framing Miss Kent as a decoy... Only one man could know I prepared these dummy letters and pretended to take them from her purse, and that is the killer. The man who murdered her father and stole the map and letters this morning. You, sir, Mr. Sanford. Well, I'll be... Mr. Kramer, there's your killer. You'll find the missing map and letters on him or concealed in his home or office. You won't need the evidence anyway. Look at his face. He's self-confessed. Self-confessed like fun? He was booby-trapped. No, Mr. Crane. Not a complicated case, really. Very simple. Elmer Rodman sold a packet of old family letters to the swindlers for a small sum. They used the letters to perpetrate their fraud on Miss Kent's father. And the stamps on the letters were valuable? They were a special Hawaiian issue, 1851, Miss Kent. Nicknamed missionaries, because missionaries use them for writing home. They are extremely rare stamps worth upward of $25,000 each. Hey, no wonder they were worth two murders. We found five of them on Sanford. Excellent. Somewhere or other, Rodman discovered the value of the stamps after he sold the letters. In his effort to get them back, he communicated his discovery to the swindlers, Cross, Halleck, and Sanford. 
So that's why they refunded the money so fast. Precisely. In an effort to have the sale rescinded. Rodman sought out Kent and tried to convince him of the fraud. Alas, he would not listen to the truth, Mr. Kramer. Oh, I get it. And while the others were hassling around, Sanford tried to steal a march and quietly resorted to murder. Ah, uh, there you have it. Ha-ha! Great job, boss. Great job. So Gloria not only gets her ten grand back, but uh, five times twenty-five, which is about a hundred and twenty-five thousand worth of goodies. Now, figuring your rates by the hour, that means you've done a gratis job worth about. Yes, um... Ken. I did not know what I demand a large fee for what I have done. I will not go back on my word, but I can beg for a favor. I'll only be too happy. To... Wait, wait, wait! I ask something that will not be easy to grant. What is it? Will you use your red hair, your pretty face, your admirable figure, and your ample fortune to lure Mr. Goodwin away from this house tonight? I would like to enjoy my dinner in peace. That won't be difficult, Mr. Wolf. <laughs> Let's have an understanding right now, Gloria. Difficult for you or for me? I'll be delighted. <laughs> Indeed. To spend an evening with Mr. Goodwin, there is only one word for you, Miss Kent. Intrepid. <laughs> You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's story by Alfred Bester was based on the famous characters created by Rex Stout, produced by Edwin Fadiman, and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Wally Mayer as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Howard McNair, Jay Novello, Larry Dobkin, Bill Johnstone, and Herb Vigran. Music by Joseph Enos. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Careworn Cup. Don Stanley speaking. The preceding was transcribed. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The chimes ring for Dennis Day and Judy Canova tomorrow night on NBC. Also, Judy Canova prepares to go operatic tomorrow because her special guest is Itzio Pimza. This is Chester William Bendix Riley. The man called X follows on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf. Saturday night chimes on NBC mean a full hour of fun with Dennis Day and Judy Canova. Dennis always appears perplexed and bewildered. But one thing that doesn't perplex him is how to make a popular ballad come to life in his thrilling tenor voice. And there's music also on the Judy Canova show, plus comedy in the mischievous Canova manner. That's Judy Canova and Dennis Day, tomorrow night over most NBC stations. My boss is the smartest and the stubbornest, the fattest and the laziest, the cleverest and the craziest, the most extravagant detective in the world, Nero Wolf. It's the transcribed adventure of The Case of the Careworn Cuff with that brilliant, eccentric private detective, orchid fancier, and gargantuan gourmet... Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. The place is Nero Wolf's office. At the moment, the world's greatest motionless detective is sitting in the chair which was built especially to support his 300 pounds. His eyes are closed, and he's making sounds through his nose. Archie. 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 Yes, Mr. Wolf, what is it? The phone, if you please, Mr. Goodwin. Well, it's on your desk, only eight and three-quarter inches from your left elbow. All you have to do is lean forward. Found it, Archie. What do you think I am, an athlete? Hello. No, wrong number, mister. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Wolf, if that old phone awakened you. Wrong number, and I was not asleep. I was merely uh, concentrating. On what? We're out of work. There's nothing to concentrate on. May have escaped your errant attention, Archie. 
There are other subjects for thought besides murder. Mm -hmm. Sure, blondes. And blondes. You're right at that, brunettes. Phew. That's not a nice thing to say about any girl, even if she does happen to be a brunette. Archie. Yes, sir? Go away. You annoy me. Suppose I did. It would get your beer for you. Fritz. Tonight happens to be Fritz's night off. However, you can always get your beer for yourself. Don't be an idiot. There are exactly 23 steps between here and the kitchen. As you very well know, I abominate strenuous physical activity. 23 steps times two is 46. You could walk very slow. Nonsense. Now that you mention it, uh, I happen to be mildly thirsty, Archie, would you? Now that I mention it, you'd better let the beer go for tonight. Why? Our stock is running low. You mean careless? I've been careful, because something else is also running low. What? Money? Fiddle sticks, there's plenty in the bank. Sure, but very little of it is yours. Mr. Wolf, do you remember that batch of orchids you bought last week? Of course I do, magnificent and very rare specimen. I got a magnificent bill for him this morning, too. It was uh, large? It was large. Hmm. Confound it, Archie, I shall have to do some work. You turned down half a dozen cases in the last few weeks. One of them may still require me. Most of them hired other detectives. However, there is a Mr. Wenceslas who might still be in need. His problem is what? As I remember, he's being followed by midgets. <laughs> he wanted you to do something about it. Not, not that he minded the midgets so much. It was the elephants they were riding. The man needs a psychiatrist, not a detective. Anyone else? I can check my files, but I don't think... Ha-ha! <laughs> Saved by the bell. Another creature like that, and I shall... Should... Answer the phone yourself? Assassinate. you see what it is. Okay. Hello? Yes, Mr. Wolf is in. Yes, he'll be in. He always is. What? But... Hmm. That was a Mr. Charles Porter. He was in a hurry. He's on his way over right now. Should be here in ten minutes. Prospective client, I trust? A thousand dollars worth of prospective client. Splendid, Archie, my beer. Okay, but, uh, <clears throat> look, I'm not sure you're going to accept his offer. Indeed, what does he want me to do for his paltry fee? That's the point. If I heard him right, he wants you to do nothing. The door, Archie. Yes, sir. I hear it. Mr. Porter? Naturally, I'm Charles Porter. Who else would I be? It's a large field. Uh, never mind. Come on in. I'm Archie Goodwin. Where is Wolf? Mr. Wolf is in here. Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Porter. Good evening. Fat, aren't you? It's moderately noticeable. Out your chair for Mr. Porter. Don't bother. I'm too impatient to sit. When I have business to take care of, I take care of it quickly. Very well. Send him out of the room. Mr. Goodwin, nonsense. He's my assistant. He remains. I don't like it. Archie, show Mr. Porter out. Now, wait. There's no need to get temperamental. Perhaps I'm a little abrupt. Rude. I'm a worried man. And impatient. You're wasting time, Mr. Porter. I suppose I am. The reason I came to you... It... Young man, what are you doing with that notebook? Getting ready to make marks in it. But... No, never mind. Mr. Wolf, you have a client named Dorothy Spencer. Have I? There's no need to be coy about it. I happen to know. Then you know. I want you to drop her. Drop her? Refuse to handle her case. Close the books on her. You know what I mean. Why should I? The girl has no money. I have. It doesn't answer my question. Perhaps this will. Appear to be a small package of dollar bills. It happens to be a thousand dollars. Archie, will you? I will. It is a thousand dollars. Thank you. Mr. Porter. Yes? You're paying me a thousand dollars in order that I refuse to act for Miss Spencer. Nothing more. That's right. What does she suspect you of? I said nothing about... Well, that is... You must know that as well as I do. Possibly. Nevertheless, what does she suspect you of? Uh, being a blackmailer. Whereas your occupation really is... I'm a musician. Pianist. I'm appearing nightly at the Windsor Hotel. Archie, have you made out a receipt for Mr. Porter? Yep. Give it to him and show him to the door. Okay. Mr. Porter? Mr. Wolf, I want your assurance that the entire affair is definitely finished. My association with Miss Spencer, you mean? You have my assurance that it is. You'll forgive a classical illusion. 
Miss Carver. Thank you. Good night. Mr. Wolf, I have a secret about Mr. Porter. He <laughs> smells. Some perfume or other. More important is right coat cuff. Is more worn than his left cuff. And a cop happens to be a musical term, meaning start again from the beginning. Oh, Porter thought it meant finished. Therefore, Mr. Porter is a liar. His ignorance of common musical term indicates that he's not a musician. The worn right coat cuff that he is an office worker. That's kind of leaping to a deduction. But even if Porter's a liar, Mr. Wolf, there is something else. He, uh... He paid you $1,000 to drop a client named Dorothy Spencer. Mr. Wolf, you never had a client with that name. Well, that's that. Dorothy Spencer is not in. Anyway, she's not answering her phone. Mr. Wolf, I said... I know what you said. Ah. That a comment? I'm worried. Mr. Porter may have assumed erroneously that Dorothy Spencer had employed or was intending to employ me. That does not explain why he lied about his occupation. Maybe he didn't lie. After all, your deductions could be wrong. Phew. Okay. Take care of that. Right now. I'm phoning her. Hello. Uh, Windsor Hotel? Get me the manager's office. Thanks. Ah, uh, could, could, could you tell me if a Charles Porter plays the piano, it's... Uh-huh. She sounds blonde. I see. Thanks a lot. What do you do after work? You... Oh, well, so long. She goes home and beats her husband. About Porter, Archie. Bad news. He does play the piano at the Windsor in the move room. So where does that leave your deductions? Untouched, of course. Let me think. Hmm... Yes, naturally. Naturally what? I came to the conclusion that Mr. Porter was an office worker. We have just discovered that Mr. Porter is not an office worker, therefore... You were wrong. I am never wrong. Therefore, the man who was here is not Charles Porter. Mr. Wolf, do you think a man of your weight should climb out on a limb like that? Fiddlesticks. Look up Porter in the phone book and call him. Okay. I'll take a second. Uh-huh. Archie, the phone company's best friend. <clears throat> yep, here he is. What do I ask him? Um, there'll be no need to ask Mr. Porter anything, just phone. You're the boss. Yeah, I have to say something to the guy. Hello, I'd like to speak to Charles Porter. So would you. Who is... Oh, Stephens, huh? Yeah, that's right, Archie. Oh. No, no, don't, don't, don't bother why I call it a coincidence. Goodbye. You know who that was? No. That was Sergeant Stebbins, Sergeant Pearlie Stebbins. I might add, as though you didn't know that Stebbins happens to be a sergeant in homicide. Indeed. You expected this. I still don't know what your conversation was about. It was about Charles Porter, who maybe was a liar, but who isn't going to tell any more lies. On account of he was just shot to death. Well, 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 if it ain't Archie Goodwin. Come in, Goodwin. Thank you, Sergeant Stebbins. I've been expecting you. Oh, that's sweet of you to say that, Pearlie. <laughs> Why did you phone Porter? His right coat cuff was more worn out than his left. So for that, you had to kill him? No, actually, I killed him because he didn't know his da capo. Hey. Yeah, hey. He don't look good anymore, eh? Guys who stop bullets with their face never look good. Burley, you've been robbed. I did. Hmm? That corpse is not Porter. <laughs> now relax, Goodwin, relax. His fingerprints were on file and they check. His girlfriend says he's Porter. If he could get up and talk, he'd tell you he was Porter. And what makes you think he isn't? Well, because when he visited us earlier tonight, he looked different. Not much, but... You said girlfriend? Yes, I said girlfriend. She's in the next room mopping up. She kind of broke down when we brought her here. You brought her here? Now, don't tell me what her name is. Why shouldn't I? It's Spencer. Dorothy Spencer. Ooh, that's what I was afraid of. Sergeant, I... Oh. Ignore him. He comes with the woodwork. His name is Goodwin, Miss Spencer. Archie Goodwin. Find what you were looking for? 
What I was looking... Somebody's gone through this place like a minor league hurricane. You? What business is it of Of you? mine? None, maybe. On the other hand, Nero Wolf might have other ideas. Matter of fact, I'm sure he'd have. Miss Spencer, why don't you go see him? The address is 601 West 35th Street. I don't see why... You want your boyfriend's murderer found, don't you? Now listen, Goodwin, the police are working on this. Sure, they'll see to it nobody harms a corpse. Goodbye, Miss Spencer. Don't forget that address, 601 West 35th Street. Believe it or not, you used to be a client of ours. Oh, Mr. Wolf, you're getting to be so brilliant, it's boring. Hooey. Uh, <laughs> that is, um... <laughs> All right, tonight you deserve it. I'll get you another can of beer. But this is the last one. Unless you promised it. Do some exercise, like uh, like maybe standing up and sitting down five minutes a day. Thank you. <sighs> and why should I indulge in such idiotic behavior? Well, after a while, you might be able to see your shoes. I've already seen them. Oh, that was 20 years ago. Things had changed. No more buttons. Hey, that must be Dorothy Spencer. Hmm, she's undoubtedly young and beautiful. You deduced that from the way she pressed the buzzer? I deduced that from the gleam in your eye, bah. Bah, all you want. I'm going to keep that gleam shining. Hello, Miss Spencer. Come in. Thank you. Mr. Wolf. Is the large sitting down gentleman behind the desk? This is Dorothy Spencer, Mr. Wolf. You will forgive me not rising. It is due to a necessary conservation of energy rather than rudeness. Archie, a chair. Sure. Here you are, Miss Spencer. Thanks. Now then, Miss Spencer, have the police found anything but dust in Mr. Porter's closet? Why, no. You were engaged to Mr. Porter? I was. That ring you're wearing, he gave it you? Yes. May I see it? Well, all right. Here. Thank you. Hmm, expensive. Very expensive. You may have it back. Miss Spencer, why are you marrying Charles Porter? I, I loved him. Who is Mr. Porter, according to Archie's description, was twice your age with considerably less than half your attractiveness. Love may perhaps be blind, but it is not astigmatic. I, I don't know what you mean. What were you searching for under the nose of the police? Nothing. Nothing how, at all. How did your fiancé earn his money? He played the piano. It's a... Boy, what he earned there in a year wouldn't begin to pay for the ring he gave you. Would you like to try again? I don't know how he made his money. I suggest that you do. I suggest that he earn money by the same method that he induced you to consider marrying him. Blackmail. Oh, but... Why was he blackmailing you? Old letters I'd written when I was too young to know any better. Your motives for murdering Porter would be twofold, then. Recovery of blackmail material and the avoidance of marriage to a man you dislike. I didn't kill Charles. No doorbell, Archie. Get Miss Spencer into the kitchen. Once. It must be the police. Yeah, let's go, Miss Spencer. Right through that door. And stay there until I call you. Front door, Archie. Uh, Mr. Wolf, do I know Dorothy Spencer's here? You know nothing. A simple role for you to play. Uh, I haven't got time to resent that insult right now, but wait until the next time you drop a collar button. Well, bless my soul, if it isn't dear old Inspector Kramer. How is the homicide department? Where's Wolf? A big surprise. He's sitting. Mr. Wolf. Good evening, Inspector. Where's Dorothy Spencer? This is not the Bureau of Missing Persons. The district attorney would like to talk to her. I shall tell her so the next time we meet. Yeah, that could be right now. She's in this house. I don't see her. Mind if I look around for myself? You have a search warrant, of course. Well, it so happens, no, but... Uh... Archie, the inspector's leaving. Okay, I'm leaving. I suppose by the time I get back with a warrant, she'll be in Hoboken. Hoboken? Where's that? Look, Wolf, you can go too far. One of these days, you won't be able to talk yourself out of a... I... Ah. Trail me to the door, Goodwin, to show what a good detective you are. Oh, Inspector Kramer doesn't love us anymore. Unfortunate. Archie, take Miss Spencer to a respectable hotel. Register her under an assumed name. She is to stay there until notified otherwise. Luckily, the good inspector neglected to inform us that she was the leading suspect in a murder case. Hence, we are not accessories after the fact, and I don't want her arrested for murder as yet. Her beauty has won you over. Oh, you will then return here immediately. Okay. What are you going to be doing in the meanwhile? I, uh, she shall be thinking. <laughs> Hmm. 
Archie? No. No, not Archie. Ah, that impatient and non-musical friend came in through the window. How are you, Mr. Not Porter, of course. Where's the girl? Question is beginning to bore me. I don't know. I think she's here. So did the police. I might add that they were slightly closer to the truth. Incidentally, what makes you think she was Porter's accomplice? She must have been. Nonsense, she wasn't. Porter was blackmailing her. Just as he was blackmailing you. In her case, it was letters. In yours, a previous criminal record, perhaps, that your employers might be interested in. I want to know where she is. Maybe this would help you remember. Good heavens, don't point a pistol at me. It annoys me. Ah, the police, I should think, open the door for them like a good fellow. Oh, no. I'm leaving. But if I don't find that girl, I'll be back. Knock the blasted thing down if it isn't open. All right, well, I've got the search warrant. Also, no doubt, a fine tooth comb. Bah. By the way, Inspector. All right, boys, cover the house. All right, Inspector. Yeah, what did you want? As your men go through the house, will you have one of them shut the back window? I've just had a burglar, and I suspect he left it open. Unless the matter is attended to, the house might be filled with <laughs> fresh air. Yeah, what's the matter with that? Fresh air, deadly poison. It clogs the lungs. And may I point out that the warrant you're clutching in your hot little hand is not a lease on the house. Finish your search quickly, if you please, and then... Uh... <laughs> Why not try hobo? So I just missed the inspector, huh? You did? That I can stand. I'm sorry about the burglar, though. Perhaps we can arrange to have you meet him in the morning. He left his calling card with name and address on it? He dropped his handkerchief here on my desk. Oh. Hmm. It's a handkerchief. It smells. <laughs> so it does. But, um... All of our unknown friends' clothes carry the odor. Therefore... Yeah? You will go out immediately to the nearest drugstore, buy a specimen of every kick of soap manufactured in this country. Mr. Wolf? Mister? No. I never realized just how many different brands of soap are made in this country. You should listen to the radio more often. So far, we've sniffed at 37 cakes. None of them smell like porter. Let's see. 38. Hey. Let me have it, Archie. Yes, the soap. Ah, it's labeled orchid ovals. I should say basically mislabeled. Orchids have no odor. Our task for the evening is finished. Why? All we know is the guy washes with a basely mislabeled soap. No, the odor would not have been so persistent in that case. Unquestionably, our visitor works for a soap company that makes orchid ovals. Every employee of a plant in which perfume in large quantities is used inevitably carries the odor on his clothes. Oh. And you already deduced he works in an office. Uh Uh-huh. Ah, I I go see him in the morning? You do? (laughs) You know, Mr. Wolf, what with hiring rooms for girls and paying visits to a perfume factory, I'm beginning to feel like a maiden aunt. No one would ever mistake you for a maiden aunt, Archie. Thanks. Is that another deduction? Maiden aunts rarely need a shave. Can I do anything for you, sir? Yeah. That is, uh, <clears throat> let's postpone that question and slip in another one. I'm, I'm looking for one of your office people. A sinner's 40s, 5 foot 10, brown hair and eyes, speaks in a sharp, quick voice. He owes and... you money, too. Uh, who owes me money? Mr. Wheeler, the man you were describing. He owes everybody money. In spite of the fact that he's office manager and makes lots and lots of money. How much does he owe you? Hmm? Oh, not, not an awful lot. It won't break me if I don't get it. Is he in yet? Well, he was, but he went home. He was sort of sick. Sort of? Mm, he got a phone call from somebody and rushed out. Mm, too bad. Well, I'd better scram. Well, you didn't answer my question yet. I'm off at five. My name's Gwen. Goodbye. Wolf speaking. Archie here. Our unknown's name is Wheeler. 
He left the office this morning sick after he got a mysterious phone call. Bad, probably. Get to Dorothy Spencer at once and bring her here. Right. I'm at Wheeler's house now. Thought I'd better check. His wife's here, too. Blonde? Uh-huh. How could you tell? Fetch you smirk in your voice. Get out of there fast and don't stop to console Mrs. Wheeler. <laughs> Huh. Nobody home. Shut that door behind you, Goodwin. What? Uh, never mind pulling triggers. I'll shut it. Oh, Archie. I would prefer silence. Keep your hands high, Goodwin. It's unhealthy. All the blood had run into my head. Archie, he murdered Charles. He did. Tart, Mr. Wheeler. You really shouldn't have it. It's against the law. Get into the bathroom, both of you. I already shaved. I phoned him. I thought maybe he had my letters. Porter couldn't keep his mouth shut about his other victims. He was going to force Dorothy to marry him. Did you find his material, Wheeler? Yes. In an office. He read it as a front. It's all burned. And why all the melodrama? You know about me, so does she. I can't trust anyone. Get into the bathroom, I said. Look, let's not lose our heads about this. Get moving, Goodwin. I like it here. All right, then. Here is where you'll get it. Hey, hey, hey wait, wait, wait a minute. Something's wrong. I got shot and Wheeler fell down. I shot him, Goodwin. Stebbins. Dear Sergeant Stebbins. Oh, you little flat-footed angel. <laughs> it's lucky for you my flat feet got staked out here in time. Just for that, I'll buy you a pair of arch supports for your next birthday, but... I'm beginning not to believe this. You had it all figured out? Well, not exactly. Well, that is... Uh Ah, Wolf sent you here. Well, he kind of phoned in and suggested one of us shoot down here and do some rescue work. (laughs) That old devil. Hey, you're not kidding. (laughs) What are you laughing about? (laughs) Wolf wasn't sure whether you'd need rescuing from Wheeler or... (laughs) Stop killing yourself with your own jokes. (laughs) Or whether Miss Spencer would need rescuing from you. You being a very foolish young woman, Miss Spencer, I suggest that in the future you exercise more care in your correspondence. Oh, I shall, Mr. Wolf, but how can I ever thank you? Well, one one way would be to listen wide-eyed while he explains how he solved the case. I have no intention. Oh, of... come on, Mr. Wolf, stop stalling. Please, mm. Mr. Wolf. Well, uh, I'd be very happy to. As a matter of fact, I'd like to see anyone try to stop me. <laughs> A man came to me, offered me $1,000 to drop a client I didn't have. Why? Because obviously he wished to direct my attention to that client. Me? You, Miss Spencer. Now then, he identified himself as Charles Porter, a musician. But I tested him and discovered that he knew nothing of music. Ah! The da capo routine. Precisely. Therefore, he was an imposter. His purpose... Yeah? To indicate by no means subtly that enmity existed between Porter and Dorothy Spencer. Huh? Thus, when Porter was found murdered, I would presumably be convinced that Dorothy Spencer, balked in her effort to enlist my aid against Porter, had resorted to most foul and bloody murder. Most foul and bloody murder is very fancy, Dorothy. Shows he likes you. Oh. I thereupon asked myself, why should an unknown seek to convince me that Dorothy Spencer was Porter's murderer? And you answered yourself? One reason only, because he himself intended to murder Porter, as he did. For which peccadillo he has, thanks to Sergeant Stebbins' accuracy with a revolver, already paid with his own life. Quadrat ap demonstrandum. Latin for that's what you wanted to know. I think you're wonderful, Mr. Wolf, and I'm going to... Ah, oh, be careful. ...kiss you. Hmm, Archie, Miss Spencer is a very dangerous young woman. Today I feel brave. Do you, Archie? Very brave. What are you doing tonight? Nothing. Let's do it together. Bah. Oh, is that Mr. Wolf? I said bah. Would you very much mind conducting your romance elsewhere? I would not. And do so at once. I have a very important matter to attend to. Goodbye, Mr. Wolf. Goodbye. Night, sir. Very important. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> 
have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Lamont Johnson as Archie Goodwin, and Jane Webb, Peter Leeds, Bill Johnstone, and Wilms Herbert. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Dear Dead Lady. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The NBC chimes are excited about the big show. An hour and a half every Sunday night with Tallulah Bankhead as Femme C. Comedy with stars like Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Jack Carson, Groucho Marx, and a host of others. Music with Meredith Wilson, Mindy Carson, and many more. It presents drama with Mr. Jose Ferrer and many more leading stars of Broadway and Hollywood. It's the big show. Starts Sunday, November 5th on NBC. This is Chester William Bendix Riley. The Man Called X follows on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf. This Sunday marks the premiere of The Big Show on NBC. Not just any big show, it's The Big Show. NBC's hour and a half of comedy, music, and drama. The best of each. The Big Show will be heard every Sunday afternoon over most of these stations with Tallulah Bankhead as Mistress of Ceremonies. Your stars for this Sunday's broadcast include Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Ethel Merman, Frankie Lane, Mindy Carson, Meredith Wilson, Danny Thomas, and hosts of others. All this and Tallulah, too. No wonder it's The Big Show. My boss is the smartest and the stubbornest, the fattest and the laziest, the cleverest and the craziest, the most extravagant detective in the world, Nero Wolfe. It's the adventure of the case of the dear dead lady with that brilliant eccentric private detective, orchid fancier and gargantuan gourmet, Nero Wolfe, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Nero Wolfe had just come downstairs, having tended to his precious orchids. He was, as usual, seated in the library, which served as the office. He had just dialed a phone number, and, with his eyes closed, was leaning back in his specially built chair, which was big enough for two, but not two of him. Domestic and imported delicacies. Mr. Halsbrecher, this is Nero Wolf. Oh, oh, yeah, Mr. Wolf. I was just about to ring you. Well, when... I have need of two pounds of duck liver. Ah. I do not, of course, refer to the commercialized Strasbourg pate. Well, I appreciate the order, Mr. Wolf, but. Uh... Next, my cook Fritz informs me that we require three fine fat geese. Look, Mr. Wolf. There's a little matter of an unpaid... You bill. might add 12 cases of beer, a bushel of Vermont apples, green for stuffing, and a gallon of Marquisa Patrisa Roman oil. Mr. Wolf. In addition, I... Fritz has listed six dozen eggs, four braces of Sussex woodcock, and a few pounds of Westphalian ham. You have all that? Well, I, I can get it, Mr. Wolf, but my bookkeeper... Thanks te- very much, Mr. Halsbracker. That will be all. Yeah. <clears throat> Now then, Archie. Yes, boss? You seem to be worried. Oh, I am. This means naturally that I'm supposed to handle Haltzbrecher's delivery boy when and if he shows. 
I had thought of leaving that simple matter to you. And what about the simple matter of the money? Money? I, I hate to bring up a vulgar subject, but where is it coming from? Oh, of course. You're right, Archie. I should have said... Said to... what? Charge it. Boss, look, you don't realize, I know, but we're into that truffle broker for 500-odd bucks and change. All right, all right. Then give him a check. Okay. Okay, I will give him a check. And I hope they'll let you keep the orchids in your cell. You're a wit, Archie. Uh-huh. You know, I'm on the bank's mailing list. We got a notice this morning. You don't mean... Oh, but I do. Again? Yeah, you just can't take money out of an account, boss. Sometimes you got to put some in. This is the only way to deal with the man I work for, and if I hadn't thrown him that scare, he wouldn't have been willing to listen when the door buzzer rang and a prosperous-looking young guy in the kind of clothes that don't grow on trees came in and stood in front of the boss's chair fiddling with the brim of his pork pie. My name is Oliphant, Mr. Wolf. Oliphant? Uh, yes, sir, Oliphant. I am the spiritual leader and guiding head of a small religious group known as the Seekers of the Inner Power. Ah, I see. Also a man addicted to marrying neither wisely nor well, but often. You read the papers. I do. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I am as aware of my sin-ridden past as anyone else is. The point is that I'm no longer that kind of man. Even a person such as I can see the light in time. Good. Might I ask why you've come to see me, Mr. Oliphant? I need your help, Mr. Wolf. Concerning? A certain young lady with whom I'm deeply in love. Oh, I beg you not to confuse the present emotion with any of my earlier escapades. What I feel for Miss Dana is the pure and righteous glow of an upright seeker of the inner power. I promise to look on you as thoroughly redeemed, Mr. Oliphant. Proceed. Oh, by the way, do I recognize the name of your young lady as a Park Avenue socialite, an amateur swimming champion? Yes, but she's sweet, wonderful, beautiful. I've asked her to marry me, and she's given me some hope. In time, I fully expect to make her my wife. Well, then where's the problem? The problem is the presence of another man in her life. I'm sorry, sir. I'm a detective, not a matchmaker. Oh, this isn't a question of making a match, Mr. Wolf. I have much too much respect for your talents to think of offering you such an assignment. Exactly. What do you want me to do? I want you to save Il Sedena's life. A life? Mr. Wolf, this other man I spoke of is insanely jealous. Not only of Ilse's present, but of her past as well. He has threatened to kill her. I don't doubt your earnestness in this matter, Mr. Oliphant, but how would you know? I was listening on an extension in Miss Dana's apartment a few days ago when Hunter called. Hunter? Yes, sir. Jack Hunter. Known as Jack the Babe Hunter. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I know that canvas back. Huh? Sure, he's a coffee and cake prelim waltz. Oh, he's not. He's a boxer. Archie is being fancy. Overlook it, Mr. Oliphant. Is Hunter in love with this lady of yours? I doubt it. He's a man of complete moral and spiritual corruption, I believe. Naturally, you would. But what are the facts? In my opinion, he's after her for her money. She has money? To burn. And you, Mr. Oliphant? Me. Can you also afford to burn? How much do you want? The answer to that would be astronomical. However, if you leave a check for, say, $7,000, I shall look into your matter the very moment I have completed a little research into the nutrition of the Polynesian orchid. Elephant's check gave our bank account a slight blood transfusion. I think it was the boss's plan to spend a week or two in the plant room before he got busy on the case. And he'd have done it, too, if that phone call hadn't come in about a little after nine, just after Wolf had polished off one of Fritz's dinners and was settling back with a stein of beer in his hand. Don't disturb yourself, Archie. I'll get it. Yeah, well, look out. You don't strain yourself, boss. You got to straighten out an elbow to reach that receiver. You have an unfortunate flair for mixing humor with impertinence, my friend. Hello, Nero Wolf speaking. This is Elsa Dana, Mr. Wolf. How do you do, Miss Dana? We were discussing you only this morning. So I've heard. Through whom? Ted Oliphant. I see. The young man seemed to be quite worried about you. The young man should tend to his own affairs. He said you were in some danger. I know what he said. And not one word of it was true. Oh? Uh, I'd like to talk to you, Mr. Wolf. I'm sure it'll be an immense pleasure. Where do you live? I have an apartment at uh, 22 Blanton Street. Could you be here soon? I could be there in a quarter of an hour, Miss Dana. By proxy, of course. (laughs) 
The proxy, naturally, was yours truly. Ten minutes later, at 20 past nine, I walked up to Ilsa Dana's door with a nosy elevator boy giving me the double O. The reason for his interest was that her door was open and the room inside was empty except for a little twisted pile of pale pink satin, which at close range turned out to be a woman. Which woman turned out to be Ilsa Dana? And Ilsa Dana was dead. She used to be pretty. She isn't now. Yeah, strangulation doesn't help any girl's look, son. Make anything of it? Well, the position of her body and the bloodstains on her pointed fingernails tells me that she put up a tough struggle before somebody succeeded in smothering with a pillow from the sofa over there. Yeah, that figures. When did it happen, I wonder? Yeah, the last 15 minutes, I'd guess. Say, who's been up in the elevator this evening? Nobody for her. Well, somebody came up. Well, who says not? They could have used the stairs, you know. Yeah. How well do you know Miss Dana? I know exactly zero about Miss Dana. How could you write her up and down every day and know nothing about her? It's a rule at a house to keep your mouth shut. The rule also goes when being questioned by a cop. A cop? Who's a cop? Oh, I guess you're a cello player from the Philharmonic. Look, I happen to work for a guy named Nero Wolf. Oh. Heard of him? Maybe. Well, if your memory comes alive, son, I might see my way clear to uh, spend a few dollars with you. Understand? I'll keep you in mind. Going down, mister? I spent time trying to get sense out of the superintendent and a set of chambermaids, but they were as quiet as a ballpark on Christmas Eve. Then I called the cops and told them about Oliphant and Hunter. By the time I got home, the house was dark and Nero Wolf was sleeping. Next morning, I gave him the details while he drank three bottles of beer. When I finished, he sat for a long time and then started another bottle. The prize fighter. What about the prize fighter, Archie? Hunter? Well, I, I phoned the hotel he lives in before you got up. And? They told me he wasn't in. Hmm. You know, I begin to think that Mr. Oliphant brought us a more absorbing case than he suspected. You know, I'm glad you like it. I don't like it. I don't like work of any variety. But this thing has its points. Well, what do we do next? Next, we investigate my client. What? Merely because a reformed playboy employs a detective doesn't exempt him from suspicion, Archie. Oh, now who's that? I'm afraid we have no choice but to open the door and see. My name is Young. Basto Young. It's nice meeting you, Mr. Young. What do you want? I want to see Nero Wolf. About? Uh... About a certain young lady with whom I am deeply in love. What? Will you repeat that? I want to see Mr. Wolf about a certain young lady with whom I am deeply in love. Mm -hmm. Her name, please? Ilsa Dana. Is it possible that you entertain plans of making her your wife? Why, uh, Yes, but uh, there's a problem involved. Another man? Uh, yes. Well, and... do come in. Do come in. I think we've been waiting for you. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Here's another one. Ah, oh, Mr. Wolf. You've come to me about Miss Ilsa Dana, sir? I have come to you, more specifically, about a man who has threatened her life. Hmm. How unusual. He's the treacherous kind. Mild-mannered, you know. As we say in my profession, he underplays it. Your profession, then, is the stage. It is, sir. Go on, you interest me deeply. I was present recently when he told her that he would certainly kill her. Unless she mended her sinful ways. Sinful? No one denies that Ilsa has had, uh, shall we say, a checkered career. But the man's attitude is totally fanatical. What's his particular brand of fanaticism, Mr. Young? Theodore Oliphant is a religious maniac. Well, what do you know? He's come to give Theodore a bad report card. I don't understand. I, I've come to ask Mr. Wolf to prevent his murdering Miss Dana. Am I allowed a direct question, sir? Why, of course. Where were you between 9 and 9.20 p.m. last night? 9 and 9.20? Why do you ask? You said I was permitted a direct question. Oh, well, I was walking in the uh, park, as I remember. Do you make a habit of walking in the park? I have lately. I'm preparing for an important role in the forthcoming production. What's so important about last night? From your point of view, a great deal, sir. Well, what do you mean? Last night, Miss Ilsa Dana was murdered... What? Mr. Goodwin here discovered the body. No. 
I'm afraid I must insist, Mr. Young. Uh, oh, why, why are you looking at me like that? Uh, are you accusing me of... A, I have a... accused you of nothing, my dear sir. Well, now, look, you're making a mistake. Oliphant killed her. You may be sure of that. I have your word. I know him. He was trying to reform her. I wanted to make her a devout follower of his cult, the Seekers of Power. I heard him tell her to her face that if she refused redemption, he would see to it that she didn't live on in her wickedness. You could produce other witnesses? Do you know... In your own smug way. You're as detestable a character as I have ever had. All right, all right. Let's everybody take five. Yeah? Nero Wolf? He's busy. This is Archie Goodwin. You'll do, Goodwin. This is Jack the Babe Hunter. Oh? Uh, how are you? Great. Except the cops seem to want to talk to me about some murder fandango because as I get it, you name my name. You got it wrong. I doubt it. And I'm coming over there to set you straight. <laughs> Why'd you ring me in on this mess, Wolf? You knew the girl pretty well. Me and how many more? Besides, what time was she murdered? Last night, between 9 and 9.20. I see. So if you would inform the police where you were at the time, that should be that. Yeah. By the way, Mr. Hunter, where were you at the time? I don't see your badge, Wolf. I was only wondering. I haven't been near the Dana woman for over a month. But if you're really interested, I'll give you the name of the killer. Please do not keep us in suspense, Mr. Hunter. A couple of years back, Ilsa financed a guy in a big and lousy Shakespearean play that closed like a clam and nothing flat. Go on. It was money down the drain. The guy's got nerve. And he was in love with her, and he figured she'd do anything for him. So he comes back to her to finance him again. This time in Hamlet, no less. I see. And I don't have to tell you what a flop that would be. You needn't tell me the actor's name either. You know? Mr. Barstow Young just left here. Yeah? Well, he's your man, Wolf. He got so sore when she told him she wouldn't toss any more moolah into his broken-down career, he went off his rocker and tore it down. Your reason for thinking so? I met him on the street one day, and he started beefing to me with blood in his eyes. So I could do not to punch him. The results might have been less fatal if you'd followed your instincts, sir. Ugh, I couldn't. Guy's built like a broomstick. He's weak as a cat. Hit him once, he'd crack like dry plaster. I see. Hmm. Hmm. What's on your mind? This man you're accusing of Miss Stainer's murder, Mr. Hunter, he was very much in love with her. She was thinking about marrying him, he said. He said. Yes, he did. I heard him, too. He was talking to a skullcap. Ilsa wasn't going to marry anybody. No? No, she couldn't. Why couldn't she? Well... But she just couldn't, that's all. So long. Well, now we got a perfect circle with everybody pointing at everybody else and nobody able to prove a thing. What Hunter says isn't impossible, Archie. You think Young did it? I don't think at all yet. But if there's anything more dangerous than a woman scorned, it's an actor scorned. We have another visitor. Yeah, who are you expecting? At this point, anybody. Hi. Oh, you. Yeah, I told you you might hear from me. Come on in. Who's this? A uh, fellow runs the elevator at 22 Blanton Street. What do you got for me, kid? Postcard. Postcard? Yeah, the cops missed it, but I spotted the edge stuck under a rug. Nice of you to have delivered it. Or maybe he was just being curious. Curious? It's not every elevator boy who has a chance to see Nero Wolf in the flesh. Oh, him? <laughs> Come off it, High Pockets. I'm here because you mentioned something about spending a few bucks. Oh. I wouldn't cross the street to see the best gumshoe that ever breathed. Look, gumshoes don't breathe, and how would you like a sock? Archie, a... pay him and let him go. Yeah, pay me and let me go. Sure, Mr. Wolf. Here you are. Thanks. Don't mention it. Anytime, pal. Anytime. How do you like that fresh little punk? Archie, the lad has done us nobly. Yeah? Typewritten card addressed to Miss Ilsa Dina. Well, what's it say? Rather peculiar message. Have you prayed tonight? It's signed with a single letter O. Have you prayed tonight? Yes. Signed O? Exactly. 
Weird, isn't it? Well, what's weird about it? What could be plainer? Have you prayed tonight? Now, I ask you, who is the man in this deal who's interested in praying? All of us, I hope, are God-fearing. All right, all right. But I ask you again, what does O stand for? It could stand for O'Brien, Obituary, Omaha. What about Oliphant? Oliphant, too. Look, what, what's with this indifference? The case is cracking and you slough it off. You remember what Young said? Oliphant threatened to kill her because she wouldn't join that cockeyed movement of his. Don't exhaust yourself, Archie. We have a hard night ahead. Yes, but I don't understand. But I don't mean to stifle your imagination, my friend. But if you'd reserve your deductions for a little while, you could lend me some much-needed assistance. What do you want? I want you to become a burglar. A burglar? I want you to hurry over to the dead woman's apartment on Blanton Street and ransack it. For what? How do I know? We need help. Anything may help us. Go through the place with a fine tooth comb. I tore the late Miss Dana's apartment to shreds, but I saw nothing. Then, just as I was about to give it up as a bum job, I noticed a little writing desk in the living room. Fried loosed the lock and spotted something among a pile of papers that belonged in no well-to-do flat. It was a pawn ticket. Lot 8N046. And the address was a pawn shop around the corner on 6th Avenue. It wasn't more than 90 seconds later that I walked into the joint and tossed the ticket across the counter. Oh, oh yeah, this, uh, Want to redeem it. And fast, up, Pops? Yeah, it's nothing that's worth much, mister. No? No. Oh, what is it? This... Small steel filing box. Oh. Anything in it? I don't know. Come to me locked. Never been able to get it open. We got it open, Wolf and I. Smashed the front end with a poker. There were some odds and ends inside. Old earrings, some thumbtacks, a cigarette lighter. Just trash. Then the boss stuck his fingers in and pulled out a plum. This is it. What do you mean, this is it? You fail to recognize this classic document? Huh? A marriage license, Archie. A marriage license. Yeah, well, whose marriage license? The wording is self-explanatory. Listen. This is to certify, etc., etc., thus licensing on this third day of May, 1946, the marriage of Miss Ilsa Dana to Mr. Johan Jaeger. Johan Jaeger? Exactly. Well, who in the world is Johan Jaeger? We'll soon see. I don't get it. I can understand. It's a befuddling little puzzle. It would be very easy for one to make a fatal mistake here. But, of course, you won't. I won't. Three hours later, I'd herded all the suspects into the office, and he sat in his chair and glared at them. Oliphant, Young, and Hunter. It was tense and tight, and the boss let it stay that way, saying not a word to anybody while he calmly sipped his beer. It was Oliphant who cracked first. I didn't kill Ilsa. I couldn't have. Jealousy is a very compelling motive, Mr. Oliphant. And you came to me, remember, complaining that there was another man in Ilsa Dana's life? Whatever I complained about him. And jealous as I was, I didn't kill her as the sacred power is my holy judge. Being unacquainted with your sacred power, I'd have to ask you for a better authority. Sacred power? Oh, it simply wouldn't have been possible for me to have done it. Why not? Yeah, why not? Because I... I was at Mickey's Night Owl Club last night from 7 until 4 a.m. Contemplating the sacred power, no doubt. That can be proved, Mr. Oliphant? Let me call now. Let the head waiter tell you. Hmm. Will you take your embarrassment as an indication that you're telling the truth? Hey, wait a minute. You you can't let him off like that. Don't be bothersome, Archie. Yeah, but we got that card he wrote, the one about have, have you prayed tonight, signed with his initial. He didn't write that card, Archie. Now, look. And the O is not his initial, is it, Mr. Barstow Young? Uh, I'm afraid I, I don't understand. On the contrary, I'm afraid you do. But for the record, I'll explain. Oh, Archie. Yes, boss? Hand Mr. Young that large red volume off the shelf behind Mr. Hunter's head. This one? That one, thank you. Now then, Mr. Young, you will favor me by opening the volume to page 1133. But why? Open it, sir. Good. You will now count six lines down from the top and read what you see. Have you prayed tonight? Thank you, Mr. Yang. What the devil is going Mr. on? Mr. Yang has just given us a reading from a tragedy. The line, have you prayed tonight, is spoken by the hero to the heroine just before he murders her. 
The name of the heroine is Desdemona. And the hero, as I'm sure you all know, is Othello. Othello? Yeah, the O was not Oliphant, Archie. Othello, I think, was a Shakespearean play which Miss Dana financed for our Mr. Young. And knowing she would recognize the quotation as well as the threat behind it, he sent it to her to warn her that he meant to murder her. You won't have the unmitigated gall to deny that, will you, Mr. Young? No. No, I don't deny it. Do I call the police? But I didn't kill her. The fact that I sent the car doesn't mean I killed her. Well, it'll do for my money. But not for mine, Archie. What? Mr. Young couldn't have killed Miss Dana. Why not? Because he lacks the strength to strangle such a healthy young woman, a champion athlete. Wide awake and full of fight. He's rather a frail person, as we know. And smothering Miss Dana with that pillow was no easy task. She struggled. Therefore, she clawed the wrists of the murderer. I'm sure that if you examine Mr. Young's wrists, you will find no scratches or scars. Here, let me see that. Go ahead. Well, Archie? Ah, you're right. Nothing. I was sure there wouldn't be. The person who actually killed Miss Dana was a powerful physical specimen. Yeah? Yes, Mr. Hunter. In all probability, a professional athlete. A muscular man in good condition. You pointing at me? Seems quite likely, doesn't it? You're out of your head. Am I? Yeah. Here, Sir Dana, war ihr Frau? Nicht wahr? Jawohl. I... I mean... You said ja, yeah, Mr. Hunter. And you meant ja, yeah. yes. I asked you in German if Elsa Dana was your wife, and you in the heat of emotion answered me yes in your mother tongue. Look, what's going on here? Allow me to present Mr. Johann Jaeger, Archie. Him? I've known it since we first saw that marriage license. You see, Jack Hunter is the English translation of our friend's real name back in Germany. Where he comes from, Mr. Johann Jaeger. Oh, what do you know? So you proved nothing. Yeah, I was married to Ilse. That's why I said she couldn't marry anybody else. But I didn't kill her. She was my wife. I loved her. Olivan told us you were insanely jealous of her. What if he did? You know better. Do we? Sure you do. You also told yourself over the phone that every word Oliphant said was a lie. Interesting. What is? How you could possibly know what Ilsa Dana told me over the phone. I haven't mentioned it to you or anybody else. Oh, well, well, you see... It... I see most clearly, Mr. Yeager, that you must have been in the apartment with her listening on the extension phone, or you couldn't possibly have that information... And it was only a few minutes after that telephone call that Ailsa Dana was smothered to death. And I see it's about time I said good night. Wait a minute, Jaeger. Wait a minute. Good work, Archie. I advise you to sit still, Mr. Johan Jaeger Hunter. I was right. I told you he threatened to kill her. But why? I've only guessed at the story. Reconstructed it, so to say. But I think you and Mr. Young are to be congratulated. On what, sir? On not having won your fair lady. You've always thought of her as a sweet, demure society girl. But actually, she was a vicious person, as bad as the man who killed her, if not worse. She tortured him cruelly for four long years. How can you say that about her? How can you doubt it, Mr. Oliphant? There must have been a great many men in her life. We know at least two definitely, you and Mr. Young. But she was in love with me. She was in love with me. I'm sorry to shatter your illusions, but she was not in love with either of you. She was using you for her purpose. What was her purpose? Tementing the man she married. That was her preoccupation day and night. She delighted in tyrannizing over him. As one might in breaking a bull or taming a wild mustang. Do I come near the truth, Hunter? Yes. Until I couldn't stand it any longer. May I ask then why you married her? Why? Because I couldn't help myself. I crawled for her. I married her on the terms that nobody should ever know I was her husband. She was too good for me, she told me. That to my face, over and over. But we belonged to different worlds. But I was crazy about her, so I took it. What I've taken you wouldn't believe. Oh, I'm sure I would, Mr. Hunt. I'm a very understanding man. The question is, will a jury believe you? And that we must begin to learn immediately. Archie. Yes, sir? Phone for Inspector Kramer. You 
have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story by Peter Berry was based on the famous characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Herb Ellis as Archie Goodwin and Lee Millar, Marna Keneally, Larry Dobkin, Barney Phillips, and Jerry Hosner. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Headless Hunter. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> And don't forget, this Sunday marks the premiere of The Big Show on NBC. Not just any big show, it's the big show. NBC's hour and a half of comedy, music, drama, and the best of each. The Big Show will be heard every Sunday afternoon over most of these stations with Tallulah Bankhead as Mistress of Ceremonies. Your stars for this Sunday's broadcast include Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Ethel Merman, Frankie Lane, Mindy Carson, Meredith Wilson, Danny Thomas, and hosts of others. No wonder it's The Big Show. And Theater Guild on the air this Sunday presents Judy Garland in Miss Alice Adams. So don't forget, Tallulah Bankhead brings you the big show Sunday on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, which follows transcribed in 30 seconds. What's on the menu at Duffy's Tavern tonight? Well, there's a full serving of laughs with Archie the manager, played by Ed Gardner, and his unpredictable friends, Miss Duffy, Clifton Finnegan, and Eddie the waiter. It's Duffy's Tavern later this evening over most of these NBC stations. And this Sunday, the big show comes your way once again with Bob Hope, Jimmy Durante, Perry Como, Jose Ferrer, Mindy Carson, Eddie Cantor, Meredith Wilson and his orchestra, and many, many more. And, of course, your MC once again will be Tallulah Bankhead. That's this Sunday for the big show. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we take you to the most famous brownstone house in New York City. The one located at number 601 West 35th Street. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf. Want something, Archie? Would you be interested in taking on a case involving a woman who was found stabbed to death in one of New York's fancier men's clubs? Can't you see I'm already occupied, Archie? My Oncidium hybrid is ailing. But, sir, cash. C-A-S-H. Remember, you need it to live on? Well, you're actually learning to spell. You'd better learn to count. We're broke. Thank you, Mr. Goodwin. Now, if you'll just go away and stop interfering. Oh, just a minute. Yes, sir? On your way out, switch on the fan. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's that one and only man of moves. The most famous detective in modern fiction. That corpulent, orchid-raising, beer-drinking gourmet who also happens to be a genius. Rex Stout's incomparable Nero Wolfe, starring Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, Nero Wolfe's long-suffering assistant, Archie Goodwin, tells us of the case of the careless cleaner. <laughs> I didn't know Clay Michelson very well at the time, though Mr. Wolf had hung one of the Michelson's paintings on the library wall. But then I guess we should have considered ourselves lucky not to have known him or his wife, Fila. Two weeks ago, they had a quarrel. Oh? Oh, Clay, darling. I didn't expect you home so soon. I thought you were going to the museum to see the Van Goghs. I decided not to, Fila. Oh. Well, if you were... Uh plan to paint this afternoon. I'll get out of the studio. I want to run some errands anyway. Why don't you make your phone call from here, Fila? Phone call? Who is he, Fila? He? Who were you waiting for this afternoon? Please, Clay, don't start that jealousy routine again. Don't try to kid me. You're being stupid, Clay. I'm stupid, all right, but I'm getting wise pretty fast. I'm through, Fila. I've had enough. I'm leaving you. So stay out of my way and keep your boyfriend out of my way, too, whoever he is, or I'll kill him. 
What can I do for you? Uh, uh, sleepy. I want to have a drink and go to bed. I'm sorry, sir. The Garrison Club's a private establishment. No rooms available to the public. You think I'm drunk? Oh, no, sir. Why, why do you suppose I came here? But I'm sure I wouldn't know, sir. I'll tell you why. I came here to see my old pal, Lou Saunders. That's why. You know Mr. Saunders. Do I know? Look, I paint him, Lou sells him. Mr. Saunders... Is your agent? I'm Clay Michelson. Just call Mr. Saunders. Clay, uh, what in the world? Lou, tell this guy who I am. But I'm sorry, Mr. Saunders. I... It's all right, Mr. Martin. You see? Let's go have a drink. Yeah, yeah, sure, Clay. Yeah. You know what, Lou? I left Fila. Yep, I walked out on her. Is there something I can do, Mr. Saunders? Yeah, have someone fix a bed in the other room of my suite. Mr. Michelson will be staying with me. At least for tonight. <laughs> Mr. Wolf? Yes, Ajim? It's Friday. Good. Fish for dinner, then. Nope. I was not referring to dinner. You were not? I can think of nothing more interesting at the moment. Oh, I can. My salary... Of course, according to the Julian canon. We're on the Gregorian, so let's stick to it. Today is Friday. Today, I get paid. Archie, there's a drop. Oh, don't exaggerate. You can't be getting the cold shutters just because I'm asking for my money. I can distinctly feel fresh air flowing into the room. Well, it's possible I might have opened a window six inches. You're insane. Shut it at once. Nope. Are you trying to blackmail me? Think it might work? Never. Then the window stays open. You're fired. I accept your offer. All you have to do is pay up. I've hired you again. Oh, Mr. Wolf, you've cleaned out the bank balance again? Well, that is... <clears throat> well, had you seen those Miltonians... Would I have voluntarily given up my paycheck for them? Orchids are very beautiful, Mr. Wolf, but blondes are... The door, Archie. I am unemployed. Confound you, it may be a client, and if it is, and we can uh, extract the fee. You follow me, Archie? I'm already on my way to the door. Mr. Wolf. I've got to see him at once. Well, come in. Thank you. Mr. Wolf, this is... My the... name is Sanders, Mr. Wolf. We've met before. I yes, think... I remember. As a matter of fact, you sold me a painting of Michelson. Yes, well, that's why I'm here. It's about Michelson, Mr. Wolf, that I've come. Frankly, I... I think the man's about to go mad. He and his wife have split up and... and uh, I... Such a splendid artist, too. A pity. I don't know what to do. He's drinking like a fish. For two weeks, I've been letting him live in part of my suite at the Garrison Club, but uh, he's just steadily getting worse. I try a hospital. I can't. The publicity. Mr. Wolf, Clay admired you so that time we all had dinner after the painting transaction. I, I thought maybe you could talk to him. Maybe you could get him on his feet again. I'm not a doctor, Mr. Saunders. But I'm sure he'd listen to you. Excuse me a moment, Mr. Saunders. Near the Wolf speaking? Inspector Kramer. Uh, good evening, Inspector. Got a guy called Lou Saunders at your place? Garrison Club said he'd gone to your place. Yes, he's here. Well, see to it that he doesn't leave until I get there. You hardly do that, Inspector. I have no reason to detain Mr. Saunders. There's plenty of reason. It so happens a woman's just been murdered in his suite. Murdered? Yeah. A Miss Hilda Lundgren. What's happened? Now, will you hold him? Uh, do you know a Miss uh, Hilda Lundgren, Saunders? Hilda Lundgren? I've never heard of her. She seems to have chosen your suite to be murdered in. Oh, I, I'd better get right over there. Mr. Saunders says to tell you he'll be right over, Inspector. Now, listen, Wolf. Good day, Inspector. Murdered? Murdered in my suite? Mr. Wolf, you've got to come with me. Uh, Mr. Goodwin will accompany you after the formality of a retainer, Mr. Saunders. Oh, anything you say. Here, here, I'll write a check. Good, uh, 500. 500? Fine. My friend and assistant, Mr. Goodwin, will go with you. I have great confidence in his ability to bring back every detail of a murder, particularly where a woman's involved. Okay, you photographers, picnic's over for tonight. Pick up your stuff and get out of here. You sound real mean today, Inspector Kramer. Well, if it isn't Nero Wolf's favorite stooge, 
What are you doing here, Goodwin? I got bored with my knitting. Look, I wasn't asking for humor. I'm Louis Saunders, Inspector. Saunders? Ever seen that woman before? I... Yes. Yes, I believe I have. I can't remember where, but the face looks familiar. Mmm, lovely-looking woman. Blonde and really built. Well, she ought to look familiar. She's one of the cleaning women here at the club. She is? Cleaning? Well, since when have gals like this been reduced to cleaning floors? What's happening to the world? There ought to be a law. Yeah, there is. She was killed with a knife, or haven't you had time to notice? Uh, That's not a knife, Inspector Kramer. That's one of Clay's Chinese letter openers. What was that? Well, nothing. Nothing at all. Yes, it is a strange knife. What were you saying, Mr. Saunders? I just, just said that that looked like one of the letter openers belonging to one of my friends. Who is this Clay? Clay Michelson, the artist. But you can't possibly think he'd do a thing like this. I think everybody did it until we know otherwise. When were you last up here, Mr. Saunders? Me? Why, just a little while ago. I changed my clothes just before I went to see Mr. Wolf. She wasn't here then? Well, I don't know. I didn't come into this room, just in my part of the suite. Your part? Who occupies this room? Mr. Michelson. He's been staying with me. Strange wound, no blood. What do you think you are, Goodwin, a medical examiner? Oh, but I Yeah, 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 the killer probably wiped the blood away. Saunders, have you any idea where your artist friend might have run off to? I haven't seen Clay all afternoon. He spends a lot of time down in the bar. Well, he'd hardly sit in a bar if he's killed somebody. But... Why would he pick on the cleaning woman? Oh, this is no ordinary cleaning woman. Get a load of that figure. Watch it, Goodwin. Watch it. You're liable to stretch your brain. But you're wrong. In spite of everything, Clay's still terribly in love with his wife. He he, he wouldn't... Uh, Hello. Where did you get in? Yeah, who's this? Clay. We're your friends, Lou. They won't serve me any more liquor down at the bar. I gotta find my flash. Mr. Michelson, may I introduce you to Inspector Kramer of the police? Who's this guy, Lou? He's Nero Wolf's assistant. Wolf? Police? Well, what do you all want? Somebody park overtime? Where's my flask? The one with my initials. I just bought it this morning. Mr. Michelson, do you know that somebody was murdered here in your room? Murdered? Why don't you guys go away and joke with somebody else? Where's my flask? You better get hold of yourself. I said there's been a murder. Understand? You serious? Yep. And I wouldn't be surprised if Inspector Kramer here considers you top suspect. Me? They think I did it? You better pull yourself together, Clay. Yeah, because I got a lot of questions. Excuse me, the phone. Now sit down, Mr. Saunders. I'll answer it. Hello? 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 This is Fila. Who is this? This is Inspector Kramer. Hello? Hello? Hmm. Who is Fila? Anyone know? Well, that's my wife. Your wife? I I want to speak to her. Come back here, Michelson. Let me alone. You're not going anywhere. Now stay back there. You're wrong, Inspector. I am going somewhere. Junior's got a gun. Yes, Inspector. You should be more careful about your gun when you shove people. Now, look, Mr. Michelson. I'll see Mr. Wolf myself. Stay back, Inspector. You haven't a chance. We'll nab you before you get a block away. Well, then I'll just jerk these phone wires. There. And I'll lock the doors. That should hold you long enough. Good night. Hmm. Here, yeah, Wolf speaking. Wolf Kramer. Indeed. Clay Michelson may be on his way over there. Hold him until I get there. Hold him? Why? Not more than ten minutes ago, he held me up at the point of a gun. He carries a gun? It was my gun. <laughs> Careless of you, Inspector. Ah. Goodbye. <laughs> Come in. Mr. Wolf? Yes? My name is Clay Michelson. Yes, I was rather expecting you. You've got to help me. They think I murdered someone. You shouldn't have run away from the police. I, I've been drinking a lot, but, but I wouldn't murder anyone. Feel it, tell you that. No way. Was she the model in that painting of yours I purchased? What difference does that make? I tell you, they're after me for murder. You obviously love your wife deeply at the time you painted her. Oh, here you are, Mr. Wolf. It... Michelson. Clay. Good Lord, man. The police are on their way over here. He came for my help, Mr. Saunders. Oh, I'm glad he did, Mr. Wolf. But we left Inspector Kramer talking from a phone booth. He'll be here any minute. 
Then we have only a minute to decide why anyone would want to kill a cleaning woman. I didn't kill anybody. She was a beautiful woman, Mr. Wolf. I gathered that, Archie, from your unusual interest in the case. She was stabbed with a letter opener from Mr. Michelson's house. Which might add Mrs. Michelson to our suspect list. Fela? You can't suspect Fela. You're very gallant to Michelson. Just how was this beautiful young cleaning woman, this Miss Lundgren, stabbed? Um, in the heart. Her eyes were wide open, pupils dilated with shock. And Details I... later, Archie. Kramer will be here shortly. The moment I would like to know where everyone was. Well, Mr. Saunders was here with us, you remember. I don't know where Mrs. Michelson was, but I could go see her and find out. No, it won't be necessary, Archie. Mr. Michelson, where were you? Me? Why, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I can't seem to remember. It's hardly what we would call helpful. I, I was drunk. Maybe I went to Fela's. I've been over there lots this week trying to talk to her. I must have gone over there. Have you ever seen the murdered woman before? No, I never saw her before in my life. I've seen her before, Mr. Wolf. Indeed, Mr. Saunders. I seem to remember your earlier statement to the contrary. Well, uh, I didn't know her name, but when I saw her, I remembered her. I understand she was quite an alcoholic. Hmm. Unfortunate woman. Beautiful woman. Well, look who's here, Inspector Kramer. Oh, here you are, Michelson. And as usual, you didn't have the courtesy to ring the bell, Inspector. And give you a chance to get this guy out of here? Nothing doing, Wolf. Now, come on. We're going to headquarters. Mr. Wolf, you can't let him take me. I didn't do it. I'm afraid there's not much I can do about it, Mr. Michelson. Come on. You come along too, Saunders. I gotta get a statement from you. Of course. This way. Come on. Very well. All right. I just got an angle. Really, Archie? Sure, it's simple. Saunders been going for this beautiful cleaning babe. Clay worms in. Saunders kills her. Perhaps there was jealousy somewhere in this case, Archie. Yeah, Wolf speaking. Mr. Wolf, this is Fela Michelson. You don't know me, but you once bought a painting from my husband. I've got to see you, Mr. Wolf. You've got to help me. <laughs> Hmm. This is Michelson. Have some of this delicious beer. Another can, Archie. And now, Mrs. Michelson, may I ask how you found out there was a murder in the first place? A policeman came to see me. He told me what had happened. That they were looking for Clay. I don't know what to think. He's temperamental, he's jealous, and he's sometimes violent, but I can't imagine anything like this. Not Clay. Maybe some of those friends of his, but... You uh, don't care for your husband's friends? No. They all live off him. They're leeches. Mrs. Michelson, did your husband come to see you this afternoon? This afternoon? No. You're quite positive? Oh, yes. Because that was his alibi for the time of the murder. He said he went to see you. Of course, he was fuzzy, usual effect of alcohol on the brain cells, but... Uh... Uh, Mrs. Michelson, might I be a little indiscreet for a moment? Indiscreet? Have you been seeing some other man? I don't know what you're talking about. Please, Mrs. Michelson, I'm afraid your face gives away more than you tell. I thought we were here to talk about a murder, Mr. Wolf. Indeed, but your husband's jealousy might well fit into that category. Oh, Clay, imagine things. You're a very beautiful woman, Mrs. Michelson. Now, if you will try telling me the truth, perhaps we can accomplish something. But I tell you... Uh... All right. So I thought I was in love with another man. Your husband suspected but didn't know, huh? No. Clay didn't know. He wouldn't have given me a divorce anyway. You sound as though you want your husband back. I did, but I didn't even know where he went. Indeed, Mrs. Michelson. Archie informs me that the murdered woman was quite lovely. What are you trying to suggest? You said yourself you wanted your husband back. Yeah, one woman jealous of another, that's always murder. Why, that's stupid. Clay wouldn't play around with a maid. That's stupid. Clay loves me. I'm not jealous of anyone. No one, do you understand? Archie, if you'll see Mrs. Michelson home... Yes, sir. Thank you. I can find my own way. I'd prefer Archie took you, Mrs. Michelson. You wanted my help, didn't you? I... Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Michelson. If you will just wait outside for a moment, please. What have you got in mind, Mr. Wolf? Try exercising your own judgment just once, Archie. You mean she's the one who's jealous? Perhaps, Archie. Perhaps she may want us to think she was jealous. Perhaps she actually doesn't want her husband back at all, only to pin a murder on him. Oh. You see, in this case, it would be simpler than divorce. Yeah? 
Yeah, she might just be trying to get rid of him. She might, Archie. But then she's a woman, so don't count on anything. <laughs> she might even be telling the truth. This is where I live, Mr. Goodwin. Nice. Very nice. I like Greenwich Village. I'm trying to figure out why Mr. Wolf sent you along with me. <laughs> I'm a sucker for beautiful women. <laughs> I wonder. Archie. Huh? Does Mr. Wolf believe me? He hasn't made an official statement yet. Nice furniture and things. You sound like an appraiser or, or someone looking for something. That's because it's November. Mr. Wolf sent you to search my apartment. You could be wrong. I don't... Oh. What's the matter now? Thought you said your husband hadn't been here today. He, he wasn't. And what's his flask doing among these papers on the desk? Very prettily decorated with his initials. He was looking for it at the club. Flask? I don't know what it's doing there. Yeah, sure. You're trying to help, Clay. Right into the electric chair. But... His only alibi was his being here this afternoon, and you said he wasn't. Then what is his flask doing here? He said he just bought it this morning, so he must have been here today. I don't know what you're talking about. Where's your phone? Well, you've got things wrong. I don't know anything about that flask. I... Hey, the lights... Who switched off those lights? Fela, put those lights on. Put on those lights. Oh, oh, the lights are... Get to the lights. That flask... Gone. Nero Wolf speaking. Wolf, where's Fela Michelson? Fela, perhaps you might try the lost and found, Inspector. Now, look, I know she was over at your place. I thought you were interested in Clay Michelson. Well, I let him and Saunders go for the present. They're clean until I get the medical examiner's report. Oh, when will it be ready, by the way? An autopsy takes time, you know that. Where's the Michelson woman? I believe she had a date with Archie. Why do you want her? I'm sure it never dawned on you, Wolf, but this cleaning woman who was killed was some dish. Maybe Mrs. Michelson was the jealous one. Your thinking is beginning to bear an amazing resemblance to Archer's, Inspector. Also, it maybe never dawned on you that Fela Michelson hasn't offered an alibi for the time of the murder. Hmm. You're right, Inspector. Yeah, you are. Come on, Wolf. Quit stalling. Where's Fela Michelson? Hmm? What? Oh, I really don't know, Inspector, but perhaps as a last resort, of course, you might try her home. Good night, Inspector. Ah, uh, inevitable. The moment I'm comfortable. Come in. Mr. Wolf. Oh, thank heavens you're here. I always am. Where's Mr. Goodman? I don't understand how it happened. I swear I don't. What happened? I haven't got any idea how it got there. Got where? Calm down, Mrs. Michelson. I... Uh, now, just what got where? Clay's new flask. Your assistant, Archie, he... He came home with me and that new initial flask was there. He thinks Clay was there this afternoon and that I'm trying to frame him or something. Oh, here you are. <laughs> She's here, therefore. This is our gal, Mr. Wolf. She's been lying right down the line. I tell you, Clay wasn't there. Then why did you give me this clout on the head and grab the evidence and run? I didn't. I didn't hit you. I ran, but I didn't hit you. And I didn't take that flask either. Oh, next thing she'll say, there wasn't any flask. Stop gaping at Mrs. Michael Sinatra and open the door. Yeah, sure. Well, Mr. Wolf, they let Clay and me go for the... Fila, what are you doing here? After your visit this afternoon, Mr. Saunders, she decided to come down and see me. After my visit? What, what makes you think I was at Felix? It was Mr. Saunders, not your husband, who came to visit you this afternoon, wasn't it, Mrs. Michelson? I... I don't have anything to do with Mr. Saunders. Then might I ask why you called him today? I, I wasn't calling him. I was calling Clay. You told me earlier yourself that you didn't know where Mr. Michelson was. Well, I... All right. So what if it was Mr. Saunders who came this afternoon? As he has for many afternoons. What are you trying to get at, Mr. Wolf? Saunders? He and Fela? Yes, Archie. Mr. Saunders, the artist's friend and agent, happens to be the one who was making a fool of the artist. But that's all over. I told him. That's what I was talking to Mr. Saunders about this afternoon. I didn't want Clay to know. Clay would never have come back. All but... right, so it was Fela and me. I admit it, but that's not murder. I suggest that it is, Mr. Saunders. 
I suggest that one of you two murder the cleaning woman. Whichever one of you carelessly left the whiskey flask in Fela's apartment. This is murder, Mr. Wolf. Not a joke. Not at all a joke. You see, our cleaning woman was not murdered by the knife found in her body. She was poisoned. What do you mean? Not by the knife? Poisoned. She undoubtedly drank from Michelson's flask while she was working in his room at the garrison club. But she was stabbed. True. However, Miss Lundgren was an alcoholic. Saunders mentioned that, and I checked with the club manager. But how does that prove there was poison in the flask? That she was poisoned? Archie. Would you mind uh, repeating your description of the dead Miss London? First, uh, as to the wound. Okay. There was no blood. Someone advanced a fantastic theory about wiping the blood away. And now, Archie, the description of the body of Miss London. I mentioned the fact that her eyes were wide open, the pupils were dilated. Uh, hey, dilated pupils? Yes, Archie. The lack of blood had already made me wonder about the entire affair. When you added the dilated pupils... What's special about dilated pupils? In death, that is a common symptom of poison by a certain vegetable drug of considerable potency. But what was the point of stabbing her? The poison did the job. However, the killer later used the letter knife in an effort to deceive the police. However, he unhappily forgot that the dead don't bleed. I think you're guessing, Mr. Wolf. Am I? All I can say is that I was at the pool in the early afternoon. Hmm. You're very certain you were at the club pool when the murder was committed, Mr. Saunders? Certainly. From one until three. Excuse me, please. Wolf speaking. Inspector Kramer, medical examiner's report just came in this minute. And get a load of this wizard. The dame didn't die of stabbing at all. I know. You know? She died of drinking a fatal dose of poison known as deadly night shade. What? Inspector, do they know what time she died? Time? The medical examiner says 2.30. Thank you, Inspector. Oh, incidentally, if you care to drop over here, you may pick up the murderer. Goodbye. I heard him, Wolf. She died at 2.30. As I told you, I was in the pool at 2.30. Which is exactly how you prove yourself a murderer, Mr. Saunders. Oh, I prove myself... Even the police didn't know what time she died. Until just now... And the body wasn't found until the evening. How did you know she died between one and three? I, I, I didn't know, but... You I... probably were at the pool at the time. The maid drank the poisoned whiskey. You put in the flask of your friend Clay Michelson. I tell you, you're crazy. You planned to get rid of Clay, who stood in the way of your marrying Fela. When you came back to your room at three and found that the maid had drunk it instead... You stabbed her with Clay's letter opener to cover up the real cause of the murder and throw suspicion on Clay. Oh, this is nonsense. Ridiculous. The and then, of... when you learned that the woman for whose love you were willing to commit murder was through with you, you took Michelson's new flask to feel his home, confident that it would be found there. Yes, and then he attacked me and stole that flask again in order to make it look like Fela had done it. Exactly, Archie. Mr. Saunders, the chances are that your fingerprints will be found on that whiskey flask. And they'll be able to trace the poison to wherever you purchased it. The chances oh, are... Oh, no, you don't. Careful now, all of you. Guns bore me, Saunders. Oh, yeah? I'm leaving. You are not... Clay! Oh! Clay. Yes, Mrs. Michelson, your husband has been there for some time. Clay, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Well done, Mr. Michelson. I think you proved that an artist's life may indeed be exciting. I have been an awful fool, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Michelson, you might remember for the future that unreasoning and unjustifiable jealousy sometimes creates the very conditions that it fears. You're being very kind to me, Mr. Wolf. How can we ever thank you? By prompt remittance of your check on receipt of my bill in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Good day, Mr. and Mrs. Michelson. Good day, Mr. Wolf. Good day. What's the matter with Archie? You look glum. Yeah. I always have the lousiest luck. Meaning? A hectic case with two beautiful dames. Michelson gets one, the undertaker gets the other, and what do I get? Hey, that reminds me. You got a fee. I get paid. <laughs> You 
have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story was written by Cheryl Hendricks and based on the famous characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin and Betty Lou Gerson, Howard McNear, Dan O'Herlihy, Vic Perrin, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Beautiful Archer. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun and laughs with the chimes later this evening when Ed Gardner stars in Duffy's Tavern. As usual, Duffy won't be there, but Archie the manager will definitely be on hand to spread his whimsical advice where it'll do the most damage. Tomorrow night, there's action on NBC with Herbert Marshall starring as the man called X in another exciting battle against the forces of international intrigue. Next, Sam Spade. Later, William Bendix on NBC. Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. It's five o'clock in New York City, and the big neon signs light up the dark office that overlooks Broadway on the corner of 53rd Street. Behind a second-hand mahogany desk, relaxing in a swivel chair, is the leading figure of the Diamond Detective Agency, combination stockholder, office boy, and clue chaser. He is Richard Diamond, and his mind is on a lovely redhead named Helen Asher as she sits on a couch talking about things he likes to hear. At this moment, however, another scene is taking place in the wealthy district of Long Island. A long black convertible is just pulling up to an old English mansion, and a curvaceous blonde steps from the car. She is met at the door by her brother. Well, good evening, my dear sister. You're looking simply ravishing. How would you know the difference? Oh, drop dead. You disgusting excuse for a man. Why don't you sober up for five minutes and take a look at yourself? I did once. Oh, by the way, our dear stepfather would like to see you in the study. Tell him to go... I already did. Now it's your turn. I don't want to. Now get out of my way, Chris. Mm, Suit yourself. But Murray Lang's in there with him. Murray? Hmm? Did I start your heart going pity pat? Oh, shut up. <laughs> you better go in and protect your money, darling. Bye, jailbird. Stop. I don't care what your plans are. They can turn my daughter, and that's enough for me to put a stop to them. You're not going to put a stop to anything. You can't intimidate me, Lang. You're just a cheap, no good gangster, and your methods are too well known to frighten me. Come in. Oh, hello, Liz. Hello, Murray. I'm glad you're here, Elizabeth. Mr. Lang and I were just discussing your future. I'm surprised you put up with it this long, Murray. Come on, let's leave my dear stepfather until he simmers down. Elizabeth, I want to talk to you. Well, I don't want to talk to you. Let's go, Murray. Listen to what he has to say. Maybe you'll get a laugh out of it. Well, what is it? I've just been talking with Lang about your intention to marry him. I have advised him that if such a thing were to take place, it would result in the most serious of consequences. Is that all? No, that is not all. When you got into your trouble with the police, my dear stepdaughter, you were paroled in my custody. If I should report to the board that you had violated the terms of your probation, you would most certainly go to prison. Why, you... What's the matter? Aren't you satisfied with the salary you collect for taking care of Mother's estate? How dare you, you little... Sit down. (laughs) You look bigger behind a desk. Well, just yell and scream all you want to. After Monday, you better start looking for another source of income. You know very well it's not the money. But your greasy boyfriend here would certainly like to get his hands on it. Look, you, I don't give a hang if you are a midget. I'm not going to stand here and listen to you. Murray. No, baby, I won't take it. I'll wring his scrawny little neck. Go on, lad, go on. It would give me the greatest of pleasure to call the police and have you locked up. I'll fix it so you won't have a head to call anyone with. Murray, leave him alone. Can't you see that's what he wants? Yes, well, Mr. Lang. 
Come on, Liz. Let's get some fresh air. I want to say one more thing. Just remember, Father, my probation expires Monday. After that, you won't control any part of my income, so you better start getting packed. And if I report you to the probation board in the morning... I wouldn't. If you do that, you'll not only stop being my guardian, but you'll stop breathing. Get out. Get out, both of you. Come on, Mary. Try to intimidate me. I'll make them both sorry. Detective. Detectives. Private detectives, yes, yes. Yes. Foreign. Ah, here's one. Full page ad. Must be doing very well. Richard Diamond, private detective. If you've got a case, share it with me. Richard Diamond. Seven, seven, Mr. Diamond? That's right. I want to hire you for a few days. Oh, you saw the ad. Well, it just so happens I'm available. I can't tell you much over the phone, too many extensions in the house, but it's about my daughter. I'm afraid she's going to get herself into some serious trouble. Well, how old is she? Twenty. Tell her to wait a year. My name is Chase, Ralph Chase. I live at 82 Maple Drive, Sands Point. Will you come out this evening? A hundred dollars a day and dibs on the icebox. I'll see you about eight. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. What was that all about, Rick? Oh, got a job, baby. When do you start? Oh, yes, you're right. No, Rick. You can start it in the morning. You can't break another one tonight. Now, come on, Helen, baby. A job's a job. And a date's a date. I won't let you break this one. Your car downstairs? Yes, but I can drive myself home. Please, Rick. You promised you wouldn't break another one. Keys in it? Yeah, look. I want to hire you to protect me for this evening. Mm. I've been receiving mysterious phone calls, and I'm in fear of my life. Really? You've got to take the job. Old friends come first. I'll have to get home and shave before I start working. You mean you'll take it? After 12.30. Bye, baby. You beast. Oh, you must be getting tired from driving that big car around all day. Grab a cab, honey. It'll give you some rest. I'll take good care of your car. What? Want a buck for the cab? Huh? No, no. On second thought, you only live about 25 blocks. Walk will do you good. Rick. Deep breathing all the way up Fifth Avenue. Nothing like it. Bye, baby. Oh! On the way to the car, I thought about Helen, the most wonderful girl in the world. Money, looks, but she had one bad fault. She wanted to get married. I got into the big sedan and headed for my apartment. I'd been up late the night before with the blonde singer, and I was feeling tired. Funny how things change. My nights in college were just as busy, but at one o'clock the next afternoon, I was out playing football. I faced facts pretty well, so when I got home, I took a nap. I slept until seven and got up and dressed. I drove Helen's car out to Long Island, and at eight o'clock sharp, I was ringing the doorbell of the Chase Mansion. It was a big house, all right. If they built another one like it, Long Island would sink. Well, to someone at me chamber door. My name's Chris. Boo. Blow your booze some other direction. Your breath would wither a lung. My alcoholic exhalations are composed of the finest ingredients. You must have a weak stomach. Look, if you'll just stagger out of the way, I'd like to see Mr. Chase. Dead or alive? What? Nothing. I was just thinking out loud. Well, go right ahead. And after you talk with my stepfather, you can find me in the bar. <laughs> You'll probably wind up like I am. That's a sweet thought. Where can I find your stepfather? Probably in the library, lying in my money. I left him leaning against the front door, gagging on the fresh air. I wandered down a long hallway and a big sitting room, furnished with enough antiques to make the Metropolitan Museum give up in shame. There was something about the place, a heavy quietness, like a bar of gold in a dark room. The shot had come from up ahead, and I tried a couple of doors before I found the room. Mr. Chase! Mr. Chase! In here! In here! Mr. Chase? Yes, yes. Come in and shut the door. I looked over at Ralph Chase crouching behind a desk. He got up slowly, all five feet of him. And I tagged him for a guy who would give a thousand dollars for every inch you could put on his legs. He looked like he could afford to be a mile high. The tall French windows were open at the back of the room, and you could still smell burning cordite. 
Someone tried to shoot me from the garden. Yeah, I heard the shot. You must be Diamond. That's right. Don't you think you'd better shut the French doors and pull the drapes before someone takes another shot? Yes, yes, very good idea. Uh, you pull the dime, the shade diamond. Hey, you can start earning your money right now. You're a little excited, but I'll start to work. All right. Uh, be careful, he might still be out there. Well, I doubt it. I can't see anyone out here. Oh, he just missed me. You can see where the bullet hit the wall. I jumped and hid behind the desk. Didn't you hear him on the porch? No, he must have stood in the soft grass that surrounds the garden. That's a good ten feet from the house. You're lucky he didn't move in closer. He probably wouldn't have missed. Got any idea who it was? Of course, it was Murray Lang. Murray Lang? The gambler? Yes, do you know him? Well, I used to be on the force. Set him up six years ago on a larceny rap. Then you know what he's like. He was in the house this afternoon. We had an argument and he threatened me. An argument with your daughter? Yes, about my daughter. How do you know? Well, you told me she was getting herself into trouble. She couldn't have picked a better playmate than Lang to get there with. Father, we heard a shot. Not really. Oh, let's go. He's not dead. My stepchildren, Mr. Diamond. Oh, well, lovely. I'm quite alive, so you can both stop looking so unhappy. Does it show? Come on, sis. Let's find the guy who fired that shot. I want to give him a few pointers. Where's Murray Lang, Miss Chase? Yes, he's the man you want. I'm sure he Don't tried... be absurd. Murray left three hours ago. What are you, a cop? Does it show? You're wearing too much cologne. Come on, Chris. <laughs> oh, she's nice. That's Elizabeth. The boy's her brother, Chris. I'd hate to draw straws. I married their mother and raised those two brats after she died. The courts appointed me executor of this state. They don't like you handling their money, is that it? Yes. Since they've been old enough to ask for 50 cents to go to a movie, they've condemned me for watching their interests. You, uh, you said you were worried about your stepdaughter. Tell me about it. I'll make it brief. Hate long explanations. Elizabeth got into some trouble with the police. Hit and run. She had been drinking. The man died. Liz was sentenced to a year in Folsom. But I got her off on probation. Oh, what do you want me to do? Drive around with her and spoil her aim? Monday the probation expires. She says she is then going to marry this hoodlum, Murray Lang. And you don't want that because you think he's after her money? Exactly. When she marries, the will reads that I shall, as executor, turn over half of the estate to Elizabeth. What about Christopher? He looked irresponsible when he was born. His mother left instructions that he should not receive his share until he is 35. That's another eight years. Well, your uh, stepdaughter's old enough to know what she's doing. I can't see how you can stop her. That's what I want you to do. And if I do, you'd be in a pretty good spot. What do you mean, Mr. Diamond? You continue as executor. I can understand you thinking something like that, but believe me, as much as I dislike my stepchildren, I wish to keep them in line for their late mother's sake. Oh, well, Mr. Chase, I'll, I'll take a look around outside. Maybe I can come up with something that'll point out the would-be killer. If it was Lang, you can stop worrying uh, about Elizabeth. Sing Sing doesn't boast a wedding chapel. I went out through the French doors and started looking around on the soft grass that bordered the garden. I had a fat hunch, so I stopped looking and started wandering. I was halfway through the rose bed when I spotted them. It was Elizabeth and a man. In the darkness, I couldn't make him out, but Murray Lang was my best guess. They went up a narrow path to one of those Chinese pagodas at the far end of the garden, and I stepped up close enough to give my ears a workout. It was Lang, all right. I don't care what you think. I didn't take a shot at the old man. Then who did? He's got a policeman in there now, and he's going to start trouble. Let him. I'm clean. Maybe it was that lushed-up brother of yours. Chris hates him, but he'd never try to kill him. Well, then stop hounding me. Maybe you took a shot at the old boy. Murray! Well, you've got a good reason tired trying to buck the whole Chase household. If you love me, let's take off tonight and get married. Tell the old man to go to the devil. You can certainly wait till Monday. Yeah, but he won't. He's going to cause some kind of trouble and get you tossed into Folsom. He's not going to give up all that money just because you're through with your probation. He probably cooked up that shooting to, just to get the cops here. Oh, Murray, what's going to happen to us? Oh, ask your stepfather. He's been doing your thinking for you. I don't have to. We'll get married Monday. Okay. I'm staying clear of this place till then. But what if there's more trouble? I haven't got anyone to turn to. You worry about it, baby. I got a police record that makes yours look like a merit badge. I was too good a target in the moonlight, so I started back up the walk to the house. As I passed a hedge, I noticed a funny-looking plant that was shoving its way out of the foliage. I'm sorry I did that. It was the Johnny Jump-Up variety. Black... <laughs> The guy on the other end of the sap gave it to me right over the eyes, and I went down like a crapshooter making a pass. I rolled over and watched the moon melt and run down in my eyes. Something warm and sticky spread over my face and turned the night red. Yeah, I was bleeding again. 
I guess I showed signs of recovering, so he started all over. This time, he used his foot in my side. Oh. Oh. Oh, a couple more kicks in the ribs and in the right place, and he could have whipped up a fast course of Nola. I felt tired, so I rolled up in an old rose bush and went to sleep. When you finally start coming around, it's like swimming your way out of an acre of mud. If you've taken enough beatings before, you diagnose things in a hurry. The pain in your head is where you got sapped. The ache in your ribs is where he booted you. And the thought in your mind is, oh, it's something about an eye for an eye, as you've got one left. I sat up slowly and looked around. No one in sight. My watch said ten o'clock. I'd been out for an hour, and I was feeling lonely until I started to get up. I made it to one knee and looked down at the best reason I could think of for staying home nights. It was Murray Lang, and you couldn't blame him for staring. He wasn't impolite, just dead. Something on the walk beside him gleamed in the moonlight. I took out my handkerchief and scooped it up. It was a little nickel-plated thirty-two. You could still smell the fresh powder in the barrel. I put it in my pocket and stumbled back to the house. Chris opened the door. Well, you shouldn't drink so much. I never get so loaded I look like that. Well, try it sometime. It might be an improvement. Boo. I... I told you once before not to do that. Now, tell me, where were you ten minutes ago? I was in the bar. Who was with you? Red and green midgets. Now, let go of my collar. Okay. Where's the phone? In the hall. Hey, what's going on? Who beat you up? Nobody. I always bleed like this on warm nights. Huh? Big pores. Homicide, Sergeant Otis talking. Who taught you how? Did you sit up nights with a parrot? Oh, very funny. Only one guy could think up a lousy joke like that. What do you want, Diamond? A picture of you. I'm going to show some doctors that mercy killing has its points. Now, let me speak to the lieutenant. Comic. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Hello, Walt. This is Diamond. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me get the bicarbonate. What's the matter? I get stomach trouble every time you call. Go ahead. All right. I got a killing for you. I know it. I know it. Why can't you be a good boy and stop finding corpses? I'm out at Sands Point, 82 Maple Drive. I think I've got the murder weapon in my pocket. Who's dead? An old friend, Murray Lang, and you better step on it. There's a drunk staggering around the place, and he's liable to spot the body and put it in a cold shower to sober it up. Oh, all right, we'll be right out. Hold the fort. So Mr. Lang's dead. Hmm? You better stop sneaking up on people, Buster. And you'd better stop telling me what to do in my own house, Mr. Diamond. You sobered up pretty quick. I heard what you said about finding the murder weapon. May I see it? No. It stays in my pocket until homicide gets here. Whose gun is it? It's a 40-pound broadsword. Now, stop trying to look like a Chicago muscle man or I'll start slapping oh, you. Oh, there you are, Diamond. I've been looking for you. I... Wait, Scott, what happened to your face? Someone was giving away hints. Chris, did you have something to do with this? <laughs> Hardly. Mr. Diamond has a decided advantage over me. He has muscles. I'll be in the bar. What's happened? Where's Elizabeth? I don't know, but her boyfriend's got troubles. He, he can't explain the hole in his chest. Lang, what do you mean? He's out in the garden. Someone shot him. Is he dead? Well, if he's not, he's trying awful hard. Well, then we'd better call the police. That's been taken care of. What kind of a gun do you own, Mr. Chase? You don't see... No, I don't. I just dig around till I come up with something. What kind of a gun do you own? Why, you're 45... Now, wait a minute, Diamond. If you've got any ideas about this murder, you'd better wait until the police get here. Now, look, Chase, I've been insulted in your house, had the air let out of my ego by your beautiful stepdaughter, and beat up in your garden. That's a full night's work, and now I'm on my own time. Where can I find Elizabeth? I don't know. She may be up in her room. So where is it? End of the hall, head of the stairs, first door. Thanks. It's beginning to rain. What about Lang's body? Well, if he catches cold, call me. I went down the long hallway to the foot of a massive staircase. The only light was the one burning in the room I just left. I looked over at my sh over my shoulder and saw Mr. Chase framed in its dim glow watching me. In that moment, I thought who Chase reminded me of. A triangle hat, his hand in his vest, and Napoleon had a twin. I went up the stairs two at a time. Yes? Pardon me for barging in, but some guy in the garden just beat all the bashfulness out of me. How dare you? 
You get out of my room. You better put on something a little warmer, honey. That thing would start a Harry Carey epidemic in Boston. What do you want? Yeah. What did you do after Lang left you in the garden? What? Big ears. I overheard everything you said. I see someone pushed your face around. It's an improvement. Did Murray catch you eavesdropping? Well, if he did, he won't have much time to gloat. What do you mean? If you've done anything to Murray... Aren't you getting ready for bed a little early? I don't know what you want. I don't have to answer any of your ridiculous questions. Now, if you don't turn around and get out of here... What's the matter, baby? The drawer empty? Hmm. Lose something? No. Maybe this is it. Where did you get that gun? It was lying in the garden beside your boyfriend's body. Beside... That's it, lover. Now sit down and relax. Is Murray dead? Like Jimmy Fiddler's gossip column. Didn't you hear anything after Murray left you? Oh, no. I was crying. I ran back to the house and came up here. Is there another way back to the house besides the path that Murray took? It's one that leads to those outside doors. I, I came right to my room. Please leave me alone. This is your gun, isn't it? Yes, but I didn't do it. I didn't. Murray and I were going to be married Monday. Ballistics will probably show it's the one that did the job. You better tell me everything you know. I don't know anything. I didn't shoot Murray. Someone stole my gun from the drawer. Oh, please find out who did it. If they hold me, I'll go to prison anyway. Please, Mr. Diamond, please. It's going to be tough if this is the gun. I'm pretty sure it is. You could still smell the powder when I... The powder. What's the matter, Mr. Diamond? Huh? Oh. Oh, nothing, nothing. Look, uh... You stay in your room. Maybe I can do you some good. I promise you'll stay here. Sure. I'm not going anyplace. Ah, and try and snap out of it. Sometimes you keep losing until there's nothing left to play with. It breaks the jinx. I went downstairs and started looking for Chase. As I passed the doors leading to the garden, I stopped cold. A flash of lightning turned the garden flat white. Someone was standing over what was left of Murray Lang. Well, like the view? Oh, Diamond. I was just looking at the body. I talked with your daughter. She says the gun that killed Lang was hers. What? Claims they had an argument, but won't admit she shot him. Oh, no, I can't believe it. Certainly she had no reason, unless... Unless what? Well, unless she found out Lang was just after her money. Well, that's, uh, that's possible. Anyway, if she did do it, I still can't figure who worked me over. Maybe it was Lang. You told me yourself he didn't like you. Maybe it was Elizabeth. Oh, no. It would have to be somebody very strong. She might have kicked you, but never could she have hit you hard enough to crack your head open like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell me, when does Elizabeth come into her money? Why, at the end of the probation. The court set it aside until she was cleared of all charges. Who gets it if she goes to prison? Well, I'm the sole executor of the estate, but she's not going to jail. She didn't do this thing. I'll get the best counsel in the country. I'm sure you will. Uh, tell me something, Chase. It's pretty obvious that my face got pushed around, but uh, how did you know my ribs got the same treatment? What? It doesn't show. It just hurts. Why, I... Uh, well, you told me. Uh -uh. What are you getting at, Diamond? You'd have to reach pretty high to sap me, but if you were mad enough, you could make it. This is absurd. I'm going inside. And when I get grouchy, it's better to listen. I'm liable to use you to make the flowers grow. Go ahead, Mr. Diamond. I'm listening. Well, everybody in this house has some sort of motive for killing. With Elizabeth, it could be the old story of a woman scorned. With your lushed-up stepson, he could want to put the blame on his sister so he'd get more than his share of the estate. And we certainly know you stand to profit if Elizabeth goes to prison... Because you retain custody of the family fortune. I'm getting wet, Mr. Diamond. Everybody's story's weak, but only one of them doesn't stand up. You said earlier this evening someone tried to shoot you from outside your library. Of course they did. You have the shot and saw the bullet hole. That's right, I did. But you told me he was standing outside the room by a good ten feet. Nothing to say, Chase? You're trying to catch me up in something. Oh, you are so right. Now, when I walked into that room, I could still smell burning cordite. To smell fresh gunpowder like that, the gun would have have to have been fired outside the room. You staged it, so I'd think someone was trying to kill you. Is that all, Mr. Diamond? Outside of the slip you made about kicking me in the ribs. Now, let's go inside. I don't think so, Diamond. Oh. Oh, that the forty-five you were telling me about? Yes. Go ahead, make a try for it. I'm going to show you how it works. You kill Lang with your stepdaughter's gun, and you're going to collect the money if she goes to prison. 
Oh, you're a slob. My stepdaughter could easily kill two men tonight. Uh, you're in a spot. You can't shoot me with that forty-five and make it look like the same person killed Lang, too. So you've got to get the thirty-two in my pocket. Give me Elizabeth's gun, Diamond. You try and get it, Chase. Why, you... Rick! Rick, are you out there? You better give it up, Chase. That's the law. He eats little men like you. Rick! Stay right there, Diamond. Another killing won't matter if you try and stop me. For Pete's sake, if you're out there, Rick, answer me. I'm getting soaked. Just keep your mouth closed, Diamond. I'm getting out of here. You'll never make a chase. They'll pick you up inside of an hour. Not if you're too dead to tell them. Yes, that's it. If I kill you, I'll eat at least have a look. You should watch your step, Chase. Keep your head down, Kevin. Somebody's mad. Shut up, Otis, and get out from under that bench. Rick! Over here, Walt. What's going on, Rick? Who's doing all the shooting? Oh, well, he took turns. He was just going to kill me when he tripped over the body of his first victim. I used this thirty-two in my pocket, shot him twice. He's dead, Lieutenant. Give me my baking soda, Otis. He yelled at him. Don't look so unhappy, Rick. He was going to kill you. Oh, I'm not unhappy. I- I'm just sore that I didn't have time to take the gun out of my pocket. I ruined a darn good coat. <laughs> The three of us went back in the house, and Otis took Christopher up to bed so he could sleep it off. Walt listened to the story as I told it to Elizabeth. She cried a little and thanked me with her eyes. Walt went downstairs to clean things up, and I sat by her bed until she went to sleep. She didn't even wake up when I kissed her goodbye. (laughs) Oh, I guess it was better that way. I said goodbye to Walt and Otis and headed for 975 Park Avenue. I was late. And my face could use a mile of bandage. I hoped Helen wouldn't mind. Yes? Oh, my goodness. Hello, Francis. Tell Miss Asher I brought a car back. Oh, how bad a wreck was it, sir? Give me a glass with a backbone, will you, Francis? Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Uh, Miss Asher's in the study. Ah, oh, thank my you. Goodness. Thank you. Hi. Well, it's about... Oh, Rick, not again. Mm-hmm. Your poor little face. Yeah, my poor little face. Well, you just stretch out on the couch and I'll get you a nice tall drink. Francis is already on his way. Oh. Feel better? Yeah. Oh, yes. Got a pillow? I'll hold your head up. How's this? Mm-hmm. Like some music to go with it? Sure. Turn on the radio. You comfortable? Mm-hmm. How about you? Uh-huh. That music sounds like San Francisco. Remember the top of the mark? Yeah, fun too. Mind if I turn off the light? The glow from the fire is enough. You're cute. Better? Much. The snow is snowing, the wind is blowing, but I can weather the storm. Why do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. Mm -hmm. Me. I can't remember a worse December. Just watch those icicles fall. What do I care if icicles fall? I've got my love to keep me warm. I like your singing, too. Thanks. Off with my overcoat, off with my glove. I need no overcoat. I'm burning with love. My heart's on fire. The flame grows higher. So I will weather the storm. Why do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. That was nice. Hey, why did you turn the radio on? This is nicer. Come here, Rick. Oh, honey. Honey, you're reading my mind. Here's your drink, Mr. Diamond. Oh, my goodness.
You have just heard the fourth of a new series, Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Betty Moran, Jay Novello, Jack Edwards, and Tal Avery. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Even here in America, we're liable to have a few misconceptions about freedom. Many of us regard it as an outright gift with no strings attached. Well, that isn't quite so. All of us have received a heritage of liberty, a legacy of freedom forged in other days. Remember that the liberty you enjoy is a precious legacy, a legacy that can be lost through disuse. Don't ignore freedom. Work at it. For freedom is everybody's job. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Transcribed as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. My name's Diamond, and like a lot of working people, at five o'clock in the afternoon, I get pretty anxious for six o'clock to roll around, especially if I haven't had a client for the last three days. But even if I don't expect anyone to drop in before six, I can't take a chance, so I stare out of my office window on 53rd Street just to kill time. I see the night starting to muscle in on the Broadway bright lights, and I wonder just how many prospective clients are out in the city. Who's getting in trouble? What kind of trouble? And will they come to Richard Diamond for guidance? Now, take the two hard-looking thugs in a downtown hotel room as they watch a pretty blonde hurriedly get into a flashy mink coat. They're going to need plenty of guidance. Where are you going, Dottie? I got an appointment. Uh, don't you think you ought to stick around just in case the contact comes in? If it ain't here by now, it won't be until tomorrow. Now stop looking like a couple of anxious bloodhounds. Relax. Sure, Dottie, sure. Uh, but you really cannot blame us for being a little disquieted. <laughs> don't she look classy, Al? Hey, who are you going to roll tonight, doll face? Your grandmother. Oh, ain't she out of Alcatraz yet? Hey, I, I don't like no cracks about my family. Well, what are you going to do, Stan? People stop by the zoo every day. Yeah. Now, please, no legomachy. Yeah, no leg- Yeah. You keep running off at the mouth like that, baby, and you'll be spitting out all your teeth. Yeah, well, when you kick off, Stan, don't try to sell your body to science. I'll never get both heads in that bottle. Oh, you... Please. Please. I'm, 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 I'm going to hit... Please. Yeah. Please. Leave us, Dottie. And Stanley, you shut your big mouth before I shove my foot in it. Go on, Dottie. I think you had better make a hurried percolation. What? Beat it. Oh, Al, why didn't you let me mess her up a little? She's always acting like she's got a family background. I do not know whether her family had anything to do with it, but it is a very nice background to gaze at. Now shut your ugly face and let us start tailing her. Tailing her? What for? I think she is up to something. Yeah, well, sure she is, but I don't want to get booked as a peeping Tom. <laughs> Stan, you are a melon head. I think she is going to try a cross. Florida has not never been late with the numbers before. It... You think she's going to pick up the bundle and skip? No. I just want to see what she does with her evenings. Oh, well, I can tell you that. She... Stanley, please, you arouse my irascibility. Oh, I'm sorry, Aloysius. <laughs> Evening, Glenda. Oh, hello, Horace. Times. You look tired. Hard day at the office? I stayed home. My wife's swell. Mm. Here's the Times. Uh, thanks. Good night, Glenda. Good night. Papers. Evening papers. Have you got a light edition? Why, yes, right here, dearie. You got it? Yeah, in the purse. Put it down on the counter and look through the paper. Okay. Paper. Evening paper. What do you want me to do with the purse? Keep it till I meet you at the train. Sure, honey. 
Good to be working again, ain't it, Dotty? I gotta go. They usually got a tail on me. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Relax. We're in the chips. Paper! Evening paper! Uh, paper, sir? No, but I will take that purse. Purse? Oh, why, that nice young lady must have left it on the counter when she looked at the paper. Please, just extend your agent index and shove it over here. Why, I can't do that. It belongs to that young lady. Oh, look, it would make me very unhappy to have to shove all those nice old wrinkles around, but I am in need to possess one patent letter handbag. Now, if you will kindly move it to my approximate latitude, you old bat, we can dispense with all... Why, you poor excuse for a low-brow gun if... Madam. For two cents, I'd wrap a lead sap across your flat head. Well, hello, Glenda. Hello. How's, how's uh, business? Oh, Officer Quine. Aren't you on a little late? <laughs> yes, uh, I've been changed to the six o'clock beat. Well, good evening, sir. Uh, yeah, lovely. Uh, good evening, officer. Say, haven't I seen you somewhere before? Uh, hardly. I reside in Flatbush. Well, thank you, Mother. I do not see anything I want. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> he doesn't see anything he wants. What does he think you're running, Glenda? A drugstore there? <laughs> hey, Al, I saw a cop. Mm, I am proud of you, Stanley. Huh? Now let us hurry around this corner. What, you think that and the old dame are cooking up something together? Stop here so we can watch the old dame. Stanley, to put it in your words, yeah. I think they are cooking up something. Oh, you figure she slipped the old girl the numbers? Your perception astounds even my astu... Hey, observe. Oh, yeah. Your grandma is taking off and leaving the cop behind to watch the papers. Yeah, she's going in that building. She has got the purse. Stanley, yeah. stay here and await my return. Okay, but uh, my feet are beginning to hurt. Go in a drugstore, purchase some Blue Jays. I shall be right back with the purse. <laughs> Mr. Diamond. Well, hello, Glenda. Come in, pull up a rocking chair. Well, that's the way it begins. Sometimes when you wait around until the last minute, you get a customer. I wasn't too happy about this one because I knew she didn't have enough money to hire a tramp to spot cigarette butts. I haven't got much time. I've got Officer Quine watching my paper stand. Officer Quine? Hmm. You should be happy you aren't selling fruit. He's already got his thumbprint and every apple in Yonkers. Mr. Diamond, I found this purse. Ah, uh, found it, Glenda? Oh, you know me, Mr. Diamond. I'm going straight now. I remember a snake that said that once. He broke his back. Honest, I haven't been doing that kind of business since I got out. Well, what can I do for you, Glenda? I'm broke. Oh, it's not a touch. I want you to find the owner of this purse and return it. Why don't you give it to Officer Quine? Well, there's no money in it. And with my record, he'd sure run me in for purse snatching. No money, huh? Oh, no. No, I didn't touch a thing. Just uh, took a peek, maybe. Uh, oh, yeah. A young girl left it on my counter. If you find her, you can ask her. I didn't touch a thing. Okay, I'll see what I can do. Oh, thank you, Mr. Diamond. Goodbye. Keep your nose clean. Oh, I will. She'd keep her nose clean, all right, in a glass of gin. I'd known old Glenda ever since she started working bunco rackets and got put away for two to five. I was sure she'd lifted the dough from the purse, but I opened it and went through it anyway. I was just kicking myself for telling her I'd try to dig up its owner when the door opened and an ugly-looking mug wearing alligator spats walked up to my desk. You should be ashamed looking in someone else's purse. It's a bad habit, like not knocking on doors. Oh, it said on the door to come in. How long did you have to wait before someone came by to read it to you? May I please have the purse? Oh, is it yours? Yes. Well, I didn't notice the wedges. Give up high heels? You are a very poor comic. Now, may I have the purse, or must I make you bleed? Oh. Oh, it's like that. Well, sure, here it is. Thank you. <gasps> and something to go with it. Oh. I caught him with one that made my arm feel good clear up to my shoulder. His eyes rolled back, and he went down faster than the celluloid collar on the flagpole. I looked at the black purse and started getting that lousy feeling again. I'd gotten into something, and it was beginning to smell already. So I called the 5th Precinct Police Station and an old friend, Lieutenant Levinson. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Hello, Otis. Let me talk to the lieutenant. Is this Diamond? No, it's platoon number three of the Brownies, 300 strong. Now let me talk to the lieutenant. 
Hey, what are you going to do with all those tired jokes and you run out? Give them away to idiots. You want to start a collection? Oh, nuts. Lieutenant Levinson. Hello, Walt. Diamond. Oh, wait a minute. Otis. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Where'd you put the bicarbonate? In the top drawer, Lieutenant. Oh, uh, hold it a minute, Rick. Get me some water, Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Go ahead, Rick. I can stand it for a second. Well, if you didn't get so excited, you wouldn't have to take that stuff. Here you are, Lieutenant. Never need this stuff until you call. Now, who's dead? Uh, nobody, but there's a guy in my office lying on the floor. He's dead. He's got to be. No, he isn't, Walt. I just belted him in the mouth when he tried to get rough. Oh. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He's trying oh. to wake up. Groan for the nice policeman. Oh. You hear him, Walt? Okay, so some guy got tired and went to sleep on your floor. What do you want me for? Uh, hold it a second, Walt. He's getting a little too active. What did you do? I kissed him goodnight. What did you do that for? Well, I've seen him somewhere. I think he's wanted. Oh, well, hang on to him. I'll send the wagon down. The door will be open. I'll fix it so he doesn't get away. Wait a minute, Rick. Where are you going? Well, about five minutes ago, an old dame hands me a black patent leather purse and asks me to find the owner. Right afterwards, this cultured gorilla wanders in and says the purse belongs to him. Oh, what's in it? Nothing much. A compact, book of matches, and a handkerchief. Mmm, smells nice. No money? No. No, uh, I gotta stop by Helen Ashes for a minute, and then I'm gonna find out what makes this purse so valuable. Uh, say hello to Helen for me. Sure thing. Bye, Walt. Be a good boy. Goodbye. <laughs> I got a rope out of my desk that I hung my socks on when I had time to wash them and tied the sleeping Garneth to a chair. I didn't know much about pocketbooks, but I knew someone who did, so I headed for 975 Park Avenue and a beautiful redhead named Helen Asher. Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Good evening, Francis. Is Miss Asher in? Yes, sir. She's in the study. Shall I announce you? No, just dig up something that'll get me back on my feet. I'll let myself in. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Diamond. Yes, Francis? If you'll pardon me for saying so, sir, but I just love the way you talk. Well, thank you, Francis. Eaton, 98. Majored in Sloyd. Oh, oh, my goodness, you're pulling my leg again. Anyone home? Rick, you got here. Hi. Hi. Well... Since when did you start carrying a purse? Like it? Matches my complexion. Oh, you idiot. Take a look. Whose is it? Mm, Got to find out. It's worth something. One guy already tried to get it the hard way. Cigarette? Oh, thanks. It's got some initials on it. D.K. There's nothing valuable in it. I know. That's what I can't understand. Got a match? Here's some in the purse. Thanks. Here. Hmm. Adams Hotel. Flop house with sheets. Compact's never been used. My darling. Well, thanks. The perfume and the handkerchief, silly. It's my darling. Oh. Ah, don't look so hurt. So are you. Well, come here. (laughs) Rick. Here's your drink, Mr. Dab. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's all right, Francis. I was just trying to convince your boss we should take in the wrestling matches. Why, Francis, you're blushing. Oh, (laughs) pardon me. Miss Asher's residence? Yes, sir. One moment, sir. It's for you, Mr. Dam. Oh, thank you, Francis. I'll see if the dinner is ready, Miss Helen. Hello? You get right down here. What? Lieutenant Levinson. Get down here to the station, Diamond. You're in trouble. Diamond? Wait a minute. Slow down. Not dead, huh? My stomach starts getting back to normal, and you have to knock some guy off. Knock some guy off? I don't know why I should waste time with explanations. I ought to just send Otis over there with the wagon, but I like your girlfriend too much. What are you babbling about? I thought you said the guy in your office was still kicking. What? Yeah, somebody made a punch board out of his chest, and I like you for a suspect. Now get down here. Wait a minute, Walt. Somebody shot him? Yeah. If that wasn't what killed him, he died of fright when he saw the bullets coming. Now, I'm not talking anymore till you get here. Make it ten minutes, or I'll have a warrant out for you. Oh, swell. Rick, what's the matter? Oh, that crazy Walt Levinson's got me in line for a murder rap. I gotta go down and square myself. Murder? Rick! Yeah? I'll see you later, baby. But, Rick... I can't wait. I'll get back as soon as I can. If we were married, this wouldn't happen. Rick, you forgot the purse! Francis! Francis! Yes, Miss Asher? Francis, Mr. Diamond forgot this purse. See if you can catch him. He's gone to Lieutenant Levinson's police station. Yes, Miss Asher, my best. Rick just has got to stop this foolishness. He... Oh, how did you get in here? Who are you? I come in a back way, lady. Uh, 
Where's your shamus? You get out of here. No, just just relax, baby. One yell out of you and you get hurt pretty bad. What? Uh, where's the shamus? He went down to the police station. Okay. Where's the purse? I saw him bring it in. Uh, I don't know. Oh, come on, baby. Or do I shake it out of you? You, you stay away from me. You... Hood. Hood? It was a purse. I told you I don't know. No, stay away. Okay, but you're making it tough on yourself. Stay away. You stay away from me. With her head tucked underneath her arm, she walks the bloody tower. With her head tucked. Underneath her arm at the midnight hour. Pardon me, sir. Uh, yes, madam? I believe you have my purse. Uh, I beg your pardon, but this purse is the property of Mr. Diamond, private detective. Yes, I know. I gave it to him to hold for me. Well, I'm very sorry, madam, but you'll have to claim it from Mr. Diamond himself. Oh, yeah? Please, oh, Measure! Help! This man is trying to steal my purse. Uh, Madam, uh, let go of my coat. Yes, I giving you trouble, Mother. He's trying to steal my purse. Help! Oh, yes, huh? Looks just the type. This will learn you, Romeo. Oh, my. You're gonna know, lady, will you? Come on, get up and fight it. Hey, lady! Lady! How do you like that? Didn't even say thanks. I don't care what you say. You told me you had a guy in your office. When my men got there, they found him tied in the chair with three bullet holes in his chest. He was making noises when I left. Some guys do that when they get shot. Oh, stop being an idiot. You know I didn't kill him. Yeah, I know it, but what do I tell the commissioner? That I let you go because you're a friend of mine? Used to be on the force? No, but you don't have to act like I rubbed out the whole west side. Well, I'm mad. I want to retire in five years, and I want to do it with a healthy stomach. Yeah? Lieutenant, Murphy's got some guy out here he picked up for purse snatching. Says he's a friend of Diamonds and wants to see him. Send him in. This can't get any screwer than it is already. I got a purse snatcher who says he knows you. Purse snatcher? Francis. Yes, Mr. Diamond. I, I don't feel so well. That's all, Otis. Isn't he your girlfriend's butler? Yeah. What happened, Francis? Well, sir, I was bringing that purse down to you. That's right. I left it at Helen's. Yes, sir. Well, a little old lady approached me on the street and claimed it belonged to her. What did she look like? She had white hair, and she was wearing an old shawl. I think she'd been drinking gin, sir. Cheap gin. Glenda. Glenda Bergen? Is she the one who gave you the purse? Yeah. And then what happened, Francis? When I wouldn't give her the purse, she started yelling and called me a masher. And some enormous gentleman arrived and clapped at me in the jaw. Oh, it was disgusting, sir. And the old lady got the purse? Yes, sir. She ran off, uh, and the enormous gentleman sat on my chest until an officer came and carted me off to this place. Was Miss Helen all right when you left her? Why, yes, sir. You don't think... I don't know. But if they knew I had the purse and spotted me going into Helen's... Here, Rick, use his phone. Thanks. Don't you see, Walt, this whole thing has something to do with that purse. Purse, purse. I've still got a stiff on my hands. Oh, my goodness, Hello, honey. You all right? Oh. What's the matter? Hi. Please come home. What happened? A man broke into the house looking for that old purse. I told him I didn't know where it was, and he started slapping me. He did, huh? Yes, and I need comforting. Well, honey, I've still got something to do. Lock all the doors until Francis gets back, and I'll be over as soon as I can. All right. Did you get the purse? Francis will tell you all about it. Bye, baby. Bye. Rick, some louse shoved Helen around. Francis, get over there and take care of her. It's all right if he goes, isn't it, Walt? I guess so. Otis, I'm releasing the guy that was picked up for purse snatching. And don't say, yeah, Lieutenant. Okay, Rick. Oh, thank you, sir. Step on it, Francis. Miss Asher needs someone to take care of her. Yes, sir. Walt, give me two hours to find out what this is all about. Are you going after Glenda? Yeah. If she's tied up with this killing, I'd better send some of the boys along. Give me two hours alone. I want to find the guy who shoved Helen around. Okay, Rick. Two hours, and I put in a general alarm for you and the old dame. You know where she lives? I got a shack over near the East River. Thanks, Walt. Otis, let Diamond go and bring me a tablespoon and some water. And Otis, shut up. (laughs) 
I grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was standing at the edge of the East River. The fog was rolling in, and pretty soon, it would be so thick you could put it in bales. Below me, next to the water, was a line of weather-beaten shacks, and one of them belonged to old Glenda. You want something, Mac? Huh? Oh. Oh, I didn't see you. Uh, does uh, old Glenda live in one of those shacks? Yeah, that one. Got a match? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, keep them. Thanks. Forget it. No, uh, wait a minute. Huh? Let me see those matches. Hmm. I've forgotten all about them. What's the matter? You collect them or something? These I do. Sorry, pal. You'll have to get some others. Okay, sporty. The inside of the shack looked like a hardware store after a good earthquake. Someone had torn it to pieces, and old Glenda had gotten the same treatment. She was lying on the wooden floor, staring up at me. She couldn't close her eyes because the rope around her neck was squeezing them open. Is she dead? Huh? I followed you down. Well, hooray for you. The next time you sneak up on somebody, you'll probably end up with a skull fracture. Just wanted to see what was going on. Is she dead? Unless she can breathe through her feet. She's been strangled. Gonna call the cops? No, no. I thought I'd rub her wrists for a while. Now, here's a buck. Call Lieutenant Levinson at the 5th Precinct and tell him what's happened. Sure. Got a nickel? Yeah, here. And tell him I've gone over to the Adams Hotel on 28th Street. My name's Diamond. Good for you. Now step on it. He left in a hurry, and I reached in my pocket and took another look at the book of matches I'd gotten from the black handbag. They were from the Adams Hotel on 28th Street, so I went over there fast. The sleepy night clerk showed me the register, and I found what I was looking for. I remembered the initials on the handbag were D.K. A Dorothy King was registered in room 306. I went upstairs. Yeah? I got a message for you. Slip it under the door. I'm not that skinny. What is it? It's from Glenda. Oh, wait a minute. All right, now shut it and come on in. Huh? Oh, what a lovely gun. Glad you like it. Now, what do you want? I just left Glenda. She's dead. What? Yeah, strangled. How'd you find me? Matches in your purse. They were from this hotel. I checked the initials on the bag with the register. D.K., Dorothy King, room 306. Holmes would call it elementary. You must be the shamus Glenda gave the bag to earlier this evening. That's right. How did you know? Well, she called me. She tell you she got it back? I feel a quiet streak coming on. I usually like women who don't talk much, but right now you'd better start talking as fast as you can. Funny thing, this gun I got makes me lazy. Now get out of here. Baby, baby, I got a big fat surprise for you. Yeah? Yeah. My gun makes bigger holes than yours. Huh? What do you think I'm doing with my right hand, keeping it warm? Oh, don't give me that. You ain't got nothing but a big finger in that pocket. Oh! Surprise. Next time I make it count. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Sure. Drop it. Now, that's better. Kick it over here. All right. Please, I didn't kill Glenda. Where's the purse? I ain't got it on us. Well, who has? Now, look, baby, I'm in a bad mood. Honest, I don't know. That's right. She don't, mister. Stan. Well, you certainly know some pretty ugly company, Dottie. I don't know if I like that. You don't? Maybe I can word it a little different. Stan, he's a private cop. He come up here and tried to shove me around. Well, you should have done it, Shamus. Would have saved me the trouble. What do you mean, huh? Why, you no good cheap double-crosser. Al and me saw you slip the bag to that old dame, and Al got killed trying to get it from the Shamus. I didn't kill Al. No, the old dame did it. I went up to the office and found him dying. He told me she'd done it. What are you going to do? Well, the organization don't like being crossed. I got the purse from the old dame and paid her off for killing poor old Al. Now I gotta pay you off. I got a surprise for you too, Stanley. Yeah, you try anything, you'll have more holes in you than a fishnet. He's got a gun in his pocket. Well, look at his pocket, wise guy. Oh, gee, I wish Al was here. He'd know what to do. Come on, shoot him. Shoot him. Stan's got it coming. Looks like it's a tie. No sense in both of us getting killed. Yeah, yeah, you you plug me and I'll nail you before I go down. Don't listen to him. I think he's got a point. What are you gonna do? That's up to him. Well, as Al would say... A hurried departure is in order. I'll take care of you later, Doc. Huh? Uh, goodbye, all. Yeah, it's pretty good. Al would like that. Don't let him get away. Stop him. You stop him. All right, baby. Where is he going with that purse? If I tell you, will you give me a chance to get out of town? I can't do anything about that. When I leave, you're on your own. 
technically, you haven't done anything the law could hold you for. I haven't? No, but that won't stop me from pushing you around. Now, let's have the story. Well, if Stan hasn't been there already, he's headed for a locker in the subway station at 34th Street. What's in the locker? $100,000 in counterfeit bills. Oh. Oh, baby. Counterfeit. You have been naughty. Now, Papa, we'll have to keep you on ice for the cops. Get in the closet. Oh, please, give me a break. Sorry, honey, get in. Ouch, you're hurting me. I went down to the night clerk and told him to tell Lieutenant Levinson when he got there about the blonde in the closet of room 306. The subway wasn't far, but Stanley had a head start and he was in a hurry. I ran the rest of the way. I went down the steps. A train was just pulling out when I spotted him. He'd just taken a bundle out of one of the lockers, and as he turned to go, I walked up behind him. Hello, Stanley. What? What you got in the box? The show machine. You take it. Oh. He tossed the package in my face and started running for the exit. But a crowd of people blocked his way, and when he saw me come up with my gun, he changed his mind. He turned and vaulted the turnstile, and I ducked behind the row of lockers. He had a gun, too. I tried to get a clear shot at him, but there were too many people. And then the frightened little guy did a stupid thing. He jumped down on the tracks and started running up the tunnel. Oh, look at that fool man. He's jumped down on the tracks. Stanley, come back here. You can't get anywhere that way. You said it, Mac. He's running uptown on the downtown side. Here's a corny line. Stop or I'll shoot. You won't get me. Stan, look out. There's a train coming. Look out. No! Oh, Mr. Diamond, come in. Hello, Francis. Is Miss Asher all right? She's better, sir. She's lying down in the study. How's the jaw? Oh, I feel better, sir. This ice bag is helping the swelling. I'll be in the pantry if you need me, sir. I'll try not to. Hi. Hi. Well, poor little baby. Yes, poor little baby. You're lucky he didn't knock you out. Oh, I'll get it. Francis is nursing his face. Asher residence. Let me talk to Diamond if he's there. He is. Rick? Mm hmm. Now you listen to me. I've been chasing your conquests all over town. I end up down in the subway station. I notice gets stuck in the turnstile. Don't you think it'd be nice to let the police department in on something once in a while? Oh, sure, sure. Right now I'm at 975 Park Avenue, nursing a beautiful redhead back to health. Oh, did you find the blonde in the closet? Yeah, I got the whole story from her. You want to hear it? I guessed most of it. She was fencing for a counterfeit ring and she tried to cross them. The key to the locker was in that purse. Yeah, in the compact, under the pancake makeup. She and old Glenda used to do a duet together before they both got sent up. When the blonde got out, she started working for a counterfeit mob. They'd stashed the dough in different subway lockers around town and used her to make the contacts. So she figured she could use the 100000 Well, nothing like being in business for yourself. Well, she was afraid to pick it up herself, so Ricky. she stuck the purse to Glenda like she'd just forgotten it. Ricky! Yes, dear? Are you listening to me? I just stopped. Bye, Walt. What? Now, wait a... What is it, baby? I want some sympathy. Sure, sure. What would you like, lover? Sing something. Oh, come on, baby. We can do without that. No, I want you to. I'm sick, and then blood should be pampered. Oh, let me rub your head or something. Mm, afterwards. I want you to sing. Oh, but it's late, baby. Well, then sing softly. Sing me to sleep. Oh, honey. I'll get mad, and you'll have to buy me a present. Ah, uh, Okay. Lullaby and good night with roses be dyed. That's wonderful. With lilies be dyed. Hey, you on the board for your tonsils! Shut up! I'm trying to sleep! Well, what is that? Oh, it's that grouchy new neighbor. Oh, it is, huh? Mm -hmm. Hey, you want something, bud? Yeah, such a big vessel. Oh, is that right? Out of your face with sunshine. Oh, no! Put on a great big smile. Make up your eyes Rick, that's with too laughter. Loud. You wear Please, those... Rick. Yeah, okay. That guy gets shell shocked if you fried potatoes. Rick. What is it, baby? Come here. Oh. You do need pampering. Yeah. 
You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Betty Lou Gerson, Jane Morgan, Jack Crucian, High Averback, Herb Butterfield, and Wally Mayer. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. My name's Diamond, and I'm in business for a very simple reason. I like money. Oh, sure, I could do better, but I don't believe in straining myself. I might make a few bucks more, but so what? You work harder, your back gets weaker... And you take that extra couple of bucks and spend it for a brace to keep you from folding in the middle. No, I got a little one-room office that leans out over Broadway, and I'm very happy. Sometimes I get a case that lasts a week, a hundred bucks a day in expenses, and I make enough to pay the rent. Take my girl Helen Asher to dinner a couple of times and rest my feet on the desk like a prosperous businessman. I'm in partnership with a shill called Human Nature... And with him on my side, it just figures that people are going to get in trouble. Like the character who's ringing the doorbell of an apartment on the east side. He's built just right for more trouble than he can handle. Well. Hello, Mrs. Moran. You say that like you're really glad to see me. I'll let you know as soon as we can talk business. Did you bring a rubber hose along? Why? Are you going to be hard to get along with? This time, yes. Where's your husband? He went out. I tried to convince him the window was the quickest way to the street, but he's old-fashioned. He took the elevator. You're drunk. You can't get a bit out of me. Want a drink? Just get the 500. I don't want to be around when your old man gets back. You couldn't afford that, could you? No, and I don't think you could either, baby. Now let's stop buying games, Mrs. Moran. I've got a big, fat surprise for you, Mac. Keep it in small bills. That's not funny. That's your surprise. Yeah? Yeah. You don't get the money. You get something else. Stop yelling. You'll have the whole building up here in a minute. they will be up anyway, Mac. A gunshot makes people curious. Now, wait a minute. You don't have to pull a gun. I don't have to do anything. And I'm breaking myself of one habit right now. I'm through paying your dirty blackmail. Now, you know I got my orders. If I don't collect, someone else will be around. Come on, give me the gun. Sure. A piece of the time. I need a drink. Well, here's to nothing, Betty, old girl. Oh. Shot to death in blackmail plot. Socialite Betty Moran kills gangster, then takes own life. Read all about it, paper. I can't. Oh, paper, mister? Yeah. Hey, uh, the chair. Oh, thanks. Wealthy wife of William Moran kills. Well, I have to call Mr. Moran. No sense to lose a good source of income. <laughs> Come in. Mr. Diamond? Over here. Oh, this clothesline, I, I couldn't see you. Do you always do your laundry in your office? Free soap. 
Pull up a chair, Mr. Uh, Moran. Uh, William Moran. Oh. Hmm. Nice pair of Argyles. One of my old clients. Sends them down from Sing Sing. Have you read the morning papers, Mr. Diamond? I haven't had time. Took some throw rugs down to the laundry mat before I started on the socks. My wife died last night. What did you eat for breakfast? Why, uh, pancakes and eggs? Why? You must eat a whole pig when you're not in mourning. How did she die? She was shot to death. Couldn't she get two people for a pyramid club? She was being blackmailed. It's usually the other way around. The victim shoots the blackmailer. She did that. His name was Mac Grayson. Hmm? I want you to find the other man behind this blackmail ring. Oh, what makes you think there was more than one? I received an anonymous phone call this morning. It was from a man who said he was a friend of Mac Grayson. He made it perfectly clear that he was going to continue with the blackmail. You uh, know what they had on your wife? She was a very wealthy woman, Mr. Diamond. Before she married me, she was rather... Uh, wild. Well, they get that way sometimes. There were some letters. Why don't you go to the police? As far as they're concerned, the case is closed. They say it's a murder and a suicide, and that's that. But I want to get the people who drove my wife to suicide. Okay, Mr. Moran, but if you want me to try and dig up your blackmailers, my fee is rather high. I want to start sending my laundry out. Money is no object. That's the nicest thing you could have said. A hundred dollars a day and a fifth of plasma. Plasma, Mr. Diamond? A hundred proof. I never know what I'm going to run into in a case like this. I may bleed a little. You can reach me at Evergreen 45021. I'll write your check. Here, uh, use my pen. It's getting an inferiority complex. Do you know anything more about this man who called you this morning? No, only that he said he was a friend of Mac Grayson's. Oh, there you are, Mr. Diamond. This should be enough of a retainer. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, that's all you know? I'm sorry I can't be of more help. Oh, you've been a brick. I'll get the rest from Homicide. Thank you and goodbye, Mr. Moran. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond, and good luck. Oh, I'm sorry I knocked down some of your washing. Uh, there. Well, I'll be hearing from you. Well, that's the way it goes. One minute you're washing socks, and the next you've got enough money to stake out a claim on every night spot from Mott Street to Harlem. Unless a particular blackmail ring likes to kill private detectives. I had a hunch the assignment might run into overtime, so I put in a call to a lovely redhead named Helen Asher. Francis the butler answered, and I told him to pass the word along that I might be late for my date. I hung up before Helen could get on the pipe and start screaming at me like a wounded eagle. I locked the office, went down to 5th Precinct, and an old friend, Lieutenant Levinson. He was in charge of the homicide detail and could tell me about the late Mrs. Moran and her victim. When I walked in, Sergeant Otis was polishing his billy. Hello, Otis. The lieutenant in? Well, Richard Diamond, the all-American gumshoe. Oh, you're just jealous because that club you've got is a better shape than your head. Lieutenant, Diamond's out here. Okay, send him in. Tell me, Shamus... How does one get to be a great big private detective? Slaving box tops? Well, you have to observe things, Otis, my boy. For instance, one look at your shirt, and I can tell you've been eating well for a week. Why don't you either get it cleaned or stick it in a pressure cooker? Hello, Walt. Now, wait a minute, Rick. If you've got a body somewhere, take it to another precinct. Well, I'm a little short right now, but maybe I can dig one up. <laughs> what yeah, a Yeah, that was a swell one. Is this just a social visit or am I a dreamer? It's about the Moran suicide. You handle it? Uh-huh. One of the neighbors called us. They're both deader than Otis on a double date. What about the Grayson guy she knocked off? Cheap thug. Couple of convictions. He... Oh, don't tell me Moran's been to you with that blackmail story. Yeah, yeah. He seems to think Grayson was working with someone. Rick, that guy pestered us all morning, but there's no proof of blackmail or anything else, except two people got killed. Give me a quick rundown. I don't know why you're interested. I think Moran drummed up the blackmail theory just to cover that his wife was running around with another man. Well, I'm interested because Moran gave me a fat 200 bucks in advance to get me in the spirit of the thing. Well, if you want to be bored, here are the photographs of the deal. Here's Mac Grayson. Mm. Bullet entered his chest just below the 10th rib. Gun was a 32. Same one that the Moran dame used on herself. Enough powder burns on his shirt to show that she was standing pretty close when she gave it to him. She'd have to be not to miss him. Ah, uh, you can see she was lying about ten feet from Grayson near the bar. Huh? Probably needed a stiff shot before she knocked herself off. That's the highball glass on the floor near her head. And that's the thirty-two she used, about six inches from her right hand, and only her prints on it. Powder burns on the girl? Sure, all over her temple. We did the paraffin test on her hand, too. She fired the gun all right. Did uh, Grayson have any friends? Well, he never tied him up with anyone except an old wino that hangs out on Skid Row, dump called the Parry Club. Name's Wilbur Truitt. Mm-hmm. Now, 
Well, thanks, Walt. Now, look, the dame killed the guy and then shot herself. What more do you want? I'll let you know. Now, wait a minute. I know that gleam in your eye. I always get a sour stomach from it. If you've got something, you'd better tell me. Oh, you're a cynic, Walt. Have you, uh, have you talked to this Wilbur Troy? We questioned him this morning. Got a tale on him? Sure, but he won't take us anywhere. Now, what are you cooking up? Well, maybe you think there's something to Moran's blackmail story. Oh, don't be an idiot. Then what are you tailing through it for? Because I can't take a chance. Blackmail's a federal rap, and if Moran keeps stirring up trouble, I want to be able to prove he's nuts. Now, you look here. I want to know what's on your mind. I'll send you a letter. Oh. Otis! Yeah, Lieutenant. Get me my bicarbonate. And shut up. Bye. Goodbye. I went through the squad room and out into the hall. I used the payphone by the door and put in a fast call to my client, William Moran. I had a hunch that Moran's $200 retainer in my pocket gave him an A priority on it. Yes? Mr. Moran. That's right. This is Diamond, Mr. Moran. Uh I've got a lead on someone who knew Mac Grayson. That's fine, Mr. Diamond. Who is it? A guy who hangs out on Skid Row named Wilbur Truitt. Ever heard of him? No. Oh. Well, he might have been the one who phoned you this morning. I I think I'll go down and find out. Good, good. You'll keep in touch, won't you? Oh, as long as I'm on the case. Goodbye, Mr. Moran. I left the 5th Precinct and headed for Skid Row. If you've never seen the street, it's a liberal education in the misery of human beings. Even the sun winds up with a hangover if it shines on the place too long. The Parrot Club was a cellar with a low ceiling and a drink of wine for ten cents a glass. The smell of stale alcohol was so strong that if you opened the the door to air the place out, the walls would probably cave in. I found Wilbur Truitt sitting at the bar with a dirty towel around his neck. He held the towel and a glass of wine in one hand, and with the other he pulled the towel, lifting his hand and the glass up to his mouth. (sighs) You must have been an engineer. I learned this little stunt in grammar school, bucko. I started missing my mouth 30 years ago, so I used this towel as a sort of alcohol pulley. It cuts down the element of risk. Hate to spill a drop. You know a guy named Grayson? It's the shakes, bucko. I am completely exhausted after a night of revelry, and my hand waves like it was flagging down a caravan of whiskey trucks. Look, friend, But I... after one or two pick-me-ups, I am perfectly capable of lifting the glass by myself. And come nightfall, I'm in excellent condition to entertain my little friends. Oh, swell. Most cowards let the little fellows frighten them, and they end up in Bellevue, but... I like them. They worried me at first, but when they found out how much I drank, they began to show the strain, and the shoe was on the other foot, so to speak. Oh, no. They tried to frighten me the first night, but I just kept right on with one bottle after another, and it finally drove them to drink. Now my DTs have hallucinations. We are rapidly building up a thriving community. What were you saying, Bucko? Uh, something about the evils of self-indulgence, but I've forgotten now. Good. In that case, I will let you buy me a drink. Oh, sure. Waiter, bring a bottle. You just gave me cold chills. If I lick your hand, it's only a sign of fond endearment. Okay. Now, uh, do you know a guy named Grayson? I knew there was a catch. Are you a cop? No. In that case, I trust you. Besides, you are holding that lovely bottle. What about Grayson? First, a small glass of truth serum. First, Grayson. I can't stand to look, so I will turn my back on the bottle and tell you what I know. Mr. Mac Grayson... A very unsavory character who reached a sudden demise last evening dealt in smutty pass and made them pay off by milking his victims. He has only one friend, a Mr. Leo Fink. Now, please, I'm beginning to spit out wads of cotton. Where does this Fink live? Oh, you are indeed a heartless rogue. I was once. You aren't by any chance a spy from the Purity League? You get the bottle when I find out where Leo Fink lives. Eleven... 22nd Avenue now, please. Now, here you are. Don't struggle with the cork, bucko. I have just acquired the strength of an uncropped Samson. And as I gaze upon this ruby goblet, I am reminded of the fact that you are not the first 
to come seeking the whereabouts of one Leo Fink. Huh? Play it back in English. Ah, a thug with the disagreeable habit of twisting my ascot approached me not ten minutes before you came in seeking the same information. Did you give it to him? I had to. One more pull on my tie, and dissipation would have been a thing of the past. Thanks, Wilbur. Here, buy yourself another jug. Oh, bless you. And good morrow, cousin. Here's to my love. Oh, true apothecary. Thy drugs are quick. Thus, with a kiss, I die. I left Wilbur with his first love and walked out on the street. I grabbed a cab and headed for Leo Fink's address. All the way over, I kept thinking how wonderful fresh air really was. When we finally got there, I paid off the cabbie and looked at my watch. It was 4.30 and the city was turning soft and mellow as the sun started giving up behind the tall buildings. I got that lousy feeling again when I looked across the street. A prowl car was parked at the curb and it looked like Homicide's private limousine. Something was wrong. I went up to Fink's apartment in a hurry. Yeah? Ah, uh, what do you want, Shamus? Well, good afternoon, Sergeant. I'm taking the census. How long ago did you die, sir? Very funny, Diamond. Otis, who is that? Diamond, who else? I didn't ask for a quick quiz on well-known personalities. Let him in. Yeah, Lieutenant. Shame on you, Otis. You'll never make an Eagle Scout. Hello, Rick. What do you want? I'll bet he's dead. You'll bet who's dead. You know who's dead. Sure, I know who's dead. Who do you think is dead? The guy I came up here to see. Well, who did you come up to see? Well, I think it's the guy who's dead. Don't you know? No, I ask you. Well, I'm telling you. You told me nothing. Look, why are you up here? Because I'm looking for a guy. What guy? I think it's the guy who's dead. Who's dead? Oh, he's on third. Don't you know? I think I know, Lieutenant. You shut up. Of course I know. Well, all right, all right. If you're going to hold out on your old pal. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. How did we get into this thing? Oh, this. Here's your bicarbonate. All mixed. All right, now let's start again. Walt, who's dead? Oh, let's not have two bodies up here. The guy's name is Fink. Leo Fink. Uh, why did you say that in the first place? Because I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. Walt. Lieutenant Levinson. Now, what are you doing up here? Oh, well, I came up to see Leo Fink, that's all. Well, he's in the other room. If he spills anything, don't believe it. He's been dead for ten minutes. That's too bad. He knew Mac Grayson. Yeah, how did you find out? That sweet old gentleman you sent me over to, Wilbur Truitt. Oh, you got something out of him, huh? What else did he tell you? Nothing, but we uh, struck up quite a friendship. I'm going to go back over and see what another bottle of wine will do to his memory. I'd better haul him in. Well, don't do it, Walt. Don't do it. I can find out things a lot quicker. Shh. I got a system. Okay, but keep me posted. I've got to clean up here. How did Fink get it? Two bullets in the head. No idea who gave it to him. They used a Luger, I think. Hey, have you questioned Otis? Oh, go on. Get out of here. Walt, tell me, did you check the prints on that highball glass next to Mrs. Moran to find out whether they were from her right or left hand? Now, what difference does it make? I'll let you know. Now, you wait a minute. No, I can't. I'm behind schedule now. Bye. Oh, Otis! I went downstairs in a hurry and started back to Skid Row and Wilbur Truitt. I turned a corner and had a quick change of heart. That's far enough, Shamus. Wow. Well, well, look what I picked up. All right. Get into this alley. Now, why don't you put that cannon away? It shows up like a pair of gums at a dentist convention. Turn around and get going. I can run if it would help. Take your time. You haven't got too much of it left. Stop nudging. You got a coal barrel. Don't you like it? No, but it helps. Hey. A lesson in the manly art of self-defense. Next time, don't get so close with a gun. Well, what do you know? A Luger. Okay, so, so I'm a Butterfingers. You got the gun now. What are you going to do? I got a mean streak, and it shows up when someone tries to kill me. I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and if you don't answer them, you'll wish you'd picked on an octopus. Now, get up. Oh, you're a big one. Now, who sent you after me? I don't know. Who sent you after me? Honest, I don't know. Oh, wait, wait a second. All right, the guy told me on the phone his name was Jones. Sure, first name's John. Now, wait, wait. I, I know it's a phony, but he was recommended. You get paid for your work, don't you? Yeah, but this one I collect after the job. Where? I thought you'd gotten over that stubborn streak. Okay, 
Uh, the 8 o'clock ferry to Staten Island. He's going to slip me two bills. And you don't know his right name? No. Did you know Mac Grayson? Well, I heard of him, but I never met him. Are you as handy with the 32 as you are with that Luger? Huh? Forget it. Next question. Who killed Leo Fink? Oh, that's a pretty big one. Okay, I'll word it differently. Who killed Leo Fink? I'll take the beating. Yeah. Well, I got a hunch this Luger of yours will check with ballistics. Come on. Homicide still up in Fink's apartment. No, it's... What did you say? Okay. I hustled Louie up to Walt and left him handcuffed to Sergeant Otis. They deserved each other. Louis said he was going to be paid off at 8 o'clock, and my watch said it was a quarter after 7. That gave me 45 minutes to check at Homicide and still catch the ferry to Staten Island. The fingerprint man at the 5th precinct put the prints from the highball glass under a microscope and told me what I wanted to know. My hunch had been right. So I grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was paying for my ticket at the ferry landing. A thick, wet fog was beginning to roll in off the river, and by 8 o'clock, it was hard to even see your watch. Someone was playing a piano in the lounge as the ferry began to move slowly across the river. I didn't know who I was looking for, but I figured if there was going to be a payoff, it would be outside. I leaned against the rail and took out a cigarette. Got the match, mister? Huh? Yeah, yeah, right here. Thanks. Lousy night. Yeah. He wasn't my man. When he struck the match, I could see his dirty work clothes and his factory badge. I started down the other side of the boat. Finding a killer in that fog was like looking for your car keys in a mine shaft. I reached the bow of the boat, and right then I knew I was about to score. I get a tight feeling in my stomach when I start closing in on danger. I spotted the dark outline at the rail, so I pulled my hat down and walked up beside him. He was hunched over with his arms resting on the rail. Terrible night. Mm Mm-hmm. It'd be awful if you had to find someone in this fog. Not if he found you first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like the name Louis Osgood. Have you heard of it? I like the name Moran. William Moran. Who are you? Just an employee. Diamond. Hey, you get a gold star. Well, what do you want? Uh, Have you found the blackmailers? Now, stop playing Alice in Wonderland. I just pushed around your hired gun at Louis Osgood. He had enough to say to put you away for a long time. He couldn't have. He didn't know Didn't know your name? Who murdered your wife? You or Louis Osgood? Why do you say murder? The police said it was suicide. Well, I got news for you, Buster. Homicide just changed its mind. I checked and found out that the highball glass near her head was covered with prints from her right hand. What does that prove? It proves that to take her own life, she'd have to have fingers a foot long. The prints on the gun were also from her right hand. You're going to tell me that your wife shot herself while holding a highball glass in the same hand? That's not my problem, Mr. Diamond. Well, I think it is. If Louis Osgood didn't shoot her, that leaves just one suspect, you. Now, let's take a walk back to the cabin. I want to keep an eye on you for homicide. All right. This is where I leave you, Mr. Diamond. Hey, come here. I hadn't thought he'd make a break, but as long as he had a gun and knew how to use it, I could understand why he did. I got my gun out and took off after him. I expected him to go over the side and in the fog, and he'd have a good chance. But when a guy gets cornered, he does funny things. I never would have spotted him. But he threw open a door and framed himself in the light from the inside. I must have caught him because I saw him start to fold and stagger through the door. I took my time getting there. A wounded man with a gun can get pretty mean sometimes. The door swung back and forth with the motion of the boat, and I could hear the sound of the engines. He'd gone down in the engine room, so I dropped to my knees and went in after him. A long, polished ladder led down to the big diesel's blower, and I knew I'd hit him with the first shot because there was a bright red trail of blood leading down the ladder and behind the churning machinery. Moran! Moran, come on out! You can't get out of here. Come and get me, Diamond! I don't like being slapped around, and I'm going to see that you get yours! He was somewhere off to my left and keeping himself hidden. A catwalk circled the engine room, so I pulled an old stunt. I took a wrench off the wall and tossed it down the metal ladder. I watched for his gun flashes, and when I spotted his position, I got down on my stomach and crawled along the catwalk until I was directly over his head. He was sitting in a lot of blood, and he didn't look like he had long to go. Come on, Diamond, I know you're down here. Surprise, look at the birdie. What? Don't try it. (laughs) 
sorry, Moran, but this just wasn't your night. You want to tell me about it? I shot my wife. I came in just after she shot Grayson. And she was standing at the bar with her back to me, mixing a drink. She dropped the gun by Grayson's body, so I picked it up and shot her. Wiped my prints off and put hers on it. Why did you do it? I hated her. She had money. I found some letters and turned them over to Mac Grayson, the well-known blackmailer. I wanted him to drive her crazy until she drank herself into a sanitarium, and then I'd have her money. I never guessed she'd kill Grayson, but when I did, I saw a chance to kill her and make it look like suicide. You should never have called me. The police were satisfied. I had to find Leo Fink. He knew I'd hired Grayson, and he was going to blackmail me. So when I dug up the little wino that knew Fink, you hired Louis Osgood to bump Fink and me. Is that right? Hey, hey, Moran. Oh, well, it was a dull conversation anyway. Lousy night. The captain came and helped me carry him up to the deck. Back at the ferry landing, I called Walt Levinson and told him the whole story. I didn't wait around. I just hung up in the middle of his lecture on good behavior and started walking. A stiff breeze was kicking up and pushing the fog back where it came from. After a good round of murder, a guy likes to relax. And I knew just the place to curl up and get my fur brushed. I grabbed a cab and headed for 975 Park Avenue. And the only girl in the world who looked better than her $10 million bank account. Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Francis. Is Miss Asher in? Yes, sir. She's in the library. Thanks. Get me a glass of milk, will you, Francis? Milk? Oh, yes, sir. Right away. Hey, that's a B-flat. Rick, where have you been? Sailing, sailing over the bounding main. Move over. You were supposed to have been here at 8 o'clock. Oh, what's an hour if you tack it on to the end of the evening? Well, I'm glad you've been keeping out of trouble. I can't stand it when you wander in all beat up. Mm, you smell nice. What kind of cologne is that? Gunpowder, 38. What? Oh, nothing. What's this you were playing? Oh, a new song. Again. You were just dandy. Well, you know I don't play well. I just pick. You should be glad you don't play the guitar with those beautiful nails. You'd saw it in half. <laughs> You're ridiculous. Whoops. Oh, that wasn't a B-flat. Rick. Mm-hmm. Who do you love? I won't tell. Rick? I love you, baby. Then let's get married. Uh, hey, these are pretty good lyrics. Now stop that. Again, this couldn't happen again. I hate you. This is that once in a lifetime. This is that moment divine. You never sing when I want you to. What's more, this never happened before. Though I have waited a lifetime. For such as you to suddenly be mine. No comment. No. Mine to hold as I'm holding you now and yet never to part. Mine to... Hey, what's the matter? Don't go. You want to sing? Go ahead. Well, what did you have in mind? I won't tell. You're not being original. That's my line. Well, I'm mad. Come here, come here. No. Come here, huh? Mm -hmm. Helen. Mm -hmm. Still mad? No. Mm. Well, let's get you mad again. It's so much fun making up. <laughs> Mine again. What's the name of the song again? <laughs> uh, it never happens again. Oh, good. No. Mickey. Here's your milk, Mr. Diamond. Oh, my goodness. You never warned me. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Tal Avery, Herbert Butterfield, and Jack Petruzzi. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. 
Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. Now NBC brings you a three-way cavalcade of grand comedy with Phil Harris and Alice Faye, Fred Allen and Henry Morgan, all following in fast succession over most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. My name's Diamond, and I'm known along the big street as a guy who manages to keep his nose pretty clean and still make a few bucks while I'm doing it. Oh, sure, it gets a little grimy, but you've got to expect that. I'm a shamus, private eye, gumshoe. To the guy who hasn't ever been worried because he'd tripped over a corpse in his breakfast nook, I'm known as a private detective. And to some guys, I'm known by a lot of other names. Not the kind you'd find in a book on manners and social usages. But there are times when you might turn up on your desk calendar under the heading of what I must do today. Who hires me? How do I make a living? Well, maybe this will give you an idea. Fred, why don't you eat your toast? It's getting cold. Why don't you stop worrying about the temperature of my breakfast? I'm trying to read the paper. Did anyone ever tell you how charming it is to have breakfast with you every morning? Yeah. My ulcers. I'd like to go shopping today. Will you leave me some money? Fred, did you hear me? Mary, I'm reading. Well, stop reading and listen to me for a minute. I need some new summer clothes and I want to go shopping today. Here. Yeah. Here's ten bucks. Buy yourself a bathing suit. Oh, that's very funny. Hmm? I need more than ten dollars. I want five hundred. What kind of a bathing suit are you going to buy, Mink? I'm not going to buy a bathing suit. I need some new clothes. Will you put down that paper and listen to me? Well, I see you made Jimmy Cello's column again, my darling. What? What prominent socialite is fighting with her wealthy husband and crying on the shoulder of a big-time playboy after the arguments? Is that... That's supposed to be me? Can you remember five minutes in the past five years when we haven't been fighting? Are you accusing me of running around with some playboy? Running around is right. I expect one of you to be the first to do a four-minute mile. How dare you? How dare me? Why, you lushed-up little tramp. Tramp? Yeah, tramp. Everybody in town knows you're seeing Lauren Oliver. All right, so I've been seeing him. We're... We're just friends. Well, that kind of friendship is grounds for divorce in this state. Why, you dirty... I'm sick of this whole rotten mess. And I'm going to do something about it. You're going to do something about it? Why, you conceited, pompous... You're going to do something, are you? Well, you better hurry up because I've got some ideas of my own. Uh, yeah? Lorne. Yeah, yeah, Mary? I've got to talk to you. What time is it? Ten o'clock. Well, it's still the middle of the night. Call me back this later. This can't wait. Fred found an item about us in Jimmy Cello's column this morning. He stormed out of here like he was going to kill somebody. Well, you're just a gal who can recognize the symptoms. Well, that's a nasty line. What do you want at 10 in the morning, Longfellow? Look, honey, I'll take care of Cello, and if that husband of yours gets out of line, I'll take care of him, too. You see what I mean? If things like that didn't happen, I'd be out of business. I'll lay you eight to five that before three o'clock this afternoon, one of those charming people will be walking into my office begging for help. Yeah? Rick? Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Hi. You gonna take me out tonight? Sure, sure. I'll be over later. We'll have a quiet evening. No, no. I want to go dancing tonight. If you don't take me, I'll throw a tantrum. But, baby, I don't have the cash. I'm tapped this week. Well, if you won't let me take, you'll borrow it from Francis. You told me yourself he was good in a pinch. Yeah, but he's already black and blue from those three lunches at Lindy's. Besides, he's not only your butler, but he's a darn good businessman. He wants security. 
I'll give it to him. He's already got my badge. My book on the ten best ways to sneak through transoms, complete with illustrations, and my gun. Haven't you got something else? Yeah, but I'm saving the right eye in case of an emergency. Keyholes, you know. Look, honey, let's go take in a quiet movie and... I want to get dressed up and go to a nightclub. It's summer. The flowers are blooming and the fox has left his lair. His what? Oh, I've been hibernating all winter and I want to get out into some nice smoke-filled dance floor. Why, Helen. Why, Helen, nothing. Please, Rick. Uh, hold it. Someone's knocking at my chamber door. Come in. Mr. Diamond? Yeah, I'll pull up a chair. I'll be right with you. Who is it? I'm afraid to look. I haven't paid the light bill. This is a detective agency, isn't it? You, sir, have just won yourself a new economy home size murder sampler, complete with a matching set of bodies. Me? No. I haven't got time to listen to your bright remarks, Diamond. I want to hire you. What did he say? He doesn't like my bright remarks. You won't even admit they're bright. What else? No, oh, something about wanting to... Uh... Something about what? Uh, what was that last statement, sir? It sounded rather cozy. I said I wanted to hire you. What? I'll call you later, baby. Bye. Uh, wait, wait a minute. I, I... Now, uh, Mr. Uh... Sears. Mr. Sears, what can I do for you? I want you to follow my wife. Will I like the view? She's running around with another man. Well, if they're just running around, don't worry about it. It's when they get tired and slow down that things start to pop. There was a veiled article in Jimmy Cello's column this morning about my wife and this man. Yeah, I know Cello. So do I, but I'm not interested in Cello at the moment. Well, what do you want? Enough on your wife so you can get a divorce? Yes. Oh, well, that, that comes kind of high. I don't like cases like this, and I usually turn them down. If you want me to swallow my pride, it'll take a $200 retainer and a 100 a day in expenses. I'll write you a check. Oh, oh just like that, huh? I am quite wealthy. Hmm. That's why I want the divorce, Mr. Diamond. There you are. Yes, sir. There I am. Now, what's the man's name that your wife is uh, seeing? His name is Lorne Oliver. Well, this is turning into a family gathering. You know him? Sure. Runs the Monarch Club. That's right. What's your wife's name, and we're going to get a look at her. Mary Sears. You can see her tonight at the stork. We'll be there for dinner, 9 o'clock. I'll be there. Oh, uh, incidentally, that uh, comes under the heading of expenses, in case you have a short memory. I have a good memory, Mr. Diamond. You can send me the bill. Oh. Address and phone number? 45 East 65th Street. 45 East 65. Evergreen 41793. 41793. Now I've got to be going. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Sears. Yeah? What'd you hang up on me for? Uh, honey, this is because you always give me an argument. You never want to go anywhere. I'm getting tired of shows and hot dogs. I want to go dancing. What? And I don't mean Roseland. I want to go to the stork. I'm a growing boy, and I like to see the bright lights and throw my money around. But, Rick, you... you I'll certainly... pick you up at 8.30, and this time, don't wear slacks. <laughs> You're an idiot. Bye, idiot. Yes, that's the way it goes, just as I told you. The word private in front of detective means you're married to all the troubles in the world, and that includes everything. So if a guy turns up who's unhappy with his wife, you listen to him howl, and if he's got enough money, you take the job. It's for better or for worse. And until Mr. Sears came in, it was decidedly one-sided. I'd teach cooking to a bunch of headhunters for a fee like the one he'd given me. When I looked at his $200 check, I started getting that big man complex again. So I closed the office and went back to my flat. We'd probably be up late, and Helen always had some extracurricular activities after we'd get back to her place. You know, roasting marshmallows, fast game of canasta, or an exciting round of image on the living room rug. Anyway, I always got home pretty late in the a.m., so I spent the rest of the afternoon taking a nap. At 6 o'clock, I got up and dressed, and at 8.30, I picked up Helen. Wow. And at 9 o'clock, we were sitting at the Stark Club bar, right on schedule. Rick, when are you going to ask for a table? Well, honey, the drinks come faster here. But I want to dance. Oh, no, no, no. I mustn't overdo it, lover. Uh, How do you know? Maybe some mountain climber will ask you on a 20-mile hike to bar. Think of your feet. I am. I want to move them around that dance floor. Oh, Rick, I know you. You do something, you do it all the way. Yeah, let's nick. Oh, now you stop that. You're on a job, and you don't want to go in there because you've got to watch somebody. Well, Helen Asher, how are you, darling? Well, hello, Lauren. How have you been? Oh, couldn't be better. Why don't you ever stop over to my club? I'd like to show you around. She just brought a seeing-eye dog. Oh, 
Hello, Diamond. You two know each other, don't you? Yes. How did we make such a grisly mistake, Oliver? I don't know. I tried taking penicillin for it, but it didn't do much good. Well, it probably helped out in the other things. Why don't you try hanging yourself? Really? You always did think you were a pretty funny man, didn't you, Diamond? <laughs> It's easy being a comic. You just find an idiot for an audience. How do you like the performance? Stinks. Pardon me, Helen, but I see some people I know. You'll excuse me, won't you, Diamond? Oh, sure, yes. But the next time you drop around, bring some airwick, huh? Rick, even if you don't like him, you shouldn't say those things. It's liable to start a fight. Oh, uh, he wouldn't take a swing at a midget if he was riding an elephant. Wonder who his friends are. They don't seem to be too glad to see him. The name's Sears. Is that who you're watching? Yeah, the wife. I don't know whether I approve or not. She's very attractive. Isn't she, though? Rick! This is business, baby. Business. I'm only drooling because I haven't had anything to eat since this morning. Well, then let's get a table. You've seen her. You've observed what she's doing. Now let's get something to eat. Now, wait a minute. Here comes somebody else I know. Where? Standing at the check room. The little man? Yeah, here he comes. Who is he? Name's Cello. Oh. Jimmy Cello. Writes a gossip column. Oh, I read it all the time. Yeah? Uh, hello, Jimmy. Well, 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 a Broadway shaman. Who's the uh, lovely redhead, Diamond? Helen, meet James Cello, but be careful what you say. Jimmy, Helen Asher. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Cello. How do you do? Is this an item, Rick? If I don't get us a table soon, she's going to make me give back her sorority pick. <laughs> oh, uh, speaking of tables, I see some people I know. Uh, nice meeting you, Miss Asher. Thank you. Goodbye, Diamond. Bye, Jimmy. Rick, he's going over to see his table. Hello, Walter. Hi, doll. Hi. Well, well, good evening. What do you want, Cello? Oh, I just dropped by to see how the happy little family was getting along. Well, just drop away. Nobody asked you to stop by. Yeah, why don't you do that? And take Oliver here with you. Nobody asked him to stop by Fred, either. keep your voice down. This is my table, and I don't like a lot of crumbs lying all that over it. Who's a crumb? Come on, Lorne. I guess Mr. Sears has forgotten a few things. I haven't forgotten a thing, Cello. When you print one thing in that lying sheet of yours, and I'll have you sued for life. Listen, Sears, if I did print anything, they'd put you away so far, they'd have to pipe air into you. Oh, do go on, Mr. Cello. This is getting interesting. You'd better get out of here, Cello. No, no, no. Go on, Cello. What have you got an old money bag? He's a lying, dirty gossip monger. He doesn't have uh, a thing. Wait a minute. I don't like that. Why don't you ask your husband about North Africa sometime, Mrs. Sears? Well, just a minute. Fred, stop it. Fred. All right, now pick yourself up and get out of here, Cello. Yeah, maybe you're right. I've got a column to get out. It'll be all about you, Sears, in big time. Go on, get out. How about me? You gonna throw me out, too? You can bet your life I am. I'm getting out of here. You stay right where you are. Don't talk that way to Mary. I'll talk any way I like to my wife. Lauren, maybe you'd better leave. Here come the waiters. Now it's I'm gonna push this fat slob's face in. Yeah? Yeah. Lauren, don't. All right, all right. Come on, break it up. Break it up. Come on. Hey, waiter, give me a hand. Come on, you. Take your hands off me, Diamond. Now calm down, Mr. Sears. I'll kill that slob. Oliver, you shut up or I'll. Pull your pants up over your head and shove you in a glass like a breadstick. I don't like people meddling in my affairs, Diamond. You're fired. I'm what? You heard me. Now take your filthy hands off me. Ah, well, they were lily white before I palmed that check of yours this morning. You can have it back. Here, eat it. What? I miss... I'll have you in jail for this, Diamond. Why? It isn't every day you get to eat a $200 check. Oh, Rick, let's get out of here. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, baby, but that's what happens when you go to work for a hyena like Sears. You think he's a nice guy because he laughs so much. But you find out later it's only because he chewed your leg off. We left Sears still spitting out pieces of the check I'd shoved down his throat and headed for Helen's apartment. I was sore. When I get hot under the collar, I don't make for good company. So I dropped her off with a kiss and went back to my flat and climbed in the sack. I smoked a dozen cigarettes before I got to sleep. And when I finally did, it must have been with a big smile on my face. All night, I kept dreaming that Lauren Oliver and Fred Sears were beating themselves to death with hot paper sacks. Sunshine Market. Locks popover is our specialty. Now you stop clowning and get over here right away. Walt? Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, wow. Where are you? I'm in your office. Yeah? Well, if any clients come in, give them a good sales talk. Tell them how many people you've killed or something. There's a guy in your office now. Prospect? Depends on what you're talking about. I think his name is Fritz Sears. Uh, tell him to go home. He canned me last night. 
I don't think he'll listen. All right, all right. So he's sore. He's got a right to be. He's dead. Stop acting like an idiot, Walt. You know I didn't have anything to do with it. I know you didn't, but we find the stiff in your office and we get a report that he fired you last night, but you had a fight with him. I gotta tell the commissioner something, Rick. Tell him Sergeant Otis is teething. Now you stop that. No, what do you know about the killing? The coroner just left. He said that Sears had been dead about eight hours. The cleaning woman found him at nine this morning and called us. Mm, that puts the time of the murder around 1 a.m. We found this clenched in the dead man's hand. What is it? An article torn out of the morning papers. Here, read it. Ah, oh, Jimmy Cholo's column. Read it. All right, I will. Don't yell at me. Ah, oh, Fred Sears, wealthy import-export man, is having troubles. He's finding it hard to explain about his past doings in North Africa... And at the same time, he's finding it just as hard to explain his wife's interest in the local playboy, nightclub owner, Lauren Oliver. Yeah. He got so mad at the Stark Club... Oh, I was there. I was there. He got so mad at the Stark Club last night that he took a poke at your columnist and then tried to beat up Lauren Oliver. Will this lead to a rematch between Oliver and Sears? We're yeah. having a whole bunch of them picked up. Walt, Walt, before you do that, give me a couple of hours, will you? Try to dig up your killer? I can't. You know what we've got to do. It's routine. Well, the commissioner's already having fits every time he hears my name. Now, look, Rick. Walt, I got a business to protect. And if he finds out the stiff was killed in my office, he'll probably be a haul in my license. Yeah. One hour, Rick. That's oh. all I can give you. I got a job, too. Oh, thanks, Walt. I suppose you've got an alibi for one o'clock. Call Helen. We were toasting marshmallows. I had three good suspects, Lauren Oliver, Cello, the columnist, and Mrs. Sears. One of the three was built just right for the electric chair. An hour isn't much time to dig up a killer, so I grabbed a cab and headed for Lauren Oliver's office in the back of his club. Yeah, come in. How are you, Oliver? Oh, what do you want, Diamond? Not particular about who comes into my club. Oh, I'm surprised you can operate with that kind of policy. People probably see you in here every night. I think I'll have you thrown out. Where were you at one o'clock this morning? None of your business. Herman. Yeah, boss? Come in here and show a guy out of my office. Oh, we get rough, huh? Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll let you tell the cops who knocked off Fred Sears. Hey, this the guy, boss? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you say someone knocked off Fred Sears? That's right, but don't start crying about it. It makes me feel so helpless. I'll tell my story to the cops. They'll get a lot tougher than I will. You won't get tough at all, Mac. Oh, stop flexing, Herman. You'll snap your girdle. Well, I guess it doesn't make much difference as long as Sears is dead. I was with his wife from about 12 o'clock to... to, Well, it was a long time after one. Where were you all that time? At my place. And I'll take a walk, Shamus. You got my alibi. One more question. Did you go out at all? Yeah, I went out and got the late papers. So what? I like to read. Okay, okay. You don't mind if I stop by and see Mrs. Sears, do you? No, go ahead. I'll see you later. Oh, Herman. Yeah? You can let the air out now. Your muscles are lovely. Well, Oliver had a good story, but checked. So that left me with two more stops. Cello's newspaper office was the closest, so I grabbed another cab, and ten minutes later, I was sitting at his desk. Oh, you don't think I had anything to do with it, do you, Diamond? Where were you at one this morning? I was covering a party at Richard Gray's. I was with friends from about 11 o'clock till after 3. You can check. Come on, check. Look, Poison Pin. Sears had your column from the late edition clenched in his hand. He, he did, huh? Well, you don't think if I was going to kill a man, I'd leave anything like that around? I don't know. Well, now, obviously, someone is trying to make it look like I did it. Have you talked with Oliver and Sears' wife? Oliver's got an alibi, and I'm headed for Mrs. Sears' place right now. You know the address? Yes, yeah. 45 East 65th. But Mrs. Sears couldn't kill her husband. I know it too well. No? Well, thanks, Cello. I'll check your alibi. If it stands up, then I'll have to really go to work on Mrs. Sears. Yes? Mrs. Sears? Yes. Oh, you look even better up close. What's on your mind? You mean right this minute? Well, aren't you nice? Don't crowd me, though. I can keep up a pretty good average in this league. I'd say about a thousand. Mm -hmm. May I come in? I think so. If you keep talking, I like to hear nice things. Uh, You deserve them. But I can think of some nice things to say about a panther. We'll talk about my family some other time. Can I buy you a drink? It's a little early, unless you got some milk. Milk? Where's your husband? Oh, you know about him, huh? Oh, I'm sorry. It's looked as though it might work into quite a friendship. Where is he? I haven't seen him since last night. Why? Why? Is he a friend of yours? He's been using my office. 
Oh? Yeah, yeah. He died there last night. What? Everybody is so surprised. But, uh, how? Who did it? That's what I'm trying to find out, lover. Where were you at 1 a.m.? That's none of your business. Okay, let the law drag it out of you. Goodbye, dear. Uh, wait a minute. All right, I'll tell you. I was with a man named Oliver, Lorne Oliver. Oh, for how long? From about 12 o'clock to, well, much later. That's what Oliver says. Did you go out at all? Just to get the papers. That checks with Oliver's story, too. Did you go out alone? Why, uh... uh no, I, I went with Lorne. He says he went out alone. Oh, well, yes, yes, he did. I thought you said you went out with him. Well, that was later. Lorne was the one that went out to get the papers. Okay, what time was it? Uh, about two. When you both went out or when Lorne went out to get the papers by himself? Uh, when Lorne went out. Oh, yes, now, now I see. Well, I, I'll, I'll see you later. Uh, come back again. Oh, I'll do that after you get over crying for your late husband. I'll keep my emotions down to a minimum. I'll bet you will. I left her standing in the middle of the room, looking after me like a vegetarian with an eye on a green salad. I closed the door and started down the hall for the elevators. For some reason, I never seem to get where I'm going. Hello. Hmm? <coughs> oh. Now, while you're still tuned in, Diamond, I'll give you some advice. Stay away from Mrs. Sears. Now, I want you to be sure and get the point... Snap out of it. Uh, I'll go away. Come on, you don't look so good. Uh, it matches the way I feel. Oh, here's a new line. Where am I, Walt? In Mrs. Sears' apartment. Hello, handsome. She heard the scuffle in the hall, came out, found you, and called me. Swell. Who did it? I didn't see him, but his voice sounded like a thug that Lauren Oliver keeps around the patty cake with. Oh, that was probably Herman. Lauren is so jealous. Well, your hour is up, and now I'm going to haul them all in, including this Herman. Oh, do you know Herman, Walt? Sure, Herman Sharp. Got a record a mile long. Uh, Walt, if a guy wanted to hire a killer, where would he go? You know all the stoolies as well as I do. Yeah. Mrs. Sears, what was the fight about last night at the stork? Oh, a columnist named, named Cello threatened my husband that he was going to print something in his paper. He said something about North Africa, and Fred hit him. North Africa? This is really getting mixed up. Was your husband ever in North Africa? Yes, during the war. He was a captain in the army. Walt, can you get me this Herman Sharp's address? He's the boy I want. Sure, but I'm coming along. Have your boys pick up Cello, Oliver, and take them both down to the station along with Mrs. Sears here. Well, well you don't think I had anything to do with it, do you? I've known Jimmy Cello a long time. About five years ago, he used to run around with a little dancer named Mary Carroll. Sure he did. I'm Mary Carroll, but I broke up with him when I met Fred. Yeah, well, you'll see him at the station. You can pick up where you left off. Come on, Walt. We went down fast and climbed into the prowl car. Walt put in a call and got Herman's address over the two-way radio. Twenty minutes later, we were standing in front of Herman's door. It was an old apartment house on the lower east side. I started for the door, but Walt had other ideas. Rick, we can't go in there. Why not? Because I haven't got a search warrant. Well, you've got to go in if you want to crack this case. Not without a search warrant. Search warrant for what? To go in. Well, what do you want to go in for? I don't want to go in. You do. Do what? Go in. Well, go ahead. I haven't got a warrant. Well, what are you looking for? Herman Sharp. He's probably in there. He is? Sure. Well, what are we waiting for? Oh, what did I do that for? For that. What? Herman Sharp. Oh. Ah, is he dead? Yeah, been shot. What are you looking at? Newspaper on the floor. This morning's. Oh. Cello's column's missing. Been torn out. Then Herman's your killer. Swell. Who killed Herman? Don't you know? I'm not going to start that again. Walt, go on back to the station. I'm going to check something and make a phone call. I'll be down in half an hour and point out your killer. Now, calm down. Calm down, this everybody. This is ridiculous. I want my lawyer. You'll get one later. Relax, Oliver. They can't hold it much longer. How do you feel, Mary? I don't like this any more than you do. Well, good afternoon. And happy Father's Day. Oh. Rick, where the devil have you been? Made a phone call to Washington, Walt. Mrs. Sears, did you know that your husband had a dishonorable discharge from the Army? Why, no. You knew it, didn't you, Cello? That's right, but I kept it quiet. He got it for running a black market. What's this got to do with the death of Sears? Oliver, you told me you went out to get the papers last night. That's right. What time was it? 
Uh, a little after two. You know what time the late edition comes out. How about you, Mrs. Sears? Uh, what Lorne says is correct. How about it, Lorne? Were you the one to go out and get the papers? Uh, the yes. Uh, then, Mrs. Sears, why did you tell me this afternoon that you also went out to get the papers? Well, I... Uh, Mary, don't say anymore. You don't have to. The stories don't check, so you couldn't have been together last night. Look, Diamond, what is this... Oh, got... now you look, Oliver. You're both liars. But that doesn't make either one of you the killer. Oh, but Rick, Cello's alibi checks right down the line. Sure it does, because he was at that party. But the killer wasn't. Oh, we know that. He couldn't have been. Yeah, but the man who hired the killer to knock off Sears was. What are you talking about, Diamond? Oliver, where was your hired gone if last night? You mean Herman? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. He was with me until 6 o'clock, then he left. Walt, when you find Herman's gun, ballistics will probably say that it was the one that did the job on Sears. Herman? Yeah. Cello, you hired Herman to kill Sears, and then you killed Herman. What? You're out of your mind. I didn't even know this Herman. We found the newspaper next to Herman's body. It had your column torn out of it. That doesn't pin anything on me. It just shows you that Herman probably stuck that article in Sears' hand after tearing it out of a newspaper. That's you. That's what you wanted to make it look like. You knew Herman. You knew about the clipping, so you killed him and tore the column out of this morning's newspaper. Of course I knew about the clipping. You told me about it this morning in my office. That's right. But you were the only one I told about it. You couldn't convict Jack the Ripper on that kind of evidence. I'm afraid he's right, Rick. Hello. What time does the late edition come out? About two o'clock. Walt. What time was Sears killed? Around one. Say. Yeah, yeah. The killer couldn't have gotten hold of that column at one o'clock. The papers weren't even out on the street. Well, then how did he do it? Only one man could have gotten that column before 1 a.m., the man who wrote it. Jimmy. He oh. tore it out of the galley sheets. The proofs that are made up before the paper goes to press. Cello hired Herman, gave him the clippings, and then went to the party. Oh, you're doing great, Diamond. Keep it up. You're still in love with Mary Sears. You were jealous of Oliver, so you hired Oliver's boy Herman, figuring the cops would pin Sears' murder on Oliver. How am I doing? You're a good liar and a rotten detective. You knew I'd go to see Mary Sears, so you sent Herman to beat me up and make it look like Oliver was behind it. What? You tried to frame Oliver all along the line. Why, you cheap little scandal snooper. I'll fix it so you I'll don't wait blame anybody. Wait a minute. Yeah, all right, break it out. Break it out. Break it out. Hey, Walt. What is it, Rick? Bye. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Diamond. Uh, evening, Francis. Miss Asherin? Yes, sir. She's in the library. She's a little tired from last night. Uh, I think she's taking a nap. Well, I'll walk on my tippy toes. How about a glass of warm milk, Francis? I'm a little tired, too. Uh, yes, sir. Right away, sir. Well, look at the little baby. Mm-hmm. Oh, her's in dream rain. Poor little tired baby. The evening breeze caress the trees tenderly. Oh, Rick. The trembling trees embrace the breeze tenderly. Hello, baby. Don't stop. All right. Close your eyes. Mm-hmm. Then you and I came wandering by. Oh. Wonderful. And lost in our sight were we. Ricky. The shore was kissed by sea and mist tenderly. Ricky. I can't forget how two hearts met breathlessly. Ricky, come here. Your arms opened wide and closed me inside. Ricky, come here. Uh, what is it, dear? Just this. Mm. Here's your milk, mister. Oh, my goodness. Now, this time I refuse to blush. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, High Aberback, Joan Banks, Harley Bear, and Sidney Miller. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. 
Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Time now for Rocky Jordan, brought to you today by Del Monte Tomato Products. Not far from the Musk Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Del Monte Foods presents Rocky Jordan and this week's story, Gold Fever. It all started when the phone at the head of the tambourine bar opened up along in the afternoon. Chris was serving a lonely customer at one of the side tables, so I got up front and answered it. Yeah, Cafe Tambourine. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, who is it? I must speak to Jordan Bay. This is Jordan Bay. I must make no mistake. Are you sure? Look, I don't know who I am. What is this? You must hurry, Jordan Bay. Come as quickly as you can. Who said so? Pete Servos. He must see you at once without delay. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who did you say? Pete Servos. Servos? Come right away, Jordan Bay. As quickly as you can. Well, where do I find him? Hello? Where do I find him? Where... Oh, great. Pete Servos. That could be only one man, and his name meant only one thing, gold. The kind you never find. Only dirt and sweat and too much heartache. Yes, yeah, Servos had gold fever the worst way. I guess he'd always had it. He talked me into scratching around with him in the High Sierras once a long time ago. All the gold we ever found could have been picked up on the point of a pin. Well, I got my fill of it and finally gave up, but Pete was off to chase some other rainbow. And that was the last I'd seen of him. And why he was in Cairo and what he wanted to see me about was anybody's guess. And where I'd find him was a little point my caller had neglected to tell me. A disturbing phone call, Mr. Jordan? With my mind on the servos puzzle, I only half heard the voice. It came from my lone customer at a nearby table. He'd been frequenting the tambourine the last few days. A big, ruddy, solid set man. A combination of poise and strength named von Rudstedt. From across Africa in the Boer country. Uh, not that it is any of my affair, understand. Uh, light for your cigarette, Mr. Jordan. Eh? Oh, yeah, thanks. I fear that I am becoming a fixture in your cafe. Well, a wanderer gets the habit of settling in a spot where he feels at home. Well, stay as long as you like. Ah, you are generous. Uh, will you sit down? Yeah. Okay. You, um, been around the continent much, Mr. Jordan? Africa? No, oh, not much. Ah, remarkable changes since the war, especially in the past few months. Hmm? The recent gold strike in South Africa, for example. Gold strike? What brought that up? Oh, just a passing thought. You know, they tell me you're something of an adventurer, but... Oh, still worried about the phone call, Mr. Jordan? Huh? Oh, uh, sorry, Mr. Van Rudstead. I was just wondering why you have not thought of chasing after some of the yellow stuff. Oh, no, no. Gave that up years ago. Ah, you can never be sure. Once he has felt it, the lust for gold lies dormant in every man. Yeah, maybe so, but it's not for me. Ah, that is easy to say, but after all, when he least expects it, a man's luck might show him a rich vein one way or another. Is that not so? Yeah, you might say that. Ah, one never knows, Mr. Jordan. One never knows. <laughs> Von Rutstedt broke it off about then and went out into the street. I stayed close to the phone, and what seemed like hours later, it began ringing again. Uh, hello, Tambourine. Hello, hello. I must speak to Jordan Bay. Look, I'm Jordan Bay. Oh, 
Where are you, Jordan Bay? Where do you think I am? Where's Servos? Pete Servos? He's waiting for you. Why do you not come? One little detail. How do I find him? I told you. Are you Jordan Bay? For the last time, where is he? Where does he live? The address. Oh, oh, so careless of me. Come on now, let's have it. Room 207 at the Pyramid House. Hurry, Jordan Bay. I got outside, flagged down a taxi, and made a quick deal with a driver to look up the Pyramid House. He honked his way across the Musky Bazaar and finally pulled up in front of an ancient brownstone affair. A little more on the ratty side than most. I told the cabbie to wait around... Then I was up the steps, down a dark hall, and knocking at 207. Who is it? It's Rocky, Pete. Get inside, Rocky. Pete, hey, what's the matter with you? Better help me to bed. Sure, sure. Come on. Now take it easy. Yeah. Thanks. I've been looking all over for you, Rocky. Well, I can see now why you had to send somebody else. What happened? Uh, a couple of bullets I picked up. Well, we better take care of it. I'm all right. Just slowed me down a little. Yeah, bullets will do that. Yeah, won't they, though? How'd you get them? A lot anybody cares. Same old thing, huh, Pete? Gold? Yeah, same old thing. I don't give up, Rocky. I told you to forget it while you could. Yeah, you think I could? It's been in my blood, and what can I do about it? I've been digging ever since I could hold up a pick. Yeah, and what did it get you? A couple of bullets and a bunch of tattoos on your arm. Plenty of new ones since I saw you last. Oh, yeah. Hey, why are the numbers tattooed there on your right arm? Oh, there? <laughs> That's my social security number. <laughs> At this rate, you'll never live to collect it. I won't need it. Still think you'll strike it, don't you, Pete? Nobody's stopping me. Not even that no-good wife of mine. Well, I didn't know you were married. And I don't know why. What kind of a woman is it that won't stay by you? Share your dreams. Even help you dig. It's a tough life, Pete. How do you think it is for me? Yeah, stay home, she says. Give it up. But she'll be around plenty quick when there's gold. I know her. Uh, where is she now? Right here in Cairo, wouldn't you know? Checked into the Continental last week. And she can stay there. Look, Pete, if you didn't send for me about the bullets, what is it? What do you think? Well? Rocky. I finally struck it. What? Are you trying to tell I me... I found gold. A vein bigger than we ever dreamed about. South Africa load. After all these years, I found it. Well, that doesn't concern me. Uh, cut it out, Rocky. You're not over the fever any more than I am. I told you, Pete. I'm through with it. Yeah. How will you hear this, Rocky? I'm putting the whole mine in your name. My name? Let Clarissa try and get her hands on it then. Let her try. <laughs> it's all yours. She can't touch it. Now, wait a minute, Pete. You can't do that. We'll share 70-30. 70 goes to me. That's all right, ain't it? That's not the idea. It's ours, Rocky. Enough gold to keep us both on easy street the rest of our lives. I told you I got over the gold fever a long time Don't ago. Don't be silly. It's great having a gold mine, ain't it? From now on, we worry about nothing. No more digging and sweating and dying. Ah, <coughs> uh, you're getting tired, Pete. Come on, let's just forget it, huh? What's there to forget? It ain't like I'm asking your favor. Take it easy, Pete. Maybe I'll see you later. Yeah? Well, you'll be back, Rocky. I ain't worrying. You'll be back. The lock snapped on the inside, and I went down the hall and down the steps. Well, that was a noon. A guy offering you a gold mine on a silver platter. But I didn't want it. I didn't want any part of it. All I wanted was some fresh air. Just as I reached the front door, somebody drew back away from the glass. I got outside in time to see him dodge into a doorway a little way down. I was sure it was my customer from the tambourine, Von Rutstein. Right away, I remembered all his talk about gold fever. I wanted to know what he was doing there, so I went out after him. Hey, Von Rutstein! Von Rutstein, come back here! He ran without looking back, and all at once he was in a car and driving fast. My taxi was still waiting, so I got back and shook the cabbie awake. Oh, oh uh, do not be impatient, sir. Try and follow that car, quick. Oh, I have a very fine taxi. At times, it can go very fast. And take this pound note and get going. Here we are going, Effendi. He took that turn to the left. Oh, there is the car. Far ahead. All right, don't lose it. Come on, step on it. There is no finer taxi in all of Cairo. As I say, it can go fast. Another pound note if you catch that car. It is a deal. He swung off to the right. Can you make it? Hold tightly, sir. Sir, look ahead. Pull up, cabbie. Pull up. 
The car stands across the road. We are blocked. Use the brakes. Stop it. I am trying, but... Too late! We hit the car broadside, and the taxi front crumbled like a paper cup. One glance told me the cabbie was all right, so I was out and running to the other car. And it didn't take any time to see the car was empty. Von Rutstedt was gone. Del Monte Foods is presenting tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Hey, here comes Joe Johnson in the house after a long, hot day's work in the garden. Man, am I thirsty. I sure could use something cold and refreshing to drink. Oh, I wonder what's in the refrigerator. Hey, Del Monte tomato juice. That's for me. Opener. Glass. Right, Joe, for refreshment. There's nothing like Del Monte tomato juice. Del Monte tomato juice is fresh tasting. Yes, indeed. Del Monte tomato juice is made from fresh, ripe Western tomatoes, the flavor tomatoes. Mm Mmm. Del Monte tomato juice is natural tasting. True. Del Monte tomatoes are rushed directly from field to cannery to protect their fresh, natural taste. (sighs) Del Monte tomato juice is refreshing. Right. Del Monte tomatoes are pressed immediately at the cannery to preserve all the sunny, rich goodness of those deep, red, vine-ripened tomatoes. Fresh tasting, natural tasting, and refreshing. Fresh, natural, refreshing. That's Del Monte tomato juice. Look for it at your grocer's. Keep a can or two in your refrigerator. And remember, for real refreshment, buy fresh tasting Del Monte tomato juice every time. Now back to Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Gold Fever. Well, it took some time trying to pacify the little driver for the damage to his taxi, but I had other problems, like von Rudstedt following me to Pete's house and why he'd run off when I tried to question him. Yeah, and I was thinking about a rich gold strike in South Africa that service wanted to hand over to me, just to keep his wife Clarissa from getting any part of it. I decided it was time for a talk with her, so I went over to the Continental Hotel. Clarissa was there, but not exactly like I'd expected her. She was still young and pretty, like you want an American girl to be pretty. But there was something gone. She was thin, and the skin was taut across her cheekbones. She wasn't sure about letting me in. Who are you? My name's Jordan. Rocky Jordan. That means nothing to me. I've just been talking to your husband. I see. What does he want with me? Not a thing, Clarissa. But he's going to get well, if that interests you. What do you mean? A couple of bullets he picked up somewhere. Or didn't you know? I... I didn't know. How could I? He's your husband. Oh. And didn't he tell you I've come halfway around the world to Cairo to find him? To make one last try to get him to come home. Did you think he would? I... I don't know. Pete was such a good guy. He was a little like... I think you are, Rocky. Uh, He's still the same to me. We might have been happy. But every time we got settled with a home, he'd learn of some new strike and he was gone. You must have known that about him before you were married. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But I didn't know what it meant. I didn't realize there was no end to it. Now he won't even see me. So now I don't care. He's still got gold on his mind, Clarissa. Yes. Well, I hate it. Hunting for gold is foul and stupid, and I hate it. How about finding gold? He'll never find it. It so happens he has. What? Pete's finally struck it rich. I told you, Rocky, I don't care. Are you sure? What do you mean? What would you say if Pete put that mine he found in my name? I'd say he can do anything he wants with it. I'm going back home now. And forget Pete's service if it's the last thing I ever do. There's another one for you. Pete puts the mine in my name to keep his wife's hands off of it. Only she tells me she doesn't want any part of it or him either. That's when I double back to Pete's place to get a few things straight. When I got there, the first thing I noticed was the door smashed open 
Inside, the mattress was half off the bed, the bureau drawers open. Pete wasn't around, but somebody else was. Captain Sabaya, Cairo Police. Well, Jonah... Sam, what's this all about? You will touch nothing. What's happened to service? Where is he? Pete Solvos at this moment is on his way to the morgue. He's dead. Dead? Does that surprise you so much, Jordan? Oh, I knew he had some bullet holes, but he said he was recovering. The bullets which killed him were fired within the past hour. And a very thorough job. Any idea who did it? Well, a man hasty in his opinions is neither wise nor honorable. I think you better look for somebody named Von Rutstedt, Sam. Jordan, a certain informant tells me you were here to see Servas this afternoon. For what purpose? Just a friendly visit. Indeed. What did you talk about? Oh, old times, Pete's gold strike. Is that all? What are you driving at? Would you have killed Servos for his mind? Sam, you know me better than that. Service was an old friend. Jordan, someday you will learn that withholding information serves you no good. I've told you everything, Sam. Then how do you explain this letter? Letter? Where do you get it? I found it among papers in his desk. It is addressed to Rocky Jordan. I, Pete Servos, hereby grant to you full and complete ownership of my gold stake in South Africa on the one condition that I receive 70% of the profits from said mine throughout my life. Signed, Pete Servos. Let me see that. It will be held for possible evidence, Jordan. Oh, but the letter's to me. Do not fear, Jordan. It appears certain that you are the complete owner of a gold mine. Now that Servos is dead. Yeah, looks that way. And now, Jordan? Hmm? You will kindly tell me where the gold mine is located. Where it's located? Yes, Jordan. You know something, Sam? I haven't any idea. Come, Jordan. You mean to say a man gives you a mine, but he does not tell you where it is? That's right. Indeed. Come with me, Jordan. I have something to show you. Sam put me in his black limousine with him, and we made the trip to headquarters without saying much. There, he nodded me down some familiar steps that led to the morgue. Halfway along the big room, he drew back a sheet that covered Pete's service. Observe, Jordan. Uh, it's Pete, if that's what you're asking. You say you knew him well. Long time ago. Notice the forearm and near the wrist. Oh, looks like a bad burn or something. It is a burn. Put there after the killing. What about it? The killer obviously wanted to erase whatever was recorded there. A tattoo mark, perhaps. Oh, he had a lot of tattoos. But this one, can you recall what it was? Hmm. Afraid not, Sam. Very well. However, if your memory should suddenly return, let me know. I had noticed some numbers on Pete's arm that afternoon, but they wouldn't come back to me. After all, I wanted to clear up Pete's death, and the numbers might help. I had a hunch von Rundstedt knew... But going back to Clarissa was quicker. There was a chance she could help. The news of Pete's killing had been a shock to her, but she was packing to leave. Can't we just forget about it, Rocky? We've got to find the killer, Clarissa. Why? It had to end this way sooner or later. Will you hand me that grip, please? Oh, yeah. Here you are. Thanks. Pete had some numbers tattooed on his right arm. They've been burned off. What were they? I, I don't remember any numbers. You sure? Yes, Rocky, yes. I, I don't even know what you're talking about. Do you, do you have any pictures of Pete around? Box in the top bureau. I was about to throw them away. Oh, thanks. There you are. Uh, these all you have? Yes. Yes, they're all I have. This one here in the bathing suit. How long ago was it taken? What? That was at Daytona Beach. Just before he left me for South Africa six months ago. The numbers weren't on his arm then. I told you they weren't. Yeah, that means he had them put there after he made the gold strike. What difference does it make? Don't you see? They could be the location of the mine, in longitude and latitude. The numbers are all we need. I see. Rocky. Huh? Just why did you come here? I'm trying to clear up Pete's death, Clarissa. Are you? Whoever killed him is after that mine. He knows where it is. And you'd like to know, too, wouldn't you, Rocky? And there's nothing to do with it. Are you sure it hasn't? You said you'd put gold out of your mind a long time ago. You said the mind didn't matter to you. Well, it doesn't, Rocky, but can't you see what happened to Pete? I hoped it wouldn't happen to you. You've got the fever now, haven't you? 
You want that mine. Look, the gold's there and it belongs to me. Why shouldn't I try to find it? Yes, yes, why not? Gold can change a man so quickly. Are you trying to stop me? No. No, go ahead. I feel sorry for you, Rocky. I feel sorry. <laughs> What she was driving at didn't set with me. I got out into the Cairo night. As I tried to walk it off down the Sharia El Mar, I made up my mind I was finding von Rundstedt if it took digging out every hole in Cairo. That turned out too easy. He was waiting in a doorway. A gun leveled at my ribs. Take care, Jordan. Walk ahead. Hey, you're kind of hard to catch, von Rundstedt. He will talk in good time. About who? Service? To the left. Down the alleyway. Oh, I'm going to make it real private. Shut huh? up. No. Stand there now, with your back to the wall. Right, you're calling it. No tricks, if you are wise. I'm getting wise to a lot of things. Oh, that I followed you after the phone call in your cafe this afternoon? Yeah, it is true. Yeah, right to service's place. Did you kill him? There is no reason to hide it from you. We talked for a while, then I killed him. And burned the numbers off his arm. Why? Because they told the location of the mine? No one knows where the mine is except me and you, Jordan. I forgot the numbers. I could never be sure. So you figure burn them out of me? There is no other way. Uh, one little request, huh? It is your last. In close and clean. Uh, as you wish. <laughs> last step was his mistake. That's when my shoe caught his shin hard. He doubled for a split second and my hand came down with a jewel cut on the back of his neck. And Rootstead dropped flat in his face and the gun clattered away. I scrambled over and came up with it. It was that easy. Go around, Jordan. All right, come up, Van Rundstedt. I should have shot you while I could. Yeah, now we'll talk about the mine. Clear it up. Yeah. Yeah, you will want to know, Jordan. If Servos did not tell you, he did not find that mine. It was I who made the strike. Yeah, that's not what he told me. You fool. Why do you think he gave the mine to you? Why should he put it in your name? To keep it away from his wife. Ah, how can you believe that, Jordan? Servos stole that mine from me. Before I could file, he was ahead of me. It was in his name. And it was too late. Well, it's in my name now. Ah, yeah. Servos thought that would protect him from me. But I killed him for only one reason. Because he took what was mine. I killed him just as I will kill you. Only I got the gun. Ah. That poses a problem for you, does it not? I alone am in your way now. Unless you shoot me. Well, uh, go ahead, Jordan. Pull the trigger and get what you want. I was looking at him, but all at once I was seeing myself. Yeah, what Sam and Clarissa and now Von Rundstedt had said about me getting gold fever was right. I did want that mine, bad enough to kill. I could shoot, and I was safe, and this was my big chance. Go ahead, Jordan. You have only to pull the trigger. Self-defense, you can call it, and then you will be free of me. You deserve to die. You murdered service. Ah, that is it. Just try yourself, Jordan. Gold fever has no regard for fair play. I can see it in your eyes. You want to kill me, don't you? So you can get the mine. You'd have killed me. So now is your chance. You will find the mine somehow. The mine is all yours now. Just raise the gun, Jordan. Sam, pull the trigger. Shoot, Jordan. No. I'm not going to kill you, Von Rutstedt. That won't be necessary. Not for me. It was a difficult decision, was it not, Gordon? Ah, the police. Sam, how long have you been there? I witnessed everything. Ali, Greco, take this van Ron set away quickly. Yes, Captain. Sam, you won't be needing that service pistol. For which I am very happy. I would have hated to see you raise the gun to kill him. He killed service, Sam. Yes, Jordan. I know. You see, the police have not been idle. <laughs> Looks like you've been way ahead of me. <laughs> But Van Ronsted was right. The mine was stolen from him by Pete Service. In fact, I have learned many things from the South African authorities. Huh? Including what else? Van Ronsted was a most strange and unpredictable man, known throughout South Africa. Go on, I'm listening. He too had gold fever, but of a most severe nature. In his time, he had discovered a dozen mines. Each of them, to him, worth a fortune. To him? What are you getting at, Sam? Just this, Jordan. Both you and Pete Solvers were fooled by a man with hallucinations 
who owned a mine that was worthless. <laughs> More from Rocky Jordan in just a moment. Let's step outdoors and join the Ellis family at their barbecue. Boy, those hamburgers look good. I'm starved, honey. How long do I have to listen to them sizzling there on the griddle? <laughs> Take it easy, darling. All in good time. I'll just turn it over. There, that's about it. They're ready. Let me at them. Toasted bun. Hamburger patty. Here you are. Oh, no. Oh, no, you don't. Not plain like that. Where's the catsup? The one you served yesterday with the special flavor. Oh, you mean Del Monte catsup. You bet he means Del Monte catsup. The catsup with that special flavor. Tomato flavor at its best. It's lively, it's tangy, it's rich. Blended and simmered down according to a treasured recipe, Del Monte catsup on sizzling hamburgers, steak, or chops is a real flavor treat. And Del Monte catsup costs less than many other quality brands. Look for it at your grocer's. Remember, for flavor first, it's Del Monte catsup every time. Back now to Rocky Jordan. Well, there wasn't much more to clear up. Sam and his men took care of von Rutstedt. And all that was left for me to do was to have a little talk with Clarissa. I bought her a cup of coffee in an all-night cafe and told her what had happened. Well, Rocky, I'm glad it's over. Uh, me too. You know, I just took the cure. I'm out of the gold business. <laughs> I hope for keeps. You can count on it. So it was, it was all for nothing, then. Pete dreamed and stole and died for a mine without any gold. That's right. You know, somehow I'm glad he never found out. What about you now, Clarissa? Me? I need to go home for a while. Wish you didn't. Maybe sometime I'll come back to Cairo. Perhaps I'll see you then. Not scared of gold fever anymore? No. But there are other kinds of fever, Rocky. Let's wait and see. For the finest in tomato flavor, enjoy the whole family of Del Monte tomato products. Del Monte ketchup and chili sauce. Del Monte tomato sauce and canned tomatoes. And Del Monte tomato juice. Remember, buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Remember, you have a date next week at the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. Same time, same station. And the story is Cairo Vendetta. Rocky Jordan, written by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool, stars Jack Moyles in the title role and is directed and produced by Cliff Howell, with original music by Richard Aron. Here's a cool suggestion for a hot day. Chilled Del Monte fruit cocktail and cottage cheese. Everybody likes colorful, delicious Del Monte fruit cocktail. Serve tempting Del Monte fruit cocktail, the brand that puts flavor first. <laughs> Larry Thor speaking. Rocky Jordan is presented over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Quote the Raven, nevermore. Yes. This is me. Is this Mr. Spade? Yes, but is this Miss Perrine? Oh, yes, but... Why are you eating a peanut butter sandwich at this time of night? Why the illusion to pose Raven? Was your assignment among the literati? It certainly was. There was uh, Rowena from Ivanhoe, a lost Lenore, a no-place Ralph, and a Boris from the Karloff of the same name. Oh, how distinguished. Have you got a cold, Eph? No. Well, uh, then there was a carnivorous plant, a hideous meat-eating specimen of the botanical world, trying to take two fingers off me. (gasps) Well, I've got three fingers all poured out for you here. Ah, pretty hep. I can see you intend to be terribly amusing tonight. But even so, I intend to come right down and dictate my report on the stopped watch caper or time stood still. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, Join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Well, in a few weeks, many of us will be going bareheaded now and then, meaning we'll have to pay more attention than ever to the appearance of our hair. The best way I know to always keep your hair in trim is to use Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, removes loose dandruff, and relieves dryness which may be even more prevalent when your hair is exposed directly to the wind and sun. So right away, get the 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. sharp routine you give a prune on the phone. Where's Effie? Who are you? Sam, don't you remember me? Buffy! Certainly not. I never saw... Buffy, Buffy, wait a minute. Do I uh, sense a certain family resemblance? No, you can't be Effie's little sister, Buffy. Yes. Big girl now. But thanks anyway for the tinker toys you sent me last Christmas. I'd kill myself. (laughs) I intend to start having children of my own just as soon as it's practical. Hmm. Where's Eff, Buff? She had to go to L.A. to visit a sick friend. A likely story. No, really. Chapter and verse, please. St. Joseph's Hospital in Burbank. They went to school together, and her name is Lorene Tuttle. She's an actress. Yes, I know. A very fine actress. Is it serious? I hope not for Effie's sake. They're very close. Yeah. Well, uh, what now? Uh, you uh, take shorthand, Buff? Sort of. Spoken like a true Perrine. Come on in. Well, I hope it's good and gruesome. <coughs> I take it back. I meant the caper, not what you're drinking. Okay, Buff, you win. Ready? <laughs> Why not? Uh, date April 10, 1949, to uh, Deputy Sheriff Bill Woodington, Marin County Sheriff's Office, San Rafael, California, from Samuel Spade, license number... Uh... 137596. Oh, steady listener. Uh, subject, the stopped watch caper. Dear Bill... Here's how it turned out. And if I ever phone you for advice again, I'll take it because you were right. She was loaded. What about those threatening letters, Sam? Don't give another thought. Old Lady Raven has had me up there a dozen times the last six weeks. She got threatening letters, she got prowlers, but when I got there, she can't find the letters, and the way that house is tucked away in the woods, I don't think a prowler could find it. How do I find it, Bill? Huh? Well, the Gray Line bus goes right by the gate. Mount Tama Palais Road, about three miles this side of Rock Spring. Well, that sounds pretty rugged. You, uh, say she's a crank. But she's got money, Sam. Oh, the poor old soul. And she got a niece. Oh? Yeah. Over 23, but she's stacked. Hmm, the old lady's loaded, the niece is stacked. Who else lives there? Well, there's a butler. Somebody flattened his head when he was young, and he wears bangs to call attention to it. Sort of shuffles around the house. 
You ought to see them out in the woods chasing them old ground squirrels. Quick as a deer hound. Yeah, and, 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 and Never then mind, never mind. You sold me. All these marvels I have got to see. It was only 3 in the p.m. when I skulked in through the gates of Ravenswood, but it was so dark the hooty owls hadn't gone to bed yet. The fog snaked in and out through the dripping trees, long, chill ribbons of ghastly fog borne on a sobbing wind. I mushed on into the deepening gloom of the forest primeval. After 10 minutes of that, I began to wonder if there was any house there. When I saw it, I still wondered. It looked more like a fungus growth. Speak of the English? It is chilly, isn't it, sir? Won't you come in? Uh, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I expected that. If you'll be so kind as to wait here, sir, I'll inform Miss Rowena of your arrival. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny Stewart. Forrest, who's out there? Is it the man with the hemlock? Answer me, you brute. I... Oh, where is it? Did you say Hamlock? Oh, you must be my aunt's detective. Spade, was it? It is, right. I'm Ralph Raven. Come along with me, Spade. I have something interesting to show you. Ralph Raven was the one member of the household you hadn't described to me, and no wonder. The wasted figure that looked up at me from the wheelchair was more like a ghost than a man. His face was chalk white. So white it seemed almost luminous, and the skin clung so close to his skull there seemed to be no flesh beneath it. And his wide, staring eyes looked like two cups of black coffee on a snow-white tablecloth. I followed him into a glass-enclosed room, only slightly larger than a garden court at the plaza. The humidity was several points higher than the dripping woods, and the temperature was several degrees lower. But the plants he had growing there seemed to thrive on it. As I edged nervously through the dense, quivering foliage, I noticed a strange-looking yellow-green pod, about the size of a milk bottle, at the end of a long, tubular stem. It leaned over, opened its red mouth, and said, Hey, what is that thing? Oh, that's my Sarancenia gigantosa. Meat eater. Carnivorous plant. Don't be frightened. I just fed it. Uh, don't tell me. You know what it eats? Uh, acts like it needs a dose of bicarb. No, perfectly healthy. Merely part of the digestive process. Even as you and I. Not me. But over here... You're a detective. These plants should interest you. Oh, oh, don't touch that mandrake. Never thought of it. It won't cry out. No vocal cords. Oh, I see. It's very sensitive. Oh, sensitive. And deadly poison. Oh. And, and see here, these pretty purple blossoms? Yes, very pretty. Source of an alkaloid poison favored by the Borgias. And these, white hellebore. Watch your language. I use it in compounding veratria. A poison so ancient it would probably go undetected in the police laboratories of today. Mm -hmm. And here, here's a charming one. Both a killer and a medicine. Belladonna, or deadly nightshade, source of atropine. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, commonly known as Nux Vomica, well. produces not one but two deadly poisons. The well-known strychnine and the rare and not easily detectable Brucey. Yeah, well, it's uh, quite a hobby, Mr. Ray. Well, it's uh... not a mere hobby, Mr. Spade. It's a practical science. All the plants in this conservatory have their fatal properties, and all have played a role in the great times of history. Did my aunt get another threatening letter? So she says. Odd that she should fear death at her age, and odd that she should hire a bodyguard. How does she know how it'll come? It might be poison. Speaking of poison, brother dear, it's time for your medicine. Oh, Spade, my sister, the lost Lenore. How do you do, Mr. Spade? How do you do? Here, Ralph, drink up. Why does it always have to be in milk? And look here, it's not time anyway. Oh, it's confounded. Watch it stopped again. Spade, what time do you have? Why, it's uh, three. Uh... Oh, that's funny. My watch has stopped too. I didn't know then what that meant. In fact, if you look on the last page of this report, Deputy Dear, you'll see that the stopped watch was the key to the whole puzzle. I protest that my failure to realize its significance at that moment had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that my client's niece, Lenore Raven, was, as you so roguishly put it, sacked. About there, uh, Boris, the butler, bobbed up and beckoned me from the balustrade. 
I followed him upstairs and was ushered into the austere and regal presence of my client, Rowena Raven. That would be all, Boris. Yes, madam. Oh, Boris, I just remembered. Yes, madam. There on the occasional table, my watch. I want you to take it around to the watchmakers in the morning. It's on the fritz again. Yes, madam. Mr. Spade, I must apologize for keeping you waiting. Oh, it's all right. My watch hasn't been keeping proper time ever since those threatening letters started. Could that be a clue, Mr. Spade? Uh, maybe we'd better start with the letters, Mrs. Raven. I can't find them anywhere. I think that young man from the sheriff's office must have pinched him. Bill Woodington? Oh, I'm sure not. Well, all the same, it's very odd that every time he comes here, he can't find them. Uh, well, where did you put them, Mrs. Raven? Right there on the occasional table. Yeah, well, uh, Mrs. Raven, sometimes uh, people have very vivid dreams. Huh? Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with their minds or anything like that. You but... talk just like Dr. Slosser. That young sawbones my niece sent around looked my sciatica. Sciatic is nothing but a pain. How can you look at it? It's a lot of bull. Yeah. Uh, what do the letters say, uh, Mrs. Raven? That's why I wondered about my watch, Mr. Spade. The letters always contain some reference to time. Your time is running out. Beware when time moves slowly. Soon it may stop altogether. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. You think there could be a connection? I mean, has someone been tampering with my watch? The repairman doesn't know what's causing it to lose. Yeah, did he think it might have been tampered with? No. He thought it was something in the mountain. Magnetism or something. Well, that sounds logical. That's now, a lot of hooey. I lived here 40 years and my watch never lost a minute. Something in the mountain, my eye. Something in this house, more like, or somebody. You ask me, he's not half so sick as he pretends to be. Your nephew? Uh-huh. What do you think? Well, I think he's a very sick man. No wonder. Sitting in that damp conservatory day after day, pattering over those fiendish poisonous plants. You see the one that eats mice and hamburgers? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, what's supposed to be the matter with your nephew, Mrs. Raven? Oh, he was in an auto accident. Injured his neck. He had to remove part of a gland or something. His neck. But Dr. Slosser says he's in good condition aside from that. And if he takes his medicine faithfully, there's no reason why he should... Come in! Ah, Mrs. Raven, how is that pain this afternoon? Worse, thank you. Dr. Slosser, this is Mr. Spade. Ah, Yes. The detective you engaged to investigate those uh, letters you've been receiving? Mr. Spade thinks it's an inside job, don't you, Mr. Spade? Uh, well, that depends on what you mean by an inside job. There, you see? Inside that romantic imagination of yours, my dear lady. Hold still now oh, while I give you your shot. I loathe being jabbed. Well, oh. now, that wasn't so bad, was it? Oh, uh, can I look how, now? How is Ralph getting on, Doctor? Not well, I'm afraid. He doesn't uh, seem to be responding to the... the uh, Mrs. Raven, what is it? Uh, poison. You poison me. Uh! The cry she uttered was only half as terrible as the expression on her pain-contorted face. She pitched forward on her chair with both fists clenched and shaking as if in anger at the doctor standing before her. He put down the empty hypodermic on the occasional table. Yeah. Help me carry it to the couch. Yeah, sure. The, take away that pillow. Oh. She must lie perfectly flat. Uh, there. That's better now. Uh, She's relaxing. I'm dying. There was poison in that needle. Please, Mrs. Raven. It was only sedative. Uh, to make you sleep. 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 The time is running out. The poor woman. Malignant condition. Only a matter of time. Does she know? That she has only a short time to live? Oh, yes. Well, I have another call. Do, do you have the time my watch seems to stop? Another one? I beg your pardon? Uh, nothing. I left my watch at home. Oh. Ludwig. Well, I... Ludwig, something terrible Shh. is happening. Your aunt is sleeping. You'd better come down to the conservatory right away. Ralph is in terrible pain. What kind of pain? He keeps saying he... He's been poisoned. What? Well, come along. Take that hypo to the kitchen door and sterilize it. Where is it? On the table there. I... He stopped on his tracks. His mouth fell open and he gave to the tabletop where he put down the hypodermic. In its place, it appeared two items. An old-fashioned lady's watch and a note written in green ink. The note said, time must have a stop. I picked up the watch and held it to my ear. You guessed it. It wasn't ticking. 
I had a hunch my client wasn't either. And I was right. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the stopped watch keeper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Ralph? Ralph, where are you? Where did you leave me? Hey, wait. Over here. Oh, Spade. Keep them away from me. Ralph, I came as soon as I could. T tell me your symptoms. No. I phoned for another doctor. He's on his way now. Spade, my aunt. Take me to her. I must tell her. Tell her what? I'm afraid we have some bad news for you, Ralph. Your aunt is dead. Oh, so you poisoned her, too. Oh, Ralph, you're sick. You don't know what you're saying. She's been to every specialist in the country. They all said the same thing. They all said she was good for another three months. My dear boy, in these cases, any doctor's guess is as bad as the next. No. Oh, please, Ralph, you're very sick. Please let Ludwig examine you. If it's what you think, the other doctor may be too late. <laughs> Why not? Why should I fear death? <laughs> That's better. Now let me see your eyes. Uh -huh. So. So. Open the mouth. So. What is it? What is it? He's right. It is poison. You see? You, you know, see? my dear. Yes. When you sterilized that needle for Ralph's shot this morning, did you pick up the wrong bottle? Of course not. Strange. It's very strange. But don't worry, Ralph. There's a very simple antidote. Oh, thank heaven. You should, my dear. Indeed, you should. <laughs> that was that, Deputy Deer. Two doctors and the county coroner took one look at my late client's medical history and decided on death due to natural causes. I didn't think so, and neither did you. So there really were threatening letters? I saw one. You sure now, Sam? Sure, I'm sure. Where'd you say it was? On the occasional table. Yeah. What was you doing when it wasn't a table? Not occasionally, occasional. Oh, just any old table. No, Bill, now, Bill, get this. It's real deep. An occasional table is a table that a woman picks up at a bargain and puts into a room under the mistaken impression that it may come in handy someday. Mrs. Raven used hers as a catch-all for her unanswered correspondence, threatening letters included. And what happened to the one you saw? I don't know. I put it right here in my coat pocket along with a watch. It just disappeared. Well, that might be tampering with evidence. Listen, Bill, things were disappearing from that table almost as fast as other things showed up. Yeah, sounds like pack rat. You follow that up, Bill. I'm going to pack up and rat out of here. Now look, Sam. My client's dead. It's officially okay. I haven't made a penny out of the caper, and now I'm not likely to. So do you give me a lift back to the toll gate, or do I hitchhike? <laughs> There's your answer. Come on. When we reached the second bedroom, whence the scream had come, we found the lost Lenore looking well found and something comfortable. She's standing center stage, regarding herself with horror in a full-length mirror. She looks awful pale, Bill. You better get downstairs and get some ice water. She might faint. You think so? Yeah, hurry up. I'll stay here and keep up her circulation in case anything happens. Yeah, you're right. Beat it. Oh, oh it's you, Sam. I thought... You thought what? Look. Look, I found these on my pillow. Mm. One watch, one threatening letter. Whose watch? Mine. 
I left it on the dressing table when I went in to cream my face. I came out, somebody had slipped this under it. On the dressing table? No, under my pillow. You said on your pillow. I meant under. I mean on. I don't know what I mean. What are you trying to do to me? Just trying to get things straight. But the note. Look at it. It's exactly the same as the one he left in my aunt's room. Why do you say he? Oh, I don't know. Yes, I do. It's because I don't trust Ludwig. Dr. Schlosser. That figures he doesn't trust you either. But he pretended to think I might have picked up the wrong bottle. Uh Oh, he was acting. Couldn't you see? You're not doing a bad job yourself. I'm not acting. Not anymore. Listen to me. Listen. He's acted strangely ever since I foolishly said I'd marry him. I would myself. Oh, Sam, darling, don't joke. I don't mean like that. How did you meet him? He he got me out of a jam once. The accident. Well, my brother was hurt. I went for a doctor and he happened to be the nearest one. Well, I'd been drinking and he took over and he sent me home before the police arrived at the scene. Didn't Ralph know? He blanked out. He doesn't know to this day. Ludwig never forgot. He forced me to recommend him to my aunt. He got into her good graces, practically moved into the house. Then he pretended to make love to me. Pretended? He didn't care about me till he found out about my aunt didn't have long to live. He knew half her money would come to me. Sam, do you think he poisoned my aunt? Officially, she died from natural causes. But you said she spoke about being poisoned. And Ralph, too. What's that medicine you give him in milk? I don't know. It's... it's Prescription, just some drops that come in a in a metal container. Where do you keep those drops? Here. Here in my room. I have to hide them. They make Ralph feel so much better. He used to overdose when the doctor trusted him to dose himself. Let me see that medicine. It's, it's just here in this cabinet. Here it is. It's right. Don't tell me. It's empty. There, there was a glass bottle inside the container. Mm, small but heavy. Lead yet. Hey, what are you doing with that gadget? The thing with the dials and the speedometer. Oh, that, that, that's something medical. I have to make a test on Ralph every day to see how he's getting along. Do you know what that actually is? Yes, I do. It, it detects anemia. Well, I wouldn't know about that, but a Geiger counter is generally used to detect something else. Well, what, what, what are you going to do with it? I'm going prospecting for that missing medicine. Ah, there you are. I've been looking everywhere for you. I'm afraid I have bad news for you, Lenore. Well? My diagnosis was correct. Pernicious anemia. Dead. What is that you are carrying, Mr. Spade? Oh, uh, nothing special, doctor. Just an old Geiger counter. Lenore, did you let him take it? He said he was going to use it to find Ralph's medicine. What happened to Ralph's medicine? I don't know. It's just gone. Mr. Spade, that machinery is my property. I must ask you to hand it over. No gun necessary, doctor. Here, take it. Take your gun, too, sir. Lenore, carry the machine this way. Walk ahead of us. First, we try the conservatory. He was an amateur with a gun, but I didn't jump him for it because I'm an amateur with a Geiger. I did notice that the indicator on the dial got nervous the minute we walked into the conservatory. Ralph Raven's body was still in the wheelchair, no paler in death than in life. His sightless eyes were fixed on that obscene plant. The plant looked sick, too. It was drooping, and his red mouth was hanging open. As we walked past the wheelchair, the indicator on the dial of the Geiger counter moved forward and then slipped back again. Then it took a sudden big jump. Ah, so that was his hiding place. The more of that disgusting carnivorous plant. Well, it's not pleasant, but there's only one way to get it. Don't move, either one of you. My eye is on you. Yes. Yes, it's here. At first, I thought the plant had bitten him. But then he pulled his hand out, and I saw what had happened. There was a hypodermic outfit stuck in the heel of his hand. It surprised him no end, but he still managed to hold on to that gun. He swung it away from me and was holding it on Lenore. You... You knew? No. No, I didn't. You must have. Ralph knew. He must have told you. No, I swear he didn't. What do you think I did this for? You... To die and leave you behind. To enjoy the money I got for you. No, you will come with me. Oh, no, you don't know what you're doing. There's someone right... Shut up. What are you looking at? What's behind me? Don't bother to rush him, Sam. I've got it. Hold it, Bill. Yeah. How's that for shooting, Sam? Yeah. You find a bullet hole in him, Bill, and I'll call it good. And 
that, Deputy Deer, is the crop. And it's all carnivorous. In case you're still wondering what dropped him when your shots missed, it was the poison in that hypodermic needle which Ralph had planted there for that very purpose and then baited the trap of the all-important missing medicine. Later on, I learned that what the doctor had been feeding him was the right medicine for what ailed him, an isotope of iodine. It seems it's radioactive like uranium, but if you take too much of it, you die. Not of poisoning, but of pernicious anemia, which is how the doctor planned for Ralph to die. It also magnetizes watches so they don't keep the right time. And if they're cheap ones, like mine, they may stop altogether. Uh, period, and a report. Got all that, Buffy? Mm, I got it, Sam, but I don't get it. Uh, Buffy, people have studied all their lives to learn about atomic stuff like isotopes, and you expect me to teach you everything in one easy lesson. Oh, no, Sam, I know about that. But who killed who? Whom, dear? The doctor killed everyone, but Ralph loaded the needle. And they were accomplices? No, Buff, get this. It's real shallow. Ralph knew there was no way in the world to prove that the doctor was killing him and hastening his aunt's demise. So he saw to it that she got a dose of detectable poison and did himself the same favor. Oh. Now, uh, like a good girl, go type that up, hmm? mm-hmm. And now, listen to this. More and more millions agree every day. Wild Root Cream Oil has become America's favorite hair tonic because of the neat, natural way it grooms the hair. Because of the quick, easy way it relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. Get non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil with lanolin right away. And ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. I certainly hope that butler was brought to justice. What for? His dialect? Oh, for helping to deliver the threatening letters and then stealing off the occasional table. A brilliant deduction. How did you deduce? Sam, that's for kids. (laughs) If Ralph was too ill to walk, then somebody had to push him upstairs in the wheelchair. Now, wouldn't it have been easier just to carry him? That's how he did it? Or uh, just go up himself? That's how. Possibly, and then again, we may never know. But uh, do we care? Hmm? Yes. I hate loose ends, Sam. Then keep it up. (gasps) Oh! Good night, Sam. Spoken like a true perine, so I'll say to you, good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Rene and Pierre Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Me, sweetheart. Sam, where have you been? I don't know what to tell them. Tell who? The reporters, everybody. They all say you're the first private detective in the history of San Francisco to get rich honestly. Uh-huh. Oh, Sam! 
When I think of all the back salary I'll be getting, the fur coats I'll easy, buy... Easy, girl, easy. Prepare yourself. Sam? Yep. You mean... The $50,000 is not available to employees of the network or sponsor, which, unfortunately, I happen to be. Sam! But cheer up, girl. Think of the taxes we'll save. Now, make everything fast. I'm on my way. Meanwhile, puzzle me this. You ready? All right, Sam. Why does a man who is going to blow his brains out set his mantel clock ahead four hours? Sam, it doesn't make sense. Ah, but it does. Mall and ponder, sweetheart. I'll be down in a trice, 1951 model, with an intellectual type report to challenge serious thinkers everywhere. To wit, the Biddle Riddle Caper. <laughs> For NBC, William Spear... On the third down, Cherub, give it another try. No, it's no use, Sam. I'm, I'm mentally through. Well, you know best. I, I just give up. Sam? Hmm? Uh-huh. What are those funny little bumps on your cheek? Go ahead, guess. More box? Plague? You get more. Looks like a little waffle mark. That's what happens when somebody hits you with a microphone, sweetheart. <gasps> now, if you look closer, just above the marks, under my eye... Oh. Clearly and distinctly, in reverse, of course, the three letters of a network known far and wide for its hospitality to unemployed private detectives. You mean... Shh, not here, girl. Poise the pencil. Who knows? A sponsor may be listening. Ready? Yes, sir. To Mr. Tracy Abbott, Drake Carlton Hotel, copy to Dundee at Homicide. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Biddle Riddle Caper. Dear Tracy... It had a nice conventional start, this one. A nice conventional phone call telling me to drop up to room 402 of the Drake Carlton around 3 in the afternoon. But when I got there, I found that over the nice conventional number on the door was hung a temporary sign reading, Olympic Radio Productions, Tracy Abbott, editor, director, and producer. Bidding farewell to the nice conventional part, I made bold to enter the door. Abbott, five foot eight of solid Hollywood, was waltzing with what I took to be a musician, composer, or... Some such. We open Cold Bunny like this. Now, killer at large. Banging with the theme. Theme. Bum, 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 A great big wonderful chord there, Bunny. Check. Check. And then the teaser. Quote. Don't go away, you out there. Stick right close to that radio set of yours, because the next half hour might put $50,000 in your pocket. Yes. $50,000 will be paid by the sponsors of this program for information leading to the arrest and conviction of a mm-hmm. killer at large. Da, da, da. Tonight, that's it, sustain the cord. Yeah. Da, Tonight, the murder of Tremolo, Tremolo. <laughs> Tonight, the murder of Carol Stevens. Then, da da dee pum 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 Check. What's that? Symbol crash. Do it again. Don't need it. Check. Big, wonderful, lush. That's the word, lush. With scope and sweep and power. I got it. Well, I'll get as lush as I can with eight pieces. Scope, sweep, importance. Got to sound important. Check? Check. Uh, hmm? Oh, oh. I'm Sam Spade, Mr. Rabbit. Oh, yes, yes, Spade. Glad to see you. Please oh. sit down. No, on the other hand, you'd better stand up. No time to lose. You have 24 hours to find a man for me. Well, that's pretty short notice. How... Mr. How Spade, you... killer at large is real. We keep a sensitive finger on the pulse of the people. Well, that's nice. We deal in real facts, real people, real crimes, and real criminals. Check. Just how do you do this? How do you accomplish all this on the radio budget of today? Now, you see before you spade the mechanical marvel which makes this possible, the tape recorder. You're familiar with the tape recorder? Oh, more or less. Check. Tomorrow night at 9 p.m. PST, with the aid of the tape recorder, we shall reconstruct one of San Francisco's more sensational unsolved crimes. The murder of Carol Stevens. You mean the burlesque dame three years ago? Two years, eight months, and 29 days. You remember much about it? Well, let me see. She turned up dead on the floor of her apartment, didn't she? Check. Victim of the well-known blunt instrument. Mm. In this case, a bronze bookend carrying the base relief of Abraham Lincoln. Much ado, much ado. Headlines by the yard. A parade of witnesses, but no arrests, period. Fine. Now, what about me? Our show's spade is made up of the simple, honest, spontaneous statements of the witnesses themselves. Mm -hmm. We're set on this one except for one man, the most important one in the case, of course. Oh, who's that? Jimmy Biddle, the doorman at the Broadway burlesque at the time the Stevens girl was killed. Oh. Knew her. Some say he loved her. Top suspect until he came up with an alibi. Our advanced men have combed the city for two weeks trying to find him, but no luck. So he's born Tom. That's what I thought. Until this morning. You mean you've heard from him? I heard from someone who said he was Biddle. 
He also said he knew who killed Carol Stevens. And he wanted the 50000 Right. I mean, check. Oh, fair enough. Well, that's what you advertise, isn't it? Not to people who hang up when you get curious. Hmm? If it was Biddle, I've got to record his story. I want him here by 8 tomorrow night. Check. Well, since you keep bringing it up, check. Yes. You can make it out for 100 bucks. At Homicide, I case the files on the Stevens thing. San Francisco's answer to the Black Dahlia. A cheap killing of a cheap dame in a cheap apartment that used a lot of expensive newsprint. She'd taken her last turn under the blue spot around 10.30, left the theater, and hustled straight home. Because at 11 sharp, according to the neighbor across the hall, someone had tried the Abraham Lincoln bookend on Carol for size. She hit the floor just as the 11 o'clock news came on. Biddle's alibi had to be good, and it was. It came, as a matter of fact, from the greatest little alibi factory in town. Biddle was drinking old fashions with Joseph P. Norgard, the well-known criminal lawyer at the time of the killing. So I trotted over to Norgard's office on Market Street, found him tied up, and settled down in the waiting room next to a gimlet-eyed youth in a neon-striped suit who looked like he made a living sticking up crap games. He was filing his nails. Uh, buddy. Yeah, buddy? You, uh... You sure you're in the right office, buddy? Positive, buddy. <laughs> I just thought I might save you some trouble, that's all. Sam Spade, ain't it? Well, you're a smart kid. I try hard. <laughs> I still think you'd be wise to blow. You know, this is quite a turn you do, buddy. Study nights with Richard Widmark. Sam, I told you I want to save you a bad time. You're a nice guy. Thank you. Must be a lot of things you can do around town to make a buck without coming here. Now, why don't you lift it out of that chair? I'm not going to do it, Mr. Norgard. And that's fine with me. I'll get with you later. Bye, buddy. The guy who bustled out of Norgard's office was flabby, florid, and frightened. Penstripe gave me a last baleful look and sidled out into the hall after him, which was nice because I was running out of punchlines. Look, I thought I told you to. Oh. Mr. Norgard? I am? I'm sorry to barge in. My name's Spade. I'm a private detective. Of course you are. And a hungry one. Well, we're polite in here, too. Why do you say that? You're the fourth today. Oh? I'm about to prepare a mimeograph statement entitled, What I Know About the Stevens Case, or You Too Can Make $50,000. Like a copy? You know, I can't remember when I've been treated so nice. What do you know about the Stevens case, Mr. Norgard? It's all in the homicide file. On the fateful night, I ran into Jimmy Biddle as I was coming out of a bar in Chinatown. He'd hit the skids. But he used to be a useful friend, so I asked him up to my apartment for a drink. Was he? Sat him in a chair, made him an old-fashioned, loaned him five bucks, and hustled him out. Mm -hmm. Total elapsed time, 45 minutes, from 10.45 to 11.30 p.m. And that is all I have to say at this time. Have you seen Biddle since? Not since the investigation. I don't know where he is now, and I don't know who killed Carol Stevens. Period. Paragraph. Do you think Jimmy knows who killed him? Maybe. Well, he says he does. Oh? Where did you see him? He's hungry, too. We work the same bread line. Well, I'm sorry I said that, Spade. Who are you working for? Olympic Radio Productions. Killer at large. Yes? <laughs> they want me to come to the studio tonight and record a statement for them. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I wonder if I ought to tell them what I really think. What's that? About Biddle. There's no point in talking around it anymore. I think he killed her. Well, that's a neat trick if he was drinking your liquor at the time. Oh, well, I think he did it after he left my place. Two things placed the time of death. The medical examiner's report, which could be off as much as three hours. And the neighbor who thinks he heard the girl fall as the news came on. How reliable is that? Well, they usually think of those things during an investigation. Hmm, but they didn't think hard enough. You, uh... You say you talked to Biddle? He called my client. Why? He had 50,000 good reasons, according to him. You know, funny things happen when the dough gets into it. Bought people don't stay bought. Lost people get found. Yeah. Well, I've told you all I know, Spade, if you have no more questions. Oh, just one more. Who's the little weasel in the pinstripe? <laughs> you mean Luke? Yeah. Oh, I put him out there to scare off the hungry ones. Nothing to do with you. Mm. And the fat character he's tailing has nothing to do with me either, huh? You really want to know? Love to. He's a pastry cook. <laughs> I'm representing his wife in a divorce action. Thinks he's Casanova. Pressure cooker, eh?
Shoving Norgard, Pinstripe, and the flabby pastry cook in the look-up-later section of my hat band, I took off for Biddle's last known address, a boarding house on Pacific Avenue. There I held hands with the landlady long enough to learn that A, she hadn't seen Biddle since a few weeks after the murder, but B, when last heard of, Biddle had gone on from the burlesque dame to something even more extremely female. According to the landlady... Named Rosalie. Understand she's working on the line at the Pacific Ballroom. Red hair, blue eyes, and boom, boom. You get me? <laughs> I got you. Pacific Ballroom, eh? Uh, would you do that last again? Boom, boom. Yeah, just checking. Thanks, Mrs. Landlady. <laughs> the lucky girl? Well, you look like your name ought to be Rosalie. Oh, you're a psychic. Got your tickets? Here, let me, uh, let me know when they're used up, huh? Don't worry. Hey. You know you're a pretty good dancer? Arthur Murray, class of 1906. (laughs) Only I, uh, I didn't come here to dance. Uh, Oh. I'm looking for Jimmy Biddle, you know him? Yeah, yeah, I know him. You a cop? Not exactly. Oh, what's the difference, cop or no cop? You'll find him one of these days. Where? In the bay, maybe. Or the morgue. He knows it. That's the funny part. He knows it, and he can't do anything about it. He's got him. Rosalie, baby, look, I'm out. That's enough about Jimmy. Let's dance, huh? That's what you're paying for, isn't it? Well, come on. Where is he? You're wasting your time. I... I won't sell him out. I'm through with him, but I won't sell him out. Ah, oh, here. Here's your ticket. I sauntered over to the soft drink fountain and mulled the problem over a coke for a minute or two. There are ways of dealing with dames like Rosalie. Some of them are a little cruel, as this one was going to have to be, but time was of the essence. I kept out of sight for 20 minutes or so, watching her dancing in the arms of a moonstruck plumber, then sidled into a phone booth. The Pacific Ballroom does not permit telephone conversations while the girls are working. When I said it was the police, the plumber was turned over to a new candidate, and Rosalie came to the phone. Hello? This is Sam Spade, Rosalie. I was dancing with you a little while ago. What is it? I, uh, I found Jimmy Biddle's apartment. Oh? What's the matter? He's hurt? That's right. Uh, the bed? I'm afraid so. He wants to see you. Oh, okay. I'll be right over. She didn't stop for a wrap, just plowed a zigzag furrow through the mob at the main door and climbed into a cab at the curb. The driver must have been an old fan of hers because they were almost out of sight by the time my cab got rolling, and that's the way it was across Market Street and all the way out Van Ness to the marina. Her cab was pulled up in front of an apartment on Jefferson Street, and she'd just gotten out when we slid in behind her. Hiya, you want to go up together? But you said you... I'm sorry, honey. I know it was a dirty trick, but... Now, that's no way to be here. You shut up. The gold card holder by the doorbell listed the tenant as W.R. Smith. Mr. Smith was evidently not home. The lady manager in the apartment next to his was, and after the usual license showing and more than the usual sweet talk, she came up with a key. Biddle wasn't wealthy, but he wasn't hungry either place had the well-fixed man-about-town look, right down to the last crystal martini glass in the portable bar in the living room. Next to it was a mahogany desk, in which were sundry checkbooks and deposit slips indicating Biddle had found a prosperous widow or had been doing rather well at Canasta. A clock chimed four in the next room. Since it was after ten, I wondered why I went in to take a look. Maybe I was psychic, like the girl said. There was a tape recorder against one wall, the same kind I'd seen in your office, Tracy, with a microphone and a roll of tape in it, half used up. Holding the microphone with one hand was Jimmy Biddle. In the other hand, a thirty-eight. He wasn't hurt, as I'd told her. He was dead. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade.
This Sunday, there's another outstanding production by Theater Guild on the air. It's a one-hour adaptation of the thrilling tale of intrigue in post-war Vienna, The Third Man. Joseph Cotton and Senior Hasso star in this Theater Guild on the air broadcast. And Sunday over most of these NBC stations also means the big show, an hour and a half of the finest in comedy, music, and drama. Tallulah will be your hostess, and just listen to a few of the stars. Fred Allen, Marlena Dietrich, Danny Thomas, and Fran Warren. There'll be many more, too, so tune in this Sunday and every Sunday for The Big Show. And now, back to the Biddle Riddle Caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. In accordance with Chapter 5 of the Private Detective's manual entitled How to Keep Your License, I called Homicide and gave him the facts and figures, then went back to the study. Jimmy Biddle was surrounded by props like Part 1 of a photocrime puzzle. I carefully reached over his shoulder and pressed the button on the tape recorder. My name's Jimmy Biddle. The DA will remember me. We saw a lot of each other during the week after Carol Stevens hit the deck in her apartment three years ago. At just about this time of night. I fooled him then. I could probably go on fooling him, but I'm tired of it. I'm tired of living this way. So here it is. I knew Carol Stevens well. I was crazy about her. And I was jealous, too. That's why I killed her. Thought I could go on and on, playing hide-and-go-seek for the rest of my life. But sooner or later, this kind of thing gets too heavy to pack around it. You've you got to get rid of it. One way or another. Period. End of report. I rousted the landlady again, and we went over the room together. A helpful type landlady. She contributed a thousand odd bits of gossip about Jimmy Biddle, only one of which struck me as interesting. She'd come in this morning, she said, to clean his apartment, and among other things, had wound and set the eight day clock on the mantel. The same clock, which was now exactly four hours fast. Looking closer at the tape recorder, I saw a small label pasted above one of the knobs, reading, Morgas and Reed, recording technicians. Next scene, the manufacturing section of Sansom Street, a five-story building, all dark at this hour, except for a light in the office on the second floor back, which happily turned out to be the one. Morgas? Reed! Anybody! Hello. What, what do you want? Well, a pastry cook. Uh, I, I'm sorry. We're closed, you see. Office hours, nine to five. Now, tonight. wait a minute. Just a minute, pastry cook. I'm, I'm, I'm not a pastry cook, sir. My name is Murgis. I am one of the proprietors here. I, uh, just a moment, sir. I'm sorry, ask you to... sorry. It was getting cold out in the hall. Well, so you're Murgis, huh? I am. And I don't care who you are. I know all about it, sir. I know it wasn't a practical joke. What wasn't a practical joke? That tape. You can march right back to the man you're working for and tell him he can't buy me off. Is that clear? Not very. There's no use denying it. I saw you in his office this afternoon when he... when he threatened me. He, oh, what, what you get do? down, Arnett! Yes. What is it? Oh. I crawled out on the fire escape in time to see my buddy in the pinstripe suit hit the bottom. The alley, praise be, was blind at one end, so Luke took off toward the street. I caught him in one leg. He stumbled, fell, smacked his head against the brick wall of the alley and took the count. I was frisking him when a foul cop who heard the shots moved up. I convinced him I wasn't rolling a drunk and left him to run back upstairs. Murgis? Murgis! Yeah. Oh. I better get you to a hospital. Who, who are you? Sam Spade. I don't work for Norgard. Right now I'm trying to hang a murder rap on him. Told me it was... Practical joke. A gag. What? Tape. Jimmy Biddle. Tape. Jimmy rented the machine from you and made the tape himself, right? Yes. He. He. Norgard. What about Norgard? Tried to beat me into it. Beat. Beat me. I wouldn't give it to him. Give what? I... Tape. No, no. I... I... He tried to point to the desk. Said ribbon had come to an end, and I was pecking away at a piece of sound tape. Oh, 
Come on, Rosalie. No, I don't want to talk. Look, come on. My feet are even more tired than they were an hour ago. Okay, you first. All right, now. I'm sorry, Mrs. Spade. I thought you were lying when you said Jimmy was hurt. Look, let's I'm... not go into that now. He was blackmailing Norgard, right? I don't even know who Norgard is. You know Jimmy was shaking someone down, didn't you? I never knew where he got his money. I just knew it was dirty money. He'd laugh and say he was living high, but not for long. He never mentioned Norgard? No, he, he just said he was going to make $50,000 in a radio program. Did he say how? Singing. I thought he was kidding, then he showed up with that tape recording. Well, he wasn't kidding. Then what? He wanted to be alone, he said. He was going to make an audition and send it to a sponsor. Well, that's where he made the mistake. He sent it to the wrong sponsor. Huh? He figured to hit Norgard for the biggest touch of all. Thought hearing it might make him dig deeper. So he recorded his statement, sent it to Norgard for a sample. But there was something he didn't think of. What do you mean? He should have studied up on his tape recorders, baby. With a pair of scissors and a good technician, Jimmy's eyewitness account turned into a first-class confession. The final phase of the Biddle Riddle was, as you will recall, Tracy enacted on one of the sound stages of the nation's leading network, where, as you will also recall, you were busily transcribing the testimony of various witnesses on the Carol Stevens case. How you got him there, I'll never know. But there he was, as big and legal-looking as ever, perjuring himself once more into one of your microphones. I walked out of the Twin Dragon on Grant Avenue. As I remember it now, Biddle was across the street. He apparently recognized me, though, hey, Excuse me, will you, fellas? What? Oh. Hey, you idiot. You ruined it. I'm sorry, Tracy. Oh, we'll have to start it over again, Mr. Norgard. Would you mind if I record a few remarks? Spade, please understand my position. Biddle's confession has changed everything. I know. The killer is not at large. Yeah, yeah. 24 hours we spent recording the show. Now it'll all have to be done over again. I'm sorry. These sir. people at this house. Listen, Tracy. All right, Spade. What is it? I'm only trying to help. Now, where's Biddle's confession? On the machine there. We're going to dub it onto the main tape. Good. Now, be a good lad and show me where you're starting to stop it, huh? Right there. Okay. So, what is this, Spade? This is going to interest you, Mr. Norgard. Now, let us turn to the tape, keeping our eyes on the spool as it slowly feeds Jimmy Biddle's last statement. My name's Jimmy the Biddle. Amplifier. The DA will remember me. We saw a lot of each other during the week after Carol Stevens hit the deck in her apartment three years ago. At just about this time of night. I fooled him then. I could probably go on fooling him, but I'm tired of it. I'm tired of living this way. So here it is. I knew Carol Stevens well. I was crazy about her, and I was jealous, too. That's why I... There's a riddle for you, Norgard. He said the girl died, quote, at just about this time of night, unquote. But the clock struck three times. We know she died at 11. What happened to the other eight chimes? Spade, this is no time Be patient for... with me, Tracy. What about it, Norgard? Well, how do I know? The man was crazy, maybe. No, 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 no. He wasn't crazy. Stupid, but not crazy. So we take this spool of tape off and put this one... On. What's that? This is the part that was cut out. Got it from the guy who did the splicing job for you, thinking it was a practical joke or something. Sam, do you know what you're saying? Yeah, but Biddle says it better. The last thing we heard was I was crazy about her, and I was jealous, too. That's why I killed her. Only he didn't say killed her. Just, that's why I... Well, standing outside in the hallway of her apartment the night she died, I'd seen her leave the theater with a guy I recognized. And I followed him home to her place. Heard the argument, everything, but I had no idea he'd kill her until I heard her hit the floor. Door busted open then, and he came out looking like a crazy man. He didn't even see me. He just ran down the back stairs as fast as he could go. I went in and saw her lying on the floor dead. I could have killed him then, but I thought of something better. He's good pay. The cash comes right on time. But I'm tired of living this way. So there's the story. The man who killed Carol Stevens... That's an expensive life! Right? Right. Right. Which is as far as Biddle got, since Norgard had grabbed a stand mic and slammed it into the recording machine. In the rhubarb which followed, he also slammed it into my face, which is why I carry the imprint of the nation's number one network just below my right eye. So that's about the crop, Tracy. Norgard and Pinstripe now lie cheek by jowl in the jail hospital trying to think of an honest lawyer who'll defend them. While you, Tracy, with a third round of interviews before you, are considering tossing out Carol Stevens and doing the shooting of Dan McGrew. Period. End of report. Sam, how unfortunate. 
unfortunate. Unfortunate? She never got to explain about the clock. It was four hours fast. Why, sweetheart, that's self-explanatory. The clock said four, you see. Yes. But it was twelve. It'll have been dead an hour, which makes it eleven. Carry one, one. Subtracting four from that leaves seven. Seven. And assuming he'd been there an hour before that makes six. Hmm. Sam, what relentless logic. Just like Ellery Queen. Effie. On this program, we do not plug rival products. Now, go and type that up while I figure this out. Scoop, scoop. Yes. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's mystery and music every Saturday on NBC. For mystery tomorrow, Herbert Marshall stars as The Man Called X. The Man Called X is a man without a name who travels the world over combating the forces of international espionage and intrigue. For music tomorrow, your hit parade brings you the top tunes in the land, played by Raymond Scott's orchestra, and with vocals by Snooky Lanson and Eileen Wilson. Here it is, Sam. Mm, thank you, dear one. I uh, see by the furrows in your brow that you have not as yet solved the matter of the missing chimes. Oh. Why Norgard set the clock ahead when he shot Jimmy Bibble? Hmm. How to approach this? You realize Norgard cut a hunk out of the tape, yes. removing Biddle's eyewitness account, setting him up as a suicide, right? But Sam... Don't make me change my grip. Though Biddle, by his own statement, made the recording at the time of the murder of Carol Stevens, to wit, 11 o'clock. Now, in cutting out the crucial words, Norgard also had to cut out eight chimes. This, he realized, would be noticed. So he set the clock ahead to make the number of chimes jibe. <gasps> chimes jibe. Chimes jibe. Nice ring. Sam, hmm? will it be all right with you if I just say I understand when I really don't? Sure, sweetheart. I'll just type and answer the phone and you use your feet and your head. And together we'll end up... I know, with... Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Enjoy the magnificent Montague, then Duffy's Tavern on NBC. NBC.